you're my lawyer? Says here you uh, robbed a hospital. Why'd you do that? Yeah, I'm not guilty. That's not what the other lawyer said. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome to Law Explaining the Interwebs. I am your host, Nick Ricada of Ricada Law, a small law firm in central Minnesota. <coughs> oh, boy. Oh, boy. It's the morning, right? And uh, it's the morning. Welcome to it. We are in for we are in for one heck of a day. This chat, man, this chat is moving like lightning. I am trying to even wrap my head around it. We've got, uh, whoo, <laughs> we have 15,000 people waiting to watch jury deliberations that we can't even watch. What's wrong with you? Why would you do this? Why would you? <laughs> oh, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm very appreciative that you are all here. Um, There is so much. There is so much to do. It's not a fresh haircut, actually. Uh, it's just I, I combed it a few minutes ago. And I haven't had time to ruin it yet by, like, going, Oh, bigger! Uh, none of that has happened. What's wrong with me? Oh, that's a long list. We don't have time. We don't have time for that. <laughs> oh, man. Ooh, ooh, what is happening backstage? We have, I didn't know we would get one so early. We've got a guest. Hello, good sir. I cannot hear you at all. Uh, well, welcome to the stream when he gets uh, on mic, Mr. Uncivil Law. Uh, very, very glad to have some company on this day of on this day of bashing heads against walls, waiting for juries to come to a conclusion. Uh, hopefully the one that I came to so many months ago. Um, things have been a little uh, weird. The past day as <laughs> as uh I, I i'm getting like text messages from friends and stuff uh because they they've seen they saw what happened yesterday right and if they they may not have i don't know if they were here live or not but they certainly saw what happened um yesterday today from places like breitbart and uh and other sources that have that mentioned the show that mentioned what happened. They talked about YouTube shutdown, which was entirely bogus. Uh, obviously, um, it's it's hard to have a copyright violation on a uh, public broadcast of a public event. You know, court court is not typically going to be copyrightable. That's not a thing that we would normally expect to see because uh you know it's a public it's a public uh proceeding it it's factual there's nothing artistic about it in fact i'm pretty sure they're using the court cameras um oh man Let's see let's see who we got uh <coughs> there's not a ton of live stream coverage yet uh court tv or wait uh law and crime has it and so does live now with fox who do we choose who do we choose oh i'm not gonna do the fox one that's got a bunch of commentary going on we'll just do the court tv one
I don't know how they get the courtroom camera feed specifically. I mean, I'm I'm just uh, I'm just re rebroadcasting it. Yeah, the reason I'm not going to do Fox is because they've got like a a reel going, and I'm that that's different, right? Like this is law and crime. This is not going to be. This is not copyrightable. Hold on. Like this? I mean, what what was that? Show me your artistic impression of what's happening there. Um, nothing, obviously. But Fox, Fox is running reels of the Kyle footage. There's probably some commentary. Oh, goodness. Uh, some commentary going on in the background. So I'm not going to I'm not going to do that. That seems a little much. But today we are going to watch jury deliberate. Well, we're not going to watch. We're going to be present for jury deliberations. I am seeing this thing through to the end. And I pray, pray that the jury deliberations are short. Because um, sleep at me, I confirm. I pray that the jury deliberations are short because I don't want to sit for like eight hours or days doing this. That would be, that would be silly. So we want is short jury deliberations. I think short jury deliberations benefit Kyle for the most part. Um, I think they, they indicate a quicker finding, you know, a finding of not guilty, but we will see. I am still, I'm still getting woken up. I'm getting woke. You heard it here first, but, um, yeah, so I'm hoping it's quick, uh, with the quickness would be ideal. That way we can, we can, uh, move on to whatever the next thing actually is. And, and Kyle, hopefully, hopefully will be going home. <laughs> Havoc. Man, Richard's Richard's voice in Wisconsin Wisconsin mannerisms have been uh, one of my favorite things in this trial. Uh, Your Honor, they're unleashing Havoc on the city of Kenosha. Uh, I just that that very very thick. Like Wisconsin, Chicago mixed accent is is beautiful. It's a thing of it's a thing of beauty. It's a thing to be treasured. And to see that really come through and put Midwest on the map. I mean, in a way that has not been done since Fargo, right? And I'm glad Wisconsin is finally getting its due. Uh, because Fargo, Fargo really torqued off a bunch of Minnesotans. Hello again. Now I can hear you fine. Oh, hey, how's it going, buddy? I had to turn it off and turn it back on again. That's how it goes. That's uh that's it. Welcome to the welcome to the live stream of Hurry Up and Wait. It's Very like we're in so. the army. <laughs> Very much so. Yeah, so we're we're gonna do the tumbler thing at some point with the uh lotto balls, which I think is just kind of a hilarious way to do this. I mean why not, yeah. I suppose. But I, I've never quite seen it done that way before. I I wonder if they're gonna like sit there and do it on camera and be like juror number 51 <laughs> yeah right like what, I result, hope... what result am i ho hoping for at this point i guess to be on the jury and be deliberating if i had to go through all that mess yeah because otherwise you're just going to be sitting there literally all day uh watching anything but the news so you're going to be relic what what are they going to have them watch because like Some Disney could films, be a... maybe let's watch Frozen. Let it go. Let it go. I don't know. Yeah, because if they have just the, the court said TV stations or whatever, but if they have TV stations, they could even get. We're gonna have to have a bailiff in there with a the remote or something. No An CNN errant for you. ad. Yeah. <laughs> like just in case a commercial comes on. We if if that were the case. Like in a hypothetical, I would love to buy ad spots on each channel at the same time. 
that just yes. says Kyle's innocent, Kyle's in so that when the bailiff goes to like change through the channels of the courthouse, he's like, Oh god, oh god, oh god, <laughs> like just trying to get there. Uh any reasonable jury, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let me show you the standard for, or let me, let's talk about jury nullification. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> well, we don't need jury nullification in this case because of course he's actually innocent of all the charges. That's true. That's true. Let's just talk about the jury's duty to follow the law and not the That'd be good. Yeah. Over let's, and over let's just, and over. we just actually follow the law all the way through it. It leads to this result. Yeah. It'd be, uh, it, uh anyway, I, so what are you thinking, man? Do you think this goes fast? Do you think this goes no, over no. a day? If I were a betting man, yes. My my bet's a day and a half. Why would you say that? Uh, just because it's complicated. Well, I'm basing it off a couple different factors. Um, I'm principally basing it off the fact of what Robert Barnes said when he said that when he was doing his work, jury consultant, that he found that Kenosha was one of the most favorable counties to Kyle. But even though it's one of the most favorable, Still, two-thirds of the population had a starting premise against Kyle, and a third of the population was dar died in the wall opposed to Kyle, at least right. the way he says it. There's a third of the population that, you know, is dying in the wall, cannot be convinced. So, okay, I'm just trying to base it off probabilities. I'm saying to myself, okay, what's the probability that this, this, this uh, defense team did their jury consulting right? What's the probability that they made sure to vet themselves on the jury? might not particularly great all right so what's the probability that there's going to be someone who's going to be a complete hard nose and not want to do anything i'm like okay and then what's the probability that this person might try to wear someone down into some kind of compromise verdict so i'm trying to like calculate all these things in sort of the back of my head a back of the envelope math as it were and that's why i say a day and a half how about that for an answer that was a lot of answer but it's all right uh i i hate I hate that it's right because I don't want to, I don't want to sit for a day and a half. I want the trial done today. I want to know, I want to know the answer, right? I'm ready to don't go. You? Let's see you know, how long do we need? Do we need to elect a forbid? It's like, I'm ready to go. It's just the not guilty is fine. Yeah. It's like, I, I imagine, <laughs> imagine me. It's like, put me on a jury like this. I'm like, I know the answer. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, the, I know answer. the answer. That's right. That's right. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, man, when they were reading those jury instructions yesterday, the, the thing that went through my head is uh, I was I wanted to raise my head, hand and say, teacher or professor, this is not a fair question for my final exam in crim <laughs> law. This is not fair uh, to have the question this complex. It's like I, 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 I'm having bad, I was having bad flashbacks to law school for some reason. I'm like, I cannot go through this all. Yeah. Yeah. There was just, there was just so much to process, but they'll have. Um, you know, they'll have a printed copy of all of the jury instructions and they can, oh, take that helps. It. Yeah. They can take it one count at a time though. That's, I think the key, right? They just start and they say, okay, we're going to go. I mean, this isn't how they're going to do it because they're going to get in there and they're going to be like, well, let's talk about it. He's guilty or, well, let's talk about it. He's not guilty. And that's how that's going to go. Their, their approach, they... their approach might be better though, because uh, if it was a room full of lawyers, uh, how long do you think it would take us just to like, we were arguing over, you know, we were just basically arguing over the law because we wouldn't get oh, yeah. past page two, man, before we're starting to argue <laughs> over the nuances of words. I mean, I mean how pulling much, it out. How, these jury instructions are actually incorrect. Uh, yeah, that's right. I'm going to take much, umbrage. I mean, how much time, for example, did you spend on just the issue of the minor in possession, which is basically a sentence, which incorporates some other things, but how much time do you spend dissecting all that? And now we have 36 pages of stuff that's like that. And I have to dissect this. Like who, who can do this? Yeah. It, it, well, normal people can because they're not uh -huh. lawyers. Oh, that's uh, yeah. That's probably the answer. It's probably why it's good for lawyers not to be on the jury. Cause like, I, I don't know how to go through all that. That's a, so much. Right. I, I'm just like self-defense. Good. Which lawyers is all I need. So maybe I'm better. Maybe I am a reasonable juror. I don't know. Yeah. Cause lawyers going through the jury instructions would be like rain man going through a supermarket. <laughs> <laughs> all of these words mean the same thing and are worth the same amount. And, uh, Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. My, my dad, uh, said to super chat, he says, shouldn't the substitute jurors have to watch roadhouse? Oh man. 12 take angry men is good. I just see a 12 angry men's a good movie. Recommend take me it. off the jury then. Like, 
I just want to sit and watch Roadhouse all day. That would be good. Jury duty. It should be exclusively movies about juries. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Dad. Wouldn't it be Wouldn't it be better if it was Runaway Jury that they had to watch all day, just just over and over? <laughs> there is uh, there is one thing I wanted to talk about, which is the one, uh, one screen, two films effect that we seem to be having with ourselves and some of our brethren over on Twitter, for example. I just I find it mostly disheartening that we have such divergent perspectives because I try to, as best as I'm able, get outside my own mind and try to look at things from different points of view, sometimes to the annoyance of the chat. But I, I just, I'm like, I don't know how you guys are getting to where you are, where it's like, well, he's clearly guilty. The judge is a white supremacist and all the rest of it. I, I just, I just don't understand. I guess it's just so barely clinging to the narrative, but I, I've, I at least try to put narrative aside as I have during these analysis where I'm like, well, suddenly Richard sucks or Richard's is good. So I, I just, I don't know what to say about that, except it's disheartening and I want to raise the issue. Um, real quick, guys, I, I I will answer it, but uh, I put up a poll, and the, the, the options are guilty, not guilty, hung jury, and then a compromise verdict. A comp so uh, someone said, what's the difference between a compromise verdict and not guilty, or, or and a hung jury? A hung jury would be, there's no guilt. Uh, it, it'd be a mix of votes on all of the charges, so there's there's no guilt assigned, but he's not not guilty because it's not unanimous. Um, a compromise verdict would be uh, not guilty on most of the charges, but adding one of maybe the lesser included charges to guilt as they compromise on the fact that they want him to be punished for something, but they don't want him to be punished for the full thing. So um, these are limited options because it's a YouTube poll. Uh, there could be there could be tons of different results like guilty on count one. We'd have permutations of poll results if I tried to do everything um but no uh yeah I, the one what did you call one it screen, one screen two films yeah one screen two films is uh actually you know they have tvs that do that yeah so the yeah the uh <laughs> maybe it isn't quite the same as it used to be when that phrase was created well no because it, it it kind of is maybe though, it right? is maybe exactly that maybe yeah, it's you, even more because you you have to put on glasses and basically they use interpolation and they display on one set of pixels because it's like a 4K TV. Yeah. You have one set of pixels playing a 1080p version of what you want and then a 1080p version of what someone else wants. But you put on your glasses and each one sees a different thing. Um, because I saw, uh, it what out. was it, uh, Land Rover had a screen in their car that did it by witchcraft where it didn't require any special glasses, but somehow because of where you were sitting, you literally could sure. see two different things. So the driver would see GPS and the passenger could see a movie on the same screen at the same time, just because they're in different positions seating. It's like, okay, there's, there's some witchcraft there. That's why Land Rovers cost so much. Hmm. Um, but, uh, no, I think, uh, oh, oh, we've got... Oh boy, they're treating us with a judge right away. Oh joy. Um, is it is it a motion to dismiss so that we can just all go home? They did file the motion to for mistrial yesterday. Yeah. Um that'd be uh, nice. Can we all go home now and just end this thing? That'd be great. I don't think I don't think he's gonna grant no, it. No, he's definitely not, but you know, one can hope. Oh, turn on the audio. Come on. Oh wait, I have it muted. It's my fault. Although there's still no audio, so that. That's My okay. Fault. Well, we stream strike in three, two, <laughs> one. I'm alleviated from fault now that I found out that there wasn't audio. Whoa, Shirafisi has a clone. Do you see him in the back with glasses? Eh. What's he doing there? Eh. It's his stunt double. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> he needs to go to the bathroom. He's like, you, just don't worry. You don't have to stand up and object. It'll be fine. Come on, court. Get that audio feed up. Are you sure it was the person sitting at the defense table? Are you sure it wasn't the person in the back row? Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> That's the, that, that, I think that was a Chicago lawyer that did that. Yeah, right? it definitely happened once for real. Yeah. And uh, he put, he put like his assistant who matched the basic physical description of the guy. It was a traffic stop. And he put, uh, he had his assistant 
um yeah who's like it was like the description was like six foot tall brown hair brown eyes or whatever and uh he noticed his assistant looked about the same so he had him sit at the council table with him and the defendant was actually in the back of the room and so then the he asked the police officer can you identify the defendant he's like yeah he's points to the council table and he, come on judge get get on the mic he pushed the button did he oh my gosh this is insane. Is long crime failing us let me see if i get someone else pulled up here well he's having sound problems too so i can't be too hard on him this morning i can all right fine yeah you with the boomer tax sure okay all of the tech issues so far uh, oh anywhere yeah, yeah. access any site respecting uh, the case and uh, there we go let's take the uh he sounds terrible Strike the jurors as necessary. The all of the jurors' numbers have been uh, exhibited to the defendant, I believe. And his voice, like together now, half then, octave uh, lower. Put them in the tumbler. The, the tumbler. The left will rotate it, and then the defendant will draw. Oh, uh, the judge has the a tumbler numbers. account confirmed. No, just uh, separate them. And... The little pieces of paper. So it's not the it's not the uh, lot of balls. That's annoying. And the names which are drawn out will be the jury who will be uh, oh. dismissed. Oh, please. Oh. Just reach in there. Yeah, reach in there. Oh, oh do they make the defendant do it? That's what they said. That's what they said. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Choose your fate. <laughs> This what? is one of the more bizarre moments I've seen in my life. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot believe it. I'm t- I gotta tweet that out. And also, the uh, crinkling noise reminds you of a jail cell. Just so you know, with the, the oil, it reminds yeah. you of that, this classic sound of a jail opening it up and that. So put that in. His head. That's great news. Wow. Wow. <laughs> I've never seen that in any courtroom ever. That is wow. very strange. I can't believe that you have to pick your own truth. <laughs> 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 oh, man. What a, what a weird process. Okay. <coughs> As I call your number, you please stand up. They are going to do it. 11. Number 58. Shouldn't they have had him draw number a 6 14. instead of 12? They That's did. He did draw a 6. Oh, oh, he did. Okay. Number 9. And number 52. You are not the imposter. You, the back room. You're, you're not sus. They've been ejected from the airship. <laughs> uh, we should have gotten the numbers so we could have tweeted them lost style, you know. We definitely need those numbers so we can we could redo the lost memes and, with those numbers in place. <laughs> Damn. Right, members of the jury, it is uh, for Everybody you, in the uh, chat got a bingo just whether now. the defendant is guilty or not guilty of each of the offenses charged. You must make a finding as to each count in the information. Each count charges a separate crime and you must consider each one separately. Your verdict for the crime charged on one count must not affect your verdict on any other. Uh, as I indicated, I think yesterday that uh, uh, you must return only one verdict for each count of the information. So who all is buying a lottery ticket on this one? Did, did you did you get to see the drawing? I did. That's bizarre to me. <laughs> if you need to communicate with me while you are in deliberation, please send a note through the bailiff, which is signed by the presiding juror whom you've elected. <laughs> I would send the note to the judge a note. You Do you like me? Why slash the N? Before answering, <laughs> so it may take some time. You should consider. Uh, you should continue your deliberations while you await an answer. 
I will answer any questions in writing or orally here in open court. Oh. The paper rustling you is brutal. You on your verdict, have it signed and dated by the presiding <laughs> jury as to each count, and all of you return with the verdict to the court. I think Go the to- judge does have a cold. Does have a cold. He, uh, I mean, he's been indicating sinus issues the you whole trial. You swear that you will keep your old persons born, uh, sworn on this jury together in some private and convenient place and that you will not speak to them nor permit anyone else to speak to them concerning the state of their deliberations or the verdicts upon which they have agreed so. Oh, he said bailiff, but it wrote it as Phyllis. All right, folks, you can retire to consider your <laughs> verdicts. Unless that guy's name is Phyllis, I guess I shouldn't, you know, assume. I, I, I'm, I'm going back to my earlier topic as well. I'm I'm just waiting for the, the the tweets from whoever because I don't know this for sure. But I'm maybe it's the case that the the numbers he drew are such that it makes it even more white supremacy in, in nature, and this is just further proof of bias because somehow they they tag the paper or whatever. You know, it's part of the system of white supremacy just I mean, waiting for that little note bingo is white privilege i mean that's what happens as you get older as a white person um you eventually you know traverse into bingo i mean that's how it goes it's a math formula uh mm-hmm. a function of x as age approaches infinity so it would, be, it would be wrong it would be wrong in the courtroom after they're done to just yell out yahtzee right that would be a bad thing to do <laughs> Almost always a bad idea, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm sure it'll be the the the. Oh wait, Michael Shirafisi, Michael Corey Shirafisi, he wrote the juror name, the juror numbers. Excellent. On the uh, he wrote them on the cards, and Kyle put them uh, got to pull them out. So we know that they rigged the jury, right? Like we know that that happened. He just wrote down only uh, the jurors that they wanted gone on the things and and Kyle knew not to pull duplicates yes that would because be he textured trick. the paper yeah that'd be good no that's what I'm saying yeah why not mark the paper like a card counter you know just slice just the thinnest edge <laughs> off the edge of the card like when you literally cut the card so that you can feel the difference in your hand like a card mechanic and then you know bingo bango you got the jury you want God it would be amazing what if they actually guy. sat down and did motion Fixed hearings. Out. Parting, as they say, is such sweet sorrow. What? Um, you've been wonderful, jurors, and we couldn't have asked for a higher quality jury, better jurors. I'm sure we could jurors, have. You could. I mean, you could always ask. And uh, it is, uh, yeah, with this. Um, and then when you take them up, you can take that up too. Um, there Tell us about instances. the Bible and juries. Sometimes in cases you'd recognize by their importance uh, where jurors have been restored to the jury uh, after having been dismissed. So that Ooh. is conceivable. It would happen in this case. It's not likely, but it's in fact, it's quite unlikely, but it's possible. Um, I, uh, uh, so I'm going to ask that you continue with the instruction that you not discuss the case with anyone, not even amongst the f- the six of you, you can't just deliberate at all or discuss the case in any way. You can't read, watch, or listen to any account of the trial. Did some of you bring laptops? No, no. Well, I feel badly about that because I had a jury some years ago that was just in a similar situation and the extra jurors were, all they had to watch was daytime TV and I'm afraid I can't even arrange that for you. Um, but um, I don't know, maybe there was something about some movies or something, wasn't there? Was, <laughs> we got some recommendations. I Um, the movie lady's out. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, we'll see what we can do to uh, give you some kind of uh, uh, entertainment. And join us uh, over on Nick but in the meantime, Twitch. please. Uh, we'll be watching those uh, rules and watching uh, a movie together. Um, you will be. We're not going to sequester anybody or anything at this particular point. So, uh, uh, and I hope that they have. All we have is Anaconda Two. Search for the Blood so, Orchid. Uh, any questions? Sorry. Yes, ma'am. Yes, I, in fact, I'm having the bailiff escort you up there now. And while you're there, you're not to have any conversation with the other jurors, okay? Anything else? Okay, fine. Thank you very much. <laughs> and give those to the jurors, yes. Mad Max. <laughs>
Liar, liar. That's a good one. Yeah. What's a great like self defense movie? Just super pro uh, self defense. A wrongful conviction movie. Just make him watch Shawshank Redemption over and over. Shawshank is good. It's a, cl- it's a great movie. Do you really want to put Kyle Rittenhouse through this? Do you want to send him to prison? He's not an accountant. Or he else can't else make it. For, uh, you'll, um, I've, uh... Game of kill. Thrones. Time, Time to, to Kill, kill would be great. Uh, I think stay within uh, 10 minutes from here. Rambo. <laughs> in case there's questions or something. Okay. Thank you. Man, the chat's got a lot of movie suggestions they could watch. I mean, if they need to source some movies, I think the chat's got them. What about like Con Air? You just watch yeah, Con Air. But they have to watch Con Air, though. I know. <laughs> Why am I getting My calls? Cousin Vinny? Sure. Oh, God. We forgot that one. That's sad. So that's unforgivable. The Punisher. <laughs> just, oh, yeah. A judge dread. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh man. Um, well, it, I mean, it looks like they're not going to do any motion hearings. I guess the judge is just uh, seems like he'd be efficient, but maybe he's giving the state an opportunity to respond. I wonder how many on a motion for mistrial. I guess the state's going to get. You know, they'd have a week or so to respond, or two weeks, maybe. So, what's the final demographics of the jury? They said one of them was a woman. Do we have uh, final demographics? That just might be interesting. I have no idea. All right. Well, if anyone happens to know, <laughs> yeah, I didn't. I didn't. Uh, I never saw like the jury numbers. Yeah. I, there's a report on them somewhere. Yeah. Um. So uh, while we're waiting for me for nothing, can we go back to my earlier question of my sadness of the polarization of reality? Yes. Yes, we can. Um, where were we? Was I talking? Yes, you were talking. Okay. <clears throat> the, uh, I mean, it, it's, I think the, the main takeaway from that, and this is something everybody should know, is that uh, lawyers in weird ways, like everybody hates them, but then they get this vaunted status at various times, right? Like uh, suddenly they're imputed with a bunch of authority because we, we went to school and uh, and we learned a lot of words and we learned a lot of history in a particular way. But at the end of the day, they're just people. Right. And so they bring their their biases and their preconceptions and their political interests and their and their ignorance, just like everybody else, into a topic uh, that they're one that they're not specifically studying. So if if a lawyer, you know, knows a whole bunch about a topic uh, that's broad, sure. Uh, because they, maybe they specialize in law around that area, or maybe uh, a lawyer has researched deeply into a particular thing, and and we could be pretty good at researching deeply when we need to. Uh, then then we might have a lot of facts. But other than that, I mean, you're going to come in with the same preconceptions that you would otherwise, right? Like just like anybody else. So I think that's a big part of maybe our our comrades, and I use that with all of the Russian I can muster over on. Uh, over on the Twitter side of things is that they're bringing in a lot of preconception into this. I'm sure that uh, as busy practicing attorneys, they have probably not watched uh, 60 hours of trial on the subject and they're getting summaries just like anybody else would. So um, that's my, that's my apologetic answer. If you want my brimstone answer, I can do that. I'll take brimstone too. (laughs) They're a bunch of communists, Kurt. They're a bunch of commies. There, there's the brimstone answer. It's, it's, the reality. it's really just that simple. It's really just that simple. <laughs> yes. they, it's anything to support the narrative and whatever supports the narrative, everything else be damned. Yeah. Okay. The, 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 that was the, a simple I, answer. Yeah. I've seen tons of these lawyers out there, uh, purported lawyers. I mean, I don't know any of them who are out there saying that uh, he was he's a white supremacist out shooting black people. And it's like he didn't. He, the only black person around involved in the shootings, he missed. And I like to think, I like to think that was him being consciously not racist at that point. He's like, oh God, I can't shoot this guy. Right. Like that would be bad. 
I can only shoot the white guys. I'm, I'm joking, of course. But no, I mean, there, there are people who've been running the false narrative. There are people who suggested that the gun charge was not only like a proper charge, but that he was sure fire guilty of the yeah. gun charge from the get go. No question. Like you, you could propose the alternative reading to them yep. and they would never even consider the possibility that what the law said was what the law said. It must have meant, and, and you'd say, but it's kind of weird to impose hunting regulations on someone who isn't tagging a deer. Like that's a strange thing to do. And they'd be like, Nope. <laughs> well, I, I, I did like it. where you tweeted out yesterday. Was it PolitiFact of Wisconsin or something had uh, at some earlier point said that he was in legal possession was just false. And then you tweet <laughs> yesterday. It's like, well, that held up. Well, it's like, <laughs> we actually did some legal analysis. Yeah, it was like, and and that was the thing. These uh, a lot of news outlets who have lawyers on staff to handle, yeah. the, like to help them with these things. They just they apparently didn't read the law, and when they wrote their articles, they never mitigated with the possibility of you know there's and because that was a confusing law. It's a very confusing law. It's confusing yeah. to a to the judge who's been practicing law in some way, shape, or form for forty four years or whatever, and he's like, I spent. He's like, I don't even want to tell you how much time I've spent thinking about and trying to think through this law. It's very confusing. And so, you know, uh, you can give a mitigating idea of it. You can you could give that. I And maybe uh, as, as self-reflective, maybe I didn't mitigate enough, but I think that I was pretty fair when we got to trial to say, you know what, if the jury instruction is under 18 and deadly, a dangerous weapon, he's going to be guilty. Of course he is, but we have this exception and, and the, ex I, I still don't think the exception's an affirmative defense. I mean, that's, no, that's that doesn't make any me. sense. It doesn't make any sense. That's an but, affirmative uh, defense. But maybe that's how Wisconsin does statutory interpretations on criminal laws. Fair, and maybe it is. And, and, and if that's the case, you know, I just don't know. But but to me, it seems like an exception written into the law is a matter of law to determine. And and they could have just picked up the gun and measured it uh, when they got it. They could have measured the barrel length because they never they never asserted in their complaint or anything that this was a short barrel rifle. That was actually it was a little incorrect of the judge, in my opinion, because he said, as pled, there's probable cause. But the pleading should should require it to be a short barrel rifle. Right. Like the that should have ne been necessary for the pleading of a 17 uh, against a 17 year old. Now, if they had said he was 15 at the time that he possessed it, different story. But since he's 17, pleading should have included short barrel rifle. So he should have dismissed it outright, uh, even based on probable cause standards. The, the chat is saying seven, uh, seven women, five men and one person of color in there. So that means 11 white. So at least it's not an all white jury. So we got that going for us. Oh, uh, well, yeah, I'm sure the nar the token narrative isn't coming. <laughs> isn't it kind it's, of insulting from, the, already been insulting from their point that. of view to call that guy a token? I mean, because they're dismissing him and lowering testing, him. Testing, testing. Yeah. Yes, you're here. Yeah, we're, you're here, oh, buddy. Good. Sorry, I we're just... We're just uh, you for a second. Sorry. I've been having audio problems for the last couple of days, so... Uh, well, that's okay. Not, that hasn't happened to anyone else on the panel. Uh, I was just... There's already articles about, oh, there's only one black guy on the panel, and I'm like... If if Kyle had managed to by you know it's random chance, but if he'd drawn you know that guy to send off, they would have been just freaking out. Oh, Kyle, yeah. you know, intentionally gets the one black juror off the paddle would have been just. Uh... That's what we were saying earlier. Since Sherfisi sure, sure put the numbers in the tumbler and Kyle drew them out, there there would have been some accusation like, oh, the black guy had a textured card or whatever. Right. Or oh. the black woman. I, I don't know. A person of color doesn't actually uh, particularly describe anything. So I, I'm jumping to a conclusion by saying by saying black. And that's I shouldn't jump to conclusions. I should walk that's there fine. slowly. You're, you're good. Um, let me get a couple of these big super chats real quick. You can, can go I... full screen since we're watching nothing as well, too, by the way. Yes. And yeah. I'm mostly in court today, so I'm probably going to be. Yeah, I'm going to have to bounce out in a minute. I just want to pop in for the drawing, which I'm glad I didn't miss. Yeah, yeah, I just to, wanted to pop in and be like, what the hell? <laughs> the to, the wonderful, to the wonderful chat, you're going to be stuck with me for probably some long stretches today as uh, everybody else catches up on their week. Um, but Britt Cormier says, polarization of reality is 100% due to the media, 
both social and historic when you only report the points that f support your story or only see those reports we cannot agree on facts i think that's apt uh james says free kyle and pzp says in their closing why were binger and kraus allowed to lie about what written law states does anyone want to tackle this one the answer Real is law. objection the defense has to object if they want to address the issue and strategically we uh, i think we got a lot of insight into richards's mind when he said we've had nothing to hide they had kyle turn his phone over without a search warrant uh or not with they had him turn over the uh the password to his phone when when the police were unable to access the data on the phone they had him turn over the password they had him testify in court uh they've they've really held off on objections they have uh let in they've been extremely permissive with the evidence and i mean they're phrasing that as they've been open and have nothing to hide um and so maybe it's that rather than than laziness on the objections but that's that's how they've done it and uh, if they just didn't want to quibble over this stuff because they think their case is strong it's it's a strategy i don't i don't it's know a bold that plan, i plan cotton yeah, I'm not sure I uh, that I fully agree with that. I think I think matters of law that are misstated by the prosecution are just ripe for calling out. Your Honor, he's lying about the law. He's lying about what the law actually is. It just like and then let the uh, the court overrule the objection, but with a clarifying instruction, you know, to say, OK, um, you, you should be instructed that this is this is what the law actually is. And uh, it's Richard Hogue. Yeah. And, hi, uh, gentlemen. I think I can only pop in for about an hour or so, but I figured I'd say hi. Did you just get to yeah, see the welcome. Tumblr? Did you get to see the Tumblr of Destiny? I, I oh, I, I saw the picture that was sent out. I can't believe they they have him do that himself. That's it was uh, it was. A, yeah, it was fun. All yeah, right. I got to pop wild. out again here, but uh, I'll be watching. Yeah, welcome. Anytime you want to pop back on, go I ahead. might as well pop out, too. Awesome. It can be you and Richard. Richard doesn't get enough airtime. Let's oh, let's so, oh, Richard I, I for a while. I popped in and everybody left. OK. <laughs> <laughs> well thanks for clearing out the panel richard it was getting dusty uh, well <laughs> i can see they love me no how I, you doing I, I, I saw you all talking and uh like i said yeah i think i've got uh, i've got a noon call i gotta prep for but for right now uh i thought uh i thought i'd pop in and chat i don't even know what you're talking about for they're, they're just gonna be silent for hours now right yes i i have a plan and um the plan will probably get uh it might get boring for some people, but I have a bunch of super chats. I've got a oh, backlog sure. of them that I'm going to read through at some point. Cause I assume I'm going to be, um, I'm going to be alone for a significant portion of today is, is my guess. So I'll be doing some of that and um, answering questions as I'm able to, but while I have people, I want to discuss things. Oh, Hey, look at this. Look at this. Not everybody is disgusted with you. Like we're we're in uh, we're in tears. We come in twos. Yes, perfect. What's up, Joe? I'm great. How you doing? Oh man, I'm uh, I'm good. I'm good. I've. It was weird seeing um, my name pop up in like Breitbart, uh, talking about the uh, and on Infowars talking about the shutdown by really? YouTube yesterday. Oh. I, I'd so. seen that Tucker Carlson referenced you not by not mentioning my name. Well, and he couldn't have been YouTube talking about. <laughs> He couldn't have been talking about ours, our show, because he said it was uh, legal experts with hundreds of viewers. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, hundreds? Well, it's, it's thousands <laughs> of hundreds. You yeah. know, it was, 77, it was hundred. of them. But at the cool. time of the shutdown, I actually had looked at our numbers like relatively right before that. At the time of the shutdown, we were not just the number one, but we had, we had more viewers than Fox and PBS combined. And I think I yeah. even made a comment about that. Uh, so... <laughs> Yes, yeah, we that's why crushing. I sent a correction on that. Yeah, we were really, really crushing. And I do think that we would have broken 100 if we didn't have that ridiculous. Now, I, I understand the reporting on that. I mean, do, do you think that this was a deliberate attack uh, or, or an error? I, they, from what I heard, it was an accident. Uh, Team YouTube has not gotten back to me yet. Um, on Twitter or in uh, or via email. Now you have um, enough subscribers <clears throat> that you've got a person at YouTube, right? That should be getting back to you. Yeah, I'm waiting. I'm waiting for them now. 
I, I want to say my, my person tends to try to fully investigate things sure, um, sure. and bring me a good answer. So I, I wasn't expecting a response from them yesterday, but uh, team YouTube on Twitter, despite being tweeted at by about a, a thousand people and uh, me DMing them. And I have, I have an open DM thread with them from a prior issue. Um, they still have not responded. And I mean, they respond uh, with relative frequency to people on Twitter. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so I, I, I don't know that it was an accident, but I do find it pretty suspicious that the PBS stream um, that was trailing behind us is, seems to be, seems to be the source of the accidental copyright uh, match. And okay. um, I, but I don't know that they actually asked for it. It's, I, right. I'm trying to get info on that. Because, uh, boy, would I love to report that PBS actually asked for all independent um, people to, to do it. But see, the, the crazy thing is, like, law and crime got shut down, too. Yeah, no, it and, was simultaneous across the board, right? Yeah. And and to, to have law and crime shut down when they're, you, you know, uh, I, I guess maybe they're on PBS's feed. I'm not sure where, like... Are those not PBS sure. cameras the one? Are, are they owned by PBS that are doing that broadcast? I don't know. I, I honestly have no idea because all the camera angles appear to be they, they appear to be sourcing the same cameras on on basically every source I've found. Um, the one difference I saw was that during the autopsy photos, PBS was not actually switching to the autopsy feed, but some okay. other places were. So I'm not sure where it came from but but to suggest that there's a um strong copyright interest in the uh, bland reporting of factual information is uh factual public information like this would be is suspicious that's a public I mean, government function I, I that's why i asked whether they were pbs cameras because you could at least make the colorable claim that that's that's our view of the public our view. guy framed it yeah yeah the but shot. I, but no, if it's not, if it's, the, you know, if it's a court system, I, it's not even close. Oh, it's, it's all from court TV actually, apparently. Yeah. So, uh, it, they're the only cameras allowed in the, in the courtroom is what I just saw from the chat from Mr. Joey camp, 2020. See, I'm a, I'm a so, benefit of the doubt guy. It's like, Oh, that's, that's, that's unusual. But I, I, I stopped before jumping to the, the full on attacks, but it certainly did. If it was an attack, that's how it would look. The uh, the reason that I uh, the reason that I think there may have been, and I, again, I don't know who the party might be, but some some hand in in doing that yeah. is um, the the frustrating difficulty that it that many viewers have expressed in finding this live stream. Um, in in search, searching for just, you, if they know your name and they know you're doing this, there are videos out there of people typing. Ricada Rittenhouse trial and not getting any videos of the Rittenhouse coverage that I've done and, and not getting the active live streams, but rather getting, um, you know, getting the mainstream sort of sources for it. And it's like, if you type in Ricada Rittenhouse, that should pop, I mean, should be the top result there. There's no question that that should be the number one result, especially with the amount of viewership that's going on. It's not like I'm uh, streaming to one person. You don't have a common like, name. It's a subject yeah. matter. No, I agree. It's not, so. it's not just that if he, it should be that if you put in written house trial live, right. And you, and you had to enter when, while he literally has more people watching him than any other YouTube channel. And he's not on the list anywhere. You will get, I, 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 I scroll down 50 spots, you know, PBS is there, Fox is there, Yahoo's there. You get old videos rather of, than live videos. And, yeah. And you'll start getting older videos. Yeah. And rather, while he, and he'll be sitting there with 66,000 people watching him and you'll get, you know, Yahoo news with their 12,000 and, and, and then, uh, and, and you'll get PBS obviously and Fox, but <laughs> yeah. And when you scroll down, you'll just get old stuff from PBS or, or, you know, good morning america like well you just get weird things and you won't get him and that's just in that's insanity and that the the fact that there would be that there are even other non-news source youtubers with 
uh, with smaller live uh, live watchers that get ranked far above non authoritative uh, under right. YouTube vernacular. Right, and 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 it's like, look, I'm I don't need to be authoritative on everything, but on this, like this this particular live stream uh, series is like the most authoritative coverage I can think of. But I know YouTube. Uh, qualifies authoritative as uh, quote unquote trusted media sources as in having basically. a network. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it, it was, it, it's just like, so when I see those things combined um, and when I factor in one other, one other aspect that I think you might appreciate early on in my YouTube career, I, uh, I, and I, I mean, I had probably, I might've had 10,000 subscribers at the time I was covering the James Damore class action lawsuit against Google. Sure. And um, it Don't took use the word Google. I know that it took about two years for my Google search page results to uh, stop being artificially um, controlled, we'll say. And and I was getting uh, Google engineers were actually sending me screenshots of the Google internal communications about because they have their internal version of Hangouts that they were using at the, the time. Yeah. yeah. And uh so they were sending me screenshots about, you know, Google employees asking for my bar number uh, and, and discussing me with a lot. And it's like, this video has like 2000 views. <laughs> like these are not huge yeah, videos. What are you doing? Well, I know and, I um, can appreciate that when I yeah. started out, especially I do, you know, virtual legality has a lot of overlap with tech. So we talk about YouTube and Facebook and Twitter and Twitch. And honestly, they've been in the news for a number of good reasons about whether or not they're doing the right things with their algorithms and, and whatnot. And I learned very quickly. <laughs> well, I, I learned very quickly that if you use the word YouTube in the first you know, sentence of your description or the title or, or Google, that that one's going to get dinged. It had an, it, I would get demonetized to start on all of those. Regardless, you know, I'm a lawyer talking about news items uh, in that series. And I... I you know, there, there is a real kind of chilling effect towards, do I want to even talk about this particular YouTube concept? Because I don't know exactly what's going to happen. And, and as a matter of fact, you know, it was earlier, I think it was earlier this year. It's been a long year <laughs> that YouTube wound up giving me a, a strike, a, a warning strike, because it was the first one or whatever. Oh, on a video That was a year old. That was about the way algorithms were treating in this particular case, Q and subscriptions and things. And it wasn't about anything except the, the legalities of it and the terms and conditions and things like that. Yep. I got struck because I, I think I, because I said the phrase right in the video and I, I, I made another video. I said, this is ridiculous because they put up a thing that says, you know, you're in violation of our cyber bullying and harassment policies. And you could tell immediately at the time that the channel got depressed, chapters wouldn't work, all these various things. I'm not even sure if I'm not on a list just from that fake strike from a year ago. Yeah. And it, it's, it's wild to have to deal with because obviously, you know, the audience is here. The audience is interested. Um, and I'm not looking to pick fights, but, you know, <laughs> play fair. No. And yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a thing the, the, for me, the, one of the weird, and, and this is, this is me half complaining. Um, so let me, let me qualify this. You can um, a little. No, la last year, was uh, at the time my biggest year on YouTube. I, I mean, from from revenue and everything, last year was a great year. It was bigger than the previous year, which was bigger than the previous year. Um, so that that's the good growth trajectory that you want. And so I'm I'm not complaining about income or anything from last year. But what I will complain about is there was a specific day where my view counts from one day to the next without me. Do, I didn't do something stupid, right? But my view count was cut in half. My live viewers were cut in half. Yep. And then there was, it was about uh, eight weeks later that another cut happened. And I went from a nightly viewership of 4,500 people uh, to then like 2,400 people and then down to about 1,200 people. And I really had to like work to build that back up. And, and it was just, it. and it happened in two distinct overnight incidents. It's like, what the heck happened? And from then on, I would start getting people who would report they were being unsubscribed. Yeah, uh, while I get that watching. Yeah, and and so it's like, okay, that part of it was so frustrating um, to to have to fight against. And it's like all I want is just just like you said, just play fair. Just yeah. 
Just play like I don't need special treatment. I just want to show up like everybody else. I just want to come out here and say my thing. I I didn't get any strikes until this year. Uh, my my first strike was covering, or my warning strike was I was watching Joe Biden um, talk about uh, do it do a speech on vaccines, right? And yeah. I uh, I agreed with Joe Biden, and I got a strike. Um, for using the it, content. Or no, I, it was stuff. it was misinformation on vaccines because he he had said something about how they you know how how the virus affects children and i said yeah actually they've known for a long time that this is how the, this is specifically how the virus affects children and i agree with this change i agree with this policy change and then they they struck it and i was like what the hell <laughs> like, yeah, i'm agreeing no, <laughs> I'm, I'm i'm on the side i'm with you but um yeah well, that, so it's that's a particular but that's a particular hot button for youtube yeah, I yeah, got yeah. My, I but got I, but, I, I got my notice and my strike because of just mentioning the two words like about the the M word about rules and the the pan, and COVID. You put that I put that in a sentence together and and I'll the, be off I'll be off the air for two weeks. You got to be careful the, about the words. I mean, and, and that is chilling in and of itself. And you know, in right. my naivete when I started this whatever three years ago, I thought, well, you know, if 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 there are more viewers and there are more ads and they're making more money, then you know, businesses are businesses. Right. And, and, and the ordinary incentives there is, oh yeah, you keep pumping the things that people like that get 95, 98% likes and they're engaging with the content and that'll grow. And it's just a little bit weirder than that. It certainly is. Well, yeah. I would, well, I would the, agree with you. I'm sorry, you go, Nick. I cut you up before. No, no, you've, you, you're on his point. I'm going to go back to something. So you uh, Okay. Ahead. When you say businesses are businesses, yeah, I agree with money. you. Yeah. <laughs> But what here, here's what here's part of the calculus that I think you might be missing, particularly on this issue when it comes to the the disinformation uh, when it comes to treatments for for the current for 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 the the pandemic that we've been dealing with for the last uh, year and a half or so, and that is big pharma gives tons of money to all mainstream media to big tech et cetera. So yeah, okay, fine. They like to get an extra. They they like to you to put out your content, and you can. But the content that you're putting out there, and the whatever you're putting out there, there's no way whatever revenues can get that will be a tiny, tiny fraction of what they are literally being paid directly by big pharma. So right, and I don't think you have to limit it to any given lobbying group. I I agree with you that they have a number of other financial incentives that are in play. I. I I'm I'm admitting, and I'm agreeing with you that 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 you're right that those incentives clearly come into play, whether it's cultural, whether it's financial, but that when I started this, you know, I'm I'm a transactions guy. I'm a this is how business works. This is if we're rowing in the same direction, uh, you know, you're 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 going to be in a general okay with whatever the rules are set at. And I, and I am still obviously I'm still doing YouTube videos, but I was surprised to see how much bumpiness, and you could. Even at low levels of subscribership or viewership, you, you could see it. You could yep. see, oh, the thumb has been pressed down on this right now, uh, on on how those curves worked, and 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 you're like, huh. And that's that's continued to be of interest to me, not because it, it affects me even necessarily, but because I do find it interesting, especially in the current regulatory environment and legal environment, to look at that and say, mm, they they're playing with fire on some of this stuff. They're encouraging. Uh, you know, a lot of the stuff that's happening on a regulatory side. And I, I think it's interesting. Yeah, it's uh, it's wild. The the main reason I was bringing up the strikes, though, uh, was was just to say that when all of the stuff started with the uh, the apparent shadow banning and all of that stuff, my account was completely clean, like squeaky clean, never gotten a strike, yeah. you know, none of that. So it wasn't like uh, now I'm like, oh, well, I, I have an active community guideline strike on my channel. Maybe that's affecting things. I, and you have no idea. I don't, the crazy I, mean, I got the warning strike. I got it rescinded. I, I, I don't oh, know. You did? That's not, that still doesn't count somewhere in some database, you know? Yeah. You're, you're lucky that you got that rescinded. They would not rescind mine. That that stays on your account literally forever. Yeah. You lost and, your uh, warning essentially. Yeah. And, and like you said, I have a, I have a partner manager and I was I was talking to them about that strike and I was like, this is really unfair because I'm agreeing. I'm, I'm, I'm with the authority on this point that you're saying that I'm doing misinformation on. And I, I don't know 
how to talk about this when I can't even agree with the authority. Like, so that's, that's weird, but they, they would not remove it. Um, the most, John, Oh, go I'm ahead. Sorry. No, the most frustrating thing. It's not, and it's not how they depress the algorithms. It's, it's the cloak and dagger element and the constantly shifting rules. So, mm -hmm. I don't know if our if your audience here can fully appreciate. I go out and make a I make a live stream. Whatever rules I was governed by two days ago can be completely different as far as what words I can say, what words I cannot say, and and the punishments are so severe. I mean, there's there you literally can you know someone who's making their money off of of creating daily content on on YouTube. It's like they'll shut you down for well, you already have that black letter on you that 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 warning you got two years ago well now you're shut down for a week and careful because if you make another mistake anytime in the next three months you'll be shut down for two weeks and god yeah, and forbid the borders aren't clear the lines and clear. yeah and, yeah, you have, and they won't tell you what the rules are so you're totally guessing especially when you're talking about controversial controversial issues which someone like you know someone like us i'm every day what i'm saying is going to be something that i know is going to be controversial to someone and well, that's because you're hateful joe I'm not hateful. <laughs> I'm not hateful. I I just push back, but yeah. I so I know that I'm gonna be pushing boundaries, and I have no idea what the rules are. Not because I would love to see rules, and if you want to change the rules every day, at least give us notifications about the change. Yeah, of the let us know what they are. Well, and the thing that I don't like is that warning. As as Nick knows here, you get that you get that warning. It's so condescending. The communication they send you is like, well, oh, yeah, you might not realize that about these rules and these rules, but you're a cyber bully was mine. I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? <laughs> are, 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 you know, so I, I did. I made a video. I made a, a fairly passionate video about, no, you can't put public billboards up when someone looks for this video that tells them that Rick Hogue is a cyber bully and harasser. So let's talk about yeah. it. YouTube. I got I got one of my strikes uh, that was that was mistakenly issued. Uh, they said, and it was, it was taken, you know, I got it taken away, but, um, the, the strike email that I got was for some copyright violation. And again, this, oh yeah, I was streaming. Um, I was streaming a congressional hearing, yeah. right? So I'm, I'm streaming a congressional hearing, super fun to do those. And, uh, I suddenly get a copyright, uh, strike a pot or not a copyright strike but the the stream was taken down um for uh for copyright and they they issued a policy violation strike which was weird but the what the stream said when you clicked on it was that this was taken down for a different policy violation like it oh. was is bull it might have been cyberbullying even or and harassment which i i don't remember but i was like wait a minute the email you got says that it's a copyright thing and then you're telling the world that yeah, I violated you can't publicize that. No, yeah, right. and that's where I got. <laughs> I would love what? to have a copy of the message that I sent in the in the little box they give you because it was, I'm sure it was full, full lawyer, where I where I was where it's like you can't you can't <laughs> declaim to the world this YouTube. You've well, got to be kill, you're, you're killing me. That's what happened with, uh, and I know th this guy is very polarizing, but his uh, polarizing people bring up interesting legal scenarios. Um, oh, and Benjamin got thrown off of Patreon. And um, the, what Patreon did, allegedly, and I, I'm pretty sure this is true, they communicated to people, and this is a similar theory to what Project Veritas is going uh, going through with, I think, YouTube as well, or or someone else, but um, they communicated to uh, hundreds of his patrons that he had engaged in a community guidelines violation of some sort that was not true. Um, and so they actually brought Patreon to arbitration. Uh, and and I, I, gosh, I think they might still be in it. I'm not sure. Um, but they, they brought them to binding arbitration. And about well, I shouldn't say, I shouldn't say they did. Um, the interesting thing is they got a bunch of patrons to bring arbitrations individually against Patreon for violation, uh, basically for tortious interference. Because they said, you're interfering with this contract and Patreon has specific language that says, you don't have a contract with Patreon, you have a contract with the yeah, creator. Yeah, we're a platform, it's between the two of you. Yeah. Right. And so they said, you're, you're in tortious interference. And they brought... Uh, since California implemented the no class action arbitration rule, the, or the, the disclaimable 
class action arbitration rule, they brought a hundred arbitrations and suddenly um, Patreon got stuck with a bill from jams for, I think two, three million, $2 million just at the outset. And then they tried to like consolidate all of them into one. And jam said, no, you said you weren't going, you weren't going to be able to do that in your contract. We're holding you to it. And so I, I Patreon's bill on that, that issue of throwing Owen Benjamin off is I think somewhere north of $5 million so far. And I think I did a video on virtual legality on that because people were asking me about whether Dr. Disrespect's crew could pull that off with Twitch. So we analyzed the Twitch contract, saw the same setup as Patreon and it had the arbitration. It had the no class action. It had the we'll pay first as in, as is the rules for small claims in that, in that arbitration rules. And I said, well, they appear to be in, I think what I call the Patreon no. uncomfortability zone. Yeah. And yeah. uh, to the to the chat, not Carl Benjamin. He didn't bring the uh, the Owen Benjamin, the comedian. Owen Benjamin and Vox Day um, were working together, I believe, on a project or something like that. Carl Benjamin is Sargon of Akkad. Different Benjamins. Um, Carl had explored the idea, and I believe it was modeled on the same uh, the same concept that that Owen and Vox had established. Again, very. Very controversial people, I know, but controversial people tend to be interesting. So we got to talk about, yeah, got to talk right. about them. But um, I just found uh, that Breitbart article. That was that is some genuine love they showed you. Oh my god, that is great. Yeah, I it was so, cool. They, they literally, I mean, I didn't first. I didn't realize that po that Pesobic had put you out there to um, by name as far as uh, as You're far as what famous. YouTube had done. But did you see this article, Richard? Uh, no, I haven't. It's full throated fellatio. It's really, <laughs> it's really. It's, it's why it took me so long to wake up this morning. No, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's very tired. It, it's really, and you know what? No, it was. God it's, bless. It, it's it's very cool. It's very cool, and and the main thing is, uh, you know, Breitbart has been they've been covering topics like this forever, and and we see. We see this, right? We see certain publications once they are, if you're not inside the, the corporate media power structure, that's the one big advantage that Fox News has is they've, they're, they're still sort of inside and they still have one of the major news wires, right? Fox is one of the major news wires along with Reuters and Associated Press. And so they, mainstream media kind of needs that Fox News wire, even if they don't like the Fox News commentary that comes with it. Um, but when you're outside, when you're a Breitbart, when you're a Project Veritas, when you're uh, a PJ Media or something like that, you you know exactly how quickly they can go after you and what kind of damage they can do to a business you've been building. So it's great to see that. And I think uh, I think that's one place we we as creators and I'm not even going to get into the political divide on this because I don't think it's a left right issue. That's where we need to be kind of united in the in the let's support more speech, not less. No, I couldn't um, agree with you thing. more on that. I, I And that's, I think that's where get, people get tripped up uh, is, uh, yeah, absolutely. Both sides get, get more voices, get more perspectives. Not all of them are going to be right, but you have that discussion. You're going to be able to triangulate and figure out and synthesize better than if everybody's just chirping the same thing in your ear. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, let me read a couple more of these chats. John Meyer says, when I was watching on my phone yesterday and I would pause the stream to do something and then open back up the app and hit play, it would be somehow now streaming from a mainstream news site. Uh, saw that, saw a couple people with that issue. I don't, I don't really? know how it would happen, but uh, yeah, some people were getting, um, someone reported getting switched over to, uh, I think it was to PBS. Um, they Could it have they been were when watching we were here. Down? I don't know because when you click when you were on, if you clicked on the stream, it would actually just bring up the splash page of this. Uh, this has been blocked for yeah, a copyright. That's what issue. I saw. So okay. I I don't know that it would autoplay, but who knows? I I used to have this issue with YouTube and they fixed it. Thank God. But something would happen like an hour and a half into my streams, and it would it would like glitch play an ad and then autoplay to the next thing. It happened oh. for like a week or two and it would just like, people would get just launched off of the thing. I would go from, I would go from like 1500 viewers to literally 200. Oh, that little graph uh, would just be a downline. Yeah. And it was like, and on my end it was smooth, but uh, something would happen. 
Ryan Long says, I don't think it's that Ryan Long. Uh, by the way, big shout out to Ryan Long Comedy. That guy's hilarious. Awesome. Uh, can, he says, can you go great. over the law? It seems like 3C negates the entire law. I'm not a lawyer, but a crime scientist. But the idea of sections is weird. So three references something, but I can't reference itself since there are no nouns or objects in it. Okay, so he's that talking about the possession. Yes. Um, should, uh, do we want to pull it up and talk yes, through I think it? That would be useful. Okay. To show people uh, what the heck we're talking about. Yeah. Let me let me pull up the statute. I, I, I can certainly preface it by saying that three C. Everybody having a problem with it makes total sense to me because it's written bizarrely. Yes, it's it's terrible. It is a terribly written law. <laughs> and ordinarily, in a good in a good written statute. You'd also probably have something like a subject to the exception put forth so that you don't just read the early sentence that says this is prohibited because, frankly, a lot of people don't have the attention span to go and figure out that statute, especially legislatures. So um, it just wasn't written very well. It was not. I'm trying to find a oh, minor in possession of danger. I had all these tabs up yesterday, Nick. I've looked at this thing so many times. Here we go. Uh, possession of a dangerous weapon by persons under 18, 948.60. And I will bring it up uh, on screen here. And yeah, we can, we can go through it real quick. I've done a whole video on this, but uh, we'll just go through it now. Um, I'm right also back. gonna, you keep doing. Uh, keep I gotta going. send, I, I am just a second. <laughs> I gotta send an invite to, uh, to a good, to a good friend, Mr. Eric Hunley. Uh, he is not a lawyer, but he's a wise and sharp individual. And I would love to have his input on some of this stuff. Uh, I, I was uh, just tuning in when I heard your, your nice uh, talk about lawyers are just people that, that bring yeah. their own, that bring their own uh, views. I, I like to say on my channel, if you get, if you get three lawyers talking about this issue that I'm talking to you about right now, you'll, you'll get three at least marginally different answers. So that's, you know, ha have other sources. It's one of the things that bothers me most about um, the law. T law Twitter is an unfair term because there's a bunch of people who are who are yeah, affiliated with Twitter. right, and and they they have. I have a particular group uh, subset of law Twitter people that really really hate me, and that's yeah. that's fine. I I agree with them on hating me. It's good, but um, uh, I got a few DMs for being on your stream, Nick. <laughs> but that's the. Uh, the thing about it is there's there's a subset of law Twitter that pretends that lawyer and I don't understand this, that lawyers have uniform thought and that a, a consensus of lawyers is somehow like authoritative in some way. And it's like, wait, but a ton of law has been um, has been changed over the years because one small group of lawyers or even one lawyer said, no, I read it this way. And then argued about it and convinced, uh, you know, all the way up to the Supreme Court to actually say things are different. And so yeah. uh, lawyers should be used to disagreement. And I think projecting the image that that there's a consensus on something and that that is a valid uh, that is a valid claim is is dangerous um, in our profession. Yeah, there's a need for some, I think, to really feel authoritative. And I, to me, it's it's just my personality type, though. I think I always feel very cautious about people looking to me and thinking that I have some kind of voice of God on X, Y, or Z. So I always try to bring those sources in. I always try to talk about what the words say. And then I try to mention, hey, you could interpret it this way. I mean, I think even with the problems that folks are having with 3C, I, I don't think the state is crazy to say, well, that blows up the whole sentence. It's like, yeah, that's... That's right. Um, and then yeah. there's, there's different legal philosophies about, okay, should we save that from, from the legislature's idiocy or should we not? Um, and I, I agree with what the judge did here. I agree with what the, the ultimate ruling was. But you do look at this and say, they couldn't have meant that, could they? Yeah, you, uh, the way I, I think they meant what the judge came to the conclusion of. I think they've worded it very poorly. Okay. Um, because and and my basis of this is the this law was changed most recently. I think in like 1992, this section um, was was changed and added. And my understanding of this is that they were attempting to control handgun issues in um, in the major cities. 
basically and they want to be very careful to not affect hunting. I mean, I think, I think that's yeah. clear. Yeah. Uh, so let's, let's take a look at it. So we've got in this section, dangerous weapon means any firearm loaded or unloaded. So I think we can skip the rest of, of paragraph one, because if we're contextualizing in this case, yeah. yep. Firearms, a dangerous weapon. So then we go to section two, any person under 18 years of age who possesses or goes armed with a dangerous weapon is guilty of a class, a misdemeanor. And very, that's people stop. Right. It's, and it's a very straightforward statute. It's, it's basically strict liability. If you are in possession of this or goes armed. So either one, if you're, if you have it, uh, possession doesn't necessarily mean you're holding it. It means you have ready, ready primary access to it is the best way to describe it. If you're in your house and there's drugs on the kitchen table, you're in possession of the drugs. Uh, long story short, uh, under the eyes of the law. Now, if the drugs are in your roommate's locked safe, you're probably not in possession of those drugs, even if you're in the same uh, house. So that that's why they have possession or going armed. So if you're out carrying it around, they want to have that clear clear language in there. So then, ex then the next section is just uh, different classes of felony. We don't B, C, and D. So we don't really need to to go into that. Um, Kyle's not under 17 for D. So we can move straight on to 3A. So the section does not apply to a person under 18 years of age who possesses or is armed with a dangerous weapon when the dangerous weapon is being used in target practice under the supervision of an adult or in a course of instruction in the traditional and proper use of the dangerous weapon under the supervision of an adult. This is why... The range. Right. And this is why Dominic Black and, uh, and um, Kyle were able to go out and shoot on the range. Dominic Black is 18. We can infer at least because he was the one who purchased the gun. So they could go out to the range and he is an adult and can technically supervise his best friend, uh, even though he's, he's just several months younger than him. Um, the section does not apply to an adult who transfers a dangerous weapon to a person under 18 for use uh, only in target practice. So the same thing the, here, you can use this gun so we can target you. So next, 3B, the section does not apply to a person under 18 years of age who is a member of the Armed Forces or National Guard and who, is possess, uh, who possesses or is armed with a dangerous weapon in the line of duty. Uh, same thing uh, with an adult transferring it to right. someone so in the, the Armed Forces. Uh, right. In, so long as you're in the line of duty. Um, so military exemption, because some people can join at 17. Neither of which apply to Kyle in Kenosha right. on the night in question. Correct. So we can go ahead and ignore that section for this one. And then we get to the, the, the critical one, 3C. This section applies only to a person under 18 years of age who possesses or is armed with a rifle or a shotgun if the person is in violation of section 941.28. That's the short or, barrel. Right. Or, and this is the big, uh, Corey Sharafisi made a big deal over that or, is not in compliance with sections 29304 and 29593. It's funny. I think the big deal left lives in that and. Uh, right. Yes. Yeah. It, it, and, and for some people, uh, it does. So what, uh, so 241 uh, or 941.28 is a section about short barrels. 29304 is an, as a under six, a 16 and un, no, under 16 is an under 16 hunting statute. Yeah, these are both hunting regulations. Right. Uh, so 29304 basically says if you're under 16, here's a list of things that you have to do. And then 29593 is a general list for all minors um, uh, related to hunting. And that's where the big confusion comes in with that and. So Corey Sherfisi says that the or is a full stop after 9441.28. So if you're under 18... Short barrel rifle, short barrel shotgun is, is a hard stop. The next section, he then argues, only applies if you're under 16 because it requires compliance with both of those statutes, right. which would then say that even though the second statute is not age specific, that it relegates that second statute subject to the first statute, which is age specific. And Kyle so, can't be out of compliance with a statute that doesn't apply to him by age. Right. So the uh, the argument or the, the basic conclusion is that this law does not apply to a 16 or 17 year old who is not hunting or no, actually does not apply to a 16 or 17 year old full stop. 
So right, long as they're you'll rifle, never, you'll never collect the other the other statute. Right. So long as they are not in violation by having a short barrel rifle or a short barreled shotgun. Which philosophically, and I, I agree with, I agree with that interpretation, but philosophically you can understand how the state or anyone else looks at this and says, nobody on earth would write this that way if they intended for this to not apply to 16 and 17 year olds. They and were just right. They were just right. This doesn't true. apply to 16 or 17 year olds, <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, th there's a certain amount of programming language in legislation. I mean, that's how I talk about it on my channel, which is that yeah, you can get certain savings clauses from courts, especially if they want to be more active or not. But for the most part, you write this, you pass it, and then you figure out what it does, what, what the command line actually winds up doing. And, and you read through all this and I say, yeah, you, you have to be out of compliance with both of those statutes. The first one doesn't apply to you at all. You can't be out of compliance with it. And so you're good. Yeah, and the, the so the the idea of why you write a statute in this way, if if we're being deferential in saying that the yeah. legislature planned it <laughs> this way, the the main reason is to talk about what what I was discussing earlier. If you've got, uh, in particular, if you're trying to address in the early '90s gang violence in metro areas of Wisconsin, you know, Eau Claire, Green Bay, uh, what's the other one, Milwaukee. If you're trying to address that type of violence and you see you don't see a lot of long barrel rifles in the 90s, um, probably in part because I believe at that time we were we were either flirting with or we had the uh, the assault weapons ban of the Clinton era. Right. And so um, you you actually have less access to those types of weapons in the early 90s than you do today. And, and so maybe they didn't think it was as big of a deal uh to to address those but you do have a handgun problem in the 90s um go uh going up i think 1996 was one of the peak crime years in u.s history and especially for gun violence so we're leading up to that um so that if they're trying to address handguns and then if you look at the other dangerous weapons you're talking about uh brass knuckles you're talking about nunchucks <laughs> you've got uh assessed yeah, you've got a cestus, which would be some sort of knuckle blade um, or similar material weighted with metal or, or other substance born on the hand. Shuriken. Shuriken. <laughs> so you've got throwing stars. <laughs> this, this is what uh, your legislatures are writing, by the way. Just so, just so we're clear, this is not a unique set of things to randomly find. This is my favorite word in a Wisconsin statute. A Manrique Gasari. Which is, uh, I think, in English, a meteor hammer, basically. You've got a chain uh, with a weight on the end of it, and, and you're Jackie Chan. You're like, whoo, 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 whoo. <laughs> you know, spinning this thing around like a See, monster. I want the background. I want the behind the scenes of how this particular list was arrived at. And whether yeah, they were so fighting over this, whether they watched ninja movies. I, I don't know what was happening. You can imagine the legislative aide who's helping write the dangerous weapons statute cracking his knuckles and saying, yes, sir, I am somewhat of a weapons expert. <laughs> I want you to watch the Warriors and just name everything they use, please. <laughs> but, uh, oh my goodness. But I, I'm surprised that a dangerous weapon is not, they, they, what they don't have in here is actually kind of shocking, right? They don't have like a, a knife with a blade length over seven inches, for example. Um, they don't have- They don't really have any knife references, do they? No. No, uh, they don't have a switchblade, which may the switchblade may be illegal in some other section of the statute. That's right. Um, but but I'm I'm actually surprised that a knife with a with a blade length or or a double sided knife is not listed in this statute specifically, because um, that could, in a lot of states, those would be classified as dangerous weapons. And I think in Minnesota, there's a certain knife length that you need a permit to carry above that knife length, uh, you know, uh, in public. So. Um, but yeah, the, the, so if you're trying to, to deal with violence, that is more likely a result of, of a gang type scenario, you can write a statute in this way that deals with mainly handguns and, and some sort of melee weapons that are out there, concealable melee weapons like brass knuckles, um, awesome melee weapons like nunchucks and, uh, and really address that problem without infringing on hunting um, without infringing on a kid on his own property 
you know, uh, with a gun, you know, cause possession, mere possession is enough. So a kid's got, you know, his uh, rifle on a rack, you know, in his room, kid's got a, a rifle in the uh, rifle or a shotgun sitting in the gun rack of his truck. Very common in the Midwest. In fact, uh, it, it's taken them a long time to get around people bringing rifles to school because they would go hunting after school. Um, now, now you basically right. have to keep those in your trunk and, and not tell anybody, but, uh, you know, not, not all that long ago, a rifle in Texas, still, uh, a rifle in the, on the, you know, back window of your truck would be a common thing. Well, and I think that might be something that's lost culturally, depending on where you live or not. You know, I've been in Michigan, uh, for roughly my whole life and throughout my youth, you would absolutely have hunting season day starts as almost a holiday. A lot of the kids would go out with their with their dad or their parents. And, and they, they're, that's exactly what the parking lot would look like. Um, and so, you know, you do have different approaches. I am, I gotta be honest with you. I, I think I always ever read this statute and just stopped at firearm. Cause I was done. That is an amusing set of weapons listed in that first paragraph. I would have never read three C except for this specific, you know, like when I was diving into this issue going, okay. Did, Cause I wanted to know, right. Did this kid illegally bring a gun? Did he, yeah. did he, did he, grab a firearm that he shouldn't have so i i did a deep dive into the statute right away and i was like no i don't think so that's amazing <laughs> and and uh i'll be i'll be deferential to the state here i can almost guarantee that um if if kyle and dominic black had sat down and had a conversation about whether or not like if they had been thinking rather than responding to riots and fires they would said can you can you bring a gun around they would have said, no way this is legal, right? They would have said, because they, and, and this is a point the state was trying to make. You knew you couldn't buy it. And then they tried to get him to say, you knew you couldn't possess it. And he smartly did not ever, uh, say, he, he said, no, I did not know that. Um, and that was a, that was a very good answer. But I, I think if, if everybody's honest and there's nothing on the line, you go, right. if you're not in a riot and you're sitting down, you say, Kyle, you're 17. Can you walk around the streets of Kenosha with an AR-15 strapped to you? He'd say, as long as no one knows I'm 17, I think that would be the, the rational answer there. Um, but it turns out, it, it, and, and that's the problem with this law, and that's what the judge was getting to as well. It's like, if it's taking us all this time to figure this out, we've had months and months and months, and we still can't figure it out, uh, how is an ordinary citizen supposed to comply with this law? Yeah, that's where he wound up, right? Is that you need to have clarity in the law. Yeah. So uh, there you go, Ryan Long. I it, it does not blow up the whole statute, though. That is one thing that was, uh, I don't want to say it was dishonest, but it was an overreach by Krauss when he says it, it, it blows, the, the whole, blows up the whole law. It's like, no, if he's 15, he's liable. Gu guaranteed, he's liable. Um, if he's 14, tw uh, you know, 11, 12, 13, any, anything under 16, it, right. just no, seems, it just creates the window. Yeah. It just seems like the Wisconsin legislature had an idea, whether conscious or subconscious to preserve the, uh, you know, this, this rifle ownership and use for, uh, kids who are, who are 16 and 17 years old. Welcome. Well, legal bites. Fascinating. Hey, I hope, I hope my sound is all okay. This is like new stuff that Mr. Bites bought me. So, oh, is that a, is that, is that an S uh, sure SM seven B microphone? It's a sure something. I don't it, know. What... It looks like an SM seven B, except it's got this little green thing on it that I don't understand. So you nice. Got lights. You're fancy. These are kind, some kind of boppity boopity lights. I'm not really I sure. I literally have a <laughs> USB mic like resting out. on law books. So you, uh, <laughs> you sound, you sound great though. And, okay. uh, it, it probably won't pick up as much background noise. That's the, that's, that's, that's the, that, yeah, that's good. the hope. No, I think I have to bounce in like 15. So it's perfect. Um, I get it. So, you don't want to, you don't want to be on with me. That's hey, fine. I stayed, I'm going to stay for 15 <laughs> minutes. When I popped on, Nick will vouch for me. I, two other people left immediately. Yeah. Curtin, Curtin, Runkle just are like, oh, Hogla. Huh. Yep. <laughs> I got, uh, I got Video laundry games. to do. <laughs> <laughs> that's how it happened. Well, welcome to the stream, Legal Bites. We were just discussing the uh, the minor in possession charge in response to a super chat and go just going through the whole statute and breaking it down, which I think is it's it, it can sometimes be very boring. In this case, I don't think it is, but you know, really getting into statutory construction interpretation can can be can be boring 
right? And but I wish uh, there there needs to be. I like opportunities to do it because yeah. it it's what we have to do, especially when you're a criminal defense attorney and you have to say the state is bound by the words that are on the page. How can I make those words fit my fact pattern as uh, as the best way for my client? And then you go after it. Well, and it's um, the corollary, right? I mean, I, I talk about end user license agreements all the time, yes. right? Figuring out what the hell those things say is important because no matter how many people on Twitter tell you, no, nah, those will never be enforceable. A lot of the time they're going to be enforceable. I, I, so I, I try to break this to people gently, but it's important to be able to at least read those if somebody tells you there's something crazy in there. Or, you know, watch my channel. It's all good either way. But and everybody should. Oh, I got to add you guys to the description. I got to do that. I got to do that. Um, let's see. We got Uncivil, who was first. And we've um, got Yeah, I should Joe. probably let people know that I'm in here. I mean, if you want to. I mean, yeah, uh, probably, right? It's yeah. a super secret thing. Just <laughs> popping in. Wait, we got... Uh, oh. Um, on that... On that topic, uh, what do you think about I? Because I see this a lot because venues or license agreements are terms of service, as we're seeing with um, with websites. And I sure. think I think we're we're getting some conflation because uh, because of the broad aspects of Section Two Thirty, we're not actually seeing a lot of testing of terms of service. But in the hypothetical that you get around the Two Thirty issue, either legislatively, judicially, or, um, or 230 simply doesn't apply to the issue you're dealing with. Yeah. What do you, what do you think about this idea that people have that, um, lawsuits can, uh, include or exclude whomever they want for any reason? Lawsuits go in which direction? They're not lawsuits. Sorry. Websites. Websites. Oh, right. Right. Well, I mean, so we're in an interesting era, right? Because, you know, your, your, your private property folks are going to tell you the right thing in terms of the way the law works, which is let's pretend that YouTube or Facebook or Twitter or Twitch or whoever isn't enormous and one of the only places <laughs> you can go for these things. Just a mom and pop just a mom, shop on the internet. Just a mom and pop video provider. You ordinarily would look at that and say, yeah, you can host the, the sign that says no shirt, no shoes, no service. I don't, I don't have to have you on my platform. I don't have to put forth your video content, your user generated tweets, whatever it might be. And I think we're getting into a situation, which is why you see this regulatory issue. You see the judicial issue and everything else that says ah, these things are getting really big. Like, like when we talk about YouTube taking us down for five minutes and 30,000 viewers go like that, that's, that's real. Um, yeah. And you know, whether or not YouTube should be capable of doing that. If we get outside of two thirty, their terms of service are very clear here. I mean, YouTube has a provision in its terms of service that effectively says, if we ever decide that you're harming us in some way, then we don't have to host whatever it is you're doing. Um, which from a business perspective, and again, I'm a, I'm a commercial contracts guy, right? When people want to get mad at me, they call me a dirty you know, corporate lawyer uh, on these kinds of things. <laughs> and I look at it and say, in general, a lot of my book of business is smaller businesses. I want them to be able to control their, their platform, their app, whatever it is that they built, whatever storefront they have. Um, and so I, I think when you talk about these issues now, you're getting into a situation where if you want to have it regulated, you want to have it legally covered, it's a, you're going to have to slice that onion more thinly than I really think either side is discussing. You can't just kill 230. You can't just say YouTube and Facebook and Twitter and Twitch can do anything they want. I think you're looking at a new kind of legal zeitgeist that's going to have to be arrived at with you know, what I would hope would be some kind of actual discussion at a legislative and regulatory level. The polarization of the country is, is harmful, not just because of media and Twitter and how you feel every day, but because you aren't necessarily getting those conversations that are necessary right. to cover new things. Um, and that's where I think that there's a, there's a big problem because I think both sides are basically right to say, hey, it's a private company, absolutely. And wow, that really harms discourse or the zeitgeist or people yeah, both both are well, correct. Something probably should be done. But I'll I'll take it a, a step in a slightly different direction. Sure. I agree with everything you said, but as someone who represents uh, businesses, you know that while it would be nice that your business could exclude anyone for any reason, that's not actually true, though. 
I mean, we can write it into terms of service or whatever, but if you've got a public accommodation, for example, well, you're suddenly bound by, uh, you're bound by what title title seven, right? right uh, under right. federal so, law. So, so then you get into different conversations, right? So you're really hardcore libertarian commenters would say all that, that all that's ridiculous. But let's assume that a law on the books for a half century is, is pretty legitimate. One of the reforms that I it's think it's a reality, definitely... even if people don't like it. Well, that's lawyers, right? I got I got yeah. clients sitting across my desk saying, "Well, why is that?" It's like, no, no, that's the wrong question. Let's let's try to deal with it because we're you know we're not in, we're not in the halls of Congress here. But if it is reality, public accommodations, and especially the precedent there, <coughs> excuse me, sorry about that. No worries. Are not read to really uh, deal with the digital realm. Um, and certainly it wasn't contemplated when that law was written. So it is one of those reforms that you could absolutely have to make it more clear what is expected about exclusion and not. But I will tell folks that, that when they're having these conversations about the political side of things, that's never been something really that folks haven't been allowed to exclude on. We're mostly talking about immutable characteristics. That was what those acts were designed for. And you've always been able to tell folks, are you a Democrat? You can't eat at my diner. Right. Give or take. Yeah. And, uh, but I, I think it's, it, it's interesting in the conversation because yep. it, it gets to this idea uh, when, when people talk about saying, well, we actually in some spaces may want to protect political discourse in the public. If we say, for example, uh, that Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, whatever, is the public square, as a lot of people seem to think that they are, then maybe there's a point where we we include some qualification. We say, okay, if if this is it, if you're if you're a public accommodation that works in this way, well, maybe we call it an internet public accommodation and create a category, then we we absolutely have some sound basis for controlling a business. And and it it gets weird. When uh, people say, well, and, and like you're saying, the, the, uh, the, I don't know if you said libertarian or the real or, hardcore libertarian, I get, right. I get commenters of all stripes, which I love. I think that's yeah, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. But you've definitely got people that said, oh, well, the civil rights act is unconstitutional. It's like, okay, well, we'll, we'll, yeah, and we'll bring that up on a later video, I suppose. <laughs> and it, it, you know what, if, if you have that perspective, like I'm all for the idea that we could open everything up completely and go full libertarian mode on stuff, but we don't live in that reality right now. So if we're go if we're going to talk about um, this this competing principle, do we want to protect public discourse in in a, a free speech society, even though we're not talking about First Amendment constitutional protections? Right. Then That's we important. could say we could say, hey, uh, political viewpoints are protectable. And if you fall into this subcategory of businesses, we can do this. And, and we have actual precedent for this. In fact, California is a pioneering example of this, right? Because Cal California actually has uh, a political viewpoint protection built into their, uh, their Civil Rights Act. Now, it's only been applied in a specific way. It's only been applied to people who are, uh, it, was, it was pro gay rights politics in you know basically between 1960 and 1998 or something okay. like that is where the real uh, application of the law is but that's not the language of the law that's just how courts did it and and the reason was because when people were advocating for gay rights in california they were being shut out of basically everything so they said no 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 we want people to be able to speak on this topic and and they wrote the language more broadly than that but that's what their goal was and that's how the courts the courts basically looked at legislative history and then narrowed the application because of free, you know, First Amendment issues in general. But we we have like this this idea that especially all these businesses located in California um, would be somehow immune from this this political viewpoint protection. When if you were if Twitter started banning everybody who advocated gay rights. Right. Like they would actually lose that lawsuit and they would lose it quickly. Like no matter how much 230 protection they wanted to have, uh, they would they would have real issues banning. If if you could show through like an employment law sort of perspective that this is only affecting people advocating in this way in violation of California law, they'd have real issues. Well, I guess we get into supremacy issues, but. They, yeah, I mean, they'd have, have a, a potential conversation. <laughs> definitely. I mean, well, it, and, that's, and that's why I've, I've, I've talked about section 230 quite a bit also. And I think that where I've kind of landed on it is 
that if there is going to be some sort of a modification of it, which there probably does need to be, I think, I think everyone on both sides kind of agrees that it's not, it's not, not good the way it's settled right now. Right. Like it's, it's, everybody sees problems. It just depends on which side of the political spectrum you're on to, 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 to see what exactly those problems are. But I think that at least from the right of center position, um, (coughs) I, I, a, a way to, to, um, to change things in a way that would be beneficial would probably be to maybe focus on some due process controls. Um, that's something that, that isn't written into section 230. Um, and that's, and I understand why, because at the time that they passed it, like the internet was nothing like they were trying to, they were trying to like, trying to boost the internet. They were trying to like, you know, let it, let it take off. And now it's like, it's huge angel fire right like that's what they're doing they're regulating angel fire and geo cities at the time this law is passed it's amazing to think about well yeah. we as we as attorneys we tend to try and analogize to other things and one of the things i've heard from the left a lot is the whole comparison of well you guys are all into capitalism and they're private business and they can do whatever they want and they try and use the pers- the conservative perspectives as, as a basis to justify the censorship of big tech i and i when i came back from my my little breakfast break there so i heard you talking about the right to to keep someone out of a a restaurant or whatever and i do think that nick's point about this being this is not the same thing as being served in a restaurant it's not even the same thing as the right to go on a bus because those rights are not fundamental rights our there is no there is no right more fundamental than the First Amendment right to free speech. And in that realm of free speech, the one area that is supposed to be protected the most is frank conversations about engaged in political discourse. But I would say, but I mean, like the First Amendment is is also held by YouTube, right? I mean, that's the the discussion that you have to have, right? So YouTube goes out there and says, uh, we find this position abhorrent. And you have to talk about what that regulation or law looks like that says YouTube has to carry it because it's not so off the rails that that they should they should be allowed to get rid of it, and, and and that's why I think you get this this tension, because again it's easy to say these things about YouTube and Facebook and Twitter or whatever, but when I'm working with a client that's putting together their own forum on their website and it's a mom and pop and it's ten employees, I need to think about okay, if they do have an issue, what are they allowed to do? What are they not allowed to do? And, and right now I agree with everybody that's spoken, the jurisprudence and the regulations and the laws aren't right. But I'm a little bit more reluctant to start hitting big levers on these kinds of things that force people to to, to have to allow content on their service. Well, I, I think I have a very strong counter argument to your whole point. And, and to Ooh, those people out there. Fight. Yeah. <laughs> we're gonna, we're gonna go. right, I'm going to give you the it. five minute warning. I do have to bounce in five. So. Okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you short. spit. It'll land on him. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll keep it. I'll keep. I'll keep it. Quit my argument quick. You just made a claim here, essentially saying that YouTube has a right, just like we're talking about a, a right to free speech. So, to YouTube has a right when it comes to free speech. So, and that free speech could be the right to n- censor whatever is being said on that platform because you're sort of speaking for them. You're using their platform right. for free Compelled. speech. Yeah. Right. But here, here, here's here's the thing, though. The whole point behind 230 is that we are not treating YouTube as a publisher, but as a distributor, right? So what you were, we are essentially saying in that argument is it's not YouTube speaking because the difference between a publisher and a distributor is that a publisher is the one who's speaking. And a distributor is more of a – it's more of like a train station for speech to pass through just like a telephone line. Is, but you're is talking a about a legal station. distinction, right? So it's so, not their so – what I'm saying is it's I not their I don't disagree. Speech. I don't disagree that it's actually not their speech. And I, I don't disagree that 230 says it's not their speech. But the actual on the ground real politic of it is you get articles about Gab or Rumble or Odyssey and what they allow on their platforms and how the media treats them. And you can see that there's an interest in YouTube or whomever to say, it, whether it's right or not, whether you completely disagree with their position or not, we are going to be castigated for what appears on our service. We don't want it to be on that service. And under the First Amendment principles, they generally have the right to do that. Regardless of what 230 says, 230 is a legal liability shield. They Mm -hmm. still have the authority to say, we don't want that on our service. And 230 can't prevent them from losing goodwill, losing value, losing reputation, because our laws don't control the way society works. 
Okay, but but the that the perspective that YouTube, if you're sitting there advocating for YouTube's position, which essentially I know that you're unwill, you're unwillingly like said, doing that. I know you don't agree with lawyer. it, but you. I, but you're, you're playing devil's advocate on their behalf, and that's and that's what a good lawyer should do. No, he do. is the devil, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't so, you see the red behind him? <laughs> what, I, what I'm saying is YouTube's position is inherently playing both sides of the fence. Yes. On the one hand, they're saying they're a distributor, and now they should be exonerated from any liability in case anyone defames anyone on their platform. On the other hand, they're saying we're a publisher. You can't compel us to speak. And, and, that, and that playing both sides of the fence – doesn't doesn't cut mustard it, it doesn't make any sense and that's why I, that's why i think there's there's an inherent incongruity with the position the, I think of, that youtube is written taking. wrongly I, I think 230 having a provision that allows them to you know what, what is the language that says you can moderate with no problem with it if, it, if you otherwise find it offensive which yeah, captures everything in human experience yeah that's... so so i i agree with you i i don't think they're they work together well i i, I don't I, I think going the First Amendment direction is the wrong way for everybody that's not big tech. And, and I want to be careful about the shotgun approach for those kinds of things, because and, and and I think, you know, the first half hour I spent with Nick here was me grousing about YouTube. I, 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 you know, I have a complicated relationship with them, but <laughs> we are we are the domestic abused. Yes. Well, yeah, yes. we have battered wife syndrome. We keep coming back here. Yeah, so I know you won't I, do it again. I know you love please. me. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, so I I understand where you're coming from, and I agree that it's not working right. And in fact, the recitals to two thirty are hilarious. If anybody hasn't read them, they talk about how this law is going to help political discourse and yes. keep freewheeling ideas in America and all this stuff. And it's like, oh, that's that's not really the direction it went. Um, so but don't those event, recitals, I will ask you this, don't those recitals now give just cause to, to question 230 for the court to actually say that the way it's been applied is not they consistent? They give nothing to the court. The recitals I mean, are non-operative. It's, uh, it's, but it's like, it reflects uh, the intent of 230, though. They, the recitals reflect the intent of 230. So yeah, but the, the words are to clear understand how like 230 should be applied. If there were an ambiguity applied, kicked in, if, if, there were, if you could get them to ambiguity, you could start looking at congressional history, right. look at those recitals. Yeah. But it's pretty clear. Otherwise, the text on the page, yeah. Yeah, but the text on the page says that the the, the basis is if it's other, or otherwise objection. What was or otherwise? What those two otherwise words? objectionable. Objectionable. Yeah. Yeah. So it, as far it's, as a, it's a catch-all, and they're you know, but people have used successfully catch-all phrases in legislation to their advantage forever, right? Um, that, or anything else, you can modify yeah. for these specific reasons or anything you want. I mean, I, yeah. So I, and and I can understand why they. Why they probably put that language in there in the first place because they were like, I mean, we can't anticipate every kind of we you know, can't anticipate transgression that's going to happen. Yeah, we we right. can't anticipate the reality of deep fakes. Right now, you could take uh, an underage face of Emma Watson, right, or, or Dakota Fanning or something, and you could plaster it on uh, uh, a pornographic video. Like you can do terrifying. that with, with face swap, and so so the idea that you could take that, and, and in 1996, when they're passing this bill and they're making these recitations, they don't have any concept of this happening. In fact, I, I would argue they had no concept of Facebook. They had right. no concept of MySpace. None of these things existed in 96. The closest we got were forums uh, that and, – and, and I mean I think that internet forums you know, that require membership and all of this stuff might be a little bit of a, of a different category. But, but yeah, I mean – if the legislature wants to address those issues, they have to do it. I don't think yeah. we're going to get through the to other, the courts. Well, the, the one thing that I can, can I see the courts can I, doing, can I just though. pop in just one second? I got to bounce. Yes, sure. So I I might come back. This was enjoyable, uh, but I got I to gotta do some billing. So I will <laughs> talk to you all later. <laughs> later, buddy. Bill. <laughs> see ya. No, I was going to say that. So the, the one thing that I can see the courts doing, though, is is maybe honing in on the um, <laughs> on the good faith moderation <laughs> aspect. Um, sorry, the chat so says show us the deep fake so we can avoid it. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> uh, you have the no. best audience ever. <laughs> um, no, so uh, but but the what I'm saying is that the the courts I think maybe could there's there's some potential room for the courts in the the good faith moderation aspect and I don't know I mean I've I've looked at case law in in section 230 to like really understand it but I haven't looked at the actual arguments you know on that level of detail of like whether or not that those arguments were were put put before the courts 
um, in various cases uh, up to now. But it seems like like an argument could be made that, you know, yesterday's uh, live stream take, being taken down was probably not good faith moderation. Right. So I, I think, you know, putting putting some some sort of, of emphasis on on these social media platforms, having to make some kind of a showing that what their moderation was, was done in good faith in order for them to get that liability in the first place. Like that, that is all written into the statute. It's just a matter of judicial interpretation, I think. I don't know what you guys think. Yeah, I no, I, I think there's, you know, Thomas, Thomas has commented extensively on this section in in a beautiful dissenting opinion um, that I, I, I covered in a video. If you all care about those things, you can go read how much I love Clarence Thomas's dissent in that case. Um, but he, he's commented on this and it was basically we have a regulatory structure that we have imposed on several injury uh, industries. And, and again, this is what gets me annoyed about having this where like, I'm a libertarian. I, I believe me, like, uh, and again, I would prefer zero regulation to what we have, uh, my, my libertarian roots, but we don't have zero regulation. We don't live in that environment. And so I confront us with, with the reality of the environment that we're in. And so you have hardcore libertarians agreeing with currently radical, and I'm going to categorize it this way, it, it may be unfair, but radical left-wing political thinkers. Can you mute your phone while we're in court? I mean, oh my um, God. I didn't know. Mr. Nearman? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <laughs> you, you have this, this weird convergence of two different uh, groups arguing for the same thing for wildly different purposes. But, but Clarence Thomas points out, we have common carrier laws. A phone company cannot refuse you service based on your political beliefs or or what you say on their platform, right? You get on Verizon and you send a text message that says, I love Hitler and I love David Duke and I want to have a threesome with both of them. Like you, you say Somebody's that- Somebody's going to clip that out of context. <laughs> <laughs> and Ver Verizon cannot say, oh my God, God, I don't want this text communicated because you, right? They can't say that and uh, and kick you off of Verizon services. They can't do it. They're a common yeah. carrier and they can't do it. A telegram company who is asked to deliver a message from one person to another based on the contents of the message cannot, unless they've been given prior notice, refuse to deliver the message. They just can't do that. And so... Since that exists, we have this structure that could be applied to mainstream media. Now, Thomas did also go on to say very specifically that he's not so sure the courts can apply that, right? The yeah. courts are going to have to go ahead and probably defer to the legislature. But he's saying there is a structure that does exist and applies to everything that we do. And to pretend otherwise is nonsensical because we've given we've given Verizon the airwaves, right? They lease out a section of uh, of frequency um, of radio transmission frequency from the government, which somehow claimed ownership of radio frequency for some reason. We can't actually express how they did that. They just did. We we have laid we have laid lines down for uh, telephone companies, the, the Rural Telephone Act, right, of the 60s, which basically said, we're going to put a telephone line to every house so there's no longer party line. We're going to do this thing. It took a while, but we did it. And now anywhere you go, you're going to get a telephone line to your house, and you're not going to necessarily have to uh, pay the full brunt of that. And, um, and that's because the government said that. And as an exchange, look, we're delivering at the time, we're delivering Bell Telephone to every American citizen. And if we're going to deliver Bell Telephone to every American citizen, then they're damn well going to provide service to every American citizen. And then now we go and we just extrapolate that out. Eminent domain is used to send internet. We have broadband internet initiatives and we have companies on the internet that benefit greatly from those services. And the, the biggest benefactors of it are Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, Google, uh, Amazon, and Netflix. 
they're they're benefactors in a way that no one else can even come close to like what the, the traffic Netflix does. And we're we're gonna say that we use the law to get your service available to every American, not necessarily given to every American, but available to purchase. Netflix has a distribution rate of literally a hundred percent if people want to buy it. Walmart doesn't get that. No one else on earth gets that. You don't have to leave your house. All you have to do is have internet and they made sure that there's a, there's a line to your house and they're trying to make sure that there's a broadband line to every house in America right now through the government. And we're going to say, wait, that is not worth a minor amount of regulation. That is not worth a minor amount of saying, you know what? Just because you don't agree with the political speech doesn't mean you can't transport it. You can't transfer it from one party to another. That's silly because we do it with everybody else. Everybody else is under that same umbrella. So I, I, I'm curious about this because I, I agree with Thomas reasoning that this is this is certainly more appropriately handled by legislature than by um, than than by the court because the, the, I don't I don't I can't sanction judicial legislation. And that's essentially how this would come across. My question is this. I mean, we've seen states like Florida try to pass laws as to what policies Facebook must abide by within the confines of their state. And my question is, when we talk about legislature making change, I I, I question. I thought it was I thought it was a bold move by DeSantis and I, you know, I applauded him for it. I question the legal authority for a state to create its own unique laws as they relate to something that is clearly interstate, international, like a, you know, like a carrier such, you know, like, like a, any internet company, ultimately. I mean, you and I are operating interstate, technically. I think that, I think that they should be able to do it, especially because when you talk about these companies, they have a capacity to control what happens in various jurisdictions. So I think that when when Florida passes a bill saying you can't limit this person, you can't you can't you know if you you can't treat people unfairly. I'm curious about your perspective, based on the fact that it is interstate, as to how that would withstand scrutiny from the court as to the the authority of the state of one individual state to pass legislation about this topic. It it loses. It loses to the federal government immediately because if they, the federal they, government supersedes, but what if they tack on a rule? That means that 230 should through supremacy trump any private state-based litigation, right? Like it I mean it based on how it works That should happen because Congress has a sole power to regulate interstate commerce. And I cannot imagine that Section 230 is passed under any authority other than the Commerce Clause. Right. Like that, that, that is, uh, and to the chat, it's classic interstate. And also, and also the, the, the statute itself said that they, that, uh, any, any other laws that, that, um, that intersect with it, basically that, that would go against it are not to be applied. Um, yeah. to that kind of a case. So state law, federal law, constitutional law. Well, but yeah, the supremacy to... clause doesn't, I mean, wait, does it, is there any specific <clears throat> comment in 230 or thereabouts saying that this will supersede uh, a, an individual state law? Because I do know that there's situations yeah, where you, it does, it says it explicit, mm-hmm. expressly. Yeah. From, no, from I what I remember, I, I, I remember that. Yeah. It's 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 a pretty it's a pretty powerful powerful statute because while clearly the federal law trumps um, state law at the same time, well, depending at on the same time, on the there, there are times about. where we, we there are times I've looked at laws where I would think that there was a, there was a conflict, and and the court has said otherwise in saying that that this is not something that's that you don't we don't apply federal statute here to say that they're in conflict. But if the if it's clear if it's expressed in the statute, then obviously, yeah, I just I hadn't noticed that ever in section two thirty. Now you're gonna make me read it. Two thirty has an express statute, uh, basically granting blanket immunity from all civil litigation related to the moderation of content. Um, and uh, so then that would presumably encompass, and I think the state would competently argue that would encompass or the 
the federal state would co competently argue that would include state law tort claims as well. Um, but the, I, don't you think, know the, I don't think the federal government would be involved in that suit. It would be Facebook versus the state of Florida. And I, but you're saying Facebook could rely on the supremacy clause that uh, um, that's, that that's 230 would apply. Government. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that the feds may actually implead into that, right? Like the federal government may implead on behalf of Facebook if they if they disagreed with the state law. Yeah, can, you know, Legal Bites was saying earlier that that on both sides of the aisle we're not happy with Section Two Thirty. That's true, that's true. But the reason for that, different reasons. Yeah, and but and those reasons could not be more opposite. I mean, the left literally wants much more censorship. They want they they their cancel they want cancel culture to be codified as law. And whereas our position is no, let everyone speak, and I don't care how offensive they are or this if they're spouting, you know, lib leftist gibberish. I don't care. Just let everyone let everyone speak, and let the the public decide where their tastes lie and who's correct based on by voting with the the power of their attention span. So, um, let me read this uh, super chat. Uh, David Stern says, "Kyle, better believe in the heart of the cards." Kyle, I use Pot of Greed, which allows me to draw two more jurors for my deck. <laughs> Binger, I attack with false evidence for 100 credibility damage. <laughs> Judge, uh-oh, you activated my trap card. Mistrial with prejudice. Uh, yes, yes, there you go. That was uh, that was very confusing to me. Uh, is that Yu-Gi-Oh, I think? David S. says, please keep us posted on future coverage. You guys are the perfect example of fair, unbiased coverage while offering a unique perspective. There you go. Well, I, I mean, all of us stream all the time. Uh, <laughs> probably too much. Yeah. <laughs> probably way too much. But uh, we we do. Um, and, and that's why I've included everybody's link in the description who has joined the stream so far. Uh, let me find the next one here. Uh, Catherine H says, what do you think backdoor binger and big boys reaction will be if Kyle is found not guilty of all charges Will they have a public meltdown and argue with the jurors and judge? No, I think um, I think I think Binger's going to have like a, a dramatic close up. It's going to be in black and white, and then you're you're just going to hear this "Hello, darkness, my old friend." That's going to be it. Yeah, you're just going to sit there stunned. He's going <laughs> to. That's it. I I think Kraus might go um, destroy an entire Jimmy John's. Like, and I don't mean go eat everything <laughs> in Jimmy John's. That would be the obvious joke. No, I think he will go to Jimmy John's flipping tables over ripping the boots off the wall like he is gonna be he looks he Can looks so mad every time anything doesn't go their way but oh wait no the, this is for you guys i'm the the big panel doesn't get this does not get this someone sent me something yesterday and we all miss this we all miss this and it's oh hold on I've got to do this very carefully because I don't want to um, give their, you know, I don't want to dox their name. Perfect. Perfect. Let me share this. This the chat. This is for you. Uh, <laughs> we all miss this. And, and so you guys are here for jury deliberations. Again, what's wrong with you chat? I love you, but what's wrong with you? Um, <laughs> oh, a lot of people God. Here too. Okay. What are we so, looking at? this is from yesterday. This is a clip. Richards is going to say something, and my man who did this video is going to pinch to zoom on Krause's face. Kraus <laughs> oh, is what matters in this clip, okay? I don't want to spoil it beyond that. Here yeah. we go, guys. Watch Kraus. Walked, he walked right by Jeans them, Armstrong. and then they ran ahead. Uh, they were lighting a fire when Kyle walked The only thing I up. can say about James Armstrong is, okay, that's interesting. <laughs> what I'd like to say about his photographs, his knowledge of what he did, and some of the statements that the state has made regarding it is, what he did for those 20 hours is hocus pocus, and he makes an exhibit <laughs> that is out of <laughs> focus. And that's, <laughs> that's, that's an agreement. Not, I don't know oh that's my God. Agreement. I don't know if that's agreement or his face is more like. No, that's, more that's like, a. Hmm, that is actually, respect for that is respect the game. For the lie. 
That is right, yes. set for the game. <laughs> yeah, that, I, that's how I took it. I don't think he's agreeing. He's agreeing that it's hocus pocus, but I think he's like, "Wow, well played." I got to tip my cap to that At one. At the very least, yeah. That, yeah. And I thought that that was that was his glove don't fit, you must acquit moment, and that he should have come back. He did sort of play off of that theme later on, but that was his glove don't fit moment. Well, he kind of did though. I mean, he referred to magic. He referred to fantasy land. Like he he did it in different ways. That he it's was too just subtle. like, look, it's they're too just subtle. To come. No, no, no. I, that's I disagree. Perfect. Kraus, I think that's perfect. Kraus on rebuttal said hocus pocus. Hocus yeah. pocus. Yeah. Yes. Don, that, and, and, he, he and, did it. That was yeah, a, I, that I showed that. how much he was in his head, how deep that was ingrained in his head and how just how, how much he rent was. he's paying. Yes. <laughs> yes. That was, <laughs> yeah. it was exceptional. No, I completely and I, agree. And I think the point he was trying to make was like, look, he's trying to make us look kind of ridiculous. He's trying to, you know, like, con like, you know, paint us to be these 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 you know oddballs that are you know trying to make things up but it's like by actually using the phrase the jury for all we know forgot the the hocus pocus phrase but then as soon as he said hocus pocus then no, the jury's didn't. gonna be like oh yeah hocus pocus no. out of focus nope no that, they, that photo yeah. was out of focus they, huh? they, they didn't forget that but it's it's sort of to me he came across as like i am not out of control I am tired of being told I'm out of control. I'm not out of control at all here. That's You're out of control. Whole... <laughs> it was just insanity. It was, I don't know what, the... I think strategically, it's crazy that they put him up there because we saw the meltdown he had on the stand when Nathan DeBruin, who recently opened a Twitter account, oh, which is yes. called Photos by Nate. He liked one of my tweets. That's how I found that out. Yeah. Photos by Nate D. By what is it? I think it's photos by Nate D. Or something to that effect. If you look up Nathan DeBruin, I'm sure um, you'll you'll be able to find him there. And we, who we call here Photo Chad. But we saw how Kraus melted down when his integrity was attacked, and he he lost it. He just lost control, and he couldn't think straight. And that's why coming off of that of that um, response, the closing arguments from from Mark, from Mark Richards. I thought he was the worst possible personality to put up there because yep. he just sat there and just belting out his, his anger and, and doing a stupid little checklist of, of just annoyance. I am turning this off now, by the way. I'm sorry. And yeah, just, it's, it's really embarrassing. I'm, it's, I'm it's, so unprofessional. <laughs> it's so unprofessional. It's so, do you know I actually leave this thing on while I'm, while I'm doing my own streams? I stream five times a week, 10 PM to midnight. I lead into Nick's show and that's how this has happened on my show zero times. So that's why I'm kind of no one conspiracy. ever no one even knows this number. But Stuff like conspiracy. Yeah, I thought Kraus I thought strategically, you have to put your 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 team as a lawyer, you have to put your your team in its best position to win. Like a coach trying to win and you set your team up to make it most likely to succeed. And I just thought he was the wrong pitcher to go send out there in that in that moment in time because he had displayed that he cannot handle that emotional uh, the, the emotions that he feels when he when when his integrity is intact so i wonder i wonder if their line of thinking was something along the lines of like okay so the defense uh closing argument just kind of destroyed our credibility and or maybe not you know maybe they weren't they weren't thinking that it destroyed but they were like they really took a lot of swings at our credibility and they really focused on binger so can we really put binger up there now which i think it would i still think it would have been a better choice because that would have been the 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 stronger like putting the stronger foot forward and be like yeah he just said a bunch of shit about me but i'm going to come out here and tell you why he's wrong or you mm -hmm. know like or tell you why why that's all a mis mischaracterization and i'm i'm continuing on because i'm i'm on my way to to get justice here you know like like that that would have been a better look but it seems like they 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 maybe thought at least i i this is what i'm imagining anyway is that maybe they thought if we throw kraus up there and he kind of defends like binger and binger's character or something by like going out there and like kind of taking swings at the defense and and getting angry like maybe that'll maybe that'll look better maybe that'll play better but i, I don't i don't i don't see how that how that would play well for anyone because that that just i mean they just he was yelling at the jury he was getting in their space while yelling at them and yelling into a, a handheld microphone like i just yeah n none of that looked good i don't yeah. know why you take binger who if 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 any of us are honest we got to go binger is very good to the jury like he's very good in front of the jury he's very comfortable his cadence is is uh is solid 
He does not. He just has a great presence. Like I, I don't mean to fluff the guy. I don't really like him, but um, hey, Eric. Hey. He, he uh, he's he's got this all around good presence, and then you go to Kraus. It's like why, why would you quit Binger? Right? It should be broke back. I can't quit you. <laughs> Binger should have been back up there, um, and he should maybe. Maybe they did it on the fly too. Who knows? Like maybe they said, "Whoa, your your entire credibility was just thrown into shambles." If you get up there and start trying no, to defend it, I had read bad. they scheduled. I had read they scheduled it that way from before the day started. That Kraus stupid. was supposed to. It is stupid plan. That's and that's an ego play still, for Kraus. Like, oh yeah, buddy, know, you helped out. I still don't know that 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 Binger looks good in front of the jury anyway with his style because, like his like. It would be fine if he was just talking down to maybe Kyle or, you know, talking down, in, you know, in response to the defense, you know, the other attorneys like that's, I think, fine. But when it was he was he, he had the same sort of persona, the same sort of vibe on the other witnesses that are that are much more um, credible and and much more like sincere, likable by the jury, like Nathan De Bruin, for example. Well, he wasn't cross examining him, but like but. You just you had the same vibe throughout the entire trial coming from him that I I don't know that he I, you know he was smooth sure he was very smooth but he, he still was very condescending and especially the combination the combination of the two of them together very condescending very much on like you know in this like in in, in this like white tower or whatever what what have you you know like just kind of call, calling down to everybody else like you don't know what you're talking about I know what I'm talking about. I'm the prosecutor in the white hat and uh and I'm gonna tell you how it is. Everybody else is wrong. Didn't Binger uh, yeah, come maybe. across as the high dollar um defense lawyer that got flown in from New York. I mean, if you're gonna look at the comparison, like he's the guy that had the slicker suits, he was the one that had the pens, he was the one who had the smooth demeanor and attitude. And I don't know if that plays well in that area or not. I can't speak to the jury, but what I can say is Richards, at least at the end, felt like he was a member of the community. Yes. And that was, totally. that was, and that is, I think, a, a, a great element. I mean, we, we look, we were attacking Richards for the last, what, two weeks, and justifiably so. He earned our scorn and our wrath because of his passivity in trying and defending or sleeping and through his opening this entire statement. trial. Yeah, his opening statement was okay, though. I mean, I think uh, he basically. I, I, mean, I don't agree. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't I, that's. It was. It, we all remember. We'll, we'll never forget the hard R. We will never forget the hard R. And if yeah, you're memorable. If that's all you take from it. Yeah, is that what you think. want to remember? <laughs> <laughs> that's sort of like Nick's uh, tweet that I just uh, shared that it got pulled already out of context for Kato. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> it took uh -oh. like, what, five minutes? Yeah. What, guy, what, what was pulled out of context? Me saying uh, about the threesome with Hitler oh. and David Duke. It's already nice. out there. <laughs> nice. Oh, boy. Oh, God. <laughs> it's beautiful. And my face wow. is right next to this smiling. Like, yeah. Isn't that oh, no, no. They cropped them. It's oh, all thank there. you. But your ringtone awesome. slipped Thanks, in at chat. the end. Thanks, chat. You don't even put you don't put someone else in there with me. You don't ruin <laughs> someone else's life. That's not even fair. Uh yeah, but your so ring, the ringtone made it in. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, very nice. Oh my gosh. Uh welcome to the show, Eric. Man, I'm glad Thank to have you. Thank you. I, I feel good. I, I the non-lawyers here, I guess it goes to a jury, so I, I'm the jury. You can be the jury. <laughs> what do you what do you think, man? You've been following along, I assume. Yeah. Um, I mean, I agree with you guys the most part. I was blown away yesterday. I was like, who is this guy? And where did they put Richards? I mean, seriously, that that was a, yeah, a shocking replacement. And my only theory is, you know, Barnes keeps talking about how he's got a, a very short temper. He was pissed, and I feel like he came across as righteous indignation. Yep. And that was good. It, it, that mm. was the first time in the entire trial I felt like he was actually fighting for Kyle, like he cared. And I hope the jury sees it that way. But I mean, it was like. I, I love that he was like binger 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 the same way that um binger went after kyle he was going after binger in every way and i i still worry about it though because of that debate that nate had 
I don't know if you saw that on um, Matt Orfala's channel. He was with um, Bess, like millennial explaining Bess or something like that. It was a you know, very, very woke seeming individual. Sure. And uh, her ultimate thing is in the end that morally, I think it's wrong. He should just be, you know, it doesn't matter. He showed up, he had a gun. He's bad. And I, I fear that there are people in there. And as Barnes pointed out, the whole behavior panel got shut down, left out. So all it takes is a couple of those in there to screw everything up. Yeah. Well, we'll see. Um, the that's, jury that's panel why there is... would be a, that's why there would be a mistrial or a hung jury though. Mistrial. Because of I want to confirm with you guys. Cause I had, I had well, Runkle of the Bailey on my live stream last night and we were pretty sure about this, but I'm not a criminal defense attorney. He is a criminal defense attorney, but from Canada. Yeah, the so jury right now, like not even real. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so the jury right now, if they, I assume that if they were to reach conclusions on, let's say, three out of five charges and get hung on the other two, so those those conclusions would be binding, and and yes. if it's an acquittal, he would be acquitted, and if it was you know conviction, he would be convicted. Because I, I could see something like that happen. I don't think they'll be hung on, on all these charges. I think that on some of these charges, they might end up hung and others not. And so that is the ramifications, though. In theory, they would leave over two charges as a mistrial, and then the state can go after him for the other two charges and start all over again with only those charges pending, right? Yeah. I guess or maybe the judge will step in and just say, okay, get rid of this. We're done. No, I mean, that if, if it's a hung jury, they're not going to get dismissed with prejudice. Uh, so they would, they would be able to bring them again. The state would have to decide whether they want to bring them in again, because, well, you know, if they, if they're losing or if it's close, then that's not, uh, the best look to go ahead and, and try, try another bite at the apple. Plus it would give the, uh, the defense, a, a different approach to the case, right? Like they would get to look at the things that they did wrong and, and clarify those. They wouldn't have the benefit of having the um, the curfew charge and the gun charge, like tainting mm. the whole jury. Mm -hmm. So the, the state has to make a lot of consideration whether they want to bring that case back. Now, they may do it for political points, but um, in theory, uh, they, they have just as much reason not to. You know, state resources, the embarrassment of the state for losing the case in the first place. Like if they lost it the first time, they should expect that they're going to lose it again. And, and the other problem with the state's case in general is that it's such a technicality based case. We want to fool the jurors that the facts are not what the facts actually are. And that is maybe the most offensive part of this. They know I don't think provocation. that's true. I think, I think you're mistaken. I think, I think that you and I see it that way. I think that's real. I think your perspective is reality, but in the mindset of Binger, in the mindset of Krauss, we saw from their emotion they showed passion and emotion in this trial that, that we saw didn't see from Richards at all until closing arguments. Because I believe that like many lawyers do, when you get deeply invested in your case, you fall in love with it. And you genuinely believe the crap that you're saying. I, no attorney stands up and makes such an idiotic argument of to a jury along the lines of, he has no right to fire when the guy is lunging at him within four feet and everyone, because everyone gets beat up sometimes. So you can't use lethal force. What a moronic, stupid thing to say that anyone who just walks in and hears someone make a statement like that would think to themselves, you're an idiot. Like that doesn't make any sense at all. That, there's no logic. There's no justification. It sounds so stupid. Did but you okay. when you're a lawyer who's fallen in love with your case and you really believe in the positions you're coming from, Every all that kind of stupidity makes sense to you, and don't tell me that you, as a lawyer, as an advocate for someone, haven't fallen fallen for that yourself. Or sometimes arguments that, in the abstract, wouldn't you wouldn't really believe in so strongly, but you sort of at least go through the process of thinking to yourself, "Yeah, that might work. I think that'll work." And then afterwards, you step back and you're like, "Wow, that was that wasn't the smartest move to throw it's out." It's cognitive there. dissonance, Joe. Cognitive yeah, dissonance I, is the word you're looking for. But that's why that's why every every time that you're that you get deeply involved in any kind of any kind of litigation, you want to have other lawyers outside of 
you know, outside of your, your immediate circle that you can call up and say, Hey, I need, I need a gut check right here. Am I seeing this right? Or is this just like me liking the smell of my own cologne? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so Uh, that kind of thing is, is very important. I don't, I don't know that I fully agree. Um, I, I know that lawyers can get wrapped up in that, but I'm, I'm not sold that their indignation is because they're so, so invested in this case personally uh, that, that, that they ignore like obvious flaws in their case. I mean, we're talking, this is not um, them making a novel argument that they really passionately want to be the truth about some issue. This is about them reframing the entire case against common sense. And to me, it looks more like um, a lawyer who's been given a bad case. They've got a client that they're, go- they're going to service the client, whatever they need to do. Maybe it's a, maybe it's an existing client and this is a minor issue or something. And they're going to make a great a effort because the client says, I want to pursue this. And that's the state, right? Saying mm-hmm. you're going after Kyle. I cannot believe that Kraus and Binger, are bad enough attorneys to genuinely believe the nonsense they're saying about self-defense. Like I there's, yeah, I, that's fair. I, I, I just, I just can't get there. I think, uh, I think maybe they're making a passionate argument about provocation maybe, but I, I mean, I Binger, don't know. Binger's statement that, that the fact that he, the fact that Kyle, so Binger argued that Kyle, by bringing a gun that night gave up his right to a self-defense, that statement was was retweeted by lab by sorry by bad legal takes like that's how you know that it's bad when part of your closing argument is retweeted by bad legal takes here's the thing like, though. Cause, cause, is that for lawyers or is that for people it's so, so that's I, a, I keep going back to bess and nate that's what she wants i mean she's hanging on that whole thing he brought a gun bad things happen if he didn't bring a gun those bad things wouldn't happen and it I'm not saying it's logical or anything else, but you're like, it's a bad skirt. legal thing. <laughs> if, she, if she hadn't worn that skirt, well, I, 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 lo- I, love that, I love that analogy. But then getting back, I, as I said, is cognitive um, dissonance, right? Mm-hmm. They have their argument. This is their theory of the case. Bad, 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 Kyle. And have you ever argued with somebody who's just dug in on a subject? Of course. And no matter Never. what you do, well, <laughs> except for Nick. He's, he's the arbiter of uh, reason. Um, whatever you do, they get just crazier and crazier and crazier. Like um, you're a doctor and you're telling people not to smoke, but you're smoking. And it's like my grandfather lived to be 102 and he smoked cigars and drank whiskey every day. And it just goes on and on and on. And it becomes more and more ludicrous. And I kind of feel like that's what you saw happening in real time because there is no time to actually step back and react. It's like, oh no, I'm just going to throw at it. I'm going to throw at it. I'm going to throw at it, and not necessarily respond with reason. Or sanity. okay, to the to the chat who's freaking out here. Here's the feed from court. There, there's nothing. There's nothing happening. It's not muted. Nothing's going on. Yes, the judge briefly appeared in frame. Someone is saying court TV. Uh, reported that 90, you know, after 90 minutes, the jury asked for 11 more copies of the jury instructions. That's all fine. And Danny, none of that's actually coming through the feed though. I do have it up, even though you can't see it it, there. There's just literally zero is occurring on the screen. If something happens, uh, you'd actually hear it because the audio will come through uh, the, will come through the computer and, and you'll hear it before I switch it over, but there's, there's nothing going on. I am monitoring it. 11 copies well there's that 12 means jurors that, that means they're completely confused they've got to be completely confused and they're all like wait wait what what does that mean and that that doesn't maybe matter. they maybe in the alternative they decided they each want to take a few minutes and go through all of the counts themselves and so each one is going to go through the jury instructions and go count one check 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 mm. count two and then they're going to come together and say what did we come up with maybe that is uh, maybe it's not just confusion. That could be a maybe. possibility too. Or they're having a group reading together and they're trying to like understand it. Yeah, you are Horatio. <laughs> you are Yorick. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> it's say like a play. They're doing a right. table reading. <laughs> Jury instructions. Um, That'd be fun. But yeah, we're, uh, don't worry. I am monitoring this. Look, if there's an announcement, if anything happens at all, I'm 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 on it because I I would expect I really an announcement before they come out. They're not just to come out. Also, the jury's there. They 
I think the the, the public at large would well, know they gotta... that they're going to announce the jury, you know, the jury reaching its conclusion, and they'll come at one p.m. or whatever. Yeah, because they got to get the parties back there. Oh, excuse mm-hmm. me. They got to get Kyle in there. They got to get all the attorneys back in there. The attorneys are all right now, you know, calculating their billable hours. Or if they work <laughs> for the state, they're sitting there, you know, eating the souls of children. One Fingers of those two things is occurring. CNN right now um, with his agent. <laughs> well, I just, <laughs> I just really think that this is a case where self-defense has gone awry. And our interpretation of self-defense is probably not the correct interpretation anymore. <laughs> Wouldn't you agree that he shouldn't have been there with an AK 47 R 15? Wouldn't you agree that his 75 uh, clip magazine bullets were way too much and that he shot so many people? It was just, it was, I hate but he his but he should have, tone. He should have made, he should have made more shots by, by making some warning shots, perhaps. I yeah. Love what that was suggestion. The, he could have fired warning black shots. People? I don't understand that. If he would have fired warning shots, what's he one? He's going to shoot him into the air, like like the Arab Spring or something. Like what is or happening into the ground? Here? Either way, you have another charge for reckless endangerment. He did fire yeah. two in the air, jump kick guy. Yeah, he, he, well, he fired them at him, but not I'm just joking. indiscriminately. He should have fired him. He should have fired near the victims. That's the that's the way you actually do this. Just like ignoring someone, someone around the feet, just make them dance. Ignoring the legal reality that that would be attempted homicide because that is also deadly force and would carry the same punishment as the actual homicide. So, uh, oh my gosh. Uh, now, you guys talked about <laughs> them never playing it in real time. Did they ever play? the incident in real time at no. some during point during trial, during maybe. yeah testimony but that's a long time ago closing which was frustrating yeah a long long time ago perhaps like i i i definitely i appreciate what he was trying to do by breaking down all of the the tiny little decisions that he had to make within such a short time frame and it was it was great to to highlight that but i really i really wish that he would have just taken that that last step to say okay so now you saw all of those decisions. Let's take a look at how much time he actually had to make them. Let's play yeah. it from the top. <laughs> You've heard a lot about four shots and don't even play the video, right? Just grab the audio from it. You've heard a lot about four shots. I want you to hear how fast those shots were. This is not sped up or altered in any way. Like, and then that's it. That's the yeah. time that the defense is saying he could have stopped shooting that he should have determined that he was he was on the way down and 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 should have known that he was at that point par- at that point they should have known that the problem is of course if that first shot doesn't take them down hesitating even for a moment ends up with Kyle dead yep. right oh, yeah. like that's that's where you go with that. And I ju- I like you, uh, Legal Bites. I just wanted him to hammer the point home. You've seen all this. Just we've gone fr- we've gone frame by frame. I want you to realize how fast my expert, Dr. John Black, testified. This is 30 frames per second video. So each one of those pictures where the defense or the prosecution is trying to show you that he's he's doing all this stuff. He's checking his gun. They're showing you one picture at a time and, and trying to extrapolate uh, extrapolate all that. I want you to understand that each one of those is one thirtieth of a second. That's one thirtieth of a second. And let's look at how it looks in real time. And then you see Kyle get kicked in the face, spin around, bang, bang, grabbed his gun, bang, and then waits just a second and bang. Like yeah. it's, it's so fast. It is. So it is. And I would have played it over fast. and over and over. I would be like, okay, so this happened. Wait, I didn't see that quite right. Let me replay that. You see how, wait, oh, no, it's too and fast. That's, that's another, that's another good point is that another, another possible way of, of doing it would be showing it in real time every single time. And then each mm-hmm. time showing a new detail. I mean, like, okay, this was super fast, but did you miss this? Did you miss this? Did you miss this? Like, yeah, I like, and then I like just, that, just I like to that show approach. like, oh my God, there's, there's so much real in to drill in that you the only way you can really break down what happened here is if you slow it down far slower than kyle had to react by the way and i i think when you're doing that i like the fact that he did touch on this it's not just where he shot and when he shot but also who he did not shoot that anyone Mm -hmm. that people who had been rushing him but then step back to show that they're not a threat that he was able to make that calculated that calculated uh, assessment 
in tiny fractions of a second to say, okay, we're not, look, I'm, I don't want to shoot anyone. I don't have to. And you show that, yep. you know, it was not some crazy active shooter. He's not someone who was hoping to be in that situation. Quite the contrary. He was trying to get away from that situation any way humanly possible. By the oh, way, sorry. that whole argument Binger kept making, speaking speaking of which, that, that whole argument Binger kept making, saying, like, did, did it, look at the callousness that he lets Rosenbaum bleed out there rather than helping save oh. his life after he just shot him down. What kind of ridiculous stupidity is that? That Does he think anyone in the jury would be like, yeah, that's what he should have done there. That's what he should have done. He should have gone down to his knees and tried doing chest compressions on Rosenbaum while everyone's screaming, he shot him, get him. That's what he should have been doing. It's like Speaking of Binger, he said um, in Kyle's shoes, right? I also would have made the point of saying, here's the slow motion. This is what we see as we're looking at later. Then real time, mm -hmm. this is what Kyle saw. This is what we see. This is what Kyle saw. What is yeah. Kyle supposed to do? Kyle sees it this fast. We're sitting here parsing it. This is what Kyle saw. This is what we see. This is what Kyle saw. And just over and over That's... and then say, Mr. Binger said, put yourself in Kyle's shoes. Put yourself in Kyle's shoes. Look at this. What would you do? And that's what John Black was supposed to do. Um, that, uh, that, that whole thing got left off. John Black was a an expert on not only video in general but he was an expert on uh, and he testified to this was qualified for this at his dober hearing he was an expert on the perceptions of the people in the video and their decision making based on information that was available to them rather than the video itself and right. i think they really bungled john black's testimony i i think they really did he was yeah. his his whole qualification they pay him a bunch of money. They fly him out there. They do all this stuff to have him ready to go. And then the questions were all just like, this is, you're, you're just going to play some slow-mo clips. Like that's, that's what we're going to do here. You lightened it up and you're playing it. Like put him down and say, uh, have him say, no, here you go. O of course, what Kyle was doing based on the information in the video is at issue. So if the state objects to this, they're going to look absolutely ludicrous. And they're just going to say, how is this not relevant to his state of mind? This man, we talked to him. He's qualified as an expert in what people actually see versus what we see from the perspective of a camera. That's his whole role for being here. And you agreed to that. And then you, you let him talk about those things, but they, they so like accepted the limitations of his testimony. They should have asked the court to expand upon it and said, your honor, this guy is who we, we brought in for this purpose. The defense wants him limited to just timing shots. Like he's a, he's a more accurate stopwatch or whatever, which is great, but they have raised all of these issues. Of course we get to go ahead and impeach them with an expert. Of course we get to do this and, and let the state feebly argue in front of the judge that no, we want less evidence on this thing. In my opinion. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I think I think that he he seemed like uh, a very competent expert witness. I mean, especially the way that he was he was explaining things at the beginning. Um, and I was really disappointed by the way that they set up that line of questioning, because I, if I remember correctly now, I don't even remember that much from his testimony, which tells you just how well that went. But yeah. from what I do remember is that the the middle portion, which is the worst part to have your zingers, the middle portion is like where he started to get into good stuff. Um, so uh, yeah. And, and by that point, I think that the jury was long gone. No one was paying any attention, but, but he was, he was actually very good at explaining, uh, a lot of this technical information. He just wasn't being asked it in a way that, that really was helpful for the jury to be able to pay attention. And that's the thing about, about an expert witness is, I mean, that the two keys, two keys for, for a good expert witness is first, yeah, they obviously have to have a good understanding of the, of the material. So like, you know, the guy, the pinch and zoom expert who was not very good for that purpose. He, he really knew nothing about these, about these, the, the pixels that, that, that get, you know, sort of populated when you, when you pinch and zoom and what color are they? Well, I don't know. I don't know what happens there. I um, <laughs> this stuff. I, I, what, what's mind blowing yeah. is, you know, that the um, company's software, the company itself, the software they are using in their blog stated, you cannot use this as evidence in their <laughs> blog. I'm not, oh, I, no. I shared it with Barnes the other day. Um, I can text or 
God. DM it to you, Nick, but it's mind blowing because they themselves put it out. They said this could be a good investigative tool, but right. not oh. as evidence. And they talked about the shortcomings in it wow. themselves. It oh, is God. staggeringly uh, poor form. Um, the, yeah. But the other, the, but the other part of a, the, the, sorry, I was gonna, I was going to finish my thought that no, the other no part of the, um, of a good expert witness is, is uh, being able to translate what you do know into regular English for, for people that are not from your field. This is obviously like, this is like the biggest, the biggest issue for lawyers is, is trying to be able to explain things to clients so that they understand them, et cetera, et cetera. But, but yeah, I mean, and that's, yeah, but anyway, but I, I think that the bigger problems with his testimony were, uh, more having to do with the, the way that the questions were, were framed for him to, to explain, explain what he needed to explain. I so, uh, you, Nick. three quick things. One, uh, the quartering can check his DMS Two, hmm. Um, yes, the chat is correctly pointing out that, uh, the judge barred, uh, through his order, the discussion of those things pre-trial and the proper way to address it, as I said, is to bring the request to the judge, not to try and introduce it out of, out of anywhere, bring the request to the judge says, judge. And if anybody remembers his in-court order, which is what he went over rather than the proposed order that he ended up signing, um, he did say, I'm going to leave the door open for the behavioral testimony. He did say that if it becomes relevant. Because this judge has mm. not been a fan of an a priori exclusion of evidence throughout the trial. We've seen that and specifically of testimony. So you bring it to the judge, not what Binger did, right? You bring it and you say, judge, we believe that they have made Kyle's decision making an issue in this case at several points leading up to this. Uh, not only throughout the whole night, what we want to do is introduce limited testimony of our expert around the events in which self-defense is occurring and the decision-making process under stress so we can show his perception rather than the camera's perception that's what our experts here to do that's what we discussed you did say at the pre-trial uh, motion in limine hearing that you would allow this type of testimony if the door is open we think the door is open your honor can we do it and then again let the state argue that the door is not open to what Kyle was doing at the time he's making the shots. Of course that's relevant. And they're going to try and argue that it's not. And then you, you, they were, I believe firmly that they would have easily won on that request. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I think they misused that expert uh, it, for the reasons stated and for, by me and by uh, legal bites here that it, I don't remember his testimony at all. I don't, I don't remember either. any of it. And the uh, the third, people are now asking, would this be grounds for a mistrial on appeal? And the question is always, was the objection preserved? And on this one, it's muddy, right? Because they did preserve an objection to the expert and the introduction of the expert's uh, use of this software. They didn't do it on the same grounds. So that would be the argument on appeal. We preserved an objection. Here this is. Well, then the appeals court has to determine if this new information constitutes new evidence uh, that they can that they can or cannot consider. And so then the state would ar obviously argue against it. What is but, that law he was the judge was talking about that um that was you know bad science led to people losing their jobs and everything else oh, and you can't just go with bad because could you not like with um what I sent you in the DM but. Uh, use something like that like the own company said this should not be used uh, to overturn that piece of evidence if that proves to be pivotal yeah what what he was referring to is the dober standard which Dober. is uh which is case law d-a-u-b-e-r-t i pronounce it dober because it looks french I pronounce it <laughs> wow. i don't know but so many so many legal terms depend on on like what geographic area you're yeah, in so you like, I, like, like i've Barnes. talked about this before <laughs> like, like even, even, even within Texas, which is where I went to law school, they, they, they taught us in, uh, in our, our, oh, like yeah. our, our okay. advocacy classes. So how do you say voir dire like, then? How do you so, say voir dire? So, so if you're, if you're, if you're in federal court, they said, if you're in federal court, it's voir dire, but if you're in state court, it's voir dire. 
voir dire. Voir dire. It's, it's voir dire. <laughs> yeah, uh, you can't. You, no, there's no. Texas does not own pronunciation of anything legally no, no, no. related. They no, but can't. That's, but that's just that was that was the that was the recommendation. That's a Dalbert hearing. That was, <laughs> it's not, no, don't but, get me wrong. I, think, I love I think it. In, I think in California. I don't know. I've I've got I've got. I think I have at least one of my one of my California lawyer friends watching. Um, they can they can text me and 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 correct me because I've been I've been wrong on other pronunciations before. Like like the like the word like uh, California has a has a word for a motion to dismiss. It's called a demur. But for the longest time, I only saw it written and I didn't actually a use demur. it in yeah. conversation. And especially not having gone to law school in California. So my 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 boss roasted me when I when I in conversation like several times referred to it as a demur. And he's like, oh, is this is this a pinkies out demur? <laughs> well are they related i mean it, it, i mean to the, it, it sounds similar to the uh to, to the chat. is to yeah. pass over or or to choose to not acknowledge right there's I an mean, extra er on on demur in uh yeah. in california oh, okay. but um to the hey, chat Kurt. texas Hello again? should own the legal pronunciations of everything they just don't <laughs> i mean that's look i believe me if everything were said in a texas accent in the courtroom that things would be better i believe that's a new <laughs> mv7 microphone if memory yeah it is correctly. sure mv7 i have one too yeah so i oh, I, yeah, yeah. I have Eric, one is too. it plugged in through Eric usb DM'd me earlier about that <laughs> is it plugged in through Our, usb Probably. uh yes yeah i was just curious because the sound quality was really good so interesting it's cool they sound better uh, on usb than they do on uh, uh audio interface okay now but that's a built in app or near and far uh, that's that's the advantage of it i have it as a travel but that's how uh that's how a lot of legal terms go is because you're in law school and you're reading through them and you get latin you're like pro hack vice <laughs> what the hell is this <laughs> Like you never hear it said unless it yeah. comes up specifically in a class. And then you're still relying on some dummies interpretation of how it sounds. And yes, I did refer to all law school professors as some dummy uh, because <laughs> at the end of the day, that's what we all are. And everybody needs to get off of their horses in my, in my humble opinion. And I think law professors who Texas realize law that professors are actually on horses. Fun fact. Yes. No. <laughs> True. Okay. On a horse with a big iron on the hip. Uh <laughs> No, it's, uh, it's, uh, so I always say I qualified as, I read it as French. My, my mom is from Louisiana. Uh, and mm. so, you know, like I, I read French words as French words, uh, mainly because of that. But, um, that's, that's just how it goes. I don't know the correct, correct pronunciation, but yeah, it's, it's that standard that, uh, they, they wanted a way to qualify experts to make sure they were actually experts. And in this case, you've got a guy who clearly is not an expert. Like he, his his expertise is literally I put in program, I click the button. <laughs> and then yes, asked, and yes. you know, as soon as they scratch the the surface on like, well, what do you really know about this? He's like, I don't know. And then also I wish they had pushed back a little bit more on the peer review. It was peer reviewed. So is this peer is this peer as informed as you are? Because if so, we have way more trouble. I love the judge. Peer reviewed. What what does that tell me? Right? What like that mean? was a who's the peer? <laughs> What what does that tell me now? What, how that doesn't help I mean, me at all? I mean, Nick's stream is peer reviewed by us, and look at the quality of that. So you know, damn. <laughs> hey, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, they just let anybody on. <laughs> yeah, we even have non lawyers on this. I channel. know. Oh, Occasionally, yes. just disgusting. <laughs> no, well, it is I nice always... to have a nice a non lawyer on because they can talk from their perspective, and I, I think it's it's interesting, particularly at this point, like see what other people are seeing and how they're reacting mm -hmm. to things. Yeah, because we're we're I, all I over say, the always... legal niceties. It's like because we're doing the flow charts, you know. Well, if we go to this part of the flow chart in three A C sub I, <laughs> and the third word they're in, we know, well, we got that element. And, oh, uh, so uh, the, oh, know, sorry, that's not the, the just not the uh, non lawyer reaction where self defense good. Well, it's also it's also like one of the other reasons why I love when we go on Eric Hunley's channel on on like every other Friday is like because we'll be we'll go off and we'll start like like rambling off about something and he's like actually I don't I don't understand what that term is <laughs> and then we're like oh wait okay other people probably don't also and it kind of is a nice reminder to like kind of slow down and like define a few things for people uh here uh Eric sent me this and um let's let's do this real quick so uh Kurt I don't know how much you've been following along but um this is from the amped 
software Ooh. that was used to make the uh, to make the video edits. This is from their blog on uh, can AI be used for forensics and investigations. So this is from their forensic image and video processing. So here we go. Investigative versus evidentiary use. Image and video forensic software is normally used for two very closely related applications as a tool to get investigative leads, a tool to analyze data to be presented as evidence in court. I already expressed the concept in a previous article. When you're doing image enhancement in the investigative context, you're just trying to get a clue to the footage, blah, 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 blah. When you're working in a judicial context, your work must be ready to eventually become evidence to be used in court, hence your process must be more rigorous and formalized. Many of our customers use our tools mainly for the investigation fade, but we obviously design them uh, for the most stringent demanding evidentiary use. The pitfall from the division above is that often the lines between investigative and evidentiary contexts are blurred. What was initially used as a quick investigation hint may become the strongest evidence and if the work was not done properly since the beginning can turn things into a huge mess. Furthermore, even at a purely investigative level, getting on the wrong track can be worse than having no information at all. Uh, sure. So there's some there's some Scroll doubt. Scroll down, there's a highlighted sentence, a bold sentence that is um, very important where they say flat out should not be used. Um, hold on. This is the uh, en enhancement part where they're talking about it. Um, and I believe they go into Here we know, go. introducing. According to the above. Uh, oh, hey, we've got real quick. Let me add a I'm bring guys. I'm very sorry. I'm going to bring a bunch of Wisconsin into this stream. Uh, so let <laughs> me uh, order. I'm sure. Let me do that. And I would like to welcome to the stream. Mr. The quartering. Come on. I'm just How's here. It going, buddy? I'm just going well. I mean, uh, I'm just here to wreak a little havoc. And, um, <laughs> and uh, that was my favorite part. Yeah, Your Honor, to... I want to throw this man <laughs> off the panel. He's he's coming in here with a fake accent, Your Honor, trying to cozy up to us good Wisconsinites. <laughs> <laughs> it's so sad because uh, closer to you, that's a correct accent. But we don't <laughs> like. I'm in southeastern Wisconsin, so we don't really have. We don't go behind the snack shack and look at a tallywhacker. <laughs> but you're so you're closer to Kenosha then. Yeah, I'm 15 minutes out. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. Well, which is which a foreign, foreign land. country from where you yeah, live. Yeah, you're apparently. in a foreign land. The, yeah, uh, so, I do. so you're farther than Antioch. I'm close. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm closer than the foreign land of Ray, Racine. Uh, so can well, can we get? I mean, this may be a hard admission for you. This is a tough. We asked the tough questions here. But are you actually who shot? Two and a half people in Kenosha that night. And was it actually you in the video? Look, I was just out walking my dog, and um, uh, you yeah. know. they all say that. They Kenshi all say Zoom that. says otherwise. I was, yeah, I was, um, I was, uh, I was, I fought like a man, mm. and I didn't, I didn't use my weapon. Yeah, <laughs> look, everybody takes a beating sometimes. I guess don't we all? Lord knows <laughs> I have. Yeah. You know what? My thought was, my thought was, I didn't that, even think of it. I was like, my thought is, as that's not really true because some people have guns. So no, not everyone takes a beating. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Some people just pull out the gun and shoot the armed assailant. Um, okay. So, but what we were talking about, this is the software that they used. And so this is uh, according to the uh, above image enhancement with AI shouldn't be acceptable in general for in evidentiary use. Hmm. So that would have been uh, helpful for them to bring up. That's all I'm saying. That'd be very helpful. Oh, here's their own site. Well, I line, think your honor. I think with the combination of having an expert who disqualifies himself, uh, you, this this would have been beautiful to bring up. It's like, wait, so your honor, we we have on their own blog them saying this shouldn't generally be acceptable for evidentiary use, and here we have this guy who's operating the software who can't tell us how any of it works. I think when we combine these two, your honor, this this has to go. The this has to go. The least expert expert ever admitted to a to a jury. <laughs> I mean, I was, know, there was that cop earlier who uh, pulled up everything off Twitter and YouTube. Th this guy he was, was a pretty good expert. No, that guy, that he he might not have been expert in like that particular area in that particular element that he was testifying about. This guy who's supposed to be the expert, he's literally like, "Well, I bought Photoshop and I just finished paying. I got my subscription to it and I put in the product key number, and then they say, okay, click here,' and that's what I did. So. I I just pushed the magic autocorrect button, and it it, it worked. And in, in and him. in his and in his his testimony, I mean, somebody can can just 
go back to that footage and then pick out all the times when he said, I don't know. And it's going to be at least a handful mm -hmm. of times. I think it was, I think it was close to 15 times that he said, I don't know. It was, it was a lot. It was mm -hmm. a lot. On I don't basic think that... things, on basic things about how it operates. That's what makes him so inexpert. It was like, it's like, okay, when the pixels get separated like this, is it going to, is it going to change? And you have blue here and red here. Is the middle one going to be blue? I don't know. Is it going to be red? I don't know. Is it going to be purple? I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's insanity. Well, what that do you crazy. know? <laughs> I don't think that that resonates with the jury anyway. Um, I think all the nitpicking about AI and I think most people understand zooming in on their phone. Like you, you guys, as an invoice of lawyers, you're really interested in that. But I think most people in the jury, they probably didn't, didn't care about that. Well, that, the, the, that's what we're, what we're arguing is that they shouldn't have allowed his testimony at all because the yeah, first yeah, argument yeah. about it happened in front of the judge. The jury's not in the room when they have their objection. They say, Hey, this guy, you know, he can't tell us how many pixels are being added. And this is exactly why, because of what you're saying, right? The jury mm -hmm. goes, I pinch on my phone. I, I look at my, my kid and I, I get their face bigger and, and everything works great. And, and so they're saying, your honor, we can't allow this evidence in it's prejudicial uh, because it, it's going to show something or they're going to be able to say it shows something that might not actually be there. And the jury's going to trust it because they trust zooming in. So, yeah, I, I think uh, I, I agree. I, I think it doesn't matter to a jury. And they were probably zoned out during that questioning because uh, they're bored. Right. That was brutally oh, no. that was brutally technical. Uh, and it was like three people who didn't know what they were talking about, talking about very specific things. <laughs> And you can just smell that. And there's no way anyone on that jury was dialed into that. No way. Uh, Jeremy, I did a... see your videos on the defense and uh, the prosecution's closing. I didn't know if you did a video on the rebuttal. So I wanted to ask you about your impressions of it. Because to me, it just sounded I'm... like angry man, angry at jury. So real, well, real quick uh, before that. Sorry, I, I have to, there's an ad that needs to run for <laughs> CVS Pharmacy on the stream. Uh, welcome, <laughs> Mr. Ron Coleman. <laughs> Well, Ron. How are you doing? Is How, he in a full your... body cast? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no, it's oh, just my. it's just ice. It, he I had a wisdom keep, tooth I, removed. My, my, uh, it's it's uh, just unbelievable what my what my jaw looks like, what my chin looks like. I, the so only reason I'm, I'm checking in is not because I have anything to add at all. I just want a better seat. <laughs> <laughs> Jumping to the front of the line. I'm sorry, Jeremy. I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh no, you're fine. You're fine. Hey, by the way, congrats on uh, all the success uh, of your stream and um, suckering all these people into subscribing to you. Wait till they see where your real content's like. But the, I thought the rebuttal was, you know, for a guy that only worked 20 hours as a as a lifeguard, and by the way, t only 20 hours. Um, I thought it came across as, if I had to de define it in one word, it would probably be sweaty. I don't think um, he seemed irritated and seemed to talk down to the jury, in my opinion. Um, frustratingly, they let some mistruths just slide by. Um, you know, there are no left handed and right handed weapons, which is absurd. Um, and they could have just made them look bad if they just had said something. But maybe they were using the whole don't interrupt your opponent while they're making a mistake. I have to hope that they're playing 40 chess because I thought they had a couple opportunities to dunk on that guy and didn't do it. No, yeah, I, I can't imagine I agree that the that. jury saw that 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 no the 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 comment about no the guns don't have a handedness. Sorry, um, if I can spit it out, um, you know, I think that comment. I I can't imagine that that comment played well with with the jury when they actually just saw for themselves an example. Of of why that particular gun would not work well in the opposite hand. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're like going to inject a just... casing into your face, you know it's <laughs> it's probably yeah. a relevant thing, right? <laughs> yeah, right. it. Uh, it well, you know, maybe. Cause, cause, I mean, only if you it. don't want casings in your face. I, I mean, knew that. I knew that. that was coming. I knew it literally. <laughs> well, at least you didn't point it at the jury. <laughs> it's it's not just a matter. I know though. that's the <laughs> other thing is when Binger frigging pointed the gun at the jury. That was the first time. That, so Baldwin, when my Baldwin, Baldwin, yeah, right. <laughs> well, when I was when I was um my my one L summer, I interned at the um public defender's office. And I remember the very first trial that I got to observe, that was like one of the biggest benefits there was getting to observe trial. First one I did, I saw in closing argument, the uh, the uh, the defense counsel, he 
pretended to have like a like a bow and arrow in his hand and he was trying to illustrate i think some kind of a, <laughs> attempted attempted homicide or something and so he's like pretending to 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 draw back the bow and arrow but he's pointing it directly at the jury as he's doing it <laughs> and all of us were just kind of sitting there like why are you threatening the jury and then i think he ended up just completely bombing and and totally lost that case but i, I don't know i mean i wonder i wonder if maybe like in the moment Dinger was just like, yeah, this is a fantastic idea. I want them to feel the, threatened the way that that they thought maybe Groskowitz was, felt threatened or or Rosenbaum felt threatened or something. But, but that's, yeah. that's the ultimate Hail Mary. If that was the strategy, that is the ultimate Hail Mary. Like, let me scare the bejesus out of the jury to get them to to go along with me. That's a real that's, that's um, a real risky venture there. So we have some conflicting reporting going on earlier uh it was it was mentioned that the jury had requested uh 11 additional copies of the uh, jury instructions which are 37 36 37 pages right there's some conflicting reporting coming from a fox news uh, multimedia reporter named giovanni uh leggi l-i-e-g-g-i i don't know how to pronounce it sorry i'm not that italian um but uh he says they only asked for 11 uh, the 11 additional copies of only pages one to six of the jury instructions which he asserts are the pages that lay out the self-defense privilege now um i'm uh someone uh mr ken jennings kiwi farms ken jennings has suggested that he has the pdf copies uh, of it and so i've asked him to send them to me so we can take a look at the pages one to six but if that's the case that would be I don't know if that's the reason stated, but if that's the case that they're only looking at self-defense, that makes a pretty interesting sort of I mean, uh, honestly, twist to I that. I think that could go either way because that that ultimately is the heart of the case, right? Or, well, I mean, maybe that is a good thing because because maybe they did hear what Richards was saying in his closing argument that he said, at the end of the day, this is about self-defense. That's what you need to be deciding. And if there is self-defense, then, then you need to acquit on, on, you know, on all of these charges in, in each instance, if there's self-defense, but I don't know, but, but then again, they could be deciding that there wasn't. Hey, I'm going to, yeah. I, I don't want to uh, take the spotlight away from, from all these uh, brilliant minds. So I'm going to, I don't want to hang out too long, but I, I wanted to maybe not now, but down the road, I thought there are two things I wanted to get your guys' opinions on and then I'll dip. But one was um, I felt like in their closing, um, in the defense's closing, I felt like they didn't do a great job being very clear that they wanted a acquittal or not guilty verdict. I think they kept using, I thought the words they were using, I forget what the exact word they were using. Um, it was kind of like when they were talking about red herrings on the pro prosecution side. Is there a reason that they didn't just say, look, hey, if you believe, they didn't come right out and say, if you believe that this was self-defense, then you must acquit. Is there a reason they didn't say that? And two, do you guys think there? I actually don't think there'll be jury will come back today. Do you guys think that that'll happen? No. I want them to desperately, but I don't know if it will. I, I think it's it'll be by tomorrow, or they're going to be hung. That's my thought. The, you're, you're um, Jeremy. I, you're right on that. The, I question the the privilege. They kept using the word the privilege of self defense, which kind of bothered me in a way, because. A privilege means something is given to you or bestowed upon you. And I would almost think that you'd want to push it as a right. Like I have, I have a, a right to defend my life versus I, I, a privilege. I and think I think the weird. reason I think the reason why they did that though was because they were speaking to specific terms that are in the jury instructions. Um, because by you're you're able to then then get the jury to connect what they're saying in in their closing to the actual jury instructions because because Privilege is a word that comes up there. Right. I, I understand. Yeah. I'm just I'm just trying to think as a just a person who doesn't think legally going. Yeah. Privilege. So, I mean, they maybe should have explained what what a legal privilege, what what privilege means in this case. Privilege does not mean that they have the opportunity to it. Uh, they, they probably should have said on their clothes. Privilege means that when they are acting in self-defense, in good faith, then they are protected from prosecution by that privilege. That is what the privilege means. Mm. It is, in a sense, enacting a right to self-defense so long as they meet the required criteria. Maybe, but I, I don't know that getting into the weeds too much on it would be super helpful. 
but I, I think they are mirroring the jury instruction. I mean, I think that's oh, sure. the language yeah. that they use and that's probably why they're doing it. Yeah. Cause at the end of the day, those are the, those are the, the words that they're going to take with them into the, the jury deliberation and they, they need to be able to apply that to something. Yeah. So and it's, think- it's, it's a real shame that the, the social, social media has co-opted the use of the word privilege from us brilliant legal scholars. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, oh, well, man. they they would ascribe it to Kyle right now. Of course, he has that yeah. privilege. Yeah, they want to yeah. use that word privilege quite a lot. <laughs> See, he is privileged. So, we said so the whole time. Okay, so <laughs> let me um let me pull this up because this I think is instructive on what they what they asked for. If it's correct that they're only asking for the first six pages, uh, and and of course they could be asking for the first six pages. Uh, now and then asking for other pages later but here we go so this is the jury instructions the final copy that was filed just uh, yesterday cool and um, it starts off with the opening instructions information is not evidence here's the charges and then the first thing privilege of Mm -hmm. self-defense is right here on page two and goes to three no duty retreat provocation and then here are intent here's the intent four, five, uh, and, and it goes into part one, six. Didn't the judge, or wasn't the instruction though, that you find on the first one before you go any further? If you uh, find, before you go, you agree? kind of, kind of uh, on the lesser included is what he was saying. The okay. first, but, uh, but the first count doesn't have any lesser included, but this, and I'll, I'll puff myself here. This speaks to my theory that, uh, of the case entirely is that everything hinges on the shooting of Joseph Rosenbaum. Mm -hmm. I think Mm -hmm. if that is justified, then every other action that Kyle does is justified at that point, because at that point he is under threat and he is trying to then get away. And, and I think the jury is going to be in that mindset. If he, if he's not justified in shooting Rosenbaum, I think he loses everywhere, but I think the jury might have to have questions about the remaining counts. Like, did he become justified? I think they come to know as the answer if they come to know on the first one. But I think that first one is just the most critical aspect of the case. I think Richards covered that too, because he said scene one, scene two. He tied it in like this is the one film, the one incident, the one movie or one show. So it's all this show. So whatever what, happened what, there initiated yeah, the rest. I, th- I think you're making a good point, Eric. And I, I think that he actually made a mistake on, on, on that element in that he said if if Kyle sticks around there in that case he's gonna scene two happens at the, the at the car lot there and I wouldn't have phrased it that way I said if Kyle sticks around there to treat Rosenbaum he's dead he would not have mm-hmm. survived that in order to just remind the jury as to the extent of the grave threat that he was facing in that in that given moment rather than just saying well okay he would have ended up killing huber at the station no i don't think that happens i think if he stays there he's dead or either he's dead or a lot more people are dead so yeah or both I, he and they got to that a little bit with uh if he would have taken his gun he would have shot someone else and and again he i think this is a crit, a fair criticism is he kept saying that he might he would have shot someone else more people would be dead that night etc 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 instead of he would have shot kyle rittenhouse and then shot other people. He would have gone on. This this is a man who was trying to enact violence the entire time. And remember that this is part of the theory of their case. Uh, and I think was even brought up on opening. That he was trying to steal the gun. Because he couldn't get one. Joseph Rosenbaum mm-hmm. was prevented from owning a gun. So he had to steal a gun. And Binger took big exception to that. Saying there was you know, no evidence of it. But. Other than the lying in wait and the ambush and the trying to grab the one guy, he didn't do it with others. He had an incident, and and Richard's kind of went over a little at the other place. There were more than one, uh, there were more than one individual with an AR-15, and he couldn't do it. But Kyle was by himself, so he was separated from the herd. Rosenbaum ambushed him, and that does fit that theory of the case. But it, I don't think he really drew it out well. Um, one of the things going around on Twitter to my to my uh, lawyer people, not not to exclude you, Eric. Oh, my gosh, yeah, that not? was rude. Uh, but to the lawyer people, <laughs> people are asking <laughs> if, if Binger committed uh, 18 different criminal acts yesterday, 
in trial when he pointed a gun with his finger on the trigger mm. at 18 members of the jury. Um, Mr. Me. I mean, that could be argued as provocation, can it not? Uh, I'd be pissed but if you pointed a weapon. Not just me. provocation, it's it's <laughs> specifically a criminal act to yeah. uh, unsafely handle a firearm in a way that puts others in danger. Now, we'd Someone have to analyze up, it. I, th I don't remember if it was Runkle who pulled it up or someone pulled it up and said that actually in, in Wisconsin, that is a crime and there's no, and you need to rely on self-defense. So it technically was a crime. And like all the crimes that were being committed before Kyle was engaged in, you can expect it's just as likely that that crime will be prosecuted. <laughs> so I just wish somebody jumped out of the jury box onto Binger and took him down. That would have been funny. <laughs> That would have been grounds for a mistrial. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it would be justified. Yeah. <laughs> it would be self-defense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, <clears throat> oh excuse me. Um, yeah, but I, I mean, I think, uh, I, I think one of the, the state qualification, first of all, you got to realize that it'd be his office prosecuting him, which they're never going to do. Um, second of all, the, the, the qualification of the defense argument for that would be this, this gun was checked. It was completely unloaded. Uh, it was not only was it unloaded, there's no ammo sufficient for that uh, weapon in the courtroom at all. Um, that would be the arguments that they would make. We saw how well that worked for Alec Baldwin in not shooting someone, but um, exactly, you know, that would be the thing. <laughs> I, I do think that the, the law in Wisconsin requires endangerment as an element. Um, and if, if that's the case, the jury didn't seem to be in any danger other than apprehension. But they Did may anyone have... duck. I'm I'm curious. I, I don't know. I, they I, may I, have I civil. The jury. We can't like, see the jury. Civil court. Court. I don't know. If I'd be kind of a little like. <laughs> that's a that, that's that a would civil. Be, it's a civil. That would assault. be kind of funny. That would be it's kind a, of funny if if afterwards if, if they if they acquitted Kyle and then afterwards there's a lawsuit filed against Binger. <laughs> eighteen counts. Eighteen counts of civil assault, common law assault. Uh, that'd be beautiful. I, that would make my day. <laughs> the, the the state's attorney's office would basically have to settle that out. I mean, mm -hmm. they they'd argue a litigation privilege, I guess, but I don't think litigation privilege would ever extend to a a physical threat against a juror by the state. That doesn't seem fair. <laughs> you get toward immunity from it, or would yeah. he would he have qualified immunity? I don't, I don't see Do why. you really think he's qualified? I don't think he's qualified to handle he was, the weapon. If you saw the way he held, handled it, yeah, <laughs> it should be a strict liability. It really should be strict liability. But that'd be that'd be funny. Um, Catherine H says, uh, "Did we cover this? What do you think Backdoor Binger and Big Boy's reaction will be if Kyle's found not guilty of all charges? Will they have a public meltdown to argue with the jurors and the yeah, judge?" Yeah, we went over that. Probably. Yes, we did, and I think the consensus is yes. I I think he would go on a media Prowse tour. Would. I I think <laughs> well. I don't think they'd put Kraus on TV, but I think they'd put Binger on TV. And, uh, yeah, and, and, and he would just have his shoulder right over Groskowitz and say like, yeah, we did everything properly. We, uh, we're co-writing we, we... a book. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> How two lovers found themselves through the court system would be the book. I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't implying that. <laughs> I was. I, was in, I think that's the best title they could come up with. <laughs> that would book would sell millions. <laughs> I dropped a Babylon B um story in the um private chat if you want to take a look. Oh, you can can you I've or got actually, the court feed. I've got the court feed shared. So if you Oh, wanna, oh, oh uh, no, I get it. I get it. Okay. Yeah, if you share it, then I don't have to redo it every time. Kylos Rex says, uh he doesn't have a motive. No why. He's not lying. Members of the jury. The prosecution's not going to get Kyle today. No, because I'm going to get the prosecutor. Your Honor, my opposing <laughs> counsel, Mr. Binger, should go right to F-word jail. The son <laughs> of a bitch is guilty. <laughs> uh, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> the ba How is the Babylon B the funniest publication uh, that's out there right now that does that does any of this type of content? Like the Onion used to be funny, and they stopped. they're not woke. They just do humor, and it's funny. They just put it up there. I mean, good lord, oh, that's, that's that is beautiful. a pretty inspired article there. 
is pretty good. <coughs> oh goodness. Uh, Richard Sparks says, uh, as Tucker Carlson, which I can't do a Tucker, uh, voice, but he said what the Rittenhouse trial taught us. Tucker's video from last night talks about the stream takedowns yesterday. Yes, he did. He did. He didn't mention the stream by name. Except uh, he but definitely he, got his facts wrong because he said only hundreds of people were watching. I'm trying. I was trying to decide if seventy-seven thousand <laughs> nice. people qu qualifies as hundreds or if it necessitates. <laughs> I mean, it's hundreds thousand. and hundreds and hundreds. Maybe hundreds. you thought it was my Friday <laughs> streams with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I corrected him when I, when, I, when I tweeted it out there, but I think I think that uh, those of you who joined late here, I think that Nick got a makeup from 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 media at large. With the uh, can I, I'm going to read an article to you here that I stumbled on. Oh which... come on! Let's do it. Let's <laughs> which, do it. Are we uh, going to embarrass Nick? Let's do it. You stumbled <laughs> on it. You mean you found it when I mentioned it on stream? Google owned YouTube censored, then reinstated independent streams of the public trial of Kyle Rittenhouse, including the popular Ricada Law Channel stream over what Ricada Media says was a quote BS copyright claim. Live footage of the trial is publicly available and cannot be copyrighted. It appears that YouTube quickly reinstated Ricada's law stream, but not before it interrupted the experience of roughly 40,000 viewers who had been viewing it. Quote, we're back up. More I wonder that. if they interviewed you. Did they it was 70,000 then. We lost well, we 40,000. Lo that's what they're saying. We lost. No, we, oh, we're okay. back up. YouTube dropped us by 40,000 by 40, yeah. viewers over a BS copyright claim because they're literally paid for by the media, said the official Twitter account of Raketa Media in a statement. Quote, there is no cop copyright issue here. YouTube is just shutting down independent creators. And then they conclude a quote from, uh, from Jeff uh, uh, they, that you were re quote tweeting. Jack Posovic, Raketa Law is one of the most popular legal channels on YouTube. I guess you are. You are one of the most popular legal channels on YouTube with over 260,000 subscribers. You got to be by three at 300 now, right? You, I mean, I'm uh, close. Yeah. But here, look at this. Here, here's the thing with view counts in general. So yeah. we, we have 63,000 live viewers, which is amazing. Oh, the, poll, the poll I put up at the beginning of the stream has a hundred and eight thousand five hundred and fifty one votes. So mm, uh, coming in and out. Yeah, unique viewers go is is way way vastly different than than what happens. So I'm not finished. I'm not oh. finished. <laughs> Raketa has called out the media for lying about the Rittenhouse case and anticipated that the prosecution's attempt to charge the teenager with unlawful possession of firearm would fail, as it did when the judge dismissed the charge earlier today. In a video ahead of the trial, Raketa slammed the media for referring to the rioters who attempted to assault Rittenhouse as, quote, protesters and, quote, marchers. Quote, these were not protesters and marchers. These were assailants. All three of the people that Kyle Rittenhouse shot were in the process of assaulting him, said Raketa in the video. Quote, the question isn't even about whether or not they were assaulting him. The question is whether the assaults and the response would justify under Wisconsin law. Breitbart News has reached out to Google for comment. They don't say if they, re they reached out to you for comments. So that's what I wanted to know. Did they, they talk did to you directly? It, they did not. They may have called me. Uh, I don't know. You were just um, too busy with the chat. Where's Where's Breitbart <laughs> located? Well, it's Andrew Breitbart's organization, so California, right? Because L.A. Uh, Ben Shapiro was uh, editor at well, he large. Moved to Tennessee. And, well, the no, that's I Daily asked, Wire. Yeah. I was talking about Breitbart. I was watching TV with my wife uh, last night uh, before bed. It was about midnight and my phone rang and there was a phone call from Washington state. I mm. think it was. And so I, I didn't answer cause I was like, oh, I'm midnight. I'm not answering a damn phone call, <laughs> but, uh, but like, <laughs> so, um, so I, they could have potentially reached out then. They but, didn't uh, leave a message. No, like, no one left like a that, message. That, that would warrant leaving a message. Yeah, that usually helps. Or or text first and say, hey, this is blah, 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 blah. Can I call? That's always a handy thing. Uh, folks, I got to go back to my day job. I'm oh, not a don't leave. lawyer. Give, give me just a second. Just a second. Guys, yes, sir. this man, Eric Hunley, operates a fantastic YouTube wow. channel. 
an absolutely yeah. fantastic YouTube channel. He brings in two, uh, two, he, two, right? Like two, yeah. but I'm talking about the main one for now. He brings in uh, a diversity of opinions and personalities to host excellent panels. He talks about subjects that you can't find anywhere else. And he does so either intelligently or with intelligent company, whichever one seems to fit the operation <laughs> guys, it's content. Uh, you know, we all talk about legal stuff, Eric, talks about legal stuff he brings on lawyers he talks about media stuff he brings on media people he covers all sorts of subjects that are fascinating carol baskin carol baskin this guy interviewed he, carol baskin you not need to go only back that and watch that interview because yeah because the Nick best super chats, super chats ever given during the interview and make you cry laughing that that for for eric to read out asking carol baskin certain questions that were pressing <laughs> and and that were that that questions Nick that felt, we're all thinking maybe we, look Nick wanted answers for and look, yeah maybe we needed to know if the bones came out in the tiger's poop or whatever i, I can't even remember but uh go no, check out said, eric hunley when my He's husband linked. was missing i think what happened was she said when my husband went missing and nick nick super chatted went missing where'd you are you still looking for him maybe check inside the tiger <laughs> oh yeah that's what it was. <laughs> But uh, since, yeah, I lost my, my, since I lost my husband, did you check inside the tiger? I, I might have been cursing at Nick a little bit under my breath <laughs> as I was trying to keep her on the episode and keep her talking about Don Lewis all the time. And miraculously, she did. But, well, my yeah. favorite part was I know she read that chat. Like you could see her see it, micro react for a second, and then go back. And it was and like her phone kept ringing, Nick. Did you notice her. her phone kept ringing? got her <laughs> somebody saying shut up anyways anyway. guys eric Thank uh you. and and all of the panelists well except i don't have the quartering in here yet i guess i have to link that little tiny channel um <laughs> little baby I channel forgot, <laughs> i forgot to shill at jeremy that he needs to add me on twitter and that's never gonna happen it's never gonna happen uh but know. uh <laughs> eric eric's channel <laughs> quartering everybody's down in the description now um, just click on their name. It'll take you to their YouTube page and check it out. Eric, thanks so much for coming you, on, man. Sir. Ciao, Eric. See you, Eric. All, All right. right. Now, now it's only lawyers here again. Okay. Okay. We're now let's tainted. stop. Let's get back we're, into we're the real talk. We're not tainted by natural, real, wholesome people, and it's just <laughs> us slobs. Now so. that there's no one for us to make feel awkward, let's stop talking about the law. Right? Let's, <laughs> let's do that. Uh, with that, I've got 2% right, says, just wanted to pimp while we wait. The upcoming sci-fi con in Lebanon, Tennessee, Confinement 3.0, weekend of February 25th, small, chill, casual convention with authors like Michael Z. Williamson and Stephanie Osborne, confinementcon.org. No mask, no vax, no problem. Uh, so there you go. If you're into sci-fi and want to go to Lebanon, Tennessee, uh, which is better than the actual Lebanon, from what I hear infinitely um, <laughs> uh that uh that is that is confinement con um the dragon's treasure says speaking of small businesses i'm closing in on making ten thousand dollars in a month a major wow. milestone for me i couldn't even make that in my first two years help me break this barrier coupon code is four doors more whores nice um if you if you like loose leaf tea, which I I very much do, and he has great ones, ton, like a ton of variety, legitimately. The uh, dragonstreasure.com, uh, which is a haven for tea and anime lovers, and, but don't don't hold that against him. I was thing. I was so excited to buy it last week, or I think it, I think it was last week. I don't know. I can't tell time anymore after this case. <laughs> but uh, recently on one of these streams, I was like so excited to buy. It, I totally forgot to put in the uh, the 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 promo code. <laughs> oh well but uh, but uh, but no he, he had to, he had a really good selection on there it was like uh i think what what did i get i got some kind of like christmas flavored one um because that's typical me and then uh oh and then the the, the one that was like on the on the front page the everything changed when the fire nation attacked oh okay uh, i don't know which one that is uh, all i will say is elixir of the gods is really really good it's really good so uh, that's my personal endorsement nice. of the nice. week on on that uh, on Dragon's Treasure Tea is Elixir of the Gods. I could drink that <laughs> stuff like water. But uh, 
next we've got john wells says i'd have a phone call go back to the youtube app and it would completely reset ev anything or everything then had to find you in history yeah the uh did we showed up on kids tube actually at some That's point weird. yesterday what is That's... how did we show up on kids tube or YouTube kids, I should say. But yeah, uh, I don't know because all of my, all of my um, streams have the same thing. No, it's not made for children, but no, do not restrict it to people under 18. Cause right. if you do that, I mean, you, you kill everything, but yeah. if it's not made for children, it does, it's not supposed to go to uh, YouTube kids. Um, so that uh, I don't know why that uh, happened. I have Ooh. no idea. Because what were they I, what were they sharing on on they weren't mirroring your stream what were they doing with it no it was the stream showed up in the youtube like the youtube kids thing and then the recommendations oh, really? oh, you're that saying, followed oh, were funny. kids shows <laughs> it, was, it was very odd it was very uh, odd so i hope some kid got strange. a legal education yesterday uh <laughs> that that would be good um speaking of kids content um do you, I was a little bit surprised that they didn't you put up, put up more more graphic imagery in the closing. The, I was too. The prosecution. Yeah, I, I thought, thought they was... were going to go go over all of those autopsy photos. I I was ready for it, and it didn't yeah. happen. Yeah, we. I, this is a good opportunity for us to talk about strategy and and different moments, like legal strategy, which it's not even about. I'm not even talking about the whole thing about you know the flaws of objection, but just as far as like approach to handling different elements of the case or things like you just brought up like the strategy of of throwing things out there i, I think is really interesting you know mm -hmm. yesterday we actually saw a debate on our panel here that i noticed and it's sort of i don't and it never got called attention to where when they were talking about referring to whether it was better to attack finger individually whereas mm -hmm. which i think is what viva was saying that it's good to go after Binger directly, whereas uh, Emily, Emily Baker was it should be the state. Yeah, Emily Baker said make it about the state and the government. And I actually was rolling that around in my brain: which is better to go after Binger directly or this or reference the state, the dark state? And I wanted to get your thoughts on that before I tell you which of you were right and which of you were wrong. So, <laughs> um, I. I will happily do so, but let me first say people are asking if it's if it's good or bad that this is taking so long. I, I say it's completely neutral at this point. This is a complicated case with five different counts, and and several of those have sub counts. So we're we're not talking about an easy twenty minute decision unless everybody walked into that jury room and just said not guilty to everything. Um, you're going to have some debate and uh, welcome to the show mr matt wilson hey matt how are you doing welcome today matt. it's lawyer it's at lawyer matt on twitter that's yes. correct i'm yes. having a little bit of an issue with my earbuds right now for whatever reason it is not picking up uh that happened to me the other day don't you hate it when uh, that happens yeah. are they are they communist earbuds i mean is that possibly <laughs> the problem it, it could be i hope y'all aren't hearing I mean, any reverb if they are i'll jump off they all come from no. China, don't they? <laughs> you, uh, you sound good, actually. So it, uh, on our end, I think we're we're okay. Okay, um, good, good. I mean, you're you're echoey, but that I think is the room you're in more than anything. You're not echoing us. You're ec you're just you sound echoey. You should get a whole bunch of foam and put it around everything you own, just <laughs> for ignore, when you show ignore up him. Here. You sound or very, very alluring. Put it over you, you sound <laughs> very, Thank very you, alluring. Baby. Okay. Uh, to Joe Joe's question, uh, Matt, did you get a chance to watch the closing arguments? I watched some of it yesterday, not an awful lot. And the reason I didn't was because I was working on a big case that if I told you about it, you might get demonetized by Google. So I'll... yes, yes, <laughs> it's, it's a it's a fascinating case. And I wish you a ton of luck. Uh, we've seen some good results from some courts on those types of cases in the past couple of days. Oh, this, gotcha. is, uh, this is about various medicines, I assume. Uh, yes, yes, it is. And various mm -hmm. orders. Because and maybe the forced was... application of them. I exactly. wish upon you God's blessing in doing in doing the Lord's work. So, so. Uh, but the the question that uh, that Joe is proposing is in in closing arguments uh, they went after uh, Binger the the state's attorney Binger on credibility issues and stuff like that. But the question is, was it wise to go after 
Binger personally, or should that have been uh, a, a an approach of going after the state itself uh, rather than Binger uh, as an individual? Um, so, well, I my my thought on that is when when you are fighting for the life of a seventeen year old boy, I mean, you don't want to leave anything on the table, and let's face it. The, the defense left an awful lot on the table when they didn't object to stuff. I mean, you know, if you're going to keep the attention of the jury, sometimes saying stuff like that works. Now, I think a lot of it was to try to rile um, uh, Binger up because the the gang knows that if he gets riled up, he's going to take it personally. And then when he takes it personally, he's going to say something really stupid like, you know, you shouldn't, um, well, of course it wasn't Binger who said this, but the, uh, was it Krause? Is that the name of the other DA? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, when he said that stupid line about he should have just, he was a coward for not putting up his fists and fighting. I'm mm -hmm. thinking, I'm sorry. I, I, look, I'm not the lightest fella in the world. I have a little bit of a weight problem. I'm not in good shape, but Krause probably has never gotten in a fist fight in his life. So he probably don't need to be talking. Uh, he might have been in fist fights, but they probably were one sided. Man, probably so. one sided. That's that's usually how it was with me. But <laughs> the point is, you know, he, it, that just shows the level of naivety. Um, if if a raging mob is coming after you, you're going to defend yourself, and you're going to use the best methods that you have to defend yourself. And mm -hmm. apparently, the district attorney is is not mindful of that. But I think riling them up was they had nothing to lose. But no, uh, the question, the que the real question here is: I think we're all on, on the same page as far as the strategy of going after the, mm -hmm. them, um, after the tactics of, of being so dark and shady, and nefarious, and constantly yeah. shifting to whatever they can try and fit a, a claim against them. But the question really is: is it strategic? Do you think it's strategically better? for them to attack Binger as a person for the way he conducted this case or to attack the state at large, the government at large, and make that your focus in order to say, yeah, this is your classic evil government doing what evil governments do and make it less about Binger on an individual basis. That's in, really- in, in general, I would defer to trying to just go after the state but I think under these, in this case, Binger's behavior was so out of line, I think I think it needed to be called out because, and this is the thing that, that I would have been reluctant to do that down here because I know my judges would have put me in my place. I was very surprised that the judge says, oh, it's just argument. Let him go on. And yeah. um, I mean, just let, let the boys fight. And so he got away with it. And since he got away with it, I think that was a, it was a, you think a strategically it's better. To I think it was strategically name. better in this case, since he got away mm -hmm. with it now. I'm speaking with hindsight because, like I said, if the judge had slapped him on that objection or slapped him for that behavior, it would have certainly backfired. It's kind of like, you know, when it's fourth and 10 in football and you decide to go for it and you actually make it a 12 yard run, you know, you look at it and think, hey, that's a great job. But then, you know, if you had missed it, well, you'd be firing the coach. So, but I, in uh, retrospect, I think it was a good idea. I need to step away for just a few minutes. I'll be right back. Though. All right. So, Legal bites. What are your thoughts on this? I think I'm 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 thinking that part of it might also have to do with the demographics that we're talking to because if you have if you have jurors on on the jury panel that are they they tend to be you know government friendly they have no no real reason to to dislike the government that they mm -hmm. might be like mm, really the whole everybody the whole state yeah. the whole government yeah. everybody's doing that. You know, um, but I, I I see this guy right here. That's a that's a total slime ball. But I don't know that 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 looks like it's everybody in the government is is uh, is, is playing this narrative. But you know, on the other hand, you know there there are plenty of other people that are very distrustful of big government, um, very distrustful of the state in general. Um, and so maybe that would that would play play well for them better than turning it into what could look like a, a, a personal attack that like this is this is now turning into, you know, these two lawyers hate each other and are going out for each other when that's not what this case is about. Like there's there's always a, a risk of that. So I don't know. I mean, I, I do agree. I think that in this particular case, I think I think Binger and Krauss ran this really too dirty um, to 
to to really let them let them slip by. And I think that that this was probably a proper case where like they, they ran it dirty enough that I think it probably warranted calling them out as individual attorneys. Uh, so I actually I agree with both of you. And I'll explain to you. I want to give you my perspective as to why calling out Binger individually was was uniquely important here. And it touches on what you were just saying now. You need to put yourself in the mindset or the responsibility of Richards is to put himself in the mindset of the last couple of jurors who have not been sold by all the video evidence and all the forensic evidence which shows that it was justifiable self-defense under the law. You're trying to approach the mindset of someone who came in here with a pretty strong leaning against Kyle thinking he didn't, he didn't belong on the streets there. This is not someone who's going to be a based conservative. It's going to be someone who's at least leaning left. And, and someone today, in today's culture, who's leaning left, they have very strong worship of big state government. That's, that's what they're hearing on the left is how government is protecting us. They're saving us from, from the pandemic. They're, you know, everything, they're, there's a very strong mental, mentality that's pro-government from the left today. So if you're trying to appeal to someone who is on the left and you just start implying like, oh, yeah, it's like there's another case of big government trying to trample over the little guy. That is not an argument that's going to fall on deaf ears to someone who's anywhere left of center. And that's why if you make it personal, and you don't make it like, oh, you're not you're not going to be viewed as a conspiracy theorist that government is bad, which is what the left will look at. Look at look, look at you. But you just say, no. This particular DA's office, they're really corrupt in the way they handled this particular situation with Kyle Rittenhouse. And here's how, and here's where you see it, and here's the different things, steps that they took. And this way, I think attacking the government in that scenario, I think, I think it, you're not hitting your target audience. Your target audience is the people who are not yet convinced, as opposed to people who are already convinced. And your target audience is likely <clears throat> to favor government, and that's why I think making it personal on Binger is a more powerful way to approach it. You know, another Although, thought, just, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, well, no, go ahead. Well, the thought I had, that I had a thought too, mind, so. <laughs> well, I had a thought that just crossed my mind yeah. even as we were talking. Mm -hmm. And that is, imagine for just a moment that you are on this jury, regardless of your political persuasions, regardless of this, that, or the other, okay? Most people don't want to be on a jury. And they sure don't want to be on the jury of the, of the one case that is being viewed all over the world right now. And, and because they don't want that pressure, they don't want that stress. And it's a lot easier psychologically to blame the kid for even just showing up in the first place with his gun, because if the kid had just stayed home that night, they wouldn't be there. Okay. Mm -hmm. So from their standpoint, they probably from, from Rittenhouse's standpoint, even though he is presumed innocent, even though he is, you know, under the law and the jury is supposed to have this clean slate, they, they, they're bound to have a bias against him just because of the fact that if it weren't for what he did, they wouldn't be wasting, you know, 12 days in trial and not being able to watch anything they want on television and having to deal with this stress and having to deal with their mouths being shut and all that kind of stuff. And so they and go the in stress, there with and, this and, bias against and, Rittenhouse. And, and so if you're going to counter that bias against Rittenhouse, you got to create another bad guy. And the other bad guy is Binger. And it's, it's not just I think those stresses you mentioned are important. But even further stress is the stress that they're, they're, they themselves and their families can be put under public pressure and be doxxed, be punished, be canceled, that if they come out with a decision here, they're put into this box now where they either throw this kid in jail. And this is a, it's a tough spot for someone that you either put this kid in jail or you know that, hey, my name might come out there as being one of the people who acquitted Kyle Rittenhouse. And that's something that I, there could be some crazies out there who are going to be really angry about that. And exactly. that's a stress. Who needs that stress in their life? That's a stress that none of us have ever dealt with. I do. Well, I do. well, Kyle can tell you the best the place to buy an AR for self-protection. He's got it down. He can take you to the store. He can help you out with their purchasing needs. He is 18 now. Actually, so he actually, no, he, he does not know. He does. He only knows one place to buy ARs. They specifically asked him if he knew any other place possible. And he's like, no, I don't. I also don't <laughs> understand the point of that question. If he did know other places to buy ARs, why does it matter either way? They're, right. How they're trying that to prove or just some, of anything. Some weird theory on he selected this yeah. evil gun, which is I like. Went, I went to the gun show and I saw a row of, row of ARs. And I picked out this one because I thought it was the best for hunting commies. 
I was expecting him to go, did you know that this is the same model of rifle used by the San Bernardino murderers? You know, like some, <laughs> you knew that, that didn't you? That's the reason why you got it? <laughs> didn't you? Um, I've got a purported criminal history of Jump Kick Man. Ooh. Well, that would, uh, do we have a name? We have is. a name on Jump Kick Man? Um, according to the Dan O'Donnell show, uh, they, they have, let's see. Uh, Jump Kick Man da, 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 has never been identified until now. And this is today. Mm -hmm. This is today. The Dan O'Donnell Show can now e report exclusively that Jump Kick Man is a 40-year-old black male from Kenosha with an extensive criminal record who was at the time of the Rittenhouse shootings on probation following a conviction for domestic violence battery. So all the investigations in the world couldn't figure out who this is, but this guy, they figured it out. They have not. Uh, what a corrupt him. state. What a corrupt they DA's office. They definitely knew who Jump Kick Man was, and they didn't want him on the stand. What they a have corrupt, not, uh, evil government we have. Or at least they have there a, locally in Wisconsin. That now this is an interesting point. What about, I mean, I wonder what Brady evidence is not being hmm. disclosed or hasn't been disclosed. I mean. Oh, tons. I mean, how many, how many conversations has Binger's office had with potential, with witnesses that are not disclosed? Right. Like because they're in the course of like their criminal charges, like what what conversations did Binger's office have with Zeminski's, for example, uh, were those disclosed to the uh, to the defense? Um, you know, Kelly Zeminski's uh, case was was pled out or whatever. But uh, do we do we have the do we have any record of those conversations regarding plea deals? Like uh, did any of those occur? Uh, outside of of her presence, so that they're not, you know, I, I don't know. I'm I'm just curious, what uh, what what is not being shared? Yes, the Brady evidence. Thank you. I am so, <laughs> I'm so angry about this. There is no way that this that this information wasn't in the hands of the DA's office months ago, probably within days after after the incident actually happened. And they, yeah. So and it, they so they don't name him in the article. But they do say that according to online court records, Jump Kick Man is a criminal record that dates back more than two decades with multiple felony convictions for car theft, ID theft, drug possession, escaping custody. Uh, da, 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 da. His earliest conviction listed in the Wisconsin Circuit Court Access Online Database is for felony escape, meaning that he had already been in custody or convicted of a crime in the, in the penal system. Blah, 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 blah. So I, I'll bet, I don't I'll know. Bet they know who Yellow Pants Man is. Also, I will bet they know all of these people. Of course they like. Uh, of course they have access, unless unless they're a chaos tourist, right? But uh, mm -hmm. but we all know that the only chaos tourists there that night were packing AR-15s. Of course, right? Like that. That's the only mm. people who are there chaos touriziming. Um, all of the testimony about any of the rioters being from out of state a came from a friendly couple fires just tipping over a ported potty or two. Which no one was in. It's like, how do you burning know? down car dealerships? Because to the panel, I'll throw this out there. If you were in a porta potty that got tipped over in the middle of the ride, <laughs> would you jump out of it and tell everybody that you were in there? Or would you yeah, hide? I, was, I, I was assaulted by Joseph and I hate Rosenbaum. You for putting in my head. I, 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 <laughs> can we block Nick from his own stream? Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> That's an image I just didn't want to imagine there. Well, neither did the person who was in the porta potty that went. Yeah, that was over. true. That so would I be was pretty embarrassing. Um, I was assaulted by Joseph Rosenbaum. Yeah, I had I had drunk a lot that day, and uh, I was having issues with my uh, my stomach. And there was that porta potty there, and I got in there, and the next thing I know, it's rocking back and forth. <laughs> Okay, the, no, no, the long will, crime stream is mute, blowing up. I need up. a mute button for other participants in the channel. People are saying <laughs> the jury is back. Um, no, I, I, but uh oh, I'm they trying to confirm. <clears throat> if so, that's amazing. All right, what's the over under? <laughs> well, then you would be right on the over under, and I'd be off, but okay. Uh, I don't see that the jury's back. I've got the court TV feed <clears throat> and the law and crime feed up, and there's nothing happening currently. Uh, so if if they're bringing the jury into the courtroom to review video evidence, which is a possibility, then it we may not be able to see that uh, because it would risk unnecessarily risk exposing the jurors um, by camera. But but no, I uh, again, I I'm monitoring the feeds and uh, we do not <coughs> we do not see it. 
Court TV tweet has them back. Let's see. We'll have to follow. How many things do we have to follow? The law and crime feed is is going just garbage. Uh, checking Court TVs. McDonald's is going to offer the Egg McMuffin for 63 cents on Thursday. Can I order 100 of them and freeze them? They have breakfast forever. The most recent Court TV tweet was 20 minutes ago. Uh, lunch break for the jury? Okay, yeah. Why, why, wait, why do you get a lunch break in the deliberation room? Don't they just bring the food in? That's what they yeah. used to do. You to just bring the food in there. Uh, so anyway, well, in my day, they brought the food into the jury's division. This I is mean, in any day, you're where, in you, the where are you room. from? Where are you? What Just, century are you from? They got the go last and... one. Literally, the last <laughs> century is what century I'm from. Uh, yeah, <laughs> the so same had, one you are. <laughs> oh yeah, the same potbelly stove ovens they would cook up their lunch on, and every, they would then they would bring it in. I don't know where you're coming from. What? But That's... honestly, wait. So you're you're trying to tell me that the jury deliberation room? They're gonna have them leave the deliberation room to eat lunch? I, yeah, I think they have a lunch room. Are you allowed to deliberate to... during lunch in the lunch no, room, or is that just a deliberation room? There's no talk of written house during lunch. Oh my gosh, uh, absolutely insane. <clears throat> Um, I got to get okay. my 245 over. So, um, for my bet here with Nick. So, uh, yeah, uh, sorry. No way. If we're, if, oh, no, I, I actually fully <laughs> accept that they're in the lunchroom and not able to deliberate. So, we get to well, take an hour off of the time. Sucks for you, brother. <laughs> no, we get to take an hour off because that 245 question. can't include lunch. What's up, Matt? Hypothetical question um, Is the judge going to send them home? Let's say they deliver for, deliberate from multiple days. I mean, will the judge have to send them home, or will he sequester them and put them in a hotel room, or Ooh. whatnot? Or let, how late will they be staying in the courthouse before the judge says, "Okay, that's enough for the day. We're going to send you back." And does Wisconsin have a law on those in, in that regard? I know Tennessee had something a few years ago where you know you, a, a case got set aside because the jury was stuck you know in deliberations after seven or eight o'clock at night and i'm just wondering if there's anything comparable in wisconsin i have no idea um the judge has been reluctant to sequester them um in general but i i it's possible that he would he didn't sequester them last night after the after everything was done and he could have done that <coughs> so who knows who knows if uh if they will sequester them or not. Um, oh, I'd seriously doubt it. I, they're all going to be able to go home and surely not talk about it with anyone overnight. <laughs> yeah, Of course not. Yeah. Never. How's it going, honey? Yeah. Right. Oh, let me tell you about work today at the courthouse. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Some, uh, Noah Hastings says the jury already decided they just wanted that last free Asian food lunch. Oh, <laughs> oh. Uh... Rhonda Ernst. Oh, this is a great chat. It says, you just told a Midwest mom me to have your son take a beating like a man. If he dies, he dies. That is what he said. You lost any trust I may have given the prosecutors. That threw me over the edge yesterday. I, it was essentially over at that point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and that's, that's a real risky gambit to any of the parents, moms or dads, I think, on that panel who go... Because uh, like me, my oldest is 14 and, and so it's a little bit different, but I can't, I cannot fathom myself in three years going, you know what, son, go be an activist, please. Like, I don't want my kid at any, uh, at any political rally like this or whatever riot, let's call it what it is. I certainly don't want my kid at a riot at 17 years old. However, if my kid is happens to be at a riot. Maybe a riot comes to my town. I don't know. I certainly want him to be able to defend himself and not quote unquote, take a beating in the street from a, I've, this... I've watched enough video of people taking beatings at these riots uh, from, you know, seven or eight people soccer kicking someone in the face while they're down on the ground. And I go, that's, that's death potential in every hit. No, you can't just take a beating. This isn't a, this isn't a fight that a teacher is going to come break up in the high school, you know, over, over someone stealing lunch money. This is, I love, this I love having all of our man cards checked. You're not a real man. 
you know, you won't take off, you won't get out there and fight them hand to hand and, you know, take it like a man. I'm like, well, Jesus Christ. I mean, what happened to toxic masculinity as a concept? But Lord, here's, here's the thing. This is, this was such a massive screw up. And you know, that chat really point drilled it into my brain there that you just read off. And that is before yesterday, there was never any implication from the state that there was an admission on their part that Kyle would have faced any physical harm at all if he didn't fire. They waited because they, in theory, you could argue for all, any, all of us know, maybe he's lunging just for the gun to get the gun away, which is what they were implying the entire time. He's just trying to get the gun away from this dangerous guy who's waving it around or trying to take his gun, but not that he's going to physically harm Kyle at all. And they wait until closing arguments to basically admit that, that, that Kyle should have stood there and gotten the crap kicked out of him. And that's the first time the jury heard that. They never said that before. When they, if Binger did in his opening, where he's like, when he admits that he brought a gun to a fist fight, I wouldn't have framed it as a fist fight if I was the state. I would have said that he's just going for the gun. That's all he wants. He doesn't want to beat up Kyle. Kyle. We have no evidence, according to the state. I think the state's out of their mind, but he's like, they don't believe the threat to kill him, they're, or they're trying to get the jury to disbelieve that. Why would they admit that they would have been a fist fight at all? It was such a stupid, stupid error by the state. Thank God. But I think it was moronic for them to admit that if Kyle did not shoot, a fist fight would have ensued. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, the interesting thing about all of that is, <coughs> is this admission that there was a need for Kyle to defend himself, but he just went too far with the self-defense. Yep. Which, which I think is... I think that's a bridge that they should not have have built uh, personally, yep. because a jury may have said, you know, he could have just kept running. Uh, he, he, he didn't need to he didn't need to do anything in that scenario. He could have gotten away or he shouldn't have been there. But once you say, well, there comes a point when he should have put the gun down, put up his put up lefty and righty and gone to town uh, throwing bones on these people is is stu it's it's a pointless admission pointless admission and i hope they get hung on that actually that would be great if the jury comes out not only do we find him not guilty we find him not guilty because kraus is a moron that's what we <laughs> that's what we've determined we and, the uh, jury we find not guilty and kraus is an idiot let me let me yeah, ask y'all this question findings we didn't we, we were asked to find but yeah <laughs> we, 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 we branched in our own direction here let, let me ask y'all this question because this, is this just crossed my mind rooted. Sorry, go ahead. All right, you're, you're a juror who may be genuinely afraid that one day you're going to be doxxed or that your children are going to be retaliated against because of what you're going to vote on today. So you have an emotional vested interest in your own personal safety to, to do something to throw this kid under the bus just to protect yourself, okay? So, you know, I'm sure there may be some jurors in there who may be looking for anything to peg a conviction on so they can go home and, and sleep at night knowing that they don't have to worry about the angry mob with the pitchforks and the, and the uh, torches coming after them. Um, but at the same time, when you do hear stupid things like the, 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 the DA saying that he should have gone there and, and took it, took it on the chin, my goodness, if a DA down here in Mississippi said that he wouldn't get reelected. <laughs> Because... He might be he might be out there taking it on the chin right after, right? Like well, yeah. Uh, I mean... the judge might have word. The, you, I, I love those courtroom videos where the judge picks a fight with one of the lawyers. That's that's my favorite. I we need more of that happening. Like last um, week. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a question for the panel. All right. This is from 2A Self Defense Law. It says question case out of Alaska four years ago. There was reversible error in a self-defense murder case. In the closing argument, they kept saying he didn't deserve to die. Uh, and it says each state lawyer said once, I cannot find that case. Are any of you familiar uh, by chance with, with a case out of Alaska in general? And then more specifically, one where they had reversible error. Because uh, To Westlaw. Yeah. Because <laughs> that... That's pretty interesting because, yeah, both I think Binger and Krauss did say that uh, basically Rosenbaum didn't deserve to die. That'd be. Do you have to preserve that objection? 
Oh yeah, so. I mean he he said as much at, before. He says like if you didn't say it, you lose it. So, but I'll find yeah. the case for edification. Why not? How good is your Westlaw subscription? And we're gonna find out. <laughs> yeah. I do have the state law, uh, like all fifty states. So if you can't find it, let me know. <clears throat> but I'm I'm not familiar offhand with that case. But it sounds. I mean that's a phenomenal. Uh, case because why I, would I you think... have all 50 states? I don't understand why you would pay for a subscription like that. YouTube, because that's I, why I cover all 50 states. We need YouTube. to get a sponsorship from Westlaw. I'm not even kidding. I only Seriously. Westlaw or Lexus, one of you guys needs to sponsor us. I don't care. I will happily shill either one of you forever. You guys spend so much on marketing to the law students anyway. Just, just either one, please sponsor me. I'll show you forever about you just how great give us you the are law and how the other one sucks. Just give us the law student package. Yeah. Right. The law like what's package, which is the, all the things that would be package. great. Yeah. That'd be, that'd be uh, solid. yeah, I, I pay, I think six fifty a month for Westlaw. <laughs> it's insanity. Someone from That's Westlaw, why I don't, someone from Westlaw yeah. or Lexus Nexus is watching this stream. I guarantee you, please contact us about sponsorship opportunities. We'd love to show your products and anything else that you have. It'd be great. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've been able to get by with using case text instead because I, oh, I looked case, at the, at the case cost. Is garbage unless they want to sponsor me, but even still <laughs> <laughs> you're spending it's been useful enough. Uh, but I mean, but yeah, I mean, Hey, if, if Westlaw, wow. I, I love Westlaw. I, 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 that's what I used before I had to pay for it myself. <laughs> I, I, I myself use Lexus, but I only do the regional subscription for the <laughs> districts that I'm licensed in or have any bearing to. And it's uh, a little bit cheaper for me. But for the other states, I have, um, uh, because I'm a member of the Mississippi Bar, they have a program or sponsorship with some agents from group. I can't remember the name of it, where you can go on and you get 50 state, you know, free from them. So yeah, if it, I'm in a pinch, I go that way. But hmm. But yeah, to the, to the chat, six hundred fifty, not not six dollars and fifty cents. Yeah, people are asking. It's it's very expensive. It's it's insanely expensive. I remember when I was just looking to get in New York, and I, you know, as a solo practitioner, I was like, "That's pricey. That's really pricey." And especially, and in New York, at least, you know, we charge an, a billable rate, which is, you know, for you for you guys out in Minnesota to to, to bring in six fifty, I what you guys are charging. I don't know, you're two hundred bucks an hour out there. Mm -hmm. that is what you guys are charging right i mean that's a normal rate there in, in my in my town the the I, the highest rate i know of in my town is 250 an hour so yeah and and if you charge 250 an hour in, in new york city no one will hire you because they'll assume you're incompetent right that's how that's how this so that's what i'm saying is if the pricing that westlaw is attaching to minnesota i that's so prohibitive for at based on the on the billable hour rate that that you guys are charging in the midwest that's hey joe rate. that's crazy yeah Will you sponsor my admission into New York? Because I would love to bill six hundred dollars an hour for my time. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, uh, T. Uh, so T sent a chat says, "Hey Nick, I was trying to look up Rosenbaum on the Wisconsin sex offender registry, and he's not showing up. Would they have removed him for being deceased? Was he never there? Did they binger it up? One, I think they would remove him for being deceased. Um, I don't know if he was ever on the Wisconsin one. Uh, he probably should have been." But I don't know how long he was in Wisconsin or if he ever registered. But he's on either the federal or the Arizona one. His criminal acts uh, against minors were in Arizona. So that's uh, – you may have to check down there. But I, I know there's uh, there's a bunch of people who have, like, the screenshots um, of of his uh, criminal history. It's it's all been found. But – yeah. Yeah, but if he if he didn't register in Wisconsin, that's that's just one more thing they could have uh, gone after. <laughs> yeah, he should have asked his girlfriend. By the way, when you guys when you moved into that new place and Joseph Rosenbaum was with you, did you have to go door to door and inform your neighbors? <laughs> we were members of the Welcome Wagon. Yes. <laughs> oh man, um, what what else do we have? Uh, oh, here's the. Uh, Janto says it's Rossiter versus state 404 P third, uh, two twenty three. It's a court of appeals case law student subscription for the win. <laughs> Thank you. Nice. What's the last, uh, citation of that one twenty eight. It was, uh, yeah. 404 P third, uh, two twenty three. Okay. 
yep. is the case. But um, yes, uh, so I I am try. I do have I have you got the audience has been amazing. I have so many super chats to read. Also, I do have a bunch of them backlogged. And if I don't get to them on a stream, I will get to them in a recorded video uh, like ASAP because uh, that's one thing I've always tried to do on the channel is if read every chat that comes in, even if I can't do it live. And so um, that's it's called the personal volume, touch, Nick. That volume has changed dramatically over the course of this case as uh, we have something like 60 times the viewers on some of these streams. Um, but, uh, but I will still be doing it. Um, okay. So to so the what panel, do you do, what do you do when more chats come on the follow-up stream? Like, how do you, that's why I'm probably just going to record it. Uh, cause I've tried to do a couple of the makeup streams and I end up, you know, getting, getting more, more. Yeah. And, and, and it's, it's like, a never ending cycle. Right. And I love that, but I'm also not trying to accomplish that on reading, on doing a, like, let's read a super chat thing. So live is just an easier format for me. That's why I was doing it, but now I'm, I'm just going to have to record it. Um, let's see. Yes. And AJ Cook points out that uh, Rosenbaum served every day of his 10 year prison sentence, which is nowhere near far long enough for that crime. In my opinion, Dozens yeah. of disciplinary infractions in prison. Then another two to three years, if I recall, for cutting his ankle monitor after he got out. Nice. Yeah, he was uh, he was an upstanding, an upstanding uh, citizen of of Arizona. Only upstanding because he didn't want to lay down on the concrete bed in his cell. Yeah. Um. Was the uh, was the thing? Mm, <laughs> yeah, that was. That's one I'll have to remember. That's a good yeah. joke. That's a good line. Yeah. So I'm, I'm writing it down. But do we do we have any? Okay. <laughs> what is the most likely charge if Kyle is convicted of anything that you guys think? It's got to be the recklessness, just because the instruction is so confusing, right? I think so. Oh, I wait. So you're saying against McGinnis? Yeah. That Take reckless one. Yeah. Well, because I, I think the recklessness against Jump Kick Man is more likely, mainly because the judge did clarify if you find self defense on Rosenbaum, it transfers to McGinnis. But he said it in a very confusing way. No, he way. tried to clarify it, but the instruction is so confusing that it's impossible to follow. It's like, yeah, it doesn't follow, but it does follow, but it doesn't, but it does. They should have, yeah. they should not have. A, a, an additional jury instruction when self-defense applies, they should have an alternate jury instruction flat out because the whole jury instruction says no self-defense on recklessness. And then it adds in a paragraph about self-defense on recklessness. It was like, why? this whole, the concept of applying reckless endangerment to a homicide that's defended with, by self-defense is an attack on our basic Second Amendment rights and our ability to defend ourselves. And it's so yes. obvious, it's staring us in the face. So let me explain to the jury. If you use bullets that are full metal jacket and more likely to pierce and come out the backside, they say you are recklessly endangering the public. If instead you choose hollow points, which are much more likely to balloon and stay inside the body, they will say, why would you use a bullet which is likely to balloon by, by, by ballooning your, the, the, the person you shoot at is much more likely to die and suffer a far more oh, yeah. serious injury. So no matter what bullet you use, the state, once you allow them to say there's reckless endangerment, if you use a bullet that's piercing, the state is basically cutting off your ability to use a gun to defend yourself on your basic Second Amendment rights. Because no matter what bullet you use, you're wrong. And that's what they want. They want to strip us of our Second Amendment rights and that's and that's exactly what this this is standing for. I wish that Mark Richards would have made that point when he was when he was addressing the Second Amendment, when he was addressing the reckless endangerment claim. That the the reason this is here is because they believe that that Americans should have no right to to to, to own weapons and to defend themselves with weapons. That's the entire point to that charge. And I don't yeah, think and, the jury has any recognition of that at all. And I, I think uh, what you're what you're saying, and maybe to clarify, is that 
the the reckless endangerment charges against McGinnis is obviously bogus, but even against Jump Kick Man is bogus. It was not a reckless act that he fired a weapon at someone and missed, right? Like that was they they should have done an attempted homicide charge on him, like they did with Gage Grasskreutz. There's a real reason that they didn't, and I think it boils down to that jury instruction on self defense in regards to recklessness. Recklessness is not pointing a gun at someone and pulling a trigger with the intent <laughs> to shoot them. That is not, that is not recklessness. Recklessness is being, uh, shooting. Like, let's say you're, uh, you're in the, I don't know, a city and you just shoot that way. You don't see anybody, but you just shoot that way. Or you, you tip the gun up at a 30 degree angle and shoot. So this bullet can traverse, you know, three quarters of a mile, uh, two miles away. Uh, it's depending like on the an anvil off a bridge. Just right. for craps and giggles. Yeah. Uh, or in Minnesota, as it were, pumpkins. Uh, throwing pumpkins off of an overpass. And, you know, that pumpkin hits the windshield at the right angle, goes right through and kills the driver because they're driving 70 miles an hour. Um, those are recklessness. Pointing a gun at someone, whether they're attacking you or not, and pulling a trigger is not reckless unless you're... Unless you think there's blanks in it, maybe, Alec. Right? Like, maybe that's... That's it, but uh, but you're not you're not going to get that if you're carrying live well, ammunition. His, well, unless, his, unless you blindfold yourself and spin around in a circle while you keep pulling the trigger. That's is this, basically, is this yeah. tantamount to the depraved heart charge that you sometimes see in some states? Mm. Like you know that, that you're just you know yeah, but it, with a, with a yeah. light with a much with a much lighter yardstick for penalty. Mm -hmm. Like it's much yeah. easier to convict. It's, I think it's a much shorter. It's a, it's a much simpler case for the for the state to convict on. I also think that's why they have uh, Rosenbaum as a reckless homicide charge, which is which is ludicrous. Rosenbaum, it's a very strange thing. It's like if, reckless. How does that even work exactly? Because it it if anything, if they if they don't think they can get intent on him, they've got to do a second degree murder charge, right? Like second degree intentional homicide. He points the gun at him. Their entire argument is that he points the gun at this guy and pulls the trigger four times on the fourth time, specifically killing him while he's down. Uh, one should be, that should be an intentional murder charge if nothing else. But the fact that they're unwilling to say that his shooting of Rosenbaum was intentional, whether or not it was premeditated is, is it, this should, Again, and this is getting into the weeds, and I don't know that the jury needs to hear all this, but you almost want Richards to bring this up and say, hey, why?" if he thought, he sat here and told you that he killed him on purpose, why didn't he charge him with intentional murder? Yeah. He charged him with reckless murder. Why, he was just shooting randomly and happened to four times hit Rosenbaum? That's, that's what way the, to go. I mean, that's what bothers me. I, and I don't know. You know, I don't know that they motioned to dismiss that charge. I don't think they did, but they maybe should have for pleading standards on that one. I want to point out this guy doesn't see here left a raise a really interesting question for the panel, uh, um, where he says law Twitter is going nuts about federal charges next. Is that even possible, or does so. double jeopardy preclude that? They're claiming federal gun homicide, hate crime terrorism etc is no. it what evidence hate is there for a hate crime because crime. the victims yeah. are the same race yeah they're, they're, and, and, and they're not a protected class uh sorry but title seven tends to apply to protected classes more strictly uh, although this isn't a title seven claim you, you would have to show they would have to the government would make have to make a probable cause showing that he shot them based on their race yeah um that's why they got Chauvin was or based because... on terrorism, but no. But yeah. Chauvin there. also, Chauvin also being a police officer, he would have been governed right. under the, um, the the criminal version of 1983. Yes, I mean there's the civil statute 42 USC 1983 where you can sue a state officer for depriving your civil rights, but there's also a a, a companion criminal statute that allows the the feds to go after a person for depriving you of their civil rights if they're yeah, acting under color of law. It's 242, right? It's like 18 USC 242. Yeah, 242, 243, I think, is yeah, something like that, yeah. Uh, as to the other question about the double jeopardy question, there was a case at the U.S. Supreme Court a couple of years ago called Gamble versus United States. So there is no double jeopardy problem if the states, if the feds want to charge him 
because they're separate sovereigns. So yes, the federal government can charge him for the same crime without it being a double jeopardy problem. That being also, the case, however, there's no oh, crime to charge him with. <laughs> and if they did create a crime, it would be an ex post facto provision. It'd be ex post facto because it would be, you know, you're, you're criminalizing an action after it happened. You're doing punishment for something that, you know, that wasn't on the books when, when the crime happened. And so unless yeah. there's an existing federal law that he violated, um, yeah, the, the, the district, U.S. district attorney, the U.S. attorney would be very hard pressed to try to find anything to that effect. Um, I, I want to throw this down real quick to to everybody in the YouTube chat who is um, who is a proponent of alt tech. You don't have to leave the YouTube chat or anything like that. But uh, yesterday when the stream went down, a bunch of people flooded to Odyssey and it I, it kind of broke everything. Um, but they have assured me that they can handle a heavy load of people. So if a whole bunch of people want to follow the link right now that I'm going to throw in here uh, on Odyssey and and stress test their system again. Just, just right click and open it in a new window and uh, see if we can break the Odyssey stream. I think that would be I'm, I'm happy to that'd help. be funny. This they is have, like jumping on a bed to test it out. This is they have, <laughs> the the Odyssey guys. They they said uh, we can take it. We can take you it guys, today. So for those they actually really challenged old, twenty thousand people to show up. But I you don't, guys, I don't know. you guys are the gorilla, and this is the Sam, that's the Samsonite <laughs> luggage. It's a really old commercial. That <laughs> really, really old. I don't even think that. That, that Kurt's old enough to remember that one. And I don't also, think that I've you, seen it. If you don't like YouTube censoring your it. chats, um, Odyssey, from what I understand, does not do that. So, you know, if you if you want to say something spicy about they're bicep saying broken. boy, or... they're saying it's broken. Oh no, I'm watching it right now. It's it's live. It's all good. Uh, well, then your chat <clears throat> your chat is working in mass to like basically uh, <laughs> <laughs> troll you because yeah. I keep seeing error, error, broken, broken, and yeah. Oh yeah, no, I, I got all kinds of errors. I see the numbers climbing up. <laughs> I love your chat. That they, is they great. They make it pretty far. <laughs> There's literally like four thousand people screaming error, broken, and they are totally all effing with you. <laughs> no, I I don't know. I. I don't know. We've we've got forty three hundred over on Odyssey right now. So forty five hundred. Let's, let's make Odyssey cry. I'm all about that. Let's make Odyssey cry. <laughs> I think they're happy to to have this happen. My that's that's Some, my someone in tech product. support right now isn't that happy. I'm telling you what. <laughs> Someone's like, Look, what did you say, boss? What they said? Bring twenty thousand people over here. We can handle it. That was the exact line from I believe like the developer. So. Uh -huh. Okay, uh, I'm really getting black screen, no joke, like comments here in the chat, like out of black screen and HTML error. That's what I'm I seeing. Got all here. kinds of errors when I tried to join. That uh, just a big <laughs> wall of errors in red. I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try it myself. And see if this <laughs> I tried to comment. I tried to comment, GitHub and I got a bunch something of something library GitHub reflect <laughs> you call server. H oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Odyssey. I love you guys. I I, I want to. Is it to, broken? It broke. Uh, I mean, the video is still playing for me, but uh, I, I can't I can't comment. I get. Oh, wait, there. A comment went through. A comment went through. <laughs> 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 no, this is but this is important, though, right? Because alt tech and, and yeah. the guys at Odyssey are great. Uh, make no right. mistake. I, I, I love the platform. I want it to grow and grow and grow. And uh, I'm so glad that they started mirroring my streams over there. Because uh, yep. for a while they wouldn't uh, because of how long they get. And now they, they mirror the streams over there and I'm able to now mirror live streams um, directly over there. And, and it, it, it is functioning and I want to mirror all of them uh, going forward. So uh, I love like, these tests. This was like Krauss testing out a brand new chair made out of matchsticks. It's just. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Krauss testing out a brand new chair made of titanium. Uh, <laughs> uh. <laughs> Oh uh, man. Well, thank you guys for uh for pillaging the fertile land that is Odyssey. That made me really happy. Um I I do want like I said, I want alt tech to succeed. I am on YouTube because it's the best place to get my voice out to the most people. I wish that were not the case. Like I I want anything other than that to be true. Uh and and uh Odyssey is there. Rumble is apparently there and and I, I need to make a rumble now, I guess. You, but. We all, we all YouTube, con right, 
leaning you uh, YouTube content <laughs> providers. We're basically like interns working for Governor Cuomo. Like we're newly hired people. <laughs> and it's like, it's like, okay, so like I know this is great for my career, my advancement, and whatever groping happens along the way, I gotta put up with that. I gotta shut my mouth. I gotta take it. And yeah, you know it's gonna happen. You know it's gonna come. And you just sort of smile. Yeah, okay. Oh, I'm gonna okay. come. And then Stop. and then when we become big enough that we can go on rumble and transfer our audience over there. Then, then we can complain about how we were assaulted on Google. So, yeah, I mean, <laughs> well, I'm, I, I'm going to get a meme of someone sending me, like, showing me a picture and saying, like, show Joe, show us on the doll where YouTube touched you. So, <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, the the problem is if we if we go over on Rumble, Amazon Web Services will shut them down or something, uh, right? Like that's. That's the thing. We we get to kick it one more notch uh, or one more rung up the ladder of of internet service provision, and uh, and see what happens with that. Oh God, I hate I hate the system so much. Um, Need a way out says hello from Minnesota. Love the channel, don't you know? Oh, thank mm -hmm. you, thank uh, you. That was that oh, was very Minnesota. You know? <laughs> now there's a thing saying please enable cookies if nothing appears oh okay this is on me now to fix this problem yeah it's your fault it's your fault I still and then there's video. a warning odyssey performance may be degraded you can try to use your waste five minutes and refresh please no crush us it literally <laughs> says that wow <laughs> wow i'm tweeting that one out too <laughs> i i love them they're they're phenomenal they're phenomenal. And uh, to Thomas, I hope I hope you have a long day of coding ahead of you. <laughs> uh, I, I still have video that's live on Odyssey. I can see it. It's great. It's phenomenal. But um, whew, what a what a disaster. <laughs> um, <coughs> I did hear some reporting that pizza. Is what was delivered today for dinner at the at the jury room. So, well, I I shouldn't yeah, that, say jury room. They got pizza well, that, to eat today. Well, that's enough reason to to continue deliberations just a little bit longer now. Yeah. Pizza. Hmm. I do it for pizza. <laughs> oh yeah, guys, you you okay? Look, I have what to. What kind you of guys. pizza now? That's the other you question. You guys, is it deep dish? Is it thin? Yeah. I can tell y'all don't live anywhere near Minnesota or Wisconsin. Um, mm. Like pizza is everywhere. Like there's, there's so much pizza. It's, it's embarrassing levels of pizza. There's just, pizza. I mean, there's a lot of pizza everywhere. It's like but one it's, of the easiest things to, to market. But the problem is this isn't good pizza. It's just every chain of pizza. The, the Midwest is this weird place. And maybe we can briefly digress into this. I know it has nothing to do with Kyle Rittenhouse, but if you go to Texas and you're driving around like Houston or Dallas, you see a billion different restaurants that you'll never see anywhere else, especially in Houston, my favorite city in the world because of this. Every, every strip mall Austin's has like three, pretty good for food. Eh, I'm it's partial. Not, it's not the same. Is what I mean. Because okay. Austin has a bunch of commie nonsense going on. And uh, and they have zoning rules. Houston does not. Houston's like, zoning? What even is this? It's like, no, we want the strip club and the liquor store next to the daycare. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was my that was daycare. That was my <gasps> daycare, okay? Well, and how so how are all the ladies supposed to get childcare then? I mean, they, they have needs too. I 100% agree with you. But what I'm saying is when you drive around Houston and you're like, there's all these restaurants. It's it's like the most beautiful small business capitalism in the world. When you go to the Midwest, that's gone. Uh. It's gone. It's it's chains. It's only chains. Chains everywhere. And it's like, oh, this I like this one. Oh, that's a chain. I'm like, oh, I like this. Oh, yeah, they 27 locations. Okay, I got it. No, we're not talking about like, I mean, you can find them, of course, but I'm saying down south, you have them everywhere. Up here, it's not so much. Uh -huh. Not so much. That's and fair. It's, it's embarrassing. Even, even so the pizza to... they're getting is Domino's. Let's be honest. This is court. Better than Little Caesars. No, I don't know. Be I slanderous. have a place in my heart for Little Caesars. I, don't... I like their deep dish, Ooh. though. No. I, I used to walk. Thing. I used to walk. Uh, I don't think I've um, ever had a fresh Little Caesars and buying that it right from little caesars yeah, that's <laughs> oh yeah Th that's every pizza okay anyway <laughs> i used to walk 
with my grandma about a mile and a half through Houston, down Antoine. Uh, <laughs> we would walk down Antoine to the Little Caesars and go get a pizza. So I love Little Caesars because of that. It's it's a good memory Aww. for me. And and we also used to walk to the subway that was not too far from there as well, and the Baskin Robbins. Mm. I'm old enough to remember when you went to Little Caesars, their whole shtick was the two square pizzas that you got every time you ordered something, and it was in that huge plastic bag. And and it was, of course, when you're 14 years old, any large pizza is enough to. Well, Amazon is back then. Yeah, large yeah. was large, you know. Um, it's amazing how times change, even with restaurants. Now they're uh, now the thing is hot and ready. The pizzas all certain pizzas are always ready, and so you yes, can that's during why they're not hour. fresh because they made them two days ago and they've just kept them on their hot lights. No, no, no. <laughs> Look, you, you she's go to, saying it's like Seven Eleven hot dogs. They're just you like, go yeah, to the Little exactly. Caesars in my town. You're getting yes. a fresh pepperoni pizza because they 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 cycle through those things like crazy. I've actually gotten there when they've run out of them and I've had to wait. And I was like, thought this thing was hot and ready, you liar. Uh, sorry. I was, I have a sore spot for promises unkept. Um, <laughs> all right. So, um, let's see. Carbonis for the win. <laughs> you are from Minnesota, aren't you? Uh, let's see. Wait, Fox News Milwaukee had something. Oh, I scrolled down too far. What did we have? What did it Got say? Got a friend of mine who's a pizza, used to be on a pizza place and where I used to live and he's now doing odd and sundry other things in another part of the country. And he just texted me and said that pizza is a nice barter economy or a barter <laughs> currency. <laughs> just hand pizza over in exchange yeah. for things. Um, just a dude says Fox news six Milwaukee has the closing arguments segmented. Why not replay it to kill time with the ability to pause and comment? Cause I don't know if I want to sit through them again. Do you guys want to sit through the closing arguments again? Do we want to do that? I mean, we could. Mm. Uh, I'd rather talk about other things personally. <laughs> yeah. While we wait. Uh, like, what What about this? Uh, you know, the big people are asking what the next trial is going to be. And there's been some speculation. I mean, Ar Arbery is a big trial. Um, it is happening. That's happening right now. The chat says no, please no, 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 no. I, I don't Steve. know. Maybe they're trolling you. Maybe they're saying no when really they mean yes. Yeah, I saw that, that one could be yes. Trolling you so again. we should we should do that. One one yes means yes. We should do it. Uh, <laughs> dude, how many phone calls am I going to get today? From the UK. Okay. <laughs> uh, I can't. I, I don't know what's going on. Um, no, I don't. I really don't want to rehash the uh, the closing arguments. I, and the jury's not going to rehash the closing arguments. So I don't know that it's beneficial for us to do it either. Right. But just um, said to me, Joe, no means no. The uh, <laughs> the Arbery case is big. It's going on right now. How long is this case supposed to go? Do we have any idea? Like the Arbery case? Well, I they, think yesterday they, the prosecution was still putting their case in chief on, weren't they? And the defense can go for a while. And I will tell you that I think the testimony of Travis McMichael, and I can't imagine that he can get around testifying. I think that he's going to have to waive his Fifth Amendment rights. <clears throat> that will probably be riveting television. But I did want to ask you about the Fifth Amendment rights. Now I remember this. If there's a mistrial, I assume that Kyle's Fifth Amendment rights are not waived for the next trial. Am I correct in that? Wait, what? Let's say there's a mistrial here on some charges. Some get dismissed. And let's yeah. say there's three there's two or three charges left over. But they're the same charges, they're the same charges that were exact same charges as from this trial. Has he waived his Fifth Amendment rights with respect to the charge, or is it with respect to the jury? That's my question for you. Can the state so, go to the stand so because if, he testified the, the first time? Yes, I I think so. Because I would, I can hear, I can understand arguments saying that. Look, before that jury, we felt as if his testimony was appropriate. But now this is a brand new jury. It's a brand new case. He has a Fifth Amendment right. You can you can play video because that's an admission under oath. It's not hearsay. It's an admission. There's a million reasons why it's not a hearsay problem. You could play video. This the state wants to, but to make him come up and answer new questions, 
would be a violation of his Fifth Amendment rights. And that's my question mm-hmm. to you. Can they do that? And, I, and I, a further argument is, let's say they would add on one more charge. If they add on one more charge, he clearly has a Fifth Amendment right. I think that's, so, yeah, that's a different question in my opinion. Um, I I think on the, if they're a rehash of the existing charges because of a mistrial, then he's waived his Fifth Amendment privilege. Waiver of Fifth Amendment can happen pretty quickly if you talk about, I mean, if you talk to, even if he went in for a police interview and, and answered questions without an express waiver, um, comes close to waiving Fifth Amendment rights depending on the questions that are asked. You will admit to me that if there's an added new charge now, that he has not waived it. And depending that on the be... elements, depending on the elements of the charge, uh, I think so. I, I think he also, has not guess, waived it. I guess it would also depend upon, like you said, of the elements of the charge and whether or not he has stated any facts that would dovetail with the respective elements of the new charge. I mean, wouldn't that, Joe, have a bearing on it too? Or, I don't know, because I was thinking that these lesser included were not there when he took the stand and so i think that actually supports what you're saying now that the lesser included are dovetailing with the same elements so we don't say that well you, you you're charging him let's say all of a sudden there was a brand new charge like you know distribution of cocaine thrown in there so in that yeah. case now they, they couldn't make him take the stand you know be a uh, thing. because even if they're all in one case so the, he would not be able to take the stand because you, he can't be i don't think he could take the stand at all I don't think you can make him take the stand. Rather than uh, another perspective might be, well, they can make him take the stand on some of the charges, but if they, the state is prohibited from asking him about anything related to the drug charges, and there he could he could raise his he could raise his Fifth Amendment rights. There's different ways to look at it, and I'm just trying to figure out how this works. I'm sure this has come up in the past, and I'm, the, I'm really uh, curious. Well, the one thing about the Fifth Amendment is that they've been pretty clear on is that you don't get to come up, assert your defenses and then claim fifth amendment privilege against, against anything else. So once you waive them, like you don't get the benefit of selectively enforcing your fifth amendment, right. Is, is how the court has ruled on that. But I, I think on a, on a different charge, I think you've got a good argument, uh, assuming it's not like a, a very similar element type lesser charge included, like the lesser included right but um the uh as as for the rest of it i man i i don't know i don't know it's it's tough it's a good question it's, i think someone asked me that on one of my streams which by the way those of you who are i stream every night sunday to thursday from 10 p.m till midnight eastern time so um and i ask and people ask me questions like that and i sit there trying to postulate and figure that out so it is that's, it is very, I, that's why i asked you 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 you, sh- you minds who are sharper than mine as to it is very easy to waive a, a constitutional right um be it the fifth amendment or the right to a speedy trial or anything along those lines if you don't watch what you're doing i had a case let me think here it was back about 15 years ago 13 years ago guy was arrested for a drug charge for something that had happened eight years earlier he had um um they put it in this they failed to put it in the system until uh, the year before and it was seven years after he had been you know the charge had happened so i moved for um speedy trial i moved and said that you know his his uh, rights under the constitution to a speedy trial were violated well the the uh the da went ahead and set it for trial on a friday the monday being the hearing the day of my hearing on my motion to dismiss well, the problem for me personally was I was taking the Tennessee bar during the middle of the week. And I had to, I was presented with this situation where, okay, if I'm going to move for a continuance because I have a scheduling problem, I'm waiving my client's right to a speedy trial and I can't do that. So I, I had to file a motion to dismiss and argue it and hope I won just so that I could take the bar exam that week. Otherwise, I would have been preparing my first criminal trial instead of studying for the bar. Wow. Yeah, it's uh, and it, it is weird, like a lot of constitutional rights, if you don't assert them and or you don't assert them properly, you will lose them. For example, your right to an attorney uh, can be lost if you don't assert it. I mean, that that's one that you don't lose. You don't like wave, but you you don't have it until you assert it. Your right to remain silent in general 
is uh, not waived necessarily, but you don't have it until you assert it. And so um, it's a tough question. I, I, I don't know the answer to this. Right. Are we serious? Well, I feel I feel that's stupid because I was like, well, I'm not a criminal defense lawyer, so I don't know. I'm gonna have to ask one of those experts that I know. So it's uh, yeah, and that that gets into a that gets into one of those situations where you go, um, I think it would be an argument. I don't think there's an actual definitive answer. I think we would be, uh, the the lawyers would be arguing over did they waive their Fifth Amendment privilege in the previous trial. For this one, and, and you might be right because how often does it happen that someone chooses to waive a Fifth Amendment? And in a case like that, how often would they, would you have a mistrial? And then you would need a situation where the after mistrial, the state is sufficiently vested that they say we're going to bring this case all over again. Those are three things that do not happen very often. And for all three of them to any one of them is is uncommon to happen. For to have all three of them happen is probably highly uncommon. So. I can imagine it's not a, it's not a question of law that comes up too frequently. Yeah, uh, I I agree. It's it's very situational. Um, let me. Uh, Are we saying rest in peace to Odyssey that you destroyed the whole thing? Did you did you actually no, break Odyssey? That because it's up. I don't I'm know. Still, I'm seeing all these people complaining about Odyssey having problems. But. I I got a I got a link from. Uh, Adam Krigler that says Google, Spotify, Snapchat, Discord, and other platforms go down. But they don't mention Odyssey. Uh, nice. it's from Down Detector. So let's see. Site Down Detector began showing a spike in reports of outages starting at 1240 p.m. Eastern on Tuesday, affecting Google, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Discord, Spotify, and TikTok, as well as Target, Etsy, Shopify, and Home Depot. Amazon Web Services and Cloudflare were also mm. affected. So, AWS, okay, that's big time. Yeah, that's a, they might all be related. In all honesty, I'm still blaming Odyssey, though. Yes, they're the ones yeah, that asked for this. It's Odyssey's fault. Yes. <laughs> um, let me start reading some of these chats that have come in um, today uh, because there are good questions here. Uh, like this one from Bradley says, if you can't defend yourself from pedos and commies as they burn down your town while police stand by and do nothing, what is the point of anything at all? That's a, that's a very valid question, Bradley. Uh, that, that's actually one of my, one of my <clears throat> frustrations with the defense is that they did not get in the prior acts evidence. I thought it could be done personally. I thought they could get there. Um, and they, and they did not, but, uh, let's see. Oh, I'm hearing from Odyssey that the instantaneous rush, uh, especially of new users is tough. It didn't fully crash, but was under heavy load and aired for some percentage. Uh, but they are still working on it. So thank you guys for helping out with that Odyssey stress test. Uh, it helps them make a better product and, and that's, that's good. Dude, seriously, I'm going to turn my phone off in about five seconds. Uh, why, why are people calling me? You're still getting phone calls. They're probably media requests. They might be, um, they need to leave a, uh, a voicemail. Yeah. They need to leave a voicemail for me. I mean, yeah, that's usually my policy is like, if, if you don't leave a message, I'm, I'm assuming it's not important. Yeah, that's, that's it. Uh, 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 okay. Anyway, this one was from Michigan. I know people in Michigan, but I'm streaming. So, you know, this, we've got priorities here. Uh, Andy Lucy says, Binger's booger hook on the bang switch of that AR-15 triggered flashbacks to basic training and flagging the jury. If I had done that, my drills would have been, would have had a wall to wall counseling session with me. <laughs> yeah, you can't, uh, you can't do that. You can't do that. Um, Billy Witch Doctor 99 says everybody gets the brakes beaten off of them sometimes. Yellow Flash <laughs> slash Kraus 2021. <laughs> oh no. Uh, uh, Jack Stainback says uh, communism is a red herring. <laughs> that's a that's a quote from um, Clue. The Com movie. Oh. Okay. The communism is a red herring. Yes. I watched Clue on Twitch uh, a couple months ago. I love that movie, but I didn't it's remember. It's really the good. Quote. My, so when, I, when you were in law school, did you have, did you have anything called like, like law review or anything, any kind of like a, 
like a play that that the law students put on once a year if that would have happened i guarantee you i would have not gone to it and i would have laughed at everyone involved look i would have laughed at me (laughs) yeah i i would have laughed shamelessly at you like you went to law school and you did a play (laughs) So that, that would... so so, so at, at at UT it's called it's called assault and flattery, um, and oh, the whole God. The, the whole premise, <laughs> the whole premise is making fun of the law school law school experience, and it's always um, it's always a uh, um, like they they take they take some kind of a movie or show or something a premise and basically turn it into like what would happen if this were basically like law school, um, so the the one year that I did my three L year I did it um. I, I was like a random cast member on it and um and it was clue was was the theme it was great oh my goodness it was really that's, fun <laughs> that's fantastic uh no i i did uh, you know full disclosure i did i did some community theater uh but uh i could not imagine like a law school version of it that just seems it seems to me like it would get too wrapped up in in like inside jokes which that's the thing about community theater that I don't like. It's like when they change words and stuff to like shout out to their own community. I'm too serious about stuff. Matthew Dombrowski <laughs> says, really appreciate the coverage during the trial. Thank you very much. Um, Alex Mc, uh, McCammy says, what's the best meme to put on a, bing- a billboard that Binger and Kraus have to drive by on their way to work every morning? It's the background of this stream. It's just, it's just Kraus with his head in his hands, like or just, or the picture, or the picture of Binger holding the uh, AR-15 and aiming it at the jury. Well, that thing has been memed so much now. Like people have all the different angles of Binger, like this with his his arm way out and everything, uh, and and they've been photoshopping him into everything, like into Call of Duty screenshots, and oh, it's great. <laughs> It's great, especially with that call out to Call of Duty um, is was such a uh, th- to me, that was a big misstep by the prosecution. Why would you why would you call out video games? You thought you were in a video game. <laughs> well, you know, Nick, here's one thought to consider. We don't know the ages of the jurors. We don't unless it's been reported in an independent in a you know, in an independent report where they've given a range or something. But if you've got a higher median age group, if you've got your grandmothers and your, yeah. you know, folks who don't understand video games and they don't understand first person games and they think that, you know, all of this stuff is, is just treat, training you to kill people and that's what you like to do. I think that might have been just a way to bias a jury. Now, on the other hand, if you were dealing with a jury that had a, a mean age of 30 or 35, that would be very dumb. So I think it's going to be a, a situational thing at the end because a lot of it depends on what people know about video games. Right. Yeah, that that's true. That's true. My, I, I do, I, I guess I, I have to agree because uh, I think I've told this story before, but my um, grandmother after the Columbine incident did ask me, uh, did ask me if I ever played doom before. <clears throat> Oh, hey, I've got a, I've, I've got someone with the answer to Joe's question. Um, this is, uh, this is a lawyer that, uh, that I know through Twitter. Says, uh, "You're killing me. I'm sorry." He says, "You can always get your Fifth Amendment back if there's a mistrial and the defendant testified at the first trial. He, she cannot be called to the stand against his or her will, but the transcript of the prior testimony is fair game, so he or she will likely testify in his or her defense." So, thank you for clarifying that. Good sir, you know who you are, and uh, th- and there you go, there you go. That's I'm happy of, to to learn something. I figured that that would be. I mean, I didn't I didn't know off the top of my head if you could compel the person to testify. I didn't think you could, but I didn't want to say absolutely because I didn't know with certainty. But when you've got eight hours of video of the guy testifying, sometimes you can just bring those clips in as as exhibits or or just play the whole darn thing, you know. Because very true. In that case, the hearsay exception, the de- the declarant would be unavailable, having asserted their Fifth Amendment right now, and so then that could be brought in because there was cross examination available. Uh, this is, by the way, Nick. I want to thank you for 
letting me get on your show and introducing me to your audience. Um, oh, this has yeah. It's been fun the last couple of times I've done this. And, and I figured I wanted to thank you personally and publicly for that. Oh, well, I, I appreciate having uh, more and more lawyers on. Uh, as long as they're not nerds. Well, <laughs> like, I feel almost like Joan Rivers when she used yeah. when she was Johnny's friend, you know, and would always thank Johnny for letting her be on the show. Now, I mean, I doubt I will ever like go on Fox and you know run against the Tonight Show here versus you, but you know what I mean. Well, I'm going to run against the Tonight Show. There we go. Uh, <laughs> uh, John that, that, that O'Mara. Expression, that was a bit dated for the audience, I'm sure. Let's see. Uh, John O'Mara says, I've given three $5 Super Chats and one $20 Super Chat. This is my second. I understand the difficulty in reading them all. I'm sending this one because you asked why so many are watching jury deliberations. And he says, you are the reason. Oh, oh no. Um, well, I'm, I'm glad to have people interested in this Aww. stuff. I think, I think this case is critically important, honestly. <clears throat> like, again, it's... It's a district court case in the state of Wisconsin. It doesn't have any precedental value uh, outside of other specific self-defense cases in Kenosha. Uh, it, it, it won't be authoritative. However, I think it matters for the pulse of self-defense in this country. Like it's nationally watched. The, the facts are not as muddy as they're attempting to be made and people have a decision. How much do we want to allow people to defend themselves as a society? Where, where is it? Where's the line? I mean, for me, that line is uh, you you should have basically ultimate self-defense. Uh, I, I think Castle Doctrine and Stand Your Ground are phenomenal pieces of law that uh, that that deserve um, deserve a lot. I don't want to kill anybody ever. Um, and, and I was a concealed carry holder for five years. I'm not currently, and I don't tend to carry. And I didn't carry even when I had my license, not because I it was mainly because the gun was big <laughs> and I couldn't afford a, a smaller, easier to carry. You just one needed that Glock 27, small, tiny gun. I did. I did. I, but I have a four, you know, I have a 45 and, and so that was cumbersome to carry, but uh, it, it was, like, I hope to never have to use it. I'm not like one of these guys, like, man, I pack all the time hoping. I don't think there's that many of those people that are out there, but there are a few. Um, but I, I think the right to self-defense should be param a paramount concern. If you, if you don't have the right to keep your own life, what do you have the right to do? What does it matter? You, you know, Nick, and, and another thought just crossed my mind. You know how yesterday the – must have been – uh, Binger, who got up and said that when you bring a gun somewhere, you've waived the right to self-defense. Is that kind of what he said? Is that he? That's explicitly what he said. Okay. Well, if that's the case, then everybody who lives in an open carry state <laughs> hasn't got the right to use it if they need it. I mean, that's how absurd that is. <clears throat> and it and it's an affront to the Second Amendment. And it's a front to basic human dignity and, and and human rights in the sense that. The first thing that you have the right to do is to protect yourself and the pe people you you love and care about. And that, that's, yes. that's reprehensible for an officer of the, the court and a, and a state official to say that. Yeah, I, I think. Uh, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. Anyway, um, I, I think that. The other disingenuous aspect of what he said is is obvious in the fact that people successfully assert self defense with a gun constantly, like it that that's a quintessential deadly force claim is that someone uses a gun. No one's drawing out samurai swords except for that guy who attacked the uh, the army pilots, but no one's drawing out samurai swords to defend themselves. Like no one's walking around uh, doing that. They're typically using a handgun in self-defense. And so to suggest that someone bringing a gun anywhere nullifies self-defense just defies common sense. And I think, I think it was a very big mistake because the jury's got to listen to that and go, I mean, I don't know though. <laughs> now it's the, they're trying to use the, the essentially like the transferred intent of provocation to nullify is that kind of what I'm hearing? In other words, just by analogy, if I were to, have, if I were a criminal and if I had a gun and I was trying to shoot person A and I hit person B instead, 
then I would still be charged with the murder of person B because of the doctrine of transferred intent. Are they trying to say that provocation can be transferred and therefore if I am hypothetically trying to provoke one person but another person sees that, then they can use that to come after me and I don't have self-defense? Is that, is that basically what the DA is trying to say? Yeah, I think so. Kurt, is that your read of it? Uh, as best as I'm able to determine, because the DA <laughs> seems, they explicitly say on the one hand, we're not contesting anyone's right of self-defense or the right to have guns. And then they're like, we're contesting the right of self-defense and the right to have guns. So I, yeah. I, I the, the message from the DA in terms of the underlying theory is is weird. And I, I know it's impossible, but I wish I could, you know, just ask the the prosecutors. You keep saying that Kyle had other options. He didn't exhaust other options. I'm like, okay, I really just want you to put yourself in that moment at time and tell me, even with the benefit of hindsight, what options did he have, let alone your ability to process them at the time when your adrenaline is spiking and you're in a panic fight or flight state. And depending on your physiology response, it's not uncommon for your eyes range or ear range to narrow or even shut down. You become tunnel visioned. Yeah. And what you can hear and see, or they can shut down altogether. Your ability to process anything in this chaotic, loud environment. I'm like, even so, that's one thing. But even in the benefit of hindsight, with all these many fit photos and videos from all these angles, what exactly do you think Kyle should do? Apparently, apparently, the answer to that question is he's supposed to, you know, man up, you know, take off his bra, and he's supposed to engage in the fist fight. Yep. And I'm like, Really? So if you were in that situation and you had your druthers, right? You had, if you had your wish, you had your wish and you had your druthers, you only wish that you had had your hands and you would be comfortable in that situation. That's what you're representing to me. And it doesn't, I, I, I have a difficult time believing in my heart of hearts that he'd be like, yeah, I really totally would feel safe in that situation being chased by this guy you know, when it's chaotic and all the rest of it, and he's said he's going to kill me. Uh, so I don't, the prosecution's yeah. argument seems disingenuous just from, from that angle as well. And the pro oh, excuse me. On the provocation aspect, you know, the prosecution was making the case, and I, I think that this is a solid case in general. If he points his gun at Zeminski, if, if Kyle does point his gun at Zeminski and, and effectively uh, not like in a pretend pixel way, but in a real way, if he un unprovoked or whatever goes, you know, and just points his gun at someone does, does a third party then have a right to intervene? Do they, is that provocation? I under mean, the presumably law? the answer to that question is yes on a legal theory, but yeah. from their own frame of reference, the answer has to be no, because it's defense of others for for uh, for Rosenbaum, right? So Rosenbaum, right. In the best, but Rosenbaum sees Kyle point the the, the, the rifle at Zeminski. Okay, so he's going to engage in defense of others. Okay, so he has self defense in this view, defense of others. But why does why does Rosenbaum, from within their own framework and within their own logic, which is exactly I suppose the problem, there is none. But from within their own logic, why does Rosenbaum have this right of self defense? But if you assume the facts from Kyle's point of view, where that didn't happen, he doesn't have the right of self-defense because that's the whole, first of all, they, they said, first of all, we don't believe him that that happened, but then they go the next step further. Even if it did happen, he still doesn't have the right of self-defense. So right. like, we're willing to accept his premise and still say that it's the wrong result. So how do yeah, you get to both those places at the same time? Right. And I, I think that's, that's a distinction in this case, but in, in, in the ether, right? Party A points at party B party C it witnesses this then does party and and w one of the points uh, I think Nate maybe brought up yesterday is that we have no evidence that party C witnessed this um they never introduced that evidence but but let's say in a complete vacuum party A points a gun at party B does party C have a right have provocation sufficient to intervene um think, where yeah. party A loses their right of self defense temporarily I think the Maybe. answer has to be yes. And the prosecution yeah. even argued as much for Huber. They're because right. they're saying these people are hero. They're chasing down someone they believe to be an active shooter. So they're like, right. yeah, Huber has this right of defense of others because Huber isn't being threatened himself. And I tend to agree with the prosecutor if you assume the best case scenario from Huber's point of view. So yeah, yeah. it should be. 
So it it's uh yeah. So I I I think that is. I think that uh, Matt, I think that was addressing your question, right? I think. Let me ask you this though, Zeminski. He was pointing his gun, assuming this that he did, and I'm speaking hypothetically because there's not, as you pointed out, we had questions about pixels and stuff like that. But if he was pointing the gun at Zeminski, you know, assuming arguendo that he did that because he felt threatened by Zeminski, in other words, he was trying to defend himself from a threat from. Zeminski, then there wouldn't have been any provocation towards Zeminski that would have been self-defense. True that, because Zeminski did have a firearm, so you could then go to the next step and be like, well, maybe Rittenhouse saw it or was engaging with it or whatever. There's, I mean, there's, he there's was, possible ways to get there. Yeah, Zeminski was walking around with his firearm out throughout the night. Uh, it, it was We have pictures of him with his gun just drawn at the gas station. We don't know what he did, you know, and that's <laughs> That's the big problem in this is all of their talk about the Zeminskis and P Kyle pointing a gun at them. There's no actual evidence that that occurred because the, when asked, they can't point out where the Zeminskis are in the video. And, and the fact that the judge even got to that conclusion, but still allowed uh, that video and those photos to be showed to me, that was, that's still potentially reversible error. They did, I mean, they, they objected to that expert who cut all of that footage together. So I think they may have preserved for appeal all of the evidence that he brought in, but it's hard to say. I think it should I have think been there's more definitely specific. grounds of appeal. I'd feel a lot better writing this appeal than most appeals. But of course, I don't think it should get that far. Right, right. Um, Mag says, hoping and praying for Kyle. Thanks to you and your guests for the great insight and honest commentary through all of this. Oh, I'm going to try. You. Uh, next we've got <laughs> ha Havoc says, uh, fat locks, hyperbolic rage and closing rebuttal is legendary. I decided every kid I know gets an Armalite this Christmas instead of skateboards. <laughs> yes. He did suggest that everybody should buy their kids AR 15s instead of, you know, instead of the skateboard they were going to get, because that makes sense, I suppose. Uh, Peter says it sounded like they're going to do motion practice after they send the jury away. So may uh, we may be hearing a discussion of directive verdict or dismissal with prejudice. Once the jury is picked That'd um, be nice. it, well, that didn't, that was earlier. didn't appear to occur. Nope. Um, unfortunately, the, the other problem with that is I think motion for directive verdict is basically gone, right? Like, what are you going to direct verdict on when you have, when you have, fact questions about provocation involved well i think i i don't know for Ooh. sure but i i would because i think you can do it in a jnov i'm pretty sure you can where you where the judge can say yeah there's a technical sufficiency to find guilt beyond a reasonable doubt but the overwhelming weight of the evidence the manifest way of the evidence is such that it does not support it so i I, I i think you can technically have this jury question where it's like yeah but the overwhelming weight is the other way so it doesn't matter in the end so maybe I don't know. Welcome to the stream, Mr. Andrew Bronca, a law and self defense. Hey, this is where all the cool kids hang out, huh? This is hey, the back Andrew, of the bus a new here. Friend. Apparently, <laughs> tell us about yourself. Who are you? Yes, attorney Andrew Bronca, law self defense. I do self defense law, and that is all I do. Everything I do all day long, especially during these uh, these high profile trials. So we've got this is this is like the guy. Everything we know is wrong. This is the guy. Yes. <laughs> So uh, mm -hmm. you've been you've been watching the trial. You've been writing about it on uh, on your blog, lawofselfdefense.com. Um, you've also been live tweeting the uh, the closing closing arguments. What's your read on what's going on? Well, I mean, the whole thing's a travesty of justice. Obviously, the the evidence is overwhelmingly consistent with self defense in a trial where the state has the burden to disprove self defense beyond a reasonable doubt. I mean, it's it's not even a close call. And uh, so that's why you see this, the state flailing around like this. I mean, when they go to attack self-defense, there's really two ways to do it, right? You, you can attack the elements of self-defense, disprove any one of those elements beyond a reasonable doubt. You've, you've disproved self-defense, but that's really impossible on the evidence in this case for any one of these criminal counts. So if that doesn't work, you can try the backdoor <laughs> approach, which is provocation. If you can prove provocation beyond a reasonable doubt, then self-defense is off the table. You don't have to worry about the elements anymore. Um, but their evidence in support of provocation is laughable. It's this hocus pocus focus uh, picture. And uh, the one witness who might be able to testify 
as to provocation at that moment by the cars at the ambush site is uh, Joshua Zeminski. And of course, the state was very careful to put him on ice with a arson pending arson case that gets delayed endlessly uh, so he can assert his Fifth Amendment rights whenever he might want to be called or the defense might want to call him as a witness in his trial. So it takes him out of play. Uh, and if that's all the evidence you have on provocation is this uh, ridiculous photograph and this, this drone video that even the judge looks at again and again and again and again and can't see what, what poor Assistant DA Kraus claims is so obvious and apparent, uh, that's not proof beyond a reasonable doubt by any measure. Uh, so then you get to the third avenue of attack, which is just the rhetoric, which is just you know, uh, poor judgment, basically, the poor judgment. We can't have 17-year-olds with rifles going to riots and uh, he just made a poor decision. He lied about being in the EMT. I mean, none of these things are criminal charges. I mean, he's not charged right. with lying about being in the EMT or he's not, char thank God, we can't be criminally charged with poor judgment. I mean, as a guy with an ex-wife, trust me, that would be, <laughs> that would be bad. <laughs> um, so there's really, there's nothing here. And I, I don't think even the prosecution has any reasonable expectation of convincing 12 jurors of guilt uh, at least if we have anything resembling a fair and impartial jury. But what, what he might get is one juror who is not willing to vote for acquittal. And yeah, I think if he gets that, he gets a hung jury. Normally, I would say a hung jury is is a win for the defense. I mean, most of our you know criminal defense, you're doing criminal defense. Most of your clients are criminals. And, um, you know, if, if you get a hung jury, at least they didn't get convicted that time around. So that's a win for them. But this is not the typical criminal defense case. I mean, a, a hung jury here is a theft of a just acquittal from Kyle Rittenhouse. And, and Prosecutor Binger will be happy to prosecute this kid again and again and again until the end of time, until this kid is ground into dust. So they, they need an acquittal. Do you, let me ask, I have, I have a couple of questions. And first of all, I am Joan Yearman. I don't know if you, if you put the name to the face, but I'm actually scheduled to have uh, Andrew Branca on my live stream tomorrow evening at 10 p.m. I look forward mm. to that. Um, but my oh I, crap, that's I, not I, on my calendar. <laughs> what? Okay. Um, did, 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 we, did we do this by email? I do remember. We did it I do by remember Twitter, us, by DM. We by DM. It. Okay, I'll I'll dig it up. I'm sorry. It's crazy. Oh it's crazy God. time right now. Oh I'm glad God. you mentioned. It's also it. supposed to be your my stream tomorrow night. What's this double booking thing? <laughs> no, <it> really? <laughs> no. no, he's kidding. Uh, time. <laughs> so my question. Yeah, yeah I've, I've, I've got it right I here. I've questions. got it here. We're good. All right, good. So I'll be sending you the link to the show before the show tomorrow evening. So I've, I have two questions. One is I threw at the panel here, and I don't know if you, I don't know if you maybe have more familiarity. Assuming there is a hung jury and a mistrial here, uh, where the state comes back, do you believe that his Fifth Amendment rights have now been waived, and the and the state can call him to the stand against his will? No, no, no. Yeah, Joe, no, you, you were gone when I your... got corrected on that. Yeah, you can oh, always you? reassert your Fifth Amendment rights. I mean, anything he said in his testimony here is fair game. You know, it's that's... admissible. Yeah, of course, sure. That's all part of the record of the first trial. Uh, but mm -hmm. if he wants, you can reassert your Fifth Amendment right anytime you want. Okay, so so the next question is a, a legal strategy question, and this is something you all probably heard of Darth Crypto. I had him, I had him on. A couple yeah, yeah, yeah. Ago. In fact, I just uh, connected with him on Twitter. In yeah, the last so... couple days. So he he's done a lot of video work. Those of you who, who are in the audience who may not be familiar, he's done a lot of video work trying to break down the 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 magic focus uh, picture and disproving the state's claims. And in the course of his video work, so he actually found video which shows right before the gun waving that Kyle was that Zminski was walking toward Kyle with his gun out and. It's hard to see. It's a little bit blurry, but he's making the point that the state could, that the defense could have gotten up and made the claim saying, even if you buy this, this argument that he, that he waved his gun, it was not in defense of property. It was his own self-defense from Zeminsky. And, <clears throat> and therefore that's not provocation, that's self-defense and this, and he doesn't lose his right to self-defense for provoking Rosenbaum, but, but didn't Kyle attacking. testify that he didn't point his rifle? He, he that's that's yeah. correct. Well, that's, that's correct. a problem then, right? And right. So, and that's what I was thinking. Even if he hadn't testified that, as strategically, I think that's a tight line to walk before a jury. I think you're walking a tightrope, and I want to get your thoughts as far as giving the alternate arguments before a jury. 
Is it well? Is, I, would it I, be I, wise to say, look, there's no provocation here, but even if you because th- he didn't wave the gun, but even no, if you I don't, thought I don't he waved like, his gun, it was the self defense that he was waving his. I, gun. I'm not a fan of these alternative hypotheses for the defense when you're arguing a self defense case because the jury. They want to know what the F happened, and if they believe your story, they'll acquit you. But if you start giving them, well, if you don't buy this story, we'll give you a different story, you're yeah. done. No, that's, so, that's what yes. I, yeah. That was my thought also. To a judge, yes, you can parse right. out different arguments. If it when was a bench trial, a jury, that would be completely different, but you can't do that with a jury. That, 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 was, that was my thought as well. But I, I, I told him I was going to throw it out at the panel, and... Yeah, you showed up so that you're the perfect person to throw that out. Thank you. And and listen, I don't I so I haven't seen uh, Darth, I forget crypto, is that what it is? Yeah. Yes. So I, I saw uh, um really just one of his videos. He was doing kind of walking outside and doing like uh, what the prosecution closing might look like and I, I thought it was pretty good. I thought he did a great job. I don't know if he's an attorney or not. He's not. Um he's but not. It, I I seemed this... I thought it was he was pretty much dead on. I haven't seen any of his if, if he's done like technical analysis of the whole image enhancement nonsense. Uh, I haven't seen any of that, but, and I don't know anything about imaging, right? I'm just a small town lawyer, but I do know whatever you put in front of the jury is supposed to be a fair and accurate representation mm-hmm. of the original item. And that's clearly not the case here. I mean, it's simply, obviously not the case. It would have been nice if it, someone brought that up. It, it should, it, it should, not, this evidence should never have been put before the jury. It's ridiculous. Yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, it's, and I, I think, I think Jurafasi had the, had a great illustrative example when he had the little squares and then you expand them and then or you put stuff in here and you don't know what the hell you're putting in. That's a different image. That's a, yeah. that's not enhanced. Especially that's when doctored. the expert themselves are just saying, I have no clue. Various versions. How does it work? I don't know. What colors they, would you get? Don't know. What red, colors would these blue, be? Purple. Eh. Right. It was, but it was peer reviewed by someone who's my peer who presumably knows as little as me. So <laughs> well, again, that's good. very that's very misleading, and the defense really should have addressed that. The peer review just means you followed the standard operating procedures of your office. It doesn't mean the end product is a fair and accurate representation of the original. Uh-huh. The, the peer didn't right. say that. If the peer was prepared to say that, they would have had the peer come in and testify. Well, the best right? part is the expert himself couldn't say it because they asked him, "Did you compare the final product with the uh, with the original picture?" And he said, "No, I didn't." He, and so he couldn't. Right. He couldn't even swear that it fairly and accurately depicted what it was, what it was purportedly portraying, which is evidence 101 for foundation that for foundation to get it admitted is that you have to be able to swear that under oath. And the judge seemed to just ignore the fact that there was there was no testimony to that effect. And I think that the, the real damage damage is the Paradolos effect, which is if you tell people if you look, if you show a picture of a cloud and you say that's a that's a picture of an Indian. You know, in that case, every, people will see an Indian. If you show them the same cloud and you say that's that's a picture of a baseball field, everyone will see the baseball field. And that's what happens with this image when they throw in these different pictures here. And the jury is having a seed planted in their mind as to what they're supposed to be seeing. And so they're like, hey, yeah, I, wow, I'm, I'm positive that's what I'm seeing now. Right. I mean, we've all seen these drawings that you look at it one moment, it looks like a woman. You look at it the other moment, it looks like a horse. And, you know, your, mm-hmm. your, your brain goes back and forth with the image. And one thing that really struck me about this trial is how often the prosecution argued and how successful they were arguing that, uh, you know, we have all these thresholds in the law for evidence to be admitted, right? There are certain qualities, certain fair and accurate, certain not hearsay and and the prosecution kept arguing, well, you know, all right, maybe we don't meet the threshold, but let it in anyway. Let the jury decide. I mean, the whole reason we yeah. have the threshold is because we're not going to let the jury decide unless the evidence meets some fundamental level of quality. And, and, and that's certainly one. applied here. And later the judge goes, well, you know, if it turns out afterwards, this imaging stuff is not a re- reliable. This, you know, this conviction, if it happens, is going to collapse. I'm like, holy. I mean, your job is to take yeah. that decision before the jury sees the evidence, not afterwards. It's too late yeah. afterwards. Mm-hmm. I wanted to ask you about the judgments as a matter of law, judgments notwithstanding a verdict, the directed verdicts, the I, I think that's uh, all that's dismissal. all fantasy. It's all, all fantasy. fantasy. Yeah. I mean, technically it exists, but this judge is not going to do this. This judge no. has a uh, uh, places enormous trust uh, and respect in the institution of the jury. And if they return a guilty verdict, he's he's not he's not gonna touch that. Uh-huh. So how do you feel about those appellate chances? Appellate chances are Listen, appellate chances are zero. Always assume they're zero. Yeah, I mean, which is a fair. Which is fair. It's almost impossible. Remember, you, right now we're in the trial phase, and in the trial phase, every presumption is in Kyle Rittenhouse's Damn favor. Straight. Right? He's presumed innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Once he's found guilty, all the presumptions are that he's guilty, 
And the, the burden now is on him on appeal. And if he didn't win when the challenge was, when the terms were in your favor, the prospects of winning when they're not is very low. I read thousands of appellate decisions every year. And the number, by the way, first of all, the number that get reversed, very low. When you get reversed, it's not like the charges disappear. You just go back for another trial. Right. And that's that's the same consequence as having a, a hung jury here. They'll just, unless, Binger but, will be happy to try him again. Unless, I mean, I, it wouldn't go back again <laughs> if there was if there was sufficient misconduct that there should have been mistrial with prejudice based sure. on that Fifth Amendment violation. I, I just, I don't see I, it. I agree the, with the you. The appellate court is going to defer terrible. to the trial judge on, right. on whether it met that threshold. And the trial judge clearly doesn't believe it met the threshold because he didn't grant the mistrial with prejudice. Yeah, yeah. But he hasn't, uh, that was just filed on the 15th. They haven't actually, I don't think he's actually ruled on it yet. No, but I think if he was going to. Yeah, I mean, he would have just he done said it. He would have done it. He would have had the hearings. He would have had the parties come in and argue it out. And he, he didn't bother doing that. He's not going to do that. If he was inclined to seriously consider that, he'd do it before this went into deliberations. I mean, it's an uh, hour conversation. Right. Uh, I, I agree. They, they should have. Uh, I, I thought they should have disposed of the. Well, I shouldn't say I agree. I thought they should have disposed of the case when the Fifth Amendment violation was brought up, along with the uh, with the um, what you call it. I don't want to say the, the, the propensity. The Right. With the Thanks. with the propensity uh, question, I, I and when the judge is up there snapping about it, I think that's the time that it should be dealt with, uh, yeah. and and that he didn't was frustrating to me. But he clearly wants this to go to the jury. He wants to make the because he'll get he'll get pilloried if he dismisses the case, um, especially with prejudice. Uh, but uh, oh hey, we have another we have another guest on the stream here. Okay. Um, but Andrew, I, I wanted to get your read on the performance of the defense, and if you saw any any particular uh, issues that you really like liked that the defense has done, or particularly disliked in in either their you know examine cross examination or their closing arguments. Sure, happy to do that. First, I'd like to say hi to Robert. Robert, first opportunity for us to communicate directly. I appreciate all the kind things you've been saying. Uh, very very gracious of you, and. Um, yeah, I mean, I wrote about the defense closing just, well, I guess yesterday. Everything tends to blur when you cover these trials for weeks at a time. But um, it, I, I, I don't want to say it was bad. It wasn't bad. It was fine. It was good. I mean, he hit the facts well, the, the, the important facts. He made a lot of good points. And, and, and this may just be a reflection of my own kind of personal and professional preferences. I would have liked to have seen um, a different tone. I don't, I don't think the tone helps win over jurors that are not already on your side. I, th I think it's very well accepted by jurors who are on your side already. They feel the same way. They're angry about this unjust trial taking place. Uh, but those aren't the ones you have to worry about. You have to worry about the ones that aren't quite on your side yet, who may have some sympathy for the, 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 the people who were killed or their families or whatever the case. There's some reason they're not on your side yet. And those are the people that you need to attract over. And I don't think you do that with anger because they're not angry. If they were angry about it, they'd be on your side already. I think you need to take a more, and you have to fake it, right? Because this is obviously a terrible injustice. There's damn good reason to be angry about this prosecution. I understand why Richards is angry. I'm angry too. But the point of the closing is, is not to air your grievances with the prosecution. It's to win over jurors who are not yet on your side. And I, I think a more sympathetic tone would have would have helped there. And I think Tirofacy would have been better at achieving that mm -hmm. tone. I, I just don't think it's in Richard's nature. Um, the other thing I thought would have been would have helped a lot was I, I felt the closing was rather meandering. I think it was a mistake to step through it in like chronological chronological order of the witnesses. I think it, it would have been much more effective if they'd crafted kind of a story arc that they could because that's how people love to hear things, learn things, come to decisions. Is they they we love stories as human beings, and I, I don't think he gained much value by repeating the chronological order of the witnesses that the jury's already seen going through the trial. I think it, it would been would have been much better if you started with kind of a, a sympathetic toned opening to kind of get the jury open to hearing you, not have them close their ears, um, and then kind of tell a, a, a more natural story of the events, of how the law applies, um, why this prosecution is being brought. Then you can touch upon kind of the maybe some of the political dynamics, and but in a in a single place in the closing, there was lots of things kind of scattered around. Like a box of Legos had been dumped on the floor, and I, I just don't think that's the most effective way to 
to communicate to the jury this compelling narrative of innocence that you want them to take into deliberations with them. And to the chat, I, I see you guys spamming that the jury is back. The jury is not back. I am watching the feeds. Uh, you cannot fool me. You cannot do it. Um, it will actually probably be lucky if the jury does come back today at all. But um, I, I am watching, so uh, it's it's not there. I don't know where that rumor started, but but knock it off, you nasty kids. <laughs> so when, when I when I come across as critical of, of the of the defense closing, I, I don't mean that in kind of a, an absolute sense, but in a relative sense. You know, what I would have liked to have seen is perfection. Yeah. You can't get perfection, but as close as we can get that as possible is is what I would have liked to have seen. And I felt there was room to be more perfect uh, than it was. I I agree. Um, I I thought largely I was surprised. Um, I thought that that may have been Richard's best day in court personally. Um, I, I thought I was really concerned about how his closing come across, but aside from it being a little long and a little meandery at times, and I, I do agree with you that uh, that sort of narrative structure would have been preferable, but I was, I was actually pleased with his closing. And I think he came out with some good uh, indignation against the prosecution and how they've been treating this case. And, and I got very much a sense of the, Come on, like, come on, jury. You know this is nonsense. You know it is. That's all they've got. Here, here's, here's what we know. Here are the facts. And, and I, I think I, there's a place for that, but I think you have yeah. to build up to that, right? right? You have to kind of seduce the jury to that point. And, and he just he he kicked over he kicked open that front door with that from the very beginning, his first sentence in the opening. And I think if if you're a juror who's already amenable to the to the defense argument, that's fine. You're on that page. But if you're not, uh, it's it's pretty abrupt uh, way to try to reach out to those jurors. Andrew, uh, this is uh, Matt Wilson I'm from Mississippi. I don't think we've ever met. Um, so what I'm hearing you say, if I'm hearing correctly, is that the art of persuasion is trying to make the jury believe that it's their idea, not yours. And so if you if you lay enough of a facts that are that are very small, bite size, leave them a trail one after the other, one presumption is met after the other, until finally, psychologically, they're hooked, they will make the decision that you want them to make. Is that right. what I'm hearing you say? That's right. And, and you do need those facts. I mean, obviously, you can't leave the facts out. I would have liked it, frankly, if they were, how can I put it? I mean, more structured along the lines of what the, the, the self-defense jury instruction is, what those elements or self-defense is for each one of those encounters. Uh, point to the specific fact that meets the conditions or at least shows that it hasn't been disproven beyond a reasonable doubt, especially with respect to Roosevelt. Uh, oh, this yeah. whole, because the, I mean, the, the prosecution pounded relentlessly on this nonsense of you can't shoot an unarmed person, uh, which is ridiculous. In any case, he wasn't unarmed. He was arming himself with a rifle. He was arming himself with Kyle's rifle uh, at the time he was shot or attempting to do so. In any case, hundreds of people every year in America are killed with nothing more than fists and boots. So, which are obviously that would be a deadly force consequence of those attacks. Um, so you have to look at the circumstances of the attack, not, not just the fact that somebody was unarmed. And I, I think they sh they should have hit that harder because Rosenbaum's really the linchpin here. Um, if you know, because if, if you believe that was an unlawful killing, then it's very easy to believe the rest of the prosecution narrative that all the consequences that followed are also Kyle Rittenhouse's fault. If you believe that was a lawful killing. Well, then Kyle, Kyle Rittenhouse is an innocent person running to the police for help and getting assailed by a mob, which, of course, is the defense narrative. Uh, so you really have to, you know, crush it on that Joseph Rosenbaum incident. But, Andrew, have you considered that everybody takes a beating sometimes? Yeah. Like, did you, did <laughs> that amazing. thought occur to you? I need to know. <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing. And uh, again, uh, frankly, you know. I would suggest that there were a number of points that Krauss brought up on rebuttal that had not been adequately addressed by the defense cross and should have been because they were predictable that they were going to be argued. And you know, you're not going to have a chance to come back after rebuttal. Uh, so I, I did think that was, that was a shortcoming. Can you, can you give examples of what Krauss said that you thought he failed to address in his, uh... well, this whole, this whole unarmed thing. I, I mean, Binger had mentioned that repeatedly over the course of the trial, you know, that's going to come up uh, and, and they just didn't adequately address it on cross. They should have made clear you absolutely can use deadly force on an unarmed attacker if the nature of their attack is one likely to cause you death or serious bodily injury. And if they're 
threatened to murder you, and we have credible evidence that they threatened to murder you, and no evidence that they didn't, right? I mean, that the, the prosecution keeps saying it wasn't caught on video. Well, that an absence of evidence is not evidence. They, they didn't have a witness testify, hey, I was with them the entire time. I, I saw everything they saw. That never happened, right? They couldn't right. say that. They didn't and, actually and, have any ca substantive counter evidence to the testimony of the death threats. And if someone threatened you with death an hour before and is fighting you for your rifle, that's a deadly force attack. The reasonable expectation has to be that they intend to use that rifle against you. That rifle is the only thing keeping you alive. That's your life preserver. And if all they do is take it from you, then the rest of the mob kills you. And the, uh, the, of course, the big problem for the state is that that testimony about the threat came in from state witness Ryan Ball, right? <laughs> like, they they elicited that testimony on their own. They don't get to say, well, the defense gets there convenient. You know, Kyle saying it could be very convenient, but Ryan Balch was brought by the state. They asked him the questions. He's like, well, he did threaten to kill us that one time. <laughs> right. It's a very common pattern you see in these politically motivated trials. Now, of course, I, I'm speaking mostly about these self-defense trials, which is my area of expertise. But same thing in the Zimmerman trial, same thing in a lot of these trials. The prosecution starts to present their case, and they call witness after witness after witness. And you're waiting for them to show you the substantive evidence that's inconsistent with self-defense, right? They have to disprove self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt. So that's a high threshold. And witness after witness after witness for the state appears, and their testimony is either ambiguous on self-defense or it's actually favorable for the defense. Happens all, And it's because they don't actually have a meritorious prosecution to bring. And that, and the, and I think that the defense failed to make that point very much, if at all, that all these witnesses, which who were so favorable to Kyle, that that Balch was put up on the stand, they were brought by the state. The I state's own witnesses are the I ones who said that. that there was a threat to his life that Rosenbaum yep. threatened to kill him if he ever caught them alone. That's the state's witness, not our guy who we found and plucked out. The state knows this is true, and they're going to sit here and lie to you and tell you, well, this person we put on the stand, don't believe them. Disbelieve right. this person. We, we put him, why, why would the state put him on the stand if they think that you shouldn't believe him? They put someone on the stand who they think you should believe, you should trust. And that person who the state thinks you should believe, you should trust, told you under oath that he and Kyle were directly threatened that by Rosenbaum, that he would kill them if he ever caught them alone. Yeah, guys, I should mention, I'm, I'm Italian by heritage, so I tend to talk a lot. So don't just let me dominate the conversation. Feel free to jump <laughs> in any time. But if there's silence, I'm, I'm, I'm prone to fill it. Well, I think we're, we're really happy to have your specific expertise on this type of issue. I mean, like, uh, again, I said when you came on, you're the guy. You're the guy to have on, on a show like this. So it's really great uh, to have it. So I know, as for me, I, I mean, I'm going to personally hold it against you, but I'm, I'm just like to listen and, and absorb what you're saying. Uh, but I do want to ask Mr. Barnes, how's it going, man? Welcome to the show. Good, good. Yeah, I mean, Andrew was one of the people that I wanted as part of uh, a dream team for Kyle. And I think as we've witnessed in the trial, and we'll see, if it goes past today, they did not do their job on jury selection. Yeah, I and, concur. Uh, again, they that was totally the choice of Richards and some people around him. Um, you know, I thought Richards' clothes was the best clothes he could give. That's not saying it's the best clothes a good defense lawyer could give. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the, he's just, he's a bulldozer. Uh, that's who he is. Uh, and the reason why, he, uh, he did the chronology or it was recommended to him to do the chronology is that it stops him from meandering even worse. Uh, being. it keeps, you know, it's, it's just his limitations. Um, and I mean, I thought Kyle got a poor defense, frankly, I've, I've made that clear all the way through. I thought he deserved a much better defense. There was the funds raised and the lawyers available, uh, and the assistance available to do it. You know, there was tons of people who were willing to help without any advance guarantee of payment. Um, you know, yeah, so it's, it's, if this goes past a day or two, then there's a real risk of a mistrial. From what I heard, uh, the, the 12 that of, out of the 18 were considered at least by the journalists watching as a more pro prosecution 12, that it ended up being seven women and five men one Mexican-American man, uh, four immigrant men from different backgrounds, but like several very blue-collar Green Bay Packers, probably gun owners were excluded out of that group. Uh, Kyle got a little unlucky on the draw, it appears. You never know for mm -hmm. sure, and I don't have any confidence in uh, the jury selection of either side, honestly. 
Now, Andrew, were you surprised that neither side talked about much of the jury instructions in close in detail? Like usually what you're talking about is you go through the instruction, you give the jury a roadmap. You're asked this element. Here's the evidence that proves it or disproves it. This That's element. exactly, I mean, they had exactly what I would have done. Because it was clear they were still not really sure what self-defense was in Wisconsin. Right. So, I mean, the, apparently there's 36 pages of jury instructions, which are going to be pure legalese for lay audience. It's, uh, it's going to be intimidating in the extreme. Very easy to misunderstand, especially, by the way, the way the judge read them the instructions. Oh, which was God. mirandering and confusing. I mean, he confused himself reading the instructions. He's the trial judge. So what are we supposed to expect from the jury? You have to baby walk them through. You have to say, here's the first element of, and of course, just do it for self-defense. I mean, frankly, I would have told the jury explicitly on closing, look, you're doing yourself a huge favor if you just look at the self-defense jury instruction before you do anything else. Because if you do that, and you find in your judgment as the jury that self-defense has not been disproven beyond a reasonable doubt, you can go home this afternoon. You're done. Did you, uh... That's a very that's a very good point because the, the jury at this point is probably just exhausted. They want to go home, I would imagine. Right. So, so they that could would be read a very tempting one offer. jury instruction. They could read jury instruction 805. It's the only one they have to read. And if self-defense is not disproven beyond a reasonable doubt, their job is done. Did you... Now, the uh... good news is that's what they requested. Yes, yeah, I heard that. Yeah. One through six, but that's mostly just the self-defense instruction. I heard that. It, it's very encouraging. It's the self-defense and the first charge, which, uh, as Andrew said, and, and similar to what I've said, I that the first charge against Rosenbaum is the linchpin of the whole case. If he's justified in shooting Rosenbaum, it's going to be very hard to say he's not justified in the rest of his activity. But if he's not justified in shooting Rosenbaum, it's very easy to say, yeah, now he's an active shooter. Now he's uh, now he's a murderer in a crowd of people trying to stop him. And, and that, of course, is a narrative the state's tried to build. But um, hopefully they'll just look at those two things, self-defense, crazy, crazy man chasing down, uh, chasing you down into a place where you have nowhere to go and catching you. That's and I think that maybe is a criticism of the defense. They they didn't ever expressly say he wasn't chasing Kyle Rittenhouse. He caught Kyle Rittenhouse. He caught him. Mm. There's. It's no longer a chase at this point. It is now, what do you do when you're caught? I mean, sure, we can argue over distances, but if his hand is on the barrel of the gun that you're holding, then he's <laughs> caught you at that point. Because yeah, it's just, right, right. A, that next second is him grabbing you. And we know with Rosenbaum, that's a problem that he tends to have. Plus, you know, withdrawal <laughs> is a defense, is an exception to provocation in the sense that they find provocation if he withdrew and, give, and gave notice. All his uh, self-defense privileges are restored. Uh, the duty to escape that's only triggered by provocation. If you look at it, they could have broken down the videotape to show he really withdrew and gave notice of it three different times just within those few seconds in the parking lot because he sees Rosenbaum. Let's take the prosecution's theory. He points the gun at Zeminski. Then he sees Rosenbaum. What does he do? He, you know, he does you know, my version of explaining uh, retreat or withdrawal to a jury is Leonard Skinner's song, Give Me Three Steps. Because that's what that is all about. Give me three steps and I'm out the door. Everybody cooled. No, 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 no shooting. The uh, he he tries to step back and flee back up the road, but he can't because he's blocked. But that and then what does Rosenbaum do? He comes at him. So that was the first opera. That was the first retreat. That was the first withdrawal. That was the first notice of it. Rosenbaum's reaction is to attack again. Then he's going across the parking lot. He you know he the, something gets thrown at him. He hears a gunshot. He stops, turns around, shows he has the gun to Rosenbaum really gives him the second chance to withdraw. The he, he himself is withdrawing because he's going to turn around and run again. And Rosenbaum chooses to follow him again and run after him and chase him again. Then really at the third time, I mean, like I thought the defense could have done a better job of explaining what happens at the end because my interpretation of that video drone evidence is uh, Kyle realizes he's trapped. He turns around and really shows uh, Rosenbaum the gun. He gives Rosenbaum a chance to do something. And Rosenbaum instead, as Richie McGinnis's great testimony attested uh, on Binger's foolish cross redirect of him, uh, he yells F you and lunges for the gun. And then you have the medical examiner's testimony that the way in which his hands were injured is consistent with him having a hand on the barrel uh, and lunging for the gun. The prosecution tried to lie about mischaracterize that evidence in their clothes. Oh my gosh. Their, yeah. their thing with the hand being like this and trying to explain that the bullet went in here and came out here. It's like, what? No, th there's no evidence that that happened. This hand was like this. That's how the bullet would come in here 
and come out towards him. It, oh, that was infuriating. So- he really, testifying. Kyle gave through, like, R- Binger wanted to break down Kyle's decisions in the milliseconds as if he had hours. But l- take that and flip it around. Look at what he does. He tries to retreat, tries to retreat, tries to retreat, tries to withdraw, tries to withdraw, tries to withdraw, does it repeatedly. And it's only when he has trapped. And at the third time where Rosenbaum is within inches of being able to possess that gun and use it in whatever manner. And as Andrew notes, my understanding has always been you put your hands on a gun, you're armed. You're not unarmed anymore. Kyle shot two people that night that, in my view, were armed, and then the third person that everybody admits was armed because both of them were going for or grabbing the gun and had their hands on the gun, and there's testimony from independent witnesses and visual and photographic evidence of that being the case. Those weren't unarmed people. You go for the gun, you're responsible for that weapon. You're considered armed under the law. There are people that have been prosecuted on those bases in different states. I mean, um, poli- and- police officers routinely shoot suspects who are fighting for control of the officer's gun. And that's completely justified. Police Absolutely. officers would have shot when Kyle turned around the first time. I mean, let, let's be honest, oh. like and, and yeah. been likely justified Heck, in doing they would so. would have shot Zemitsky and Rosenbaum right when they said something threatening to them right at the, at the very when he's walking up. They would have dropped yeah, the Zeminski's- extinguisher and gone boom. But plenty of cops would have. Yeah, I mean, Zeminsky's I mean, armed and, and at that point. They would have been considered a justifiable shoot. Yeah, so the, the the whole narrative about provocation is is frustrating, and and yes, to the people in the chat, we know. Well, I w- I'm, I shouldn't assume. I know, and I assume everybody in the panel agrees that Kyle Rittenhouse. There's no evidence that he actually raised the gun. What no, we're doing is up. is but talking that, through the, they the alternative. I, I told them it was coming all the way through. There was a lot, of, but hey, credit to uh, I think Good Logic interviewed him. A lot of the stuff that came over the weekend got to the defense team. Praise God, it? because on Did Friday, really? because the they were not up? alert for this. Uh, and on earlier in the week, when Andrew was talking about, here's where they're going, they should make a motion to exclude where this theory is because it's an impermissible application of provocation. They were frankly behind the curve, despite me telling them before the trial, months before, this is where he's going to go because he's going to misapply provocation for the liberal Democratic juror who believes Kyle never should have been there, Kyle shouldn't have a gun, and don't like AR-15s. That's right, so they, they they're consider. trying to. That's exactly they're trying to, what he did with his closing. They're they're using provocation. Binger is he's trying to apply it in a legal context, like the normal common usage of the term. Like anything can be provocative, right? Uh, but that's not that's not the legal meaning of the word. The legal meaning it it's, it has to be attached to some immediate forcible response. Much that's, more limited, right? I've so been the describing fact that, it know, as he, an he came overt with a, act. The, the fact that he showed up with a rifle. I mean, in a general sense, might you argue that's provocative? Well, maybe, but unless it triggered an immediate violent response, it's irrelevant for legal purposes. Right. And under Wisconsin law, your provocative act has to be an unlawful act. Unlawful, right. So if it's not an unlawful that's why act. They, that's why they fought so hard for this ridiculous, bullshit gun possession charge uh, before they had the hocus pocus uh, photo. Because they <laughs> needed they... the unlawful act as the predicate for the argument for provocation. And they didn't they didn't have anything except for this right. gun possession thing, which, by the way, I, I did my legal analysis of that charge the week after the event. And it was clearly bullshit. Then I was shocked that it didn't get dismissed long ago. I mean, thank God, Judge Schroeder finally dismissed it what, the day of the day of closing arguments, the morning of closing arguments. I mean, just any plain English reading of that statute makes clear that Kyle is exempt from it. But the state had to have it because if they didn't have that unlawful act, they had no predicate for provocation. And they had to have provocation because the other evidence was overwhelmingly in favor of the elements of self-defense. I That's think why they, might they have shouldn't ended up- have let the curfew charge go so easily because that would have given him a thin but still a rail to say, hey, he wasn't even lawfully there. And they just were lazy about that. Uh, and, and I assume that's why they were going to pursue it, but you know they just dropped it effectively. Yeah, I don't know the backstory on that. I don't know why they let it go either. Perhaps they they perhaps they felt they had them snowballed on the gun possession thing. Apparently, I, there's an issue about whether it was actually a lawful curfew order that's being tested in another Wisconsin court, and they didn't want to relitigate it. Yeah, the I, I, I think in Kenosha, they a different court in Kenosha or maybe in Racine, they said that uh, it was not, but it was just it was at Kenosha. the district Another court Kenosha court fellow ju- yeah. of Judge Schroeder uh, said that the law that there was no lawful curfew order because the order itself was unlawful. 
I think the lateness of the dismissal of that six charge for gun possession probably worked to Kyle's benefit because mm. they had their oh, photo yeah. slides all set up there as to how they were going to structure mm. everything. They start having technical issues and can't figure out what to do it because I'm sure a lot of Binger's closing argument was built into predicating it on that that gun possession issue. And once that was stripped from them at the last second, they were left trying to scramble and adjust their arguments without relying on using gun possession. I think that they, they're they a very slow-moving boat. They're like the Titanic with a very small rudder in the back. If they have to change directions on the fly like that, I think both teams were very weak at showing that flexibility. So that last-second change probably really hurt the state a lot. And it was I don't understand why they didn't have... Binger to not... Yeah. Sorry, just inexcusable Binger not to know what that law says. I mean, I call it the Wisconsin farm boy exception. Well, it's been knows. there for forever. <laughs> that they well, want also- a 17-year-old... Yeah, they, they know that the oldest son is going to sometimes need a shotgun or a rifle on the farm to make sure no problems happen. They passed those gun control bills to deal with Milwaukee criminals and handgun violence. They didn't draft yeah, it. That's why the they made clear like a, this is exempt. He's well, like a also, Chicago lawyer imported into Kenosha. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. I mean, his mindset. The, I, don't, I don't understand why he didn't have a, a backup closing because they had, I mean, they had noticed over the weekend that this was maybe going to get tossed out. They had two days ostensibly to put something together like okay just in case a a scenario doesn't happen we need to prepare for b scenario so that you know we have something smooth to to put together i I, little binger is good at being sleazy he's not good at recognizing his own limitations or restrictions he lives in his own little world that's why you saw him make the mistake like if you'd studied mcginnis at all you would know to be very careful with him as the prosecution on direct or redirect uh, and he just walked right into it. McGinnis just smacked him across the face. Um, yep. and, and, and he kept doing that. And then Sauerkraut, when he got up there at the end, uh, he can't help himself. You, you know, you poke him a little bit. He just loses his mind. Uh, and he was just, yeah. aw- I mean, w- you, why, you know, there's an old saying in Florida, never talk about rope in a house where there's been a hanging. Well, in the same sense, Sauerkraut, there's no reason to go back into, hey, how we tried to suborn perjury from one of the witnesses. You know, I mean, just just skip that. You're in rebuttal. The, you know, the you got tweaked. Move on. He just got completely yeah. off mission. He just personalized everything. That was yes. him speaking as a as a person, not speaking as a prosecuting attorney. And Binger is one of these guys. We've all met people like this. He's he's not stupid. He's a he's a clever guy, sneaky maybe, um, but yeah. he's not nearly as smart as he thinks he is, and that leads yeah. him to be vastly over clever. And get himself jammed up. He's that. The, I would describe him as my t- the typical federal prosecutor I've dealt, dealt with. You know, smart. You know, probably did decent in law school. Knows how, how to argue certain things. Knew how to work the judge well. I mean, you know, the. I mean, for all the yelling that took place, he knew all I got to do is yeah. take the yelling, then move it a little, move it a little. He'll back off. And um, also, and yeah, he worked the, the judge very, very effectively yeah. in that sense. And, and he agree. seemed he displayed that over and over again. Every time there was emotion, so many times we would hear the the judge come out of the gate in a direction that sounded completely favorable to Kyle. Even when he was talking about that photo evidence, he's like doing his own discovery, saying, "Hey, when I enlarged my phone, I realized that everything became much blurrier here. I don't understand how we're able to trust this thing." And and we here on the panel sitting here cheering, like, "Yes, thank God! Finally, he's realizing that these pixels are not enhancing." the image it's making it impossible to tell what the image is actually showing and binger just kept adroitly just pushing forward pushing forward and not caving in until he basically wrapped schroeder around his finger for like the the 15th time that we had seen over the last couple weeks and i think that's binger's experience with schroeder personally he's had like 400 trials in front of him and he knows how to push schroeder around and make him pretty much his bitch as far as doing what he wants even in questions where it's shaken where it's questionable as to whether it's compliant with basic evidence or, or you know, uh, trial law. Well, it's one of the first things I was introduced to in family law and state court. It's a lot of state court judges are this way. They want kind of people to get along. They don't want to make tough decisions. They don't want to be seen as, you know, fit. And I learned that, like, the lawyers that kept whining and kept whining and kept whining after they lost kept getting relief, kept getting remedy, kept getting. It was like, okay, the judges say they hate it, but the people who do it keep getting rewarded for it. So you learn right. how to, and Richards, unfortunately, I mean, Nick pointed it out live during the jury instruction conference. When he walked back, oh, we've already litigated it. He lost it. All you need to do was whine four more times to the judge. And the judge said, you're right. This is nonsense. Not going to bring it in. Also, making decisions yeah. is hard, right? Making decisions takes effort and thought. Yeah. 
And most of us, I mean, I do this in my own practice. You come up with rubrics, algorithms for making decisions so it's more efficient. And Binger had clearly identified the algorithm that the judge liked for making decisions. And he would just check off those boxes and the judge would go like a little computer. Okay, I guess that's it. We'll go your way then. Uh, and and the defense simply didn't have that nailed down. Yeah, and it, it was it was so baffling. And that particular moment, I think, is a big failure of uh, Richards and Shurafisi. Because Shurafisi says... You know, it's already been hashed out, Judge. We're gonna, you know, whatever. <laughs> that was that was a mistake. But also, right before that, Shurfisi was making a compelling argument that it doesn't show uh, their expert wasn't good. Uh, judge, they're not able to do this. And then Richards comes in and he gives the judge the excuse he needs. He says, Judge, even if he's raising his gun at Zeminski, does that give provocation for Rosenbaum? And now you've just asked yeah. the judge a question that he didn't he wasn't needing right. to ask prior and the answer is probably yes and i don't know let's ask the jury and so now you've just said well here there is a potential fact issue here when it should have been they should have just stuck with no this can't come in because yeah. it doesn't show it you just watched it 10 times and you still don't see it judge i know you don't see it you know you don't see it they know you don't see it Another yeah, big difference between the, the two sides was, and you see this a lot with Binger, so he'd have some argument he wanted to present to the judge, but he wouldn't present it once, right? If it was like a four-point argument, he'd say it in one giant paragraph 18 different times. And it made it sound like it was 18 different arguments, but it's it's the, just the same thing. It's just like with this ridiculous drone video footage, right? Th they made it appear like it was five or six different pieces of evidence, right? Oh, we got the drone video. And now we have the slowed down version and now we have the enhanced version and now we have the enhanced zoom version and now we have two photos and now we have the detective look at the photo and tell us that he sees the gun being raised as if those were all different pieces of evidence and she now i have it. it on my phone you you looked on the screen you need to look it on my phone and look now it's on the phone. tv <laughs> and now we got a pointer and it's all it's all one piece of evidence and binger did this with his arguments in front of the judge too he would just keep talking and talking and talking and and it was the same thing over and over again whereas Jerophacy would sometimes have a good argument to make, and the judge would say, all right, well, do you have anything else to add? And he said, nope, I'm done. Holy crap. Just make the yeah. same argument again. I mean, as long as yes. the judge is going to let you to talk, keep goddamn talking. Yeah. And you got to keep exactly. pushing every trigger the judge has. And one thing I thought they, one of the disagreements we had was I wanted to go at Binger all the way building up to trial because he was going to do a lot of this stuff at trial. So you had to prepare the court of public opinion and prepare the court. And make the court feel at least the, the what I wanted was the court to feel guilty about having a corrupt prosecutor doing a corrupt prosecution right in his courtroom, because he was already bothered by the fact that Binger was even bringing the charges. There was attributes of Binger he already didn't like, and they needed to be highlighted and enhanced. And a pushback the court of public opinion was media was always going to try to hammer the judge. Push back. This is about governmental corruption, prosecutorial misconduct. This case wouldn't be here but for Binger bringing it. Ninety nine out of hundred prosecutors do not bring these set of charges. And go through Binger. Binger has a history of this in, in, in Kenosha. He has a history of uh, people like Binger don't suddenly wake up and start breaking the rules. They don't, you know, accidentally yeah. violate somebody's Fifth Amendment rights by accident. They don't accidentally suborn, try to suborn perjury. I think he did suborn perjury from the two car source witnesses. There's no way he didn't know they were completely lying and libeling. Uh, I mean, they tried, they effectively helped Grosskreutz hide evidence because they selectively applied Macy's law in a way that prosecutor's office in Kenosha had not done previously. <laughs> that was insane. Um, that it was, was just insane. one after the other, after the other, after the other. Uh, and But that would have had, I think, more dramatic impact on the court if it had been built up. Because what he was also doing was lying in bail proceedings. I mean, people forget, this dimwit, Binger, a little Binger, uh, this corrupt hack, went out and told told the court that the Eighth Amendment right to bail he didn't think applied in Wisconsin, the way he interpreted it, the constitutional right to bail. I mean, oh, that was an absurd argument, asinine argument, what he was trying to make a claim to it. So it should have been built up that this guy is a corrupt, rogue prosecutor who's going to go rogue at trial. He's going to make up facts, going to make up law. Going to. I mean, he said there was a duty to retreat outside the context of provocation in the beginning of his closing. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, I, yeah. I have no reason. I, I have no doubt the jury went back and was like, what exactly is the law? because you have the judge's version of it. The other thing is they shouldn't have read the combination. Like the combination of reckless endangerment, there's a part of reckless and self-defense that doesn't apply to reckless endangerment, and there's a part that does. 
And ultimately, the court determined if he had self-defense against Rosenbaum, then he had self-defense against McGinnis. Well, that was that was a lucky break for the defense. I mean, because that's a admittedly confusing area of the law. If you're just a lay person, it, it looks like circular reasoning, very difficult <laughs> to understand. And, and the judge simplified it. I, I mean, frankly, probably more than the law actually calls for in favor of the defense. Yes, yeah, because and, the you know the idea is that if I shoot at uh, Andrew and hit Runkle. Uh, I don't have self-defense uh, 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 as an argument against Runkle for if even if I had self-defense against Andrew in certain circumstances. That's the that's where that language comes from in reckless endangerment. But in this context, it becomes tricky and confusing. And the judge in the same instruction early on, kind of, he said, by the way, there's no self-defense here. And then he said, oh, there is self-defense here. So that was why it's critical that he gave that clarifying instruction. Yeah. That if there's yeah. self-defense yeah. here, I mean, for all the all you lawyers know this, but for people in the comments, I mean, the, the way this is supposed to work is if you're attacked by an armed robber and you pull your gun and you shoot him once and the bullet goes through him and strikes somebody else. Right. Your conduct was reasonable in defending yourself. It was lawful self-defense with the robber. And it wasn't unreasonable and unjustified risk with respect to the bystander who also got hit. So it covers you there. You don't have a right to self-defense against the bystander. They weren't threatening you. But the fact that your conduct was reasonable means it wasn't reckless. Because right. right. reckless conduct is by right. definition unreasonable. The alternative scenario would be if you were faced with an armed robber and you pulled out a machine gun and sprayed 50 bullets all over the neighborhood and then hit innocent people. You, may, you still have your privilege of self-defense against the robber, but now your conduct was reckless with respect to the bystanders. And the state is trying to play a game with the type of bullets you use to, to imply that that's like using a machine gun. They say when you use a full metal jacket, that's likely to go, to pierce through the body, come out the back, and end up hitting McGinnis or anyone else who's behind. I mean, and, I, I and think... that your choice of bullet now makes you reckless. But as, as we were discussing earlier, that's that's a game that they, they'll, they'll play. Sure. Because if you use a hollow tip, which is more likely to blow up in the person's body, they'll say, well, your your conduct, your self-defense was unreasonable because uh, why would you have to use a hollow tip? That's more likely to spread his body and kill the guy. It's so never it's the like right damned bullet. if you win, yeah. damned if you go A, damned if you go B, and I, that's intentional by the state, I believe. Andrew, like the, pros you ever... the prosecutor doesn't have a preferred bullet type that's acceptable to them. <laughs> no, the uh, the have common you ever sort seen of wisdom. Anybody, in... a prosecutor, actually point a gun at the jury with his finger on the trigger? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> that that was new no. to me. Ian, Runkle, Ian. what were you what were you yeah. asking? The uh, the sort of common advice, and I don't actually know how it plays in court because I've never been in the position of making this particular argument. But people always say, get whatever the local police department uses for uh, for their handgun ammunition, because then you can easily turn it around. And it's like, why do you use this? Well, because the police do. Tell me it's unreasonable. It's uh, <laughs> yeah. it's simple for for handguns. Police use hollow points, and for AR-15s, they use full metal jacket rounds. I mean, I, mean, I actually. I carry the same ammo, ammo, whatever it is that the FBI is issuing to its special agents that year. I have a friend who works for the firearms training unit there. I say, what are you guys using? Gold dots? All right, I'll get a box of that. Yeah, uh, I, I, so I was looking for opinions on this. The judge gave Kyle the opportunity to um, scrap the lesser included and just go with the original charged, uh, with the original charges. They declined to do that do you guys think that that was a wise or unwise decision? We had a Tennessee defense lawyer on the other day who suggested that, and, and he has a personal preference towards never having a lesser included because he wants proper charging just in general. But in this case specifically, good move, bad move, why would they make it? Why would they not make it? I mean, do we know whether in Wisconsin the defendant has the privilege of rejecting the lesser included? Because that's not the case everywhere. I think it did that's what the judge... Of. I think it, that's what it, the it creates said. a different appellate standard. He doesn't have an absolute right to reject it. Okay. But uh, he, it, it's, it's that it could, could be considered ineffective assistance if his defense counsel didn't object and he okay. wanted to object. That's how. Yeah, it, that's most why of the, the trials I've seen, the defendant doesn't doesn't have the, the the state is privileged to have those lesser included. When they gave you the higher level charge, not, no, gave notice to the defense of the higher level charge. They implicitly also gave notice of all the lesser included charges. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it was really that's Wisconsin's weird. rule. I mean, the key was once Kyle testified, those lesser included were coming in. That it was the risk of at, Kyle testifying. At yeah. the end of the jury instructions, uh, I believe, didn't didn't the judge have a colloquy with the defendant? And, sure and did. I thought, yeah. 
That's why this is yeah. what Dude, made no with the, sense. Try to move. The, I mean, if, if he has no say in whether or not you have lesser included, and if it's just strictly the judge's discretion, then then why even ask him? I mean, I, uh, being I because of the practicing in Mississippi and Tennessee, we don't do that. The, the, no, Robert, Robert has the call, answer. But, Robert's There's got been the a answer. court case in Wisconsin where a defendant objected to the defense counsel's failure to object to a lesser included, and it became an ineffective assistance of counsel issue. So now courts do a colloquy to make sure the defendant's on the same page as counsel at the time. But here's the, here's the thing that's so weird. They spent three hours trying to knock out every lesser included, arguing of the, that the state would say we want to have this lesser included, this lesser included, where the state and the defense counsel ended up taking opposite arguments. It sounded like we were in bizarro world, where it sounded it sounded almost to the, you know to a layperson like the defense was arguing you know for all these terrible things that he did as a basis to establish that those lesser included don't make any sense. So you spend all these hours with your counsel sitting there trying to fight and keep out all the lesser included. And then you get to the very end there and they ask Kyle, so you want these lesser included? And he's like, yeah, I do. Well, if yeah, you do, then why did your counsel spend the last three hours trying to fight to strike them all down? Well, I, I think what, uh, what Barnes, you're, you're saying that Kyle could not have objected to, or could not have, revoked them he just could have objected to them if his counsel had not and then right. that would preserve on appeal ineffective assistance so of then counsel. why not object to them and then preserve that at least you, you lose nothing oh, by yes, objecting yes. to them I, I don't know why they didn't object uh i mean it depends on how you see the case for some they think it's better to put lesser included in if you're if you think they're going to get concluded you know on a life imprisonment charge as a defense lawyer you want the lesser included if you think that they would never convict on the higher charge, but they might on the lower charge, then you don't want the lesser included. But once they put Kyle on the stand, it was it was a guarantee the lesser included would be there. Can I yeah. Sure oh, about yeah, that? that was a that was a I, I think that was a big risk of Kyle's testimony that came out as they were arguing the lesser included. Um, most of their argument was based on his testimony on cross. Yeah, I mean, I agree with Andrew who said before the trial, the only two ways you can lose this case is you could take a gamble of putting Kyle on the stand or you get a rogue jury. And I think they've managed to create both risks in the case, unfortunately. I'd like to switch gears for a second and ask Andrew or Robert a question because this is something I had, I had a conversation with several people. This is not designed to fluff myself or the panel here. But, you know, well, you fluff. brought up. You brought up earlier, Robert, that you were saying that some, I don't know if it was a stream that I did or something that I did that got to the defense counsel. You didn't, I, if you could clarify that, you can clarify that for, for me off camera. I'd be really curious and, and flattered to know that if any tiny little tenth of a percentile I was able to help Kyle's defense, that's, that's amazing. But my question is this. I've had conversations with people about the social significance or potential social significance of this panel and what we've been doing here. Because this is a brand new thing that I don't think the world has ever seen, where you can watch multiple attorneys weighing in with their honest opinions, fact-based opinions about what they're witnessing at trial, and that this could have unique social significance and you know, from the perspective of looking at it going forward. And I was wondering, and when you made this comment about the fact that, hey, you know, I was able to potentially have some impact in a way that a week ago I never would have imagined would be possible. So that only strengthens my perspective on that. I wanted to ask you whether you thought this is something that is unique to Rittenhouse because of the great passions on both sides of the aisle. Usually there's only passion from the left, not so much passion for the right. There's no passion for the right for Chauvin. There's no passion on the right for McMichaels. But for Kyle, there's passion. So now you have passion on both sides. So I think this case is special and unique. Or... Do you think that, you know what, this could potentially have social significance even on cases that are, are less of less passionate concern to, to the right side of the aisle? I really would like to get like perspectives from attorneys who I respect. Who, Robert, you've been contributing it all on the panel, but you have, you have far, far more important work that you're doing. And Andrew, you've been watching also. So I'd really like to get your, your perspectives on that. Well, first of all, I don't know how you guys do it. I mean, kudos, especially Nick. It seems like you're on my computer 24 hours a day doing <laughs> live stream this or that. And Robert, you're, you're almost as frequent between locals. And I don't even know how all that social media stuff really works, to tell you the truth. But uh, I keep getting notices and stuff popping up on my computer all day and all night. So uh, congratulations for the, that, that tremendous effort and exposure you put out. Um, I, 
I suspect it does make a difference. I mean, I had the, you know, the, the, the Rittenhouse legal team reached out to me about halfway through the trial. Um, nothing ever of substance came of it. I mean, frankly, I, I told them everything I have to say about the trial is, it's free. I mean, it's on my blog. I'm not hiding anything. I'm not holding anything back. That's my, you know, so, I mean, a large part of my practice is doing legal consulting on these kinds of cases, but you know, if you're willing to wait until the trial's in progress, you get it all for free. Cause I'm, I'm talking about it publicly. <laughs> um, so I know they became aware of me. Uh, you know, I don't know. It's ho hopefully we can have some beneficial influence. And, and by the way, I should, I should mention normally most of these cases, I mean, this one's a little different, but you know, I don't know any of these people. I don't know any of these defendants or any of these lawyers. I don't have any personal investment in them. I'm not picking sides. I just, I call these cases as I see them. And, and sometimes, you know, half the country hates me for that. And sometimes <laughs> it's the other half of the country that hates me. It's, yeah. But all I, all I can do is do the legal analysis I do and share my opinions with people. Hopefully we end up with something that's more informed. And my goal is just that, you know, we have pretty good self-defense laws in this country. We really do. And the standards are, the legal standards are pretty good. They could use some tweaking, but they're, they're pretty darn good. And if we apply them in a fair and impartial way, you know, most claims of self-defense are, let's face it, they're bullshit. They're bad guys who are doing bad things and just their lawyers raise the legal defense because that's what you do as a criminal defense lawyer. But the good guy cases of self-defense are different. And the way the laws are written, if the evidence is at all consistent with lawful self-defense, it ought to be an acquittal. It ought to be no charge in the first place. Right. Uh, but people don't understand the law. And frankly, many lawyers, many judges, many prosecutors don't really understand self-defense law. We're not taught this stuff in law. I don't know about you guys, but in my three years of law school, we barely touched on uh, justification at all. Uh, and if you're not a criminal defense attorney, you don't have any professional need to know this area of the law. And if you are a criminal defense attorney, most of your clients are criminals and they're just bad guy cases of self-defense. Most of the lawyers I talk to tell me in their entire careers, they might have four or five good guy cases of self-defense come in their office. And that's, that's just not enough to develop any high level of expertise. I mean, I, I'm very unusual because I, I kind of do a, a legal consulting practice. So I work on cases, I mean, nonstop. That's all I do. And I work on cases all around the country. So I have an exceptional degree of exposure to these legal principles as they're applied in, in all 50 states and Guam and everywhere else. Uh, but most lawyers don't have that. I mean, they just don't have that depth of experience. They couldn't. You could not support a law practice just doing self-defense cases in your, in your local area of good guy cases of self-defense. Cause you're going to have four every 20 years. That's not enough. Well, right. J even, even self-defense cases in general, if you're talking about homicide self-defense cases, you're, you're talking about first spreading all of the homicides out and then having a subset that have any even colorable claim of self-defense right. is, is a tiny subset. So uh, it's, it's it's difficult and and you're right they don't teach it in law school in fact uh criminal law is not on the bar i i believe and was an elective in my school uh so it's like oh well i i guess if you want to have even a basic background in criminal law you have to choose to do that so there was and, no mandatory 1l criminal law class uh i i don't think so i'm pretty sure no i criminal, chose to take it like for wisconsin think, uh, both criminal procedure and substantive criminal law were both required but to give an example on self-defense, the law professor who taught me that told me that he thought there was a problem for Kyle because he was, what's a 17-year-old kid doing with a gun in the middle of a riot? And that, that, well, that's my criminal law procedure professor. So, my, ah, uh, you're viva. Oh, but two good logics, quite, two things. One is uh, to show the power of the court of public opinion and the involvement of more, the ability to access experts outside of the gatekeeper institutions. Uh, I mean, I knew about Andrew because of his Law of Self-Defense channel, also because of his book. But uh, it was enhanced by getting to see somebody visually. You get a sense for who they are. Because sometimes people write books and it's their book. Sometimes they write books, Donald Trump maybe, and somebody else wrote the book. You know, you don't always have a <laughs> sense for who they are. Uh, and so it was my advice for the Kyle Rittenhouse, uh, the whole team, to bring you in, to bring in some, several other people. That's why they reached out. But that's an example of the, the utility of independent commentators then richard's wanted to go do his own thing that that's another story for another day but the but to good logic's point good logic interviewed uh i said the other day i never thought darth i crypto. would thank someone called darth crypto for a case but yeah. there's this guy darth crypto that was breaking down the video actually months ago he'd been sending me stuff that i've been forwarding to the defense team the but he did a great job of breaking down he was anticipating what binger was going to say four days in advance he was sending it to me saying, here's what he's going to do. Here's what he's going to do. 
frankly, the defense team unfortunately ignored it all the way through Friday. But after they saw what happened Friday, when Good Good Logic had Darth Crypto on his channel, Jack Posobiec promoted it, other people promoted it, Andrew promoted it, and all that intel got to the defense because you saw a very big difference between their argument in court on Friday and Richard's close, explaining mm-hmm. how this is a blurry video. It goes from left-handed to right-handed. That doesn't wow. even make sense. The, I mean, it, you get Sauerkraut had to lie about whether there's left-handed or right-handed guns uh, in order to try to retort it. Anybody on the jury that knows otherwise is like, this dimwit's lying about that. What else is he lying about? He could have easily lost a juror just on that issue um, and really blew up that part of their clothes. And that was entirely thanks to crowdsourced information and independent panels of people getting that to the defense team. There was a bunch of stuff Richards, w- I don't think, would have had in his defense, in his closing, but that I thought were important points. Like what Yellow Man actually said was not Kyle pointed it like this. He said Kyle was that. like this when he pointed the gun. Totally yep. different story. That's right. what Darth Crypto uh, That point it. Richards made on close. Had not yes. made it before that point. Indeed, didn't really even prep Kyle for his cross on that point because he could have corrected him in live time. And with this judge allowing speaking objections, heck, he could have told Kyle what to say with a speaking <laughs> objection. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, wow. I, I want to say uh, we were talking about criminal law in in law school. Um, I did have to, I, I was required to take con crim pro, which is one of my favorite classes, uh, com, constitutional criminal procedure, fourth, fifth and sixth amendments. But um, in my criminal defense or my criminal law class, uh, our criminal law professor skipped over sexual assault because that was an uncomfortable topic. Nice. So that's the status of law schools going out there anyway. Oh, we didn't skip and, over it. Uh, we w- <laughs> We did. We went right through I, it. <laughs> I want to welcome to the stream, Mr. Viva. Hey, what's up, buddy? Oh, I'm, I'm at home with two kids who have the sniffles because when kids Aww. have the sniffles and the cough these days, they are worse than typhoid Mary. Uh, but I've been watching in and out. <laughs> Andrew, nice to meet you. Nice uh, to meet you, sir. I'm a big uh, fan. No, oh, thank. I mean, I, 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 I know of your work, and now it's, uh, it's good to meet in person, at least digitally. And I just uh, heard, I heard Joe's question. There's no question that. <laughs> But your crowdsourcing information is just as valuable as crowdsourcing money, crowdsourcing fundraising, and it will be the status quo going forward that people will be watching social media in real time for these types of trials to get the aggregate yeah. knowledge of the internet, to do information research, pull up stuff faster than they could have ever otherwise, otherwise done on their own. So, so you think question. we need to do this more going forward, that we need to just it's, continue? It's going to be a thing going forward. It's just going to be a question of which trial is of interest to which lawyers. And which trials are being broadcast? My my prediction, they might not Fewer be, will be broadcast. They won't be broadcasting these trials quite as often as they might have been in the past if they see, you know, the power that people have to bring this Rittenhouse trial to 100,000 people in real time. Uh, the, the shutdown yesterday was not an accident. No, I, I, I agree it was not an accident. And uh, the fact that the mainstream media sources remained up is testament to that. Because if it was an accident one stream would have remained up and all others would have been shut down because they're all broadcasting the same audio and the same video. Um, I want to read this super chat because it goes right to Joe's question. Uh, This is from Little Rock. says, I'm a defense attorney in Little Rock, Arkansas. I've been following Viva and Barnes for more than 18 months. What you guys do here uh, and list servers in my jurisdiction is great help on legal theory and the you know crowdsourcing uh, to viva's point is 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 going to be the future of all this but the risk of crowdsourcing and this is what is going to have to be carefully managed and i don't know that lawyers and law firms are ready for this is the influx of information that you get the the more notoriety your case has can you imagine uh richard's law firm's email inbox right now like <laughs> And, and this is this is a problem because you've got probably 10,000 emails coming in and you have to find the one with with like Darth Crypto's video or whatever. And and now, fortunately, as uh, as Robert was saying, a whole lot of people were talking about the same specific thing. They're pointing to the same piece of evidence. And that's uh, the Darth Crypto video showing that he wasn't actually reaching for the gun. And And even Richard said. Uh, what's supposed to be his hand was the mirror of the car, yeah. right? He he did say that. So we know that they got that information and that's that's wonderful. But 
but the risk is that you're you're flooding in tens of thousands of pieces of evidence which inflates billing which uh increases confusion and increases fatigue and if if law firms are not properly set up to manage that influx of information when their when their case goes viral or whatever um they're they're really going to be in trouble trying to deal with the info um, well, so I, I think it is the future, but I also think uh, business idea. I think there's a, a, a consulting firm out there that would be well, uh, that would be in, in good company of business to figure out how to help law firms navigate this type of stuff. Well, the, the organic way of navigating it, because there is a, an influx of useful, useless, distracting, uh, correct and incorrect information. It, it is exactly what this uh, microcosm of, of lawyers on YouTube is, is doing basically is filtering the information up. By the time Nick, uh, any one of us does a video, talks about it, in theory, it's gone through something of quality control. So it's not a question of retweeting uh, a bogus video or a doctored image or whatever. It's We've all done something of a due diligence before republishing it ourselves. So that's the, that's it's what's going to end up happening is people are going to go to certain sources for the latest, you know, filtered up uh, information so they can get the best of it. Uh, th that video showing that the mirror was there uh, and that it wasn't actually Kyle's hand, it's incredible. You have to be careful when you retweet it so that you're not endorsing something that might be someone else's opinion and factually incorrect. But by and large, by the time it gets to any one of us, it's gone up the chain in terms of verification from the aggregate knowledge of the internet. And, and it's a really great point, Vivo, because, because what happens is, and we are pretty much the gatekeeper, the final gatekeeper with respect to our own content, which we realize that our own reputation is on the line. None of us want to be humiliated by promoting something that later ends up being factually false. We saw one person here on the panel, I'm not going to mention any names that I saw, who was very upset that he felt he got something wrong on the law. And it's like, it looked like his soul was crushed. And so we are all... <laughs> I'm not. You would think I'm talking about you. No, uh, no. I, I, you might be talking about me. I remember once when I did no, a video I, on on Kinder eggs, and I actually. I mean, I, the only I, one that's that's effectively ruled out is me because I'm the only non-he, right? I, <laughs> I just feel I just feel bad for you, Joe, talking in the third person. That's what I feel bad for. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm not gonna say any I'm not gonna say any names. You know, those people know. You know, his name might rhyme with Kung Kim Kung Kimo Paw. But, um, but he, what? <laughs> I don't even know who the heck you're talking about anymore. No so one does. You don't know how to rhyme. <laughs> Look, Viva, I don't know what you're talking about with this, you know, this spreading of false information. <laughs> but we have this new picture here shows what happened in uh, in Las Vegas that fateful Nick, day. But you know, the, the funny thing is, the internet doesn't have a sense of humor when it doesn't want to have one. And someone will take this out of context. Say Nick Ricada promoting <laughs> conspiracy theories about the Mandalay Bay shooter. Yes, um, it was Binger the whole time. <laughs> Joe, can you, can, you pull up, Nick, can you pull up a Matthew Modine's tweet that I retweeted? I mean, when we talk about idiotic takes, I'll, I'll read it from the interwebs. Matthew Modine just tweeted something. And you have to wonder what celebrities who have a big platform, like it's LeBron James level idiocy. Matthew Modine writes, is Kyle Witt Rittenhouse wearing surgical gloves? If so, why? To cover his fingerprints. Why would he load a weapon with bullets to travel to an event, aim the rifle at people, pull the trigger of the rifle he'd loaded, unless he went there with the intent to kill? Oh my God. So wow. somebody is now just getting one piece of information of this file, because if he's, if he's shocked by the fact that Kyle Rittenhouse is wearing surgical gloves, he's new to this case. But can you imagine someone thinking that someone would put on surgical gloves to cover their fingerprints, go somewhere with the intent to kill, and they wouldn't cover their face? I mean, this is the, <laughs> this is the thought process of those who would promote false narratives. Yeah, well, the whole, that whole nonsense about, they, and they spent time, what blows my mind is that they spent time and resources at trial on the surgical gloves, the state did, to try and, and get some sort of gotcha. But it's like, wait a minute, so... There's no dispute, though, that this gun was the murder, the the weapon. I shouldn't say the murder weapon, oh, but <laughs> the weapon that was used. But this is the state's perspective, right? Like, there's no dispute. We know that this is the gun fired. We know that Kyle's the guy who fired it. It's all on video. Uh, I don't think at any point in this case the defense has ever done anything other than stipulate to the fact that Kyle Rittenhouse shot eight times specifically, and nothing else has been alleged. So it's like, 
what what is the purpose of the surgical gloves? Like, why are we doing? Are we you're going to try and prove that a guy is intending to not? He, show, he's trying to like, cover his fingerprints, but not cover his face while and giving an interviews. An event that is being video video <laughs> broadcast by how and, many people? <laughs> and giving an interview in real time to McGinnis, who he knows is from the media, but doesn't. I mean, but it's just this is how people convince themselves of their stories. But they go out and tweet that Modine doesn't have a big Twitter following, but then you get, you know, the LeBron Jameses, who I will not refer to as his majesty, uh, you know, tweeting his own version of events, fake, fake tears from someone who's suffering clearly from PTSD. Uh, what's the news? What's the latest I've been watching? But um, so far, I, I would have lost a bet because I thought they'd be deliberating for less than this time. I, I've lost a bet too. I, you know, I, I didn't think they would actually be less than two hours and 45 minutes, but I hoped I hoped and wanted it and no one else was taking the better than legal mindset, but no, the, the main news is that initially, you know, they went into the jury room after 90 minutes of deliberation, they sent a request out to the judge for the first six pages of the instruction. Um, the first six pages entitle the in, or encompass the entirety of the self-defense um, and along with the first charge. So the, the shooting of Joseph Rosenbaum as a reckless homicide. Um, and actually, I had a question about this. We talked about it earlier, but uh, Mr. Branca and Mr. Barnes were not on yet. Um, so I wanted to pitch it to you guys. Do you think that the charging of the reckless homicide was an attempt to sidestep uh, self-defense in general, or what, what is the, what is the idea behind that? Maybe is a better question because as far as I can tell this, there's no evidence that this, uh, this homicide would be reckless. It would either be intentional or intentional with premeditation, but that's, that's I'll, I'll what I've I'll defer to Robert. Cause I I'm, I'm bewildered by this uh, decision to charge it as reckless as well. I, unless they just, you know, they were in such a rush that they picked something they thought would best fit the the threat and all the other circumstances. And then they were stuck with the charge. I mean, I think what's interesting is uh, prosecution completely failed to go into detail about imperfect self-defense in their close. So technically, that can be a difference in the gradations of the crimes in Wisconsin. That they could say, yeah, Kyle thought he uh, what, what he was doing was self-defense, that he was at imminent risk, but his belief wasn't reasonable. Well, it's in the instructions. Oh yeah, it's so, in mean, the, the jury, instructions. The jury got those instructions. They so did. It was some of the... I just I thought prosecution would help gr help explain that gradation. Say, okay, even if you think Kyle thought this, mm. you have to separately decide this is what this is about. Instead, I mean, they basically judge it. I mean, jurors' eyes go glazed when they're right. listening to the instruction, especially when it is as confusing as as you as you mentioned, Andrew. Um, and so, usually, I've never seen a case where neither side went into great detail in the jury instruction uh, in closing. Yeah, that, I don't that understand that. Especially this case, you have gradations of charges and you have yeah. self-defense plus provocation plus duty to retreat based on provocation that changes when, you know, I mean, it's like, I thought there'd be more there. I yeah, think the I, state I, I believe is in making the jury's job as easy as possible in my favor. So yes. step here, yes. step there, step there, step there, acquittal. Exactly. I, I, check, check, I think check. the state, uh, I think the state is very wary about bringing up the idea that his self-defense would even be subjectively reasonable, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I, I think that I think they made a big mistake in rebuttal, bringing up this whole like he shouldn't have used his gun. He should have just he should have just thrown hands uh, like a real man would have. I think that was a big mistake because it it just told the jury it would have been reasonable if he would have defended himself with fists. But, you know, not a gun like that's too far. Well, now, now it's an you, attack. Right? right. I mean, basically, the state conceded it was an attack, just not that much of an attack before it was just he's chasing him out of the area to, you know, save people. Yeah. And so I, I think that was a mistake. And I think in planning their clothes, uh, they they wanted to stay away from the idea that Kyle's that even Kyle's perspective was something he could reasonably come to. They They wanted him to be a murderer, because if they introduced to the defense that he's actually defending himself or to the jury that he's actually defending himself and that it's not all just a, a post facto lie. Then the jury goes, you know what? Actually, if I do put myself in his shoes, yeah, I would have shot the crazy man too. It, well, it was, I could not if, believe what, what Klaus said on closing Klaus, that he was too much of a coward to use his sour face. Klaus, sour, sour Klaus. It's, <laughs> it's Klaus, isn't it? It's with an R because Klaus, Klaus <laughs> 
because Klaus would yeah. be too funny, right? Like he would be in a red suit tomorrow. <laughs> okay, you know what? It, it is Klaus. Never mind. <laughs> uh, that was a Freudian slip. The memes would have already yes. flowed. Um, th that he said he was too much of a coward to fight. Uh, fist to fist with a well, they don't know that the guy's a convicted convicted pedophile but to say that and then to say sometimes you just take a beating i mean it, i nice. can't imagine how stupid it was to concede the fact that he was in fact being attacked by these people and his two choices were to give up his superiority um uh, you know equalizer of the gun and, or just to take the beating it, i i couldn't understand it and it, but it is going to it's going to complicate or confuse the jury as to what you know what they convict him on at what point in time, um, when and where. But well, thank yeah. God for Kraus because to the extent I thought the uh, defense could have done a better job on closing, they made up a lot of ground, uh, <laughs> thanks to Kraus for sure. Yes. Sour yeah, Kraus was the gift they kept on giving. But <laughs> I, I can tell you one thing: we should fully expect. Uh, I, I don't know about the politics of these things being broadcast, but we're not going to get fewer of these cases happening uh, right. because all no. there's powerful drivers for these cases to occur, uh, both monetary and political. Um, you see these- Especially I'll, I'll, if I'll, there's I'll, any convictions. If there's any convictions that uh, every little wannabe little binger in the country is gonna say, wow, even that doesn't matter. worked out for him. You don't even need a conviction. For guys like Binger, these, these trials are win-win. They can't yeah. lose. I'll, I'll share an anecdote from the Zimmerman trial. The attorney there, uh, uh, Angela Corey, uh, oh, was them. a prosecutor out of Jacksonville. She was running for reelection. She was going to lose because it had a, a large part of the demographic was African-American. She had prosecuted some African-American cases that were controversial. The uh, Marissa Alexander case, uh, who purportedly fired around into the air in an abusive uh, relationship. And then a 14 year old who had murdered someone and she prosecuted him for murder. Uh, frankly, I think both of those were appropriate prosecutions, but the community didn't like them. There were marches against her. She was gonna lose her office. And then the George Zimmerman case happened. And she got herself a completely different judicial district put in charge of that prosecution. And suddenly, instead of marches against her in her district, there were marches she was at the front of in her district. And she won re-election. And when she lost the case, he was acquitted on all charges unanimously. Um, you know, that wasn't a loss for her. I mean, sure, she lost the trial. But was that her real goal? Or was her real goal political capital to get re-elected? Because if you look at it that way, she won. And it'll be the same for Binger. If he wants to run for DA again or some political office, or it's a win-win. Either he gets the conviction, and look, I was right, the guy's guilty of murder, or he doesn't get the conviction, but he fought the good fight regardless. There's, there's no loss here for him. And in terms of uh, the money, there's a lot of money in these cases, right? Not so much the, the Rittenhouse case, although there's $10 million lawsuits flying around this too, but any of these cases that involve a cop, <laughs> I mean, the, the, these cities... Politicians who run these cities are more than happy to spend other people's money to make their political problems go away. And that's why you see in the Chauvin case, 20 million here, Jacob Blake, 27 million, whatever these numbers are. It, it, this is, is, and by the way, the lawyers, the, uh, what's his name? Benjamin, the Benjamin Crumps of the world. It's, oh, it's, it's, it's like an ATM for him. I mean, three, four times a year, he's getting a third of those settlements. It, it's unbelievable. And he doesn't even go to trial. I mean, he never goes to trial. They're all settlements. So yeah, there, long as work. long well, as there's that much money to be made and that much political capital to be made, we're going to see more of these cases, not fewer. And then you throw in the GoFundMes now, where somebody, if they can create a big enough scandal within 24 hours of an incident, the family's raising money. I mean, Michael Brown's family ended up fighting over who could get the profits from selling various Michael Brown paraphernalia in Ferguson. So their incentive is to narrate the story to go viral on social media because all of a sudden you can raise quarter a million, half a million. Your life is set for somebody that may not have a lot of means to begin with. Look, I, I have no idea what you guys are talking about. There's no money in any of these cases. I, I don't know what you are saying. And I am frankly offended by uh -huh. the imputation of my character here. Um, I, I wanted You definitely haven't be... made a dime over the last week. <laughs> I wanted to be known that uh, that Binger's TikTok has actually been uncovered. Um, here it is. Uh, four fingers more Binger. That. <laughs> you know, the, the aggregate knowledge of the internet and the aggregate humor of the internet, this is... But, but this has been the meme case of all memes. I've Can never you... seen more memes. There's well, just so many, I mean, like that now that there's like memes, but of the being of the Binger Kyle interaction on the stand with just all kinds of fictional questions. And, you know, like Binger asking, <laughs> is it okay if my wife sleeps with another man? <laughs> and, you know, and, and it's, it's always that Kyle shocked look and response. Yeah. 
I know this yeah. is, this probably dates me or ages me a bit, but seeing Binger with that right that AR-15 aiming it reminds me of Mike Dukakis on the tank back in 1988 mm-hmm. when he was running for president. I mean, <laughs> if that doesn't just make a person look idiotic, I don't know what does. And that's why I'm like listening to Andrew. You're making amazing points about you know there's there's a gain in this politically for everybody. But I like to still think reasonably optimistically and that even if someone is politically leaning to Binger's side of the aisle, they would look at that performance of, on the one hand, overt dishonesty and judge him for it. And they would look at that moment where he, with his finger on the trigger, we didn't know at the time, pointing the gun at the jury, would say, holy cow, this man has poor judgment. But I, the, the way politics are, they'll look at him and say, yeah, he fought the good fight. He did what he thought was right. And I agreed with him. And I still think Kyle is a, is a killer. And so let's let's get him in for, I don't know, what would he run for, in judge there. or? Well, they're going to blame the judge. And what's ADA coming next for, is, or DA ADA. first. I don't think any African-American ended up on the jury. So the media narrative you're going to hear, you already saw him testing it out last week. It's going to be the judge and all white jury. They're going to say there's the one person of the color. Michael case if McMichaels get acquitted. The person of color is a Hispanic male. Yes. Oh, does that uh, count or not? That only counts sometimes. <laughs> All right, yeah, Kyle Rittenhouse Zimmerman. is also a Hispanic or <laughs> half true. Hispanic male. So who knows? George Zimmerman uh, went from being Hispanic to, to white to respond overnight. To, to respond yeah, to, to what you were saying, I think that I think that people's opinions of this case differ drastically, and I, I'm, I'm sure everyone here will agree differs drastically depending on whether they actually saw the testimony themselves or if they if they got the highlights from from the legacy media or the mainstream media. I mean, just just a polling of of people that that I know and and people that you know asking my friends who who, who have you talked to about this case and and what are their thoughts and even even people that were left leaning that actually saw the testimony themselves, they were like, man. Self defense. I think. I think he's innocent. It's, it's a dangerous tendency of of we lawyers uh, to think that the world looks at these things like we do, that they look at evidence and apply <laughs> powers of reason and come to rational conclusions. That's not how normal people operate. Uh, normal people, first of all, they're busy with their lives, so they're hardly paying any attention at all. What little attention they are paying yeah. is being consumed by the mainstream media, who's serving them massive doses of propaganda, whatever they want the spin to be. And people don't magically know the truth. People only know what they're exposed to. And propaganda works. That's why people do it. So I I periodically teach at the uh, FBI Academy at Quantico, and I talk about these high-profile cases that have been propagandized. And I'll ask an audience, 300 senior law enforcement special agents, I'll say, hey, you're all familiar with the George Zimmerman case. How many people here believe that he got out of his car after the dispatcher told him not to get out of the car? And every hand in the room goes up because they saw that a million times in the paper. And then I'll play the 911 call with the dispatcher and I'll say, all right, I'm going to play it. Now I want you to raise your hand when you hear the dispatcher tell him, don't get out of your car. And it never happens. I mean, that's a complete myth. It literally Mm -hmm. never happens. Some of you probably think that's what actually happened, but it never happened. People believe it because they saw it a thousand times. And you can see on the faces of these senior law enforcement officials, they still can't absorb that it didn't happen. Their, their faces go blank because not only did they hear it a thousand times, they've said it a thousand times. They, they're they emotionally committed to this version of the truth that's untruth. And it's very difficult for people. You, you can't simply present people with proof that what they think is untrue and they just mm-hmm. go, oh yeah, okay, I guess you're right. That's how lawyers may think because we're argumentative and that's the nature of, of how we work. But that's not how normal people think. Normal, you show them counter evidence to something they believe in, and it's like it's invisible. It's like or they or empty. they go even deeper. That's been in psychological studies too. When you present people with contrary evidence, it just winds up digging them even deeper into the hole. So it's it, yeah, it's a real problem. With with the Zimmerman case, I I have now fully relinquished or abandoned any opinion I had because I realized now discovering in this trial and others what I probably did not get exposed to in the Zimmerman, I, I, I can no longer have any initial opinion of it. But watching this one in real time and seeing people out there who still do not know or did not know that Grosskrauts had a gun. And then you say, I, I say, how can anyone not know that basic fact of this? But then you realize, how, and I put out a video yesterday where the video got demonetized because it had a, an image of Grosskrauts with the gun in his hand, not the graphic image of his arm blown off, just the image of him with the, the tip of the gun pointed to the ground and the, the, another image of uh, Binger with his finger on the trigger. And you know, the video gets demonetized, so I re-edit and take out those images. 
um, still have the other uh, unedited version. On Whereas, Netflix, by contrast, the media images of Kyle with a gun have been broadcast over and over and over and, and, and over. And, and now over. that I think about it, I've done. We, we we've talked about it. I know I've used the image of Kyle with the gun. Never had a problem on YouTube. It's in all my this, thumbnails. <laughs> well, did, did you not get? Did you not have problems with YouTube for using an image with the gun in your thumbnail? Nope, not when Kyle's holding it. Well, I so can tell you that my own YouTube videos is this, what you're looking at right now. It's me talking in my office. I very rarely include any images or any video clips of anything. And every YouTube video I put up is demonetized from upload. And then I, I hit the little review button and 24, 36, 48 hours later, I get an email saying, oh yeah, we've reviewed it, it's fine. But of course, then it's, it's not timely anymore. So no one's gonna look at it. Yep. Of course. Uh, and that's every single video. And all I do is sit at my desk, just like this, talk legal analysis, and I get demonetized. Yeah, you and me both, brother. But well, forget it, the forget the fact about the guy not having the gun. I mean, I've seen tweets this week where people are saying, "I'm just learning for the first time that Kyle Rittenhouse didn't shoot a black person." Yes, yep. insanity, I, insanity. It, you know, so, and it, it's funny yeah. you should mention that, Kurt. Now the the cynical pill is going off in my head. They've suddenly discovered Jump Kick Man, who happens to be a black male, and so now I'm wondering, do they throw oh, that in at this point? The prosecution knew him all along. He said he would testify as long as he got immunity for his other crimes. The prosecution didn't want him to testify, so they wouldn't give him immunity. I mean, they've completely controlled who could testify. But Zeminsky, they can't represent they, to the court that they don't know who he is, which they did. Oh, yeah. They lied, of course. Shock, shock. I mean, I, mean, I, mean, I, 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 I still have lie. hope that I still have hope. I know we're pushing the lines a lot, but I still have hope that he's just not out and out lying to the court and misrepresenting something like that. Oh, I maybe I'm a naive person. Maybe this is a sweet he, summer he, child. He, it's who he is. Moment. When someone it's tells you who is. they are, Kurt, listen. I mean, he he's told us <laughs> okay. he's a liar from the beginning. <laughs> Damn it! I want to have faith in uh, my profession. We're good people. I oh, have faith in the profession, <laughs> well, just not faith in Binger. Binger has proven himself. There's no question. prosecutors are barely people. They become people when they're former prosecutors. Um, no, but Emily going Baker back, has entered the chat. <laughs> yeah, going back to the uh, going back to what Andrew was saying about the Zimmerman case, and you were talking about the lead the lead prosecutor on that. But if you go, there's a guy who did the documentary just like last year or the year before on the Zimmerman case. And I was reading the, the synopsis of it. And when you follow the career path of every state attorney involved in that case, you're like, Oh my, like all of them got just monumental promotions, either politically or just straight up the chain uh, bureaucratically. And it's One without exception. Now. One yeah, of those one prosecutors, of uh, uh, John uh, John Guy, is now a uh, and I hear he's a good judge in family court. They, local lawyers tell me he's a good judge there. Uh, he was the guy screaming on, on closing in the trial that not only did George Zimmerman not only did he have a gun, he had a round in the chamber in the ready to fire condition. Like you would carry a gun any other way if you're carrying a gun for personal <laughs> yeah, protection. Really. By the way, if he didn't have a round chambered, he'd be dead. If he'd had yep. to rack because he only had the one hand free, if he had to rack that slide. He, he would be dead. He would have his head broken open on that sidewalk. But you never you know, people always that ask one me, chambered. one of the most common questions I get from normal human beings is, uh, Andrew, if I do this, that, or the other thing, you know, uh, could that be used against me in court? And I have to explain to people, everything can be used against you in court. If, if by used against you in court, we mean, is a prosecutor going to talk about it in front of the jury to try to make you look bad in their eyes? There's almost no limit to what they can use against you. They'll use anything. The question is, how much is it likely to hurt you and how effectively is your defense counsel going to be able to blunt that damage? Uh, but whether they'll use it, listen, if you're, if you're a trial, uh, they're there to convict you. They're not there to lose. They're there to win. And to Andrew's point, the, re the reason why I believe you have to go after prosecutors personally for their political aspirations and everything else and, and make them put them on trial in a case and lead investigators too, is precisely what he just described. In Zimmerman, they got exposed at trial and they also got rewarded. Yet, unless you create personal risk, professional risk for them, you're not creating any disincentive for them not to march forward. Because Ethics. Binger could lose completely in this case and the left is going to love him. He'll probably get a CNN contract tomorrow if he wants it. And it'll be on path. And that's, I mean, that's why I'm creating my disbar binger campaign. Now, it's also because the head of Office of Lawyer Regulation I've had run ins with before, who runs, that's who runs Wisconsin's ethics for the Wisconsin Supreme Court. And my argument to him for two decades now has been he goes after little people and he lets prosecutors walk. And I want to use this case as a test case 
to force him, Keith Saline, been there a long time, uh, time to step up or prove that I'm right and that, you know, OLR is a joke. Um, and, you know, the uh, hopefully use it. But that's why I think it has to be done. It's not just a matter. It is tactically necessary to deter and discourage the misuse and abuse of prosecutorial power to put the personal and professional uh, reputation of the prosecutor and investigators themselves at risk. So, so hard to do. And and if, you, if it can't be done, what happens in five years when we have the next Kyle Rittenhouse case and the judge in that case is not Schroeder, it's Binger? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And well, why would you do that? Why would norm. you say that? That is rude. <laughs> I'll be right back. The um, I Well, and what you guys... said, Andrews, that's the norm. That's what we face more like in federal court. And a lot of the, that you, you don't get judges like Schroeder. You get judges that are there to railroad your client. Yeah, Schroeder's, you know, I mean, listen, the guy's ancient, he's 100 years old, and, and you know, his his demeanor and his decisions reflect that. Uh, but, he's a you know, southern he's, judge who happens to be in Wisconsin. Yeah. And isn't it, isn't it sad that when we're talking about someone who's considered a based judge or a right-leaning judge, it just means that they actually issue fair decisions as opposed to being completely slanted when you're looking at a leftist they judge? They think about it, they apply reasoning, Well, you know, <laughs> and explain judges, it. Judges come from the population of lawyers. Lawyers come from law school. Have you been to a law school lately? No, it's nothing not lately. but what social injustice. Chills. It's The floors are drowning in social injustice pamphlets. They're completely politicized institutions. I speak at them, and I show up, and it doesn't look like anything resembling a law school to me. It looks like some kind of political indoctrination factory. But all those people are going to graduate, be lawyers, and then in 10, 15 years, they're going to be the judges. And, and you know, it's when, going when... to be a different legal landscape. I went to school uh, 2002 in Quebec City. It's a 99% French uh, city. And one of the first classes I had with this teacher who was controversial, Réjean Breton, for anybody who is watching from Quebec, he, he, the first class he gives, it was labor law, and he goes into a diatribe about how, the, how America is racist and all this stuff. And then he asks the class, he says, do you know who the most powerful person after the president is in America right now? And at the time, it was George Bush Jr. who was the president. No, nobody raises their hands. And I say, uh, I think it was Colin Powell or, or Condoleezza Rice, because both of those answers came up. And this teacher was, you know, informing a class who had these preconceived notions of, of the injustice in the United States by highlighting, you know, premises that would under, undermine their most core beliefs. It was, it was social justice back 20 years ago. It just didn't have the name. And now it's got the name and it's been um, concentrated through uh, evaporation over the last 20 years and all that's left. I mean, I, I wouldn't want to go to university. No. You know, as, as has been pointed out many times, critical race theory did start itself in the law school. So yay for us for starting that whole train. <laughs> well, first first semester, first year law school for me, uh, you know, back in the old days. The uh, but it was already continue. It was already beginning. We were being taught in legal writing to uh, disguise our subjective preferences as objective legal analysis. And it was a basic case. It was about, you know, is there a right a, a, for an adult disabled child to make a loss of consortium claim in Wisconsin? You research the law. It turned out there isn't. Why? You know, probably some bad policy reasons why there wasn't. But that was the reality. And I kept getting bad grades. And I was like, what's going on? And then it became clear there was a template written. And the template was pretend your subjective biases, you want this person to win the claim, is the objective law. And I was like, that's not the assignment. The assignment is to teach us to distinguish between the two. And they were teaching, no, don't distinguish between the two. Lie to yourself and lie to others that your subjective oh, personal dear. preferences are really objective law. And now we're seeing the consequences of it, and it's going to get worse rather than better. Yeah, that just makes you a bad lawyer. Absolutely, I mean, it does. If, if you can't, if you just, if you can't, I mean, even even if you're if you're thinking that that you know you're, I mean, we're all gonna you know ha have have that thought from time to time that our subject subjective thoughts are better than others, right? But I mean, at Mine least are. you should be able to tell the difference between the two, <laughs> or at least attempt to try. Well, yeah, is it gonna make you a bad lawyer if the forum for arguing law shares those same biases? Well, or does that make Andrew, you a good lawyer in that forum? It's if the, the form's it's, not demanding uh, reasonableness and objectivity, then showing up as a reasonable, objective lawyer is a good way to lose cases. Yeah, and Andrew, to that heretic. point, look, look at the uh, look at the human rights tribunals or the administrative tribunals of Canada. The judges are who are appointed. They're not uh, lawyers become judges then appointed. They are special appointees. Some of them, I, I don't. I'm not even sure that some of them have to have been lawyers in the first place. You have these hyper politicized administrative tribunals that operate on their own uh, by their own system where the judges are um 
I, what's the word I'm looking for? Not radicalized, but you know, getting there with 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 very specific purposes for existence, and their rulings encourage the uh, reason for their existence in the first place, and then you end up with decisions like fining a comedian forty-three thousand dollars for making a joke about a celebrity kid who happens to be handicapped. You end up with another decision where tens of thousands of dollars for misgendering an employee who had worked at a place for one month. That's what you get, and we're, you can see it in Canada if you want a foreshadowment of what it would look like in the U.S. I I see it coming. <laughs> I just hope the train is moving slow enough that uh, that uh, it'll be my kid's problem. Killing. Jesus Lord! <laughs> oh, say, say that again, Kurt. I say they accuse me of black pilling. Lord have mercy. Yeah, I was man. gonna say I'm much more. I think I'm much more white pilled than most of you because I do. I see. I'll tell you what. This stream here is evidence to me that the silent majority we're constantly hearing about does exist because here it is. We have a channel which is an independent guy is just a, he's a small time, small town, no, nothing, nobody lawyer from Minnesota. <laughs> no, he's just, I'm saying he's a small channel guy. He's the leader and, of our cause at this point. And right now, right now, the right flag, now he's, the, he's the king of law <laughs> of, of, of YouTube lawyers. And he's the most popular channel to watch the most significant trial of the last of the last generation. So I think that that speaks volumes about where America's mindset is compared to what our our overmasters would have us believe it is. Look, I'm hey, normally black pill, but I, I believe in the power of love. I just want to say <laughs> um, this is a new book that is coming out soon. And I believe in the power uh, of the it, Rakita law. It will be, it will be bestseller hear- what we're saying. Uh, I hear about this on Twitter about 10 minutes ago. Apparently the jury asked for 11 copies of pages 7 to 36 of the jury instructions. <laughs> yeah, but, and but t- tomorrow morning they're going to come back and I'm ask I'm surprised they didn't get it all in the first place. I'm surprised they didn't yeah, get it all in the Yeah, I'm surprised by that too. My, read on that, uh, my guess would be there's some holdouts. Because usually sure. what that happens is they're arguing with each other about what, what the instructions really mean. Yeah, You just don't uh, know which way that breaks. But if I were to guess, I would guess they're, they, they, got some, uh, they got some rogue jurors on there. That's what, I mean, what I would Jack, call rogue jurors. Uh, they got Pistole jurors did... who came in presuming Kyle guilty and have stuck with that belief. And, and, and was, that Jack was a big Pistole problem did... from pretrial prejudice uh, in Kenosha. It was almost two thirds when, when we polled it. Yeah. Uh, two, almost two thirds of the jurors presumed Kyle guilty. And there were a third that were hardcore. They were yeah. basically impossible to move, as going to Andrew's point earlier, that the, you know, cognitive, cognitive dissonance, the nature of the psychology of mind, pre-committed opinions on, mm-hmm. you know, the, uh, mem- I call it memento memory. I've had it several times in cases. <laughs> My favorite one is, is a case where uh, there was one key point I knew I th- thought would be important. So I talked about it about 60 times so much that the judge warned me three times to quit being so repetitive. And at the end of the trial, this one juror voted against me. It's like, man, I really wish I would have known, heard about that fact. And I was like, oh, you mean this one? Like, yeah, yeah, that one. I was like, the one I said 60 something times. <laughs> the, uh, so it's just the I nature. I yelled group. at for you. <laughs> exactly. But uh, my read on this at this point is because also yesterday, half of the jurors were wanting to go home half, and come back. Half of them wanted to stay. The half that wanted to stay, my guess, were ready to make up their minds and be done mm-hmm. with it. So my guess, you got two to three holdouts. And... Uh, from people I knew in the jury, uh, or from journalists I heard from in the jury, in the watching the trial, they said that the way they put it is, quote, there are definitely a couple of Karens on the jury. It was uh, Jack Posobiec put out a tweet that said there's uh, at least one rogue juror, and Jack tends to have pretty accurate information earlier than most people. So I, I don't know what the definition of and, rogue uh, juror is here. Nick's high school friend, which uh, I could be misinterpreted. <laughs> <laughs> but Nick's high, uh, the, the high school uh, uh, Kenosha kid that had been in the courtroom talked about the <coughs> mask wearing ones. And a couple of those were people told me were seemed like Karen personalities. That was just their read on it. Yeah. And it's, it's certainly possible. And that is the, that is the oh, question. One addendum. There was oh, one yeah. juror who cried all of yesterday in prosecution and defense, just was crying all the way through. Huh. Like, oh God, make these bad speeches stop. <laughs> <laughs> we, I could I, be I watching a, this uh, on YouTube. I got a jury notice just about a month ago and I cried when I got it. But thankfully they didn't <laughs> they didn't want me, fortunately. No, but this somehow is somehow they like, this is, somehow this I've is, never got a jury notice. They, I must be on some sort of list. I don't I, well, when hearing someone cries, I, I it might be my own um, it has to be my own bias. I cannot imagine anyone crying in that context except for the fact that of what's going on to Kyle. 
I could not imagine anyone crying for someone who got their arm blown off because they brought a gun and pulled it or someone smashing someone over the head with a skateboard. I, 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 I could not imagine crying for, for that side of the, uh, well, the pleading. But they, I might might... Be, they might be feeling a lot of pressure too, though. I mean, I, well, I would imagine that over the weekend, they, yeah. they probably had or some the... conversations. I mean, let's be real. They probably had conversations with people around them. Or, or so, some threats. I, they, they, I could see them crying about I'm, the decision they have well, to make. I, what... I was being nice when I was calling them conversations. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think what Andrew pointed out yesterday is you have a percentage of people who feel very sympathetic for Rosenbaum and uh, Huber. Uh, you know, it's shocking to us because of all the facts right. we know about them and their behavior, but the liberal Democratic types, that's who they were sympathetic for. They had no sympathy for Rittenhouse. And if all they're seeing is what the media reports, it's not hard to imagine how you end up with people in that position. And it's not because they're bad people or malicious. It's just we only know what we're exposed to, and that's all that they're exposed to. Did you, you have, to, you have to find out years. that he raped children? Like, it, you have to go work to find out that this guy in the most high-profile case uh, that we've seen in a while, coming out of a state anyway, rather than a federal case, raped 11 children, or has 11 counts of rape against children. Like, that that we even have to go find that independent of the media is is exactly the problem with this. And it's it's why if, if uh, independent media like, like this type of show... Um, eventually becomes the de facto way that people watch these trials and cases evolve, it's going to be that. It's going to be, oh, yeah, did you know that this happened? Oh, yeah, did you know that this happened? And um, CNN, have they ever reported the criminal history of Rosenbaum or Huber that he threatened to murder his own grandmother? That goes against the right? narrative. Oh, it's Yeah, I mean, I was just on uh, Megyn Kelly right after Robert today, uh, actually, and... Uh, you know, I mentioned to her, she asked, she played some media footage of them saying outrageous things about the case and reporting misinformation. And and what can you do but shrug? I mean, anybody who doesn't understand yet that the, the mass media, especially the news media, is really just a propaganda arm for the political left. And that's what they do. They're propagandizing. And by the way, propaganda is done because it works, because it's effective. Otherwise, people wouldn't bother. And that's all people hear all day. That was my constant argument with Richards. He didn't, he didn't get that. It was driving me absolutely berserk. I was like, look, I get in a certain world, this, uh, in, in a case without pretrial publicity and without political undercurrents, yes, you don't have to worry too much about the jury. A random Kenosha jury will be an acquittal jury in this case if you remove <laughs> both of those factors. But you can't in this context. The, the risk of rogue jurors was so high. Um, and uh, he just he didn't, he didn't accept that idea. It's hard because, I mean, normal trials aren't like this. You, right. know, you could be a criminal defense attorney your, your whole career, never have a case like this. And it's really kind of boring. And you really do get a, a blank slate jury that doesn't know anything about the case when they come in. And, you know, you, jury selection is an hour and you're all done. And it's about as fair and as impartial as you could expect. Um, and if that's a person's experience and that's the normal experience, you suddenly find yourself, you know, under 3,000 feet of water of news media coverage when you're in one of these cases, you've just never, you can't believe it. I mean, it's impossible to conceive of what it's like if you've never been through it. And by the time you realize what's happening, you're halfway through the trial. Yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah, I'm, so I'm, what do you... I'm still blown away by the fact check, PolitiFact fact checking the, uh, the, the, yeah, they the, lied the, the, the first time about the gun law <laughs> and they just came back and said, no, it was okay. We lied about it the first time. Oh no, they said it was, it, 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 he said it was clearly legal and it's not clearly legal because uh, you know, there was some there was some discussion. So therefore, the statement that it was clearly legal is false. So they can double down on their initial lie. I mean, then it's an opinion disputing an opinion. That's but, all it is at that point. And that's what these the, fact checks have turned into. If they're opinion pieces, call them opinions, but don't call them fact checks. And uh, also, and we'll, you know, yeah. So I wanted to ask about that uh, charge six, which was dismissed. This is the minor in possession charge. And we went through the statute uh, early on in the stream, which was great to just go through and reiterate that. I did that with Hoglaw. You know, the judge said that the pleading standards were actually sufficient to sustain the charge through its initial motion to dismiss. Basically, they've met the probable cause pleading standards of a criminal complaint. But I don't think they actually did. There, and there and that's... There were never relevant facts in dispute. So relevant right. facts. You know, there were right. things they were saying, but they were not under any normal reading in the statute. They're, but they never the pled 
uh, they never pled that he was carrying a short barrel rifle, which ended up being the the issue on which Schrader uh, threw out the charge, right? Well, if it's not a short barrel rifle, I agree with the statutory interpretation of Sheriff Easy, and he argued this exact statutory interpretation in oral arguments, and I assume in his brief at the pretrial motion to dismiss. But he he then says, well, if the state is alleging that this is uh, a le- you know a long barreled rifle, then I'm going to dismiss. But he defended his decision to not dismiss earlier by saying, well, it I was just judging it on the pleading standards and, and the facts were sufficiently pled. But they're, they weren't, right? Like, am right. I crazy well, 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 on the this? Tr- the truth is, and this is just my opinion, I don't know how you guys feel about it, but I, I think the, the whole probable cause standard in America courts is profoundly broken. It's, it's nothing. It's a piece of tissue paper that the prosecutors just blow their nose right through. Uh, there's no actual threshold to prevent someone from being dragged into trial. The prosecutors routinely say things on on criminal complaints, on informations that are not true. They just made it up. And then when he gets a trial and they, for example, I'll refer to the George Zimmerman case again. He was finally dragged into court, charged with second degree malice murder because they had to charge him with murder for political purposes. Well, they had no malice. Malice is an element of the crime. So they allege in the criminal complaint that he racially profiled Trayvon Martin. That was the malice. They got him charged. They dragged him into court. You know how many times in the actual trial, weeks of trial, that racial profiling was referenced as evidence? None. Not once. They never had it. But no one ever goes back and says, holy cow, the whole the whole charging document was corrupt from the very beginning. Why are we here in this trial? They never asked that question. And so we end up dragging people into these courts and they, they, they should never be here. And the reason the probable cause doesn't work is because It serves the interest of the efficiency of the criminal justice system not to have a genuine probable cause standard because they're funneling so many criminal defendants through the system. If they had to do a genuine genuine probable cause hearing every time, uh, it would simply clog up the system beyond belief. So we pretend there's a probable cause hearing. The prosecution shows up, makes a bunch of claims. We're all supposed to pretend that it's true, and that's sufficient. That's nonsense. That's not the way the system is supposed to work. And when we're talking about, you know, Lifelong criminals, who cares, really, I guess. You know, they're going to be going through the system cyclically anyway. But when you have a good guy case going through the criminal justice system and treated the same way, you end up with these travesties of justice. There's no reason Kyle Rittenhouse should be a trial right now. The, uh, and, and for those that are out there, in the federal system, probable cause is determined by the grand jury. In state systems, it varies, but many state courts have what Andrew's referencing. You're entitled to a probable cause hearing to contest probable cause. And what's happening is they've substantively eroded both of those. Grand jury is supposed to be a restriction. To me, it's not supposed to be interpreted like a civil complaint. That grand jury is a different, whole different kind of limitation. And yet they're applying looser standards to indictments than they do to civil complaints. It's getting absurd. So completely gutting the point of the grand jury clause of federal and analogous state constitutions. And on top of that, like when I, I, I tend to always demand and find an excuse to get a probable cause hearing in my state criminal cases. But, man, they hate me for it. The judge hates me for it. Prosecutor obviously hates me for it. Everybody hates me for it, though it's almost always beneficial to my client because of evidence that develops at those hearings. It's really unique in the state. A lot of state systems, you don't, you don't get a chance of doing that in the federal system that too many lawyers don't take advantage of because they're beaten down by the intimidating effects of courts who don't want to have the don't think they have the time to calendar them and prosecutors who don't want the exposure and risk that comes with them. And, but there and needs to be to a lot it. more of them. I hate to say it, but it's not necessarily in the financial interest of the criminal defense lawyer to have the matter dismissed at a probable cause hearing. No, it's not. Right? That's if you're a criminal problem. defense where, attorney, I always tell clients, be aware of what you uh, uh, ask for. You know, you you want a lawyer who's fi- who's priced to get you the best outcome the quickest, not a lawyer who's priced by making sure you go through as much misery as possible uh, before you get any good outcome because that's what maximizes their fee. And I still think we should have be allowed bonus fees as criminal defense lawyers. If there were bonus fees as criminal defense lawyers, I would have retired a decade ago. But you're not allowed to. It's like, why? Well, 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 why can't I? Isn't my duty as zealous advocacy to make sure my client wins anyway? I'm going to suddenly break the rules now if I have a bonus versus whether I don't. Uh, I mean, that's not really what happens in the the way the system works. So, But because of the financial ethical limitations on the criminal defense lawyers and the way a typical contract works, what Andrew's talking about is if you're a criminal defendant, your lawyer is disincentivized to get you the best outcome the quickest way. They're incentivized Absolutely. to get 
protract the proceedings. Listen, he's, he's got a mortgage. He's got a boat payment. He's got the Mercedes payment. He's, and he can, you know, a lot of criminal defense practices, they sit there and they're they're cranking the handle on the practice. And That's you, it. You didn't even mention the three mistresses. <laughs> well, um, Matt, what were was, you going to say? Well, I had a case one time where I was at a preliminary hearing and uh, it was, um, well, I mean, it was a, it was a, it was a murder uh, preliminary hearing. And we um, um, had a very strong case of self-defense. So strong, in fact, that even though it was bound over to the grand jury, the, the defendant is yet to be indicted because the case for self-defense was very strong. But to play on what you're talking about, the financial motivations that some might have at this hearing, the judge, even though she bound it over to the grand jury, she decided she entertained a motion to lower the gentleman's bond. And, and I won't say how high the gentleman's bond was, but it was very high. But it got lowered to the point where he was able to get some money to get out of jail that day. And I can assure you that bail bondsman got more money getting him out of jail than I got him from not having to be indicted. And so... Uh, I see where you're coming from. I mean, so many times when you have the temptation, and I've, again, I haven't had as much of, of this as, as some attorneys might have, but when you have the pecuniary temptation to string it along, like you said, because you know that guy in jail, you know, if he's not paying for the bail bondsman, at least he's paying for you. So I'm going to make it as hard as possible for him to stay in jail so I can keep my lights on that just isn't right. And it's yet not I right, think that is the, one of those situations where it, it, it can tend to happen. It's not right, but the incentive is real. And yeah. we, we can't pretend to live in a world where we can expect people to do what's right when all the incentives are, are in the counter direction. I mean, listen, I, I do okay for myself. I, I, I have the luxury of doing the right thing, but I can tell you, we get a lot of cases coming to my office for consulting on self-defense. And just a superficial look at that decision, uh, at those facts. And I'm like, listen, I'll, I'll do the consulting if you want for the price that we normally charge, but you're not going to like the result. I mean, this is not self-defense. So I don't want to take your money. If you have the expectation, you're going to get a positive report for me because that's not going to happen. So, of course, I don't get the money. Naturally, I, I, I wouldn't expect them to. But it would be very easy for me to say, oh, yeah, yeah, no, there's something we can really work with here and, and, and collect my, my normal retainer. And I, I could do that a couple hundred times a year. Well, and I, you I get that with jury a, consultants too. Jury I consultants who may say they know never got that a, report. A, I'm sorry. Uh, a jury consultants that may want to think a defense lawyer wants a particular approach and it may not be the best approach for the client may not be the best approach to understand the jury, but rather than give honest feedback, they go along with whatever the defense lawyer wants. They structure mock trials to feed the defense lawyers, preconceived perceptions of the case rather than show them the risks and the warnings. And you, you, so you see that in multiple layers that when there's a financial disconnect between who's paying you and how they're paying you and what would be in the best interest of the client, it re and now my view is the system does this because it profits the system at the end of the day, more often than not to structure things this way. It does. For I, sure. I, I, Any of you guys work in family court? I mean, family I have, court never back, touched that ever. Back, it's back outrageous in, the in this respect. I mean, the family court Ooh, exists to serve the interest it. of family court. It's unbelievable the way they Bankruptcy drag out court. these the, divorces and, uh, oh my God! And because the court has all kinds of little projects they like to run, and I'm sure they're all good causes, women's shelters and things like that. But the court doesn't get funding for that. The court gets the money for that from all the parties coming through the court system. So the, it's in the courts. You wonder why a divorce takes four years to happen. That's why it takes that long. It could I be have an to tell you, process. Between, between you, between Andrew and Robert here, here, I'm just getting so many black pills about the reality <laughs> of the practice of law. In your guys' world, Kurt, that it Kurt, makes me you. wonder. But maybe I've been right all this time, and over in where I'm sitting in this nice little transactional IP world, where everything is nice and clean, and I'm just dealing with these really big corporations instead of the stuff you're dealing with, man. Jeez, oh, that, like, that's that's I, why I'm I look at you guys I and I envy you, and now I'd be like, damn, Lord, what's well, going on? Th Kurt, I'll give this you one. One of my early black pills was this was not an attorney with whom I worked. It was opposing counsel in a file, and we were having coffee or something after a hearing, and then uh, we're talking. I say. I said something about settling files when, you know, settle them when they can be settled. And he says to me, yeah, settle them, just not too quickly. And it was like, I, I can't, I, I can't decide if I want to ask you guys to give me a job or never talk to me again. This is where we're at. This point. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, I, I haven't I, even gone into personal injury work there. You can oh, really God. find about the, yeah. oh, God. Oh, God. you know, the, the dream client is the client that calls in that says they're going to be in ideally you don't want them dead. 
You want them in constant permanent pain and just waking up every hour just enough to remind them of the horrible things they've lost. That's your ideal client. It's, With, it's like that uh, scene out of My Cousin Vinny, right? It's a, a yeah. second My Cousin Vinny moment, but uh, where he, he sees the guy with the neck brace and he says, a car accident? Yeah, somebody hit you? No, I tri tripped and fell or something. And so he's yeah. not, not that's, interested. I'm thinking the Simpsons reference, Lionel Hutz prepping Bart when he got hit by Mr. Burns. And he goes, how are you doing today, Bart? He goes, fine. He's like, oh, isn't that fine? Bart's doing fine. You're not doing fine. You are in constant <laughs> anguish and pain. Ideally, their anguish is highly visible, where you can show a day in the life of this guy who now is a quadriplegic and has to be spoon A guy who used to be making lots of money, lots of money. And, and in the prime now, of their life, right? Yeah, and yeah, it's in the prime of their life and now is being spoon fed through a machine and you can actually have the jury crying there as they watch what, what it's like to live. And yeah, that's when you get oh. that's when you get eight eight digit eight, yeah, eight he's digit also, verdict. He's also a former CEO with a traumatic brain injury and a key and a key player insurance contract with a <laughs> with an eighty million dollar payout. Uh, well, my first you need a deep pocket to too. You need a deep pocket was a, also. Was a great plaintiff's lawyer that I worked for. In his opening line in his opening statement that I was help working on for him was home is where the heart is. And the reason why home is where the heart is, is her permanent need for care at home was worth double as much as if she was in the hospital. So home <laughs> is where the heart is because home is where the money was. And uh, Nick, yeah. do, you, do you want to remind the chat that you have the live feed on the side so that if the jury is back, <laughs> you will bring it's, it to No, our I attention. think it's it's a meme at this point. They're just okay. they're just gonna say think, jury's back every if, two seconds. If they but, ask um, for twenty six more thir or thirty more pages, we're not getting a jury verdict today. There's a couple. I of don't think so. Yeah. I, I'm I'm waiting for the judge to come back and dismiss the jury for the evening. I think that's the the likely outcome. That's going to be another hour, another hour. two hours. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I wanted to say about the probable cause thing, how we do it in Minnesota. This this ruined me because um, I had a client who was held over in jail for a significant amount of time. And um, the probable cause you get a, you get a probable cause hearing uh, within 48 hours of being arrested. You're you're constitutionally entitled to this. It's a it's a California uh, federal case. Um, but basically, they have to do a probable cause assessment or hearing. Well, those hearings happen on Sundays. They have to, because if you get arrested on a Friday, 48 hours, they have to hear it on Sunday. And if they don't do the hearing, the, they have to release the person. It's a, it's a constitutional right that you are released from jail. So, but they happen on, on Sunday, and here's how they happen. The prosecutor walks in Sunday morning, 6 a.m. They have a big stack of files. They call up the judge on the phone, at, and the judge is at their house, and they just read them the probable cause statement or a summary of it. And the judge says, yep, hold them until Monday for their for their first appearance hearing. And they never say no. I mean, they, they, they never do because it's just a prosecutor saying this is what happened. And the judge says, yes, to every of course, hold them till Monday and then we'll deal with it then. And then uh, in, in my client's case, this did not happen in a timely manner. Uh, and and I argued it at the subsequent probable cause hearing, and the judge ruled that there was no error because my client was not prejudiced by the uh, by the dis delay of their constitutional rights. So uh, my client, who was um, in it was in jail, however, he was severely disabled from a car accident, uh, in constant pain, was denied meds for seventy hours, and the judge said eh, no prejudice, too bad, and uh, he ended up. Uh, he ended up pleading and not going to jail permanently, but it was like, what the hell is this? I mean, you violated the guy's constitutional rights. You admit to it. And it was all, it was all just fine. Um, yeah, one of the but things... in... I'll oh, go ahead. Real... La last bit was just in Minnesota, you were talking about, or, or Robert was talking about the scheduling of those probable cause hearings. We call them an omnibus hearing here. And if you, if you go to schedule one of those, they schedule them uncontested. Even if you say, I'm going to contest probable cause at the hearing. I say, well, we'll schedule it uncontested. If you get there, then we'll reschedule the contested hearing later. And it's like, no, I'm, I'm going to contest it on grounds of probable cause. Like, eh, we'll schedule it uncontested. Uh, welcome back to the stream, uh, Hogue Law. Richard. Yeah, it, five hours later, you, you look all the same. I thought, <laughs> hey, I don't think you got enough transactional lawyer representation. So I just got out of the Activision mines after the Wall Street Journal blew open the doors. Uh, so thanks for having me back. I saw yeah, you put up another back. video. 
Uh, yeah, I couldn't, even with my voice somewhat shattered from illness over the last week, I can't ignore the Wall Street Journal <laughs> impugning the CEO of a public corporation embattled by four separate sets of letter regulatory investigations. So we'll put um, up a video. <laughs> Robert, I, I have a question for you about the process here, if you know. Um, is there a limit to how long the jury can deliberate on a particular day? Like, will the judge give them a hard cutoff at 5 or 5.30? Or will he permit them if they say, no, we want to stay longer to go till 7, 8, 9? What, what's the, any idea oh, on that? Totally up to the judge. But I think the judge implied that he would let him go home early. That he, he would give the jury pretty much whatever the jury wanted. He let them vote yesterday. Do you want to go home now? Do you want to stay? So I think he'll... I think there was a few jurors during jury selection that talked about like six o'clock, six thirty, pro, you know, scheduled events they needed to be for. So usually that's picking up kids, starting a work shift. You know, depends on the scenario. Going to talk um, to the media about their experience as a juror. Right. <laughs> Robert, I mean, if if anybody has had meaningful experience with this, I've had none. If they're going to come back with a verdict, which they're going to come back with a verdict, if it lasts longer than a certain period of time, is it more likely that they want to get the verdict out by the end of the day or do they wait and get it out the next morning type thing? Well, in my experience, when Deborah jurors have made up their mind, they, they, they want to be done in the, at home. Go they, on. they don't they don't How? think like, I want to do this time. I want They're like, done. They want to be in, ter in terms of getting a consensus from holdouts, would, is that more likely to come after an overnight thought process or by drilling them by the end of the day to get it out before they close to the day? I mean, usually they use jury instructions and evidentiary questions to argue with the holdouts. And it depends on how strong the holdout is. And my view was the prosecution, you could argue the defense did this too, but definitely the prosecution argued to their side more than they argued to any perceived neutral observer. Um, and, and, and basically they were arguing for a holdout because I think they prosecution, I think knew they were behind. So I think they, they would just, a mistrial is just fine with little binger. How That's many, how, how many Friend. days do you think they would deliberate before that we could anticipate the judge starting to consider a mistrial? Uh, if they haven't come back by the end of Friday, I think the judge, usually he'll listen to the jury. If the jury says we're irreconcilable, this is never going to happen. We want to go home. This is, we're never going to get, then I think he would grant that. But he usually depends on the judge. If they think, uh, it's leaning in their direction, whatever direction the judge thinks will happen. They don't admit this, but this is my interpretation that they will push the jury. If they think the holdout is someone that if they, if they think the ver uh, pushing them will lead to a verdict, they think is the right verdict as a judge. Um, but if they can't get a read on it, uh, I think this judge is very sensitive to the jury. So if they really come back, I think initially he would say, try again, maybe once or twice, but I think if it's end of business Friday and there's still holdouts, he will probably declare mistrial. The only question is, does he uh, grant a mistrial with prejudice because he sat on that the whole time? He didn't grant it because I think he thought jury verdict's going to come in that's going to clear the kid and that will end it. Um, but I think that because I think he had the same uh, assumption that Richards had, which was that pretrial publicity had not created such a biased jury that if, unless you got unless you had meaningful jury selection, I mean. Uh, for folks out there, the Arbery McMichael trial, two weeks of jury selection. This took a day. Uh, there's no way. And with no written questionnaire. I mean, they had wow. written questionnaires on top of the <laughs> void year. And I mean, I've never seen that. So in, in a case like this, you cannot do it. And it's I argued with Richards. The judge did not know what our polling data had shown. That almost two thirds that everybody in Kenosha had heard about the case. Everybody thought they had seen the videos in reality they'd seen misleading videos um and uh two-thirds presumed him guilty and a third were locked into that as a matter of emotional commitment and those are jurors you just don't budge no matter how many facts you show them yeah in the what arbery is... case they had written questionnaires first then in general voir dire the state had an additional 80 questions they were asking the jurors plus then they ran through their their usual bullshit witness list of ten thousand people that they're never going to call, of course, but they're just trying to jam up the defense because now the defense has to look at every single one of these potential witnesses. And then the defense had 20 questions of their own. So every single juror had the written questionnaire already and then went through another 100 questions of general voir dire. And after that, they were each subject to individual voir dire. But Andrew, what, what explains that difference in treatment? Is this a, a state issue or is this how they're dealing with the trial issue? And then what would account for that the, difference practically? The lawyers in the court. That, that was a difference in Wisconsin. I mean, Richards didn't ask for that. 
Richards okay. didn't. The judge said he they could have as much uh, void year in person. He said he declined a written questionnaire, but he did because he wasn't told about pretrial prejudice, pretrial publicity. He wasn't. He was never given that information. I think this judge thought there was Kenosha thought of this case like he did, and they would hear the facts and just grant acquittals, and that would end it and vindicate Kenosha and vindicate him. Uh, he did not know how much pretrial publicity had really saturated the community to it to a unique degree. Because he's used to seeing pretrial public. The other thing is, is Andrew can attest. Twenty years ago, Sorry, a written house case would have probably only had half of the jury being really contaminated. Today, because of social media, everybody sees it. Even people who never read the local newspaper, never read watch local news. They're on somebody's on Facebook, somebody's on Twitter, somebody's on YouTube, somebody knows somebody who is. And it's I mean, like in the Chauvin. I mean, it was complete saturation. And there was such saturation with such so many false stories that you that that about a third of the jury pool was hardcore rogue jurors that required probing jury selection to filter out. Otherwise, you're just gambling. And um, uh, unfortunately, that's what they, they gambled because they chose to gamble. Is the but, is bottom line with Richard? Well, I mean, a lot of those prospective jurors in Arbery, at least they were, at least they were willing to say, "I'm, I, I can't change my opinion. I'm locked in. I think they're guilty." And I respect those jurors. Uh, they're being honest. They cannot be fair and impartial jurors, and they're taking themselves out of the running to be seated. And that's that's uh, amazingly to their credit. They're incredibly honest in that they can't be fair and impartial. Those aren't the people I'm worried about. The people I'm worried about who know, are those who know damn well they're not going to be fair and impartial, and they will lie to your face all day long. They will say all the magic words. They will say, yes, Your Honor, I can be fair and impartial. Do anything to get on that jury as, as a personal and political mission because you have one of those on your jury, and you are done. The um, By the way, someone in the chat said, how would I pronounce voir dire? Robert and I have discussed this. It is proper. I think it's supposed to be voir dire, which is he, he, uh, voir, see, say, which is what you're doing basically to the evidence. But um, question for, for not voir, voir dire. Yeah, voir dire. dire. Saying, voir dire. Voir dire. Voir dire. And you have to roll the R. The New voir York dire. way. In, um, the, the question is, it depends here. on where each, you are. Each part of the country. <laughs> in New York, we say voir dire. Voir dire. Like a you got, hot, you got a lot of those, uh, the snow, the, the snow south, geese from Canada. But for me, but it's it's very very square square here, you know, it is what it is. For, the, for those who know, what, what, what uh, freedom or liberty does the judge have to have one-on-ones or like direct interactions with Complete. holdout potential rogue jurors? He can do whatever he wants. Actually, can he, he do, do one-on-ones in the absence? Individualized void he can, Actually, I need to correct myself. obligated to do, because the great advantage that Rittenhouse had, was pretrial publicity, the U.S. Supreme Court has said you have to screen out for it. So like in the Snipes case, the judge said we we're only going to get an hour of a void here. He said, never taken me longer than a half a day to pick a jury, and this uh-huh. case ain't going to be no different. But pretrial publicity and racial prejudice were the two areas they had to inquire about. So people accused me later of creating pretrial publicity about racial prejudice because of some motions we filed. Take it as you wish. We got three days of void here and got rid of most of the bad jurors. Well, now we still got three bad jurors on that case because that's how contaminated <laughs> the jury pool was um, in, in that kind of case. But, I mean, Rittenhouse was much worse. The, the pretrial publicity was off the charts and in surprising places. Like you had a lot of Republicans and Trump supporters and conservatives and who also doubted whether Kyle was innocent because that's how bad the pretrial prejudice. Fox didn't come around on this case until the trial itself. Then Fox became, hey, you know what? This is problematic. What's happening to this kid? But until the trial, they had been a little weak. Tucker had been good, but the rest had not. I'm okay, perfectly I have a... willing to admit that the trial was convincing to me um, that, that that's what it needed was the prosecution and seeing what the witnesses said. Now, I followed it rather than the headlines, and I followed this because of broadcasts like this one. Um, but I, I, it's hard to blame people that look at what are supposedly – upstanding institutions in the United States and say, everybody is lying. Yeah, it's uh well, and, and, you know, we all know this because we deal with it in some stretch, right? That you, you deal with the media bias or media lying, no matter what we, we all either, you're either doing legal work that entails research into a, into something that the media misrepresents or we're sure. covering topics on, on a show and, and you see them misrepresent something in real time. You're like, I know the opposite to be true, but, uh, but most people don't deal with that uh, at all. 
So, but I, I wanted to ask the panel's thoughts. This is, a, this is a tangential question to the Rittenhouse case. And I thought it might be interesting. So with what has come out in the Rittenhouse case, we know that his, uh, his brother, uh, quote unquote, Dominic Black, is charged with two counts of felony uh, giving a minor, uh, I guess, felony distribution of a handgun to a minor. I don't know how, we, how it's worded. That resulted but- in the death. Right. Yeah. Providing so a firearm uh, to a minor that resulted in a death. That's why it's a six year right. felony sentence. That's it. So what do we what what is the is there anything that has changed about this charge or do how do we like uh, Dominic Black's chances on that? I mean, it looks like he's going to plea out with an unspoken plea deal that he had that he his counsel clearly had arranged with Binger pending his testimony. I mean, I'm, I'm cynical like that, but that's what when, appeared to happen in court. When was he charged with that? He was charged with it a while back. Um, oh, but his, yeah, right away because they wanted to lock him up and yeah. keep him from being a favorable witness for Kyle. And his case was continued recently to just, you know, to January, I think it was, at the at the dual all request of, were, of, of him. All of the them were yes. magically moved to January. You gotta wonder what's gonna happen to well, them. Well, look, Robert, we... in, in Zeminski's case, look, they had a they had a witness conflict and the witness just couldn't be around till January. So you yeah, you trust know, me. Yeah. <laughs> we see who, who was the witness who had the conflict? Just I mean, just really. not the witness it, wasn't available between November and January. No, at no point were they available. So if you guys believe Zeminski, that... Zeminski themselves counts as a witness. They are a witness. They may not be able to be called by the state, but they're technically a witness. So yeah, yeah they... we have a witness conflict. Zeminski. If there's a mistrial, though, every one of those is going to have some some magical delay yet again, because they're going to want to they they're never going to want to have that brought delay. before a jury until after after the whole situation with Kyle is fully adjudicated. Which is crazy to me. But what but what do you guys think about the charges? Um, I mean, I don't know enough about that statute. Is it per se? And by the way, good morning, everybody. Uh, if you believe that those delays weren't intentional, I have a bridge to sell you in North Korea. It um, looks so, like evening outside your window to me. Yes, it indeed is. It indeed still is. Um, so um, one thing I, I want to know is, so if there, if it was a, a quote-unquote good shoot, right, if self-defense does apply, does that invalidate an element of that statute against Dominic Bucky Robert is shaking his head. So then is that statute you know, perhaps unconstitutional. Is that perhaps something that could be challenged? Uh, you know what? No, Black's because case. the intent part is giving him the gun, knowing he's a minor. The well, consequence it's... part isn't required. It's kind of like burglary and theft. You get into those issues. There's there at some point there's a due process issue, you... but where that point is, they their courts have been very flexible on. Mm. I think they move for immediate dismissal. Here's Isn't why there, I thought there was a uh, a section beneath this that goes into how subsections or maybe it's above it something where subsection C doesn't there's still a violation if you give it to someone even if the gun is legal for the 17 year old. Well, so here here's this right whoever violates paragraph B guilty of a class H felony if the person under 18 years of age under paragraph B discharges the firearm and the discharge causes death to himself herself or another. However, we still come against the 3C, oh, 3C which applies to the in, entire section. And it says, here's oh, the right. following. This section mm. applies only to an adult who transfers a firearm to a person under 18 years of age if the person under 18 years of age is not in compliance with sections 29304 and 29593, or it's the same language, it's just reversed, to an adult who is in violation of section 94128. I think... And Schrader's the judge on Dominic Black. I think you go straight to Schrader, say motion to dismiss. Mm. You ruled in Kyle Rittenhouse's case that this is not the thing. We have it on the record, all of the facts about the gun of this of this case in the same way that you did and uh, in, in Kyle's case. And so we know that he is not under this statute. I, I think Dominic Black. What in the world is the, is the word adult doing in there? I'm, this statute, man. Yeah, this the, there should not be an adult here. I've seen but, worse. So if you transfer a firearm to a person under 18 years of age, if the person under 18 years of age is, and then we can take out that next part, an adult who is in violation of section 94128. Like, they were too excited I, about all the ninja weapons. They, they weren't paying attention to what they were drafting in 3C. Uh, yeah. 
But I, I know people have been, or people have asked me quite a bit about this. I haven't looked at the statute in regards to Dominic Black. I, I actually thought it was a separate statute. And so I, but I just checked it. This is the, this is the statute and the same exemption and the same facts exist. And you've got the same judge. I think you go straight to him with the records. A judge dismiss this. You know, you just ruled on this and dismissed it against Kyle under the same logic. It cannot possibly apply to my client. And therefore uh, we need immediate dismissal on it. Right. Not any that motion dismiss until the bitter end, of course, with this judge, but you know, sure. Right. But any counter have an thought on I have a story to tell you. Is, does anybody read that differently? I no, I agree. I concur. Re having read that, that's the first time I've read it, and that's pretty clear meaning to me. Yep. And you have to I ask yourself because why it didn't... was a short barrel rifle. We tend to offer evidence of his short barrel <laughs> rifleness in that case. <laughs> why didn't they uh, Dominic's oh, lawyer raise that issue rather than try to push the kid into well, testifying against somebody unnecessarily? Do you my cynical answer? Uh, because he was represented by a guy named Robert Keller. Robert Keller withdrew, and he's been represented by a public defender ever since. Yeah. That's a black pill. That's why it's very – if you're smart, you help – if you have a potential co-defendant or a defendant that's related, it's smart to create a joint defense agreement, help them get funded, to help them have counsel. You know, th there's certain people in the alternative product distribution business that understand this very well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good framing, Robert. Uh, okay, so to this, so that's resolved. Okay, I thought that conversation was going to take longer. <laughs> Sorry. Um, to the panel, as as all of us uh, are are in some level uh, of social media aware attorneys, right? Um, I'll I'll qualify myself as the lowest aware, but um, and and some of us are specifically in the <clears throat> idea of uh, in the realm of consulting or money management. Uh, crowdfunding is a thing in lawsuits and criminal defense, how is, uh, is crowdfunding going to be something that is reined in or attempted to be reined in by the state? Are we going to see judges act, uh, acting on this? Because in every crowdfunded civil case I've seen, the other team's lawyers want a piece of that crowdfunded pie. They're always after the crowdfunding. They're always raising it as an issue. Um, what, what is the future of crowdfunding in lawsuits? Because I think Andrew is right in his assessment earlier that there's a ton of money to be made in, in any level of publicity around the lawsuit, and crowdfunding is a huge, huge factor of that. I think in Kyle's case, last I checked, over $2.6 million total has been raised. Nick, the, the first thought that comes to my mind, and granted, in some of these this would relate more to plaintiffs litigation and not so much to people who are being sued civilly, but uh, some states have uh, laws against maintenance and champerty. Right. And in fact, in some states, it's actually a crime. So if, if you, you know, want to support somebody who is doing litigation, and, and that person is a plaintiff and that person is trying to sue someone else in some of these jurisdictions. If you incentivize the litigation by raising money for the plaintiff or something like that, you're opening yourself up to criminal liability. Now, that's not now if you're you're trying to defend a lawsuit, that's a little bit different because in that case, you're you're trying to uh, protect yourself or to protect the defendant from the un 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 uh, the unnecessary litigation that he was not asking for. In other words, you're not trying to drum up litigation in that point. It, it, like I said, it varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And, mm -hmm. and that's something people who are crowdfunding need to be mindful of because you don't want to run afoul of champerty laws. Wasn't there a I, U.S. Supreme Court case on that point? Or am I hallucinating about the funding of lawsuits and be, it being okay? Am I making something up? I, I mean, look, I don't if, know. If, I was, if I was counsel for a, a platform, that was, you know, hosting crowdfunding for litigation, I would be nervous. I, I'm just saying that, you know, if I'm sitting there saying, hey, we've got to hold this money for the purpose of litigation, it's something I would say, hey, I, I you know, they might don't. not be totally comfortable with. I would, yeah, don't I, hold the money. Any, I would think that anything that's going to impact a litigant's ability to crowdfund would have to be enacted by legislation, not that, not by any member of the bench. What are the rules right. in the states about getting money as an advance for legal fees? Does that not have to be kept in a trust account? Uh, it should be. 
Oh, I see oh, yeah. the judge's I, I head. Oh, we got a judge head. I see uh, the judge. judge's head. Uh, nice. Yeah, I, I saw, thought, I saw, I thought I was going to clip that. That was judge, judge, judge head's a little bit different. <laughs> I, I saw a tweet that around 5 p.m. he was gonna he was gonna ask the jury what they what they wanted to do. 5 p.m. Like what, what time? For Eastern or Central? Commit I, think pro I think probably Wisconsin. Time. <laughs> Whatever time. We got an hour. We got an hour five until that happens. He's talking um, away. But. No, uh, Matt, thank you for bringing that up. I have been directly accused of champerty, right? I've, I've been accused of this because I uh, was involved in creating a, a crowdfund for a plaintiff. And uh, people then automatically assumed that I told the plaintiff that they had to sue uh, and, and all of this stuff and that I encouraged them to sue, which is flagrantly untrue. But, you know, Twitter lawyers are Twitter lawyers after all. But um, that being said, uh, the, it, it's an interesting sort of idea because I've always been under the understanding that third party funding of lawsuits is just fine so long as that funding has no interference with the attorney client relationship. And so I, I think planning through that is very important, exactly as you say, especially for a plaintiff, because of that, you cannot be seen to be leading a plaintiff into litigation for your own purposes, which is- sure. Weird because rules on that, yeah. but Peter Thiel kind of did it right with Hulk Hogan and Gawker. I mean, that that happened. Uh, what? 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 Who's Peter Thiel? What, what happened? Peter Thiel what funded happened? Uh, Hulk Hogan's lawsuit against Gawker for the um, for the sex tapes, and uh, yep. I mean, they forum shopped. They did everything. Like they but, um, they. For for individuals, it's not for, for citizens. It's not an issue, right? As far as I understand, it only becomes an issue for politicians. No, it, uh, I mean it's for everybody. Because, like, take Kyle's yeah. case. You had crowdfunding. Some of the people who end up controlling that crowdfunding ended up controlling his defense more so than he did, frankly. So that's the kind of issue they're worried about occurring. At what point does it compromise the attorney-client relationship, the client's direction of choices, the client's Etc. That's the fear, it, and and there's ethics rules that try to do that without impinging on a, on a client's ability to raise funds for their defense through such crowdfunding. And the right to and it was particularly what they complicated want. in Kyle's case because the crowdfunding started when he was 17, so he's a minor. So the custodial parent, there's a role there. Uh, it got and then the people raising money for him purport to be a charity when they were a charity that creates a whole different sets of rules or restrictions so there's all these both ethical rules and then sometimes legal rules depending on how the funds are raised right and um that that's why someone mentioned i pardon me for not remembering who but uh aren't, shouldn't they be in a trust and this is this is one of one of the reasons why they should be held specifically in trust in my opinion is that if you if the uh client who has the freedom to choose new counsel decides to choose new counsel, then that, that trust creates a legal right to the beneficiary of the trust, which can then be enforceable against a law firm, for example, who might be trying to otherwise hold those funds and say, no, no, no. If you're with us, if you're not with us, you're going to lose the funds or, or against the, the funder uh, or the grantor, as it were, saying, sure. oh, you, you got to do this. But it's and I get the free. exposure risk. My concern is always when we're talking about regulations and the ABA models and whatever the state jurisdictions are, is that there's a real slowness to adopt novel anything, whether that's fundraising or access to portals for legal services. And I would be very concerned about them striking the other side and preventing people from getting the funding that they need or the counsel that they want. And as we know, lawyers are expensive. Uh, and so that's why you have some of this. Yeah, they can go wrong in a lot of ways, but I would be reluctant to having these ethical rules prevent what are situations that they don't really even anticipate as of right now. Yeah, and, and I think I think there's a huge incentive to allow crowdfunding of lawsuits, right? Like there's just no Access way we justice, can- right? The code for Exactly. And 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 the, the people who make the rules are lawyers and they know how expensive- access to justice actually is you know people have, normal people have no idea what these things cost i mean it's not uncommon for for me when i'm consulting on murder cases for them to burn through two hundred thousand dollars before they get to trial that's Absolutely. a lot of money oh yeah and oh, most people have no cases? idea that what it costs and they also don't have any conception of you know we'd all like to live in a world where how much money you have doesn't influence the kind of justice you get right but 
we don't live in that world. <laughs> we live in a world with, with a, it's a battle, it's a war. And the amount of resources you can bring to that battle are decisive in the outcome. And maybe that ought not be the way it is, but that is the way it is. And there's an unbelievable difference between a $200,000 legal defense and a $20,000 legal defense. I mean, they're, they're just not comparable events. And, but normal people have, they have no understanding of this. They don't understand anything about how ugly and brutal the system is, the, the, the kind of machine they're gonna get fed into. Uh, if they're if they're facing for you, my friend, special charge. price. Yeah. What they, yeah. What's the expression that they go, they go in a pig and come out a sausage? But it's um, it, no. Even in civil matters, it's it, it, people don't understand the costs of an injunction to appeal something. And this is Canadian dollars, which are you know it's cheaper and lesser than the American. But Nick, it, it's not the interest is going to be to allow it. Uh, the crowdfunding, but then it's going to be to weaponize it. And then they're going to come up with all sorts of exceptions and rules as to why certain people can crowdfund for legal fees and others can't because to defend them would be to defend hate, xenophobia, racism, white nationalism, whatever. So they, they, they will build up a system only so that it can be weaponized for political purposes. And that's where I, that's where I do see it going, especially with the political interests of the organizations that would regulate in the first place. Well, we, we oh, saw have... Hughes, Hughes versus Benjamin, right? Akilah Hughes crowdfunds, Carl Benjamin, Sargon of Akkad, he Shut crowdfunds. Down. And then and then Akilah Hughes accuses him of improperly crowdfunding. Like he shouldn't have done that as if it was, and it's like, lady, you're paying your judgment out of your crowdfunding fees. But who, who was it, Nick, who raised money and then they had their, their GoFundMe shut down. They had to go to the alternate one. Was it was it Rittenhouse at one point? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah Rittenhouse. Yeah, Rittenhouse. Yeah. 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 So it's, yeah. I mean, they'll, they'll weaponize well, and it. And then you have the, when you have the former director of the FBI being able to raise a million, close to a million dollars, <throat> which can be used for any purposes, but in the name of legal defense, you're in a whole different world. I and mean, that's what Andrew McCarthy did. You know, after he got fired for his illegal actions, he got a bonus of almost a million dollars in crowdfunded money purportedly for his lawyers and his lawyers didn't end up doing much work. So, I mean, the, which means the rest of that went to him. So right, it, which... it's a whole different world. Which, ta uh, as a tax lawyer, Mr. Barnes, <laughs> that creates an interesting question, right? Yep. Because uh, ostensibly, yes. funds are coming in for legal defense, and you can you can depending on the type of crowdfunding or or the profile of the person, you know, maybe they're all uh, tax deductible gifts, right? Or, ta or sorry, tax exclusive gifts of under the thirteen and a half thousand dollar gift limit. Um, that was probably a couple of years ago. Maybe they are, but then maybe not because if you know, you've got a high often, pro <clears throat> most structures are often income and they don't know it. They don't realize right. that all of a sudden they have, let's say they raised a million dollar legal defense fund for an exceptional case. They don't know all of a sudden they owe 350,000 and 400,000 in tax, depending on which state they live in. You know, yeah. it's a whole different animal. It's uh, it's, it's an interesting thing. I think again, uh, Aspiring lawyers out there who want to create a very niche and, and special practice, you start figuring out how to manage crowdfunded uh, legal fees, how to establish um, rock solid trusts or or tax exempt entities that can function with this. You will make you will make a fortune if you can get your name out there and, and be ahead of the curve on that. Especially if you could raise money for anybody on the grounds the funds are only going to an attorney-client trust account and establish relationships with payment processors and banks that are mostly immune from attack and deplatforming, you'd have a near monopoly on the business. Yeah, it, it should be, happen. I'll be right when, back, when guys. When are we forming a partnership? Sure, <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go set up a business right now. Yeah, well, be, and and. But, and that's the trick, right? Because Rittenhouse got removed from GoFundMe because GoFundMe has specific policies that says we will not allow you to fund a criminal defense of a violent criminal act uh, or one that involves uh, unless of hatred course, or something else. Uh, right. Unless, of course, you do it for rioting in Minneapolis. Then, then, right. yes. then you can do GoFundMe's it. GoFundMe's all go. Look, but did Christy President Teigen donate, though? Go. Exactly. If, if, if Christy Teigen's going to donate, then you can crowdfund whatever you want uh, <laughs> at the end of the day. But well, I, I know in my own little narrow space of self-defense law, we see a lot of these same issues with these self-defense insurance policies that people can get, whether it's mm. USCCA or CCW safe or and I, I don't want to get into the different companies, but people think they're buying insurance. I mean, that's why they call it self-defense insurance. They're not insured. Uh, maybe the parent company has some kind of reinsurance thing set up. So when they pay out fees for one of their members expenses, they're, they're reimbursed by uh, whatever their insurance is. But the, the individual members not getting any kind of insurance they're getting a, a promise 
from the company that they'll pay the legal expenses. And frankly, I've seen cases, self-defense cases, where the company looks at it and says, eh, we don't like this one. We're just not going to pay. So is there any one of them you'd particularly recommend? Because I get asked that question a lot. Me too. I don't know. Should I get in? You want me to talk about yes, it? Yes, please. Hell yes. Okay. Be, well, <laughs> in, in, in full disclosure, there's one I'm partnered with. It's CCW Safe. Uh, I'm part, partnered with them because I think they're the best one for a variety of reasons. One is that there's no there's no cap on their coverage. So some of these programs, they'll say uh, it's a whatever, a million dollars, two million dollars in civil coverage. But it's only a couple hundred grand or 250 grand or whatever it is for criminal defense, which is, you know, listen, if you're charged with aggravated battery, that's probably enough. You charge with murder, uh, it may not be enough, right? You charge with murdering several people, like Kyle Rittenhouse, it's definitely not going to be enough, especially if it becomes a politically energized case. And then what happens if you get a, a hung jury or you get a retrial or you get an appeal? Well, once you've exhausted that cap, you're done. And let's face it, in a murder trial, you're definitely burning through 250 grand. So there is no ongoing coverage. Uh, one of the reasons I like CCW Safe is they don't place any limit on that. They'll cover your trial. If there's a hung jury, they'll cover the retrial, the retrial, the appeal, uh, all the way through the end of the process until it's exhausted. Uh, and given how much money this stuff costs, I think not having the cap is enormously beneficial. Um, another thing I really like about them is more personal. Their national trial counsel is Don West, who is one of the attorneys on the George Zimmerman trial. And I just think the world of him personally. So any legal defense that uh, use of force case that has Don West advising counsel, I think is a, a step way, a big step above where they would be otherwise. And they're no more expensive than the alternatives. Uh, some of the alternatives I don't like because like I said, I know I know of cases where members come on, come in with a self-defense claim and they just decide, well, we don't like the way this one looks. We're not going to pay. Name and shame. Who don't you like? Uh, I, I, I don't want to go into that level of detail, maybe it, maybe right. offline. But uh, I'll just wise. say the, the, the one I recommend people look at most closely is CCW Safe. Uh, it's not for everybody. It's not the best fit for everybody. It is for me. I'm a member. But uh, all people can do is, is, you know, go look at what they have to offer and decide whether it's a good fit for them. But at, at least, you know, God forbid, if something happens, you don't have to worry about selling your business or selling your home or cashing out your kid's college fund to pay for the legal defense. Right. And and mm -hmm. as we've seen, even uh, Kyle's a great, a great indicator of this. Even someone with a clear fact pattern that legally supports self-defense, so much so that it's in the complaint written by the state that self-defense occurred. It's in their closing arguments. You're still uh, if if the circumstances are ripe, you will be charged and they will run you through the ringer. Kyle had a two million dollar bail. He had uh I, I, who knows any estimate on how much this legal defense has cost? I mean, just just taking what sixty hours of jury trial. He's got three attorneys there. Um, granted, they're Midwest attorneys, but I have to imagine they're each four hundred bucks an hour. Well, I can tell uh, you the Zimmerman defense billed out at close to two million dollars by the time they were done. Now they didn't get yeah, that, that money, of like course, because Zimmerman case, didn't have right. it. But yeah, I always wonder how they came up with that number. It seemed it seemed like a lot. Well, they there's. That money. From the bail fund, I mean, right? I mean, so like uh, over here, they have two. They have two point six million, not just the six, not just the six hundred thousand. And, the, and right. the lawyers know at the end of the day that that two million will become attachable to cover their fees and expenses. Oh, so they really, his lawyers didn't get paid. There. I mean, he he didn't raise anything like that money. He raised a few hundred thousand dollars, and I'm sure they got that. But the the rest of it, they just ate. The reason he didn't probably is because he didn't have so much video showing how heroic he was in in his restraint of using his weapon compared to Kyle, where we all see that. I mean, the video evidence that we all saw for the last 14 months, unless you were closed minded or you're, you know, Joe, uh, Joe Scarborough was that this kid doesn't fire unless his life is really in danger. And that that's something we all can relate to. Well, Joe Scarborough, you know, he he really nailed it. He had his hand on the pulse. He figured out exactly, you know, 60 rounds. I, I'm surprised uh, that he conservatively estimated 60 rounds, to be honest. I, I was, you know. I, we, we, I, I just think immediate confession through projection. But speaking of rampant murder, does not Joe Scarborough have something of a questionable history that this would be the way he saw the events in his own mind? It, um... Nobody knows this is the Joe Scarborough. Did, uh, story. did Joe murder well, someone? I, I feel did, like did I he heard ball win, that. Did he Baldwin somebody? He did it. <laughs> an individual was found dead in his office. Um, Tell us more. We, I never heard this story before, Viva. So you, this sounds. Are really you joking, Joe? Yes. 
Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I just think I don't know Joe how Scarborough... the dead body got there. It's, it's in my office, but I don't know. <laughs> Everybody like, takes like, a beating sometimes, right? That, <laughs> they, they can look at the, the facts in written notes and then, it, and through their mind's eyes, see 60 shots, you know, firing left, right, and center. Uh, there's some there's some projection going on in there of what they expected to see in their mind's eye or what they actually do see in their mind's eye. But um, yeah, that was an, another bad take. There's been a bunch of he bad legal takes had, coming out of this. He had a little Twitter war with someone here in our little in our panel yesterday during closing arguments. I mean, the okay. guy sitting over here to uh, to this side of me here. Had it's a not a it's not a war when you get nuked from orbit. I mean, that's that's, just, that's, that's true. Absolutely. Yeah, but Joe, yeah, Joe he Scarborough ate a little bit of a ratio. Kata. Went after yeah. Nick Ricada, oh, and yeah, and I actually made a a veiled, not a thinly veiled reference to his his lack of understanding about this case or knowledge about the facts because he's difficult time finding good secretary. So yeah, Oof. we were we were Ooh. well aware of. Uh, well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you one thing, uh, Nick. You saw it, and I, I think other people tweeted it out before I uh, before I did. But uh, Tucker Carlson quite clearly making reference to what happened uh, to your stream yesterday on his show. It's. Uh, I'm surprised they didn't go with a name on air, which would have been great. But would have um, taken away from some of their streams, Viva. He can't do that. <laughs> That's true. Fox, Fox News did have a net benefit they, when they that gotta happened. Get the, yeah, they got to get the rhinos there, you know, streaming about their legal knowledge. I heard there was yeah, an article was... in Breitbart also about it. I don't know if any of you hmm. did. Any of you did any of you hear about this? Oh article? come on, stop it! <laughs> you already read it on stream, you weirdo. Oh, that uh, one. <laughs> look, I every every journalistic outlet should definitely write an article about it so that I can use that for a blue check on Twitter. So I can become immune <laughs> like all of the other Twitter people. Uh, so I can They're say whatever I want. Check mark, Nick. I'm not going to give you a check mark, <laughs> even if you wanted one. I've, I've applied now three times and not because I care about the check mark. I wanted one when I was running for office just so that I could make sure that sure. nobody would put out you know phony yeah. tweets. And then I tried again afterwards because now that I've got a Wikipedia page that has like legit stuff on it, like results from the local federal election, I thought I could get it. I've been turned down twice now. But uh, it's almost Andrew like that's an express requirement, right? That you have a, a, a Wikipedia page that talks about you and that you are a public figure who who literally R ran, ran for office. It's federal office. I, I tripled the, the PPC vote. And yeah, and, and, and repeatedly the first time I, I applied, I tried the, you know, the, the celebrity or not celebrity, public figure. Second time it was for the election. Third time was after the election when I had there's like my Wikipedia page has the federal election results for Notre Dame de Grasse Westmount. So anyways, I'll, I'll try again and keep trying just so I can dilute the the um, idiocy ratio of the blue check marks on Twitter. But uh, Andrew Bronca, I don't know if you noticed the uh, people in the chat were saying that uh, you, the CCW safe website crashed and I went to try uh, to log on. And <laughs> it was oh. certainly slow to get uh, to get access. <laughs> Look, I was probably wondering. I, I just want to well, say it, this it, stream is not brought to you by CCW safe. But it could be. <laughs> put, it, put it in the affiliate link. It'd be a, it'd be a five dollar super chat. <laughs> well, if, uh, if all those folks who are interested would like to uh, save ten percent on their CCW Safe membership, they can use the discount code LOSD ten. Nice. nice. I am Logs proud of the defense. grifting in this stream. It, it makes my heart warm. LOSD. Now, what does that stand for? Always be hot. Law of self self defense. It actually okay. can include the of because without the O in there, it's not quite it's as... just LSD. Yeah, that would be good. <laughs> I'm gonna <laughs> law enforcement attention. I'm gonna undercut you if if they ever sponsor me. I'm gonna demand LSD be the promo code. <laughs> <laughs> Legal self defense. That's my thing. That's what I'm going with. <laughs> By the way, Viva, if you ever apply again a fourth time to get your blue check mark because you check all those boxes, I highly recommend that you get a guy who's great at that. Get Kraus on it to represent you with them. We'll uh -huh. just like make sure check check everything everything you're doing there merits you that spot because he's very good at making sure that he's going to cover all that oh, for that, you. That was so oh, terrible in my opinion. Was, like he he looked just like a that was fool. It was so angry. I thought he was going to tear his paper. Honestly, those checks this were is where, violent. It was like an angry wife just before the divorce. You know, let me go through the list of all the ways I hate you. Oh, <laughs> let no. me tell you a few things you don't know about yourself. I saw, oh, I, I saw no. like a like a like a, a Ralph Wiggum giving a, a, a speech in high school, and he th and thinks that that makes it look better. Like, okay, mm, yep, got that one, got this one too. That's how uh, good of a lawyer I am. I made a list, and I'm checking it off for you all to see. It looked terrible, but it was not what he did. It was what he said, and those two those two things that he said. 
shall live in infamy of, of the, the tracking things things off was the least of his problems yep no no i was thinking yeah. so sometimes sometimes you just get a beating i mean yeah everybody yeah. takes All right. a beating sometimes let's uh <laughs> and yeah oh god let me he, tell you was, i i doubt that the women to music on that jury were, were thinking that was play, playing very well for them yeah I, that was not my initial reflex but when people brought that up i was like yeah if anybody has said it that, that's going to rub people the wrong way undoubtedly but like, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't ever, I, I never take a beating ever, <laughs> never have. And I hope I never will. <laughs> and I don't show well, up to, well, I don't show up to gunfights with, he says, you showed up to a, a fist fight with a gun and who said it? No, he showed up to a gunfight with his fists and yeah. uh, you, you don't have to prove your manhood by dropping your, your gun and going. Uh, True. What a strategy. Wasn't trying to show up. Kyle I mean, wasn't trying to show up at any fight. He was fleeing right. and fleeing and fleeing and fleeing until he could flee no more. Mm. I thought that was a very sad strategy when they actually put up a picture from what was it, Roadhouse with Patrick Swayze there with, the, <laughs> with the fist and his, up. <laughs> one of our locals board members mentioned in Roadhouse, apparently Patrick Swayze takes out a guy's whole neck with his bare hand. So it probably wasn't the best movie imagery. <laughs> Someone said there's a Binger press release. Uh, is is that a new thing? I haven't seen anything. What would like he that. possibly say? At this well, point? are you are you sub to his only fans? Because I mean, I think off. that's where he's putting it now. Maybe they found another drone. Oh, yes. I, want yes. to, that I want permission to reopen to bring in John yeah. Kip Man. Can I reopen? Maybe, even maybe, the, maybe the evidence fairy stopped by again. Yeah, I I don't see anything uh, in regards to that though. So if somebody's got a link to it or can direct it to me, direct me to it. I would love to. I would say that's almost next to nil that he's done something like that. Yeah, I, I can't imagine he would jeopardize in, in any way the case at this point. I mean, if if today comes back without a verdict, well, normally prosecutors don't like that. In this case, I'm sure Binger and little Binger and Sauer Krauss are thrilled. Yeah, they'd be happy it's not self-defense straight straight up on the, on yet, the short form. Yep. And yet I'm firmly of the opinion, and I had a disagreement with Nick about this earlier, where I believe that Binger and Kraus oh, we fell haven't. in love with their case. I think they invested so much time in it that they made a classic mistake that, that many lawyers make, where when you sit there arguing a position, at a certain point you lose the plot as to whether you're sounding logical or not. And we saw that evidence in the rebuttal when he makes that, that's, that, that insane argument, well, everyone takes a beating sometime and thinks this is compelling. But if you're a, a, you're a lawyer who falls in love with your with your case you tend to think that every argument you're making uh, that everyone in the world is going to agree with that even if it's completely nonsensical and i'm wondering what you guys i'm wondering if some of you newer people some of you were here when i made this point before but those of you who are, who who weren't particularly if you could weigh in whether you think that that falling in love with the case may have misled them into thinking that some of the stuff they're saying is a winner and in which case if they did fall in love with the case they and they might be under the impression that a quick jury a quick jury decision is a sign of conviction. And that's why I'm bringing it up now in this context. So I, I uh, wonder what you guys think about that. No, well, hold I on. It's a double down. Joe, we got, we, we got, is this, a, is this a legit press release, uh, Nick? Yeah. Uh, according to this person, it, it's a, it's a press release. It says, I'm not going to do a press release. It says no yeah, press. Yeah. 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 But, that, but that's a press release. And that, and now he's citing he, the reason for which he's not going to do a press release is ethics. And so he's citing a <laughs> press release. Based on his ethics, this it's, uh, knowing darn well that the jury is probably seeing what's going on in the media, and now he's just saying, "I'm so ethical, I'm not going to make a press release while oh, the jury is God. deliberating," or Stump. after, or after he's he, he's specifically saying, after the jury reaches a verdict, he will not comment. This is call this, me maybe. Press if, 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 if it is Which, unethical, that's unusual. I mean, most most of the time prosecutors do a press statement after a jury verdict. Be honest with you. This suggests to me he's anticipating a bad jury verdict. Yeah. Because if mm -hmm. Binger was going to get a good jury verdict, he wasn't going to, you know, crowd for the cameras. No chance. He um, wants an excuse as to why he doesn't show up if it's bad. But I mean, yeah, what I, ethical I, requirements would bind him if he comes yeah. back with a not guilty? I'm looking at uh, well, Wisconsin Supreme Court rules 20 uh, sub 3.6 and 20 sub 3.8. A lot if of Wisconsin it, prosecutors have been violating that over the last two decades, if that's hmm. his interpretation is correct. Let me After see, George let me Zimmerman see. was acquitted of all charges unanimous, unanimously by the jury in Florida, Prosecutor Angela Corey had a press conference where she called him explicitly a murderer after oh his acquittal. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, by that same token, if he's found guilty, the prosecutor is not going to be able to, shouldn't be able to get up on the, get up and start arguing 
his case even more just by virtue of the fact that there's going to be appeals. I mean, ethically, wouldn't that, I mean, uh, Andrew, isn't that, I've seen isn't stop that anybody. reasonable? It's never stopped this anybody is, before. Exactly. No, I understand, but I'm saying if we're going by the book, if a prosecutor is, you know, if, if you're not supposed to, obviously you can't prejudge a jury and, and I mean, you shouldn't prejudge a jury and, and judges, once you have a, a judge to decide something that is not a jury, obviously what you're saying in the press, those standards are, are minimized a little bit, but still you have to be careful what you say for ethical reasons. Um, the, uh, I, I checked the section and it's just the, it's basically model rules of professional conduct, three, six, and three, eight. So uh, I'm just, um, say, if he knew that it was unethical or if he thought it were unethical to comment afterwards, uh, he is now admittedly doing something that is unethical by commenting on how he's not going to comment citing his ethics. Cause that's a statement. And he just made it knowing that he thought it was unethical. Isn't this the same guy who uh, made reference in front of the jury to Kyle Rittenhouse asserting his fifth amendment rights? Oh yes. Same yes. Guy? Yeah, so he get brazen with me. <laughs> and committed by his own argument, committed a crime by pointing a dangerous weapon with his finger on the trigger at the jury. <laughs> and then he asked for a photo op. Oh or my goodness. Maybe maybe we're looking at this wrong because uh, the statement has to qualify, right? It says a statement referred to ordinarily is likely to have a prejudicial effect when it refers to a criminal matter that could result in deprivation of liberty. And the statement relates to like the character, credibility, reputation, or criminal record of a party uh, in a criminal case that could result in deprivation of liberty, the possibility of a plea of guilty to the offense or the existence, performance or results of any examination or test. By the, by the way, all of these things have been testified to at trial already, most of the time by Binger, but maybe he just won't be able to contain himself from attacking Kyle Rittenhouse relentlessly because he's got no chill on his temper. And if he knows he can't let Krause talk to anybody because, because Krause will just, he'll, he'll sound like a uh, Tasmanian devil. Smash. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and the predicate to this rule is have a substantial likelihood of materially prejudicing an adjudicative proceeding. So after it's, yeah. after it's over, it's, it's unclear how it applies. Yeah, what, oh, it's no. never been interpreted to my knowledge to apply after a jury verdict. Here's what happens. almost always do press conferences after a jury verdict. He expects um, a hung jury and he doesn't want to prejudice the subsequent trial. The next one. Right. That, that could hmm. be a circumstance in which he has to be careful. Yeah. But I, even then it's, you know, you have a right of free speech. There's more restrictions on the state than the defendant, but in this precise, cause I've litigated this precise issue in Wisconsin. Well, and there's I mean, a lot he, of constitutional constrictions on the scope and scale of that rule. Right. My well, view is he's only saying this because he wants a pretext there's in no, case it comes back. Uh, yeah. He's put it this way. If he was anticipating a better chance of convictions than anything else, he doesn't put out that statement. That's fair. I mean, I think you might be right. He's lashing himself to the mast. He, he's making the commitment now so that he can explain why he's not available if it would be something that he feels like he wouldn't be able to control or would be otherwise negative towards him. Yeah. Oh, Gentlemen uh, of, the, of the panel, Nick, I'm going to duck out. I may, I, re, I recognize if there's a jury today, I will be giving up my seat to another lawyer, but everyone, thank you. It's been nice talking to you and see you tomorrow this, this evening. <laughs> Take it easy. Sounds guys. good. Get out of here. Oh, excuse me, guys. <laughs> Click leave studio, you Canadian. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> Robert, this is a question maybe you can uniquely answer. I, I don't know. I, and there, there's no advocacy for anything like this, but many people have asked what, uh, what could be done about the perceived uh, indiscretions of, of Binger, for example, in this case. I mean, I personally think he has acted unethically. I'm not opposed to him in this case. I'm not, he's not, uh, you know, I'm not representing someone opposed to him in this case. So I don't take it upon myself to do any, reporting or whatever but is is there some process i mean my main thought is you know you could write a letter to the kenosha county attorney's office and just say you're you're kind of disgusted by what you see but but i, I again i'm not advocating for stuff i don't do stuff like that i'm just curious if you have any thoughts on that so i mean several components from a rem remedial perspective from kyle he can always seek a mistrial with prejudice even after a jury verdict or if there's a mistrial mm -hmm. Now, the problem is that's now easily appealable, whereas a mistrial with prejudice motion while there's jeopardy at issue, not always clear, even in Wisconsin, when exactly that is or is not appealable. But 
the and then you have a risk that the appeal takes so long by the time it comes back maybe Schroeder's no longer on the bench so that that's your kind of exposure there but there's that risk they the they can always request the court seek some sort of remedy or relief uh either a referral or a sanctions order or a factual determination something like that then uh otherwise you can seek relief through the uh, di- local district attorney's office Kenosha elected official that controls the his employment there's various DA ethical bodies that can make you know potential kind of inquiries and primarily it's the office of lawyer regulation an administrative agency under the control of the Wisconsin Supreme Court that can actually take disciplinary action against it and so all of that can be initiated and instigated by anybody that's simply aware of the facts that lead lead up to it I think what Andrew well, said bother? earlier is correct unless the di- unless the trial court judge really comes down on him it's going to be very difficult to get anyone else to take remedy. I just don't see anything substantive being done to any of these prosecutors who, who really act in egregious ways, who, who, you know, they, they, they hide evidence by not hiding it, right? They bury it under so much other evidence that it's impossible to find. Uh, They swear out complaints that are never proven at court. There's never any evidence shown for critical elements of a criminal charge. Uh, Marilyn Mosby, the state's attorney in Baltimore, tra- charged six police officers with crimes as serious as murder over the death of Freddie Gray. And there was never any evidence that any of those officers used unlawful force on him at all. And nothing, nothing happens. She just, she just gets reelected. She stays. They try to sue her and they throw it out over prosecutorial immunity. Uh, nothing happened to Angela Corey, uh, Corey in Florida. Uh, I, I just I never see these people being held accountable. Well, and that's the problem with that's the problem with the state bars, right? And as a regulatory body, and, I, and I'm sure we can all get into that. I mean, that's to me number one. We were talking about crowdfunding earlier. That just brings up all the issues with just the Byzantine regulations that are selectively enforced, right? There's always the in crowd and the out crowd who they're being enforced against, who they're not being enforced against. I mean, I've always had a huge problem with that as a, just a regulatory structure, um, and I think that's reinforced here. The fact that you need to reach such a high burden in order to have anything happen, other than perhaps maybe a written reprimand. I think that's, to most people, that's not right. Well, I think in a realistic world, you would hope that the folks with that kind of power would have the lowest bar, that they have the highest obligation. And if you're not up to it, then, hey, all right, go make your business elsewhere. But we need people that are effectively above reproach. And that's clearly not what is happening now. Just to Um, kind of, this is a little bit off topic, but I guess Jack Posobiec just like four or five minutes ago tweeted that two jurors are holding the decision up um, outright citing backlash per U S marshal in Kenosha. That's uh, that's US what I was Marshall. just about to say. So oh. thank you. Yeah. Uh, first of all, how's a U.S. marshal get involved in this? I don't know. Uh, if yeah. there, I mean, there could be just a U.S. marshal who happens to be in the courtroom, not in any official capacity. Why? Uh, only I if mean, there's federal security there applicable to the jury, which would be unusual. You know, normally this would be bailiffs. Uh, the only people who now, and usually the bailiffs are not in that in the actual jury room. That doesn't prevent them from overhearing things. Mm-hmm. And it depends right. on your state. court. I had a federal court judge who the jury came back, told the bailiff they had a question. He was panicked that it was going to lead to acquittals and he didn't want acquittals. So he did an ex parte instruction to the jury outside the presence of counsel, out, everybody. Total violation. The judge was known as uh, uh, Maximum Moody. That's the judge. So um, just because he, he and he, as it turns out, he panicked. Going back to a point Andrew made earlier, I actually picked a juror who was very open about his biases against my client potentially because he was so self-aware and so self-reflective. I was like, wow, I, I, I can work with him. He ended up being the foreman that he the jury deliberations went longer than the trial. That's what panicked the judge. And the uh, it ended up being a very uh, fair jury process. Uh, but the, uh, but yeah, so a, a judge who wants to know things can know things. Uh, they're not supposed to, but that doesn't, you know, it's only the judge who has real control over what's happened in that jury room. Bailiffs, same deal. They want to listen in a little more, they can. And then the word can spread. Right. Um, it's a Ferris think- Bueller deal, right? It's my, my sister's cousin's aunt heard that Ferris Bueller was uh, whatever, blah, 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 blah. And it's impossible to know the veracity. Night, of it's it. most likely informed speculation. But it's probably what it is, is I know of at least, at least I heard from not from the defense team, but from uh, from other journalists that they thought there were at least two of the 12 that looked bad for Kyle uh, two Karens, as they put it. 
The, uh, I will say that in my experience, Jack has been remarkably accurate in these yeah. kinds of things. Yeah. yeah hmm. The what one interesting thing is apparently the the thin walls theory that was voiced by another name a, a little bit ago. Um, there's actually a clip of the judge that uh, someone DM'd me, and you can hear the clerk, even though she's way off mic, say they can hear you in the library while he's snapping at Binger, and the. The idea that's where the jury goes, right? They they move out into the library if they're only out for a temporary time. So it is certainly possible that there would be somebody in the courthouse somewhere that might uh, overhear something either coming from a jury room or them uh, talking to the judge about about something. I, you know, we I don't know that exchange happened. Well, the other, you know, you could always have a juror talking to. It's know. uh, it's it's also like uh, legal bites. You. I, the reason I haven't brought it up and played the clip over and over is because it's, I think I played it on one of my nighttime shows. It's really hard to hear. Mm -hmm. And I, I worry that what I'm hearing is being influenced by what I read that someone says is happening. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay. so I don't know, I can't verify it, but it, it does sound a lot like that happened now, you know, it, that's probably not that big of a deal because he's yelling at Binger. It's not prejudicing the defendant. If they hear that it prejudices the state and I'm sorry, but I don't care. You can prejudice the state all day and I will never, ever shed a tear in my entire life. Um, but, uh, but yeah, uh, interesting uh, update from Mr. Posobiec and, and it would be, you know, who knows it's plausible. There is, there are demonstrators outside the courthouse today, something well, that has not happened, but not the, very many. The only other possibility is mentioned in the chat. There have been threats against the judge. And sometimes, even though U.S. Marshals only guard federal judges, they do sometimes help protect security of state court judges. There you go. Because of, it's a federal civil rights violation for someone to hurt a state judge under certain circumstances. Well, it's and we hurt. have uh, we have an across state lines threat, right? The nephew of <laughs> across the nations, foreign country across of Antioch, yeah. like the foreign country of Racine. Oh, oh. you guys are you guys are taking a joke. I was being serious. Uh, the, the guy who threatened the jurors is George Floyd's oh. nephew, who I presume to be in Minnesota. That's All right. He's done I that. I mean, yes, he's there doing could be done a federal using, investigation lingering. Right. Mm -hmm. That and that's done using a interstate communication over the Internet. Therefore, I mean, you could, so normally that would be FBI, people like that. Marshals are only usually security or federal courthouse. Right. But I'm just saying, since they have an interstate threat, oh. they may right. employ federal defense in this specific instance. I don't know the process. I'm just speculating. But right. Right. come on, Robert. The FBI is too busy uh, turning out late footage. You know, they got to they got to <laughs> dig deep through their files. <laughs> oh, we, got yes. our drones. we got our drones. When is yeah, Jump so Man going to give a speech outside the Kenosha courthouse? That's all I want to know right now. Well, the question is, of the 30 people protesting outside the Kenosha courthouse, what percentage of them are feds? <laughs> and I think that's reasonable. I think that's you know, a reasonable question. Where we're sitting. Non zero, I would say. Uh, Harvester of Sorrow says at this point, I honestly believe the best Kyle can hope for is a mistrial. If that happens, how likely would it be that Kyle gets a new attorney? One can only Hopefully pray. high. I mean, I'll put that blatantly. <laughs> Literally so, anyone. Anyone I, else I would be fine. I was patient before trial, but not anymore. Well, I think yeah, if it's a mistrial, to... it will be a mistrial because they screwed up. And enough's enough. And he needs to get better counsel. And David Hancock, the security guy who's hijacked the family, basically, functionally, needs to be out. And he needs to have a real legal team and a real media team and a real investigation team, not this nitwit, halfwit, uh, with spooky connections running the show and hijacking the funds. Now, I, I do have a question. We talked about this in regards to Fifth Amendment privilege, but let's say um, the... And I think I know the answer, but mistrial occurs. They're relitigating. State tries to bring in some of this evidence that definitely should have been objected to this entire time. Um, do they lose the ability to have those objections because it's already been in the record, or you can it's still object totally, to that? And then totally new from scratch. Not only that, okay. I mean, you don't. Kyle doesn't have to be called to testify. It gets complicated whether they can use his testimony from the prior proceedings in a mistrial situation. Uh, but you, you get to renew every evidentiary objection, whatever happened. The only thing, what is the state cannot bring back a curfew because that was rejected, dismissed after Jeopardy and cannot bring back the gun charge because that was dismissed right. after Jeopardy. That's the only thing that can't come back. Anything else can come back. Yeah, and that's uh, 
that's that's good news because that is the predicate for their case. I mean, if th that's why I'm so annoyed that the judge waited um, so long when I feel that the complaint is deficient since the complaint doesn't allege that it's a short barrel rifle. Uh, so I think it fails pleading standards on probable cause. But um, why that's why that was such a problem is because they used that as a predicate for the prosecution and then had to attempt to work around it as the prosecution progressed. And, and so it's like, if you don't have this, you don't have a case because uh, you don't have provocation. But of course now they, now they will going forward, attempt to bring that FBI or that drone footage in uh, the second time if they get another bite at it. But. I mean, a, a mistrial and a retrial would be terrible, but at, at least in the second trial, presumably the defense team would actually have the image gutted and they'd have a use of force expert actually providing some use of force testimony. I mean, they, you know, the judge limited what Dr. John Black could talk about, but not he didn't limit it as far as the defense limited themselves. I mean, the judge right. just said, listen, I'm not going to let this guy proclaim to the jury that this was lost, lawful self-defense. And that's right. He, he shouldn't be permitted to do that. But he could have talked about things like how fast someone travels when they're charging at someone, the dangers of wrestling over a gun. Those are all components that all Black did was say these shots were 0.76 seconds apart. I mean, you, you didn't need him for that. You could have just right. brought in some audio file to do that. And yeah, or just, the prosecution just brought on a regular detective and just asked him the question on direct. You used the stopwatch, and, right? Uh, <laughs> and, Let me ask you uh, a question. That was a case where Binger just baited Richards. He was like, oh, yeah. if he dismisses this, I won't call my nidwit. Because his expert couldn't even testify in direct because they didn't timely disclose him. He would have solely been a rebuttal expert, number one. Number two, he was not good. It was clear he was not it's good. Terrible. No, he was to be uh, intimidated by him. Yeah. Uh, and Black was good, and they just blew it. Because Finger said, if you only limit it to these little second thing, then I'll withdraw. And he should have said, heck no, I want him on this and this and this and this and this. You you want Black on there for his one line during pretrial, right? I could figure out how to kill a man with a skateboard. Yes, you want that guy on there. He's hilarious. Things that are outside, because that's actually outside the ordinary knowledge of an ordinary jury. Well, how dangerous a skateboard is and the ways in which it can kill people. That is not commonly popularly known. And, of course, the, the prosecution played it up, right? Oh, we should let Santa Claus know and all the parents know who buy their children skateboards. How, how, how oh. dangerous can a skateboard be? To the head. Very fatal. Well, yeah. yeah. I know I as a kid would have preferred an AR-15 to a skateboard, so I hope that's what Santa does bring more kids in Wisconsin. <laughs> well, I wonder how many people have been killed by baseball bats. I mean, let's or just hockey get sticks if you're Canadian. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, oh, that's yeah. Ma many, many hundreds of murders every year in America with uh, blunt instruments. Hundreds with bare hands and boots. That was a point someone on the panel raised the other day. Is that there are more. Uh, hand, uh, feet and fists murders in the U.S. annually than there are rifle murders in the U.S. This annually. is true. Yep, this yep. is very true. So, so uh, uh, just just nonsense. I, I, if he does, I don't want the kid to have to go through anymore, right? I want an acquittal, or if they get a mistrial, for them to just uh, go ahead and dismiss it because they they're losing the bulk of their initial provocation claim. But if he does go back, I really hope that he he gets somebody on that defense team who will stand up and just object who won't concede on their expert and limit their expert outside. Like his, his sort of expertise was video, but they even limited the behavioral and perception aspects of video review that he was spent. That's his PhD is here is what someone in a video perceives in real time and how they take in that information. It's like, that's what you need. You don't need someone to tell us what's on screen. We can have any detective do that apparently. Um, or we can have, uh, hell, the DNA forensic expert, because for some reason the state didn't object when they're like, yeah, so you're looking at this. He's grabbing the gun, right? And the, the state should have said, she's not. She wasn't there. But anyway, you have this guy who can actually do this as an expert. And then they just forfeited it because the threat of Bob coming in in a, in a greasy T-shirt with potato chips is going to outdo John Black. It was silly. Running this without a use of force expert is... It's unfathomable to me because you do need to explain things. How dangerous is how dangerous is it that an unarmed guy is running at you? Well, the prosecution was making huge noise about that. I guarantee you, you know, I've made this point before. There's no police officer on the planet that wouldn't have dropped two into him right there. You know, every officer who's saying, I've got my gun, he's charging me, you know, he's reaching for my gun. 
it's so well, frustrating to watch. I thought it'd been helpful to have medical evidence without the necessity of Kyle's testimony. Just someone would say, someone who's been hit in the way he has, how would that impact his perception and consciousness? How would that impact? Yeah. I mean, that basically you got a guy that's, you know, doesn't know what's happening. His head has been jarred and has been hammered with a head on the rock, then pushed to the ground, then hit on the head with a with feet, then hit on the head with a skateboard. You're going to be in a discharged state of mind, and all of a sudden you see any threat coming, you're going to defend yourself. And that's a really uh, good best point. part about that was never brought up. The best part about John Black is he could have likely credibly testified that he has both had that happen to him and done that to someone else. <laughs> like the way his his CV read, it's like, okay, this guy's been a cop for 23 years. He was in the armed services for 30, and he's been a, how old is this man? And how many people does he have buried under his basement? Uh, he seemed like the guy you would have do all of this stuff. And well, I don't know if you, him was I don't know if you've talked about it before. Um, but have we talked about whether there's any chance if it's hung in certain respects that they still get to a verdict on others? Like if I'm looking at it, you know, on the ground guy with a gun is to me the, no the most obvious. No oh. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> they, they cut from the courtroom feed on one of them to the outside feed. And oh, okay. so there's an idiot with a bullhorn. Yelling no yeah. justice. Well, no, no justice just saying no peace is... isn't a bad idea. It's just what does justice look like, I guess. Prosecute the police. <laughs> Sorry. But no, you no, were, you were... I was saying was, I, I, I do think <clears throat> I can imagine a composition of the jury that says, okay, guy with a gun, sure, hitting the head on the ground, sure. I'm not as convinced because this small little person that can't threaten this guy and, and he should have fought him because everybody takes a beating sometimes. And could you get into a scenario where it's only the first count that becomes trouble and that it's not worth it to, to try him again on, on only a little bit of the, of the case, or is it such a political case that if there's going to be holdouts, they're going to hold out down the whole road. Now, I mean, any acquittals are good for Kyle because those are not things that can be retried and it limits the scope of retrial. Yeah. And, and that's what I'm asking is, you know, it's just, it's so hard for me to envision having a lot of difficulties with with this particular case because there's so much evidence and it's so odd that things are really usually a lot more ambiguous than this. And yep. if they're having trouble with anything, I guess my concern would be you just hold out down the, the down the whole road. It just doesn't apply at all. Yeah, and that's what you know. That's what we were finding. All right. In, in pretrial polling, they were hardcore holdouts. And that's that what I'm curious just, about. Yeah. You know. And that, um, that's why jury selection had to be done differently than it was done here by the defense. There's a, there's a very large donation that I want to address from Black Flame Nova, and it's, it's an interesting question. It says, all right, this is a one-time donation. How can media be allowed to use the freedom of the press to mess with trials, make the jury afraid, etc., but our Second Amendment shall not be infringed means nothing? Where's the justice in law? Where's the accountability? Great stream. Much love to you all. Uh, does well, anyone want to address the disparity? The Supreme, in... Court, the Supreme Court would be nice if they showed up a little bit more frequently on the Second Amendment. They do have a case this term, finally. New York State Pistol and Rifle Association versus Bruin on the extent to which carry outside the home can occur without arbitrary conditions such as please prove to us that you have an exceptional need, which definitionally excludes the ordinary person. So is that kind of, an, is that kind of a rule valid? And that was an interesting and argument. People should check it out. It was, a, it was a good argument. In fact, I covered it on my channel. I have a three-hour stream on my channel breaking down that entire oral argument. You should check it out. Well, check that out. Yeah, absolutely. And, and well, uh, Three hours. Oh, man. Uncivil. Uncivil. Yeah. That's, That's yeah. Yeah. rookie yeah. numbers. It was the Cliffs notes. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Uncivil. Uh, what I heard from people was the oral argument sounded like it was going to be a favorable ruling. Was that your take yes. or no? That does seem to be the, seem to be the direction where things are going. The uh, the New York State Solicitor General was was not very good, but everyone else was good, and of course uh, the the lead was fantastic because you know no one is that good except for them. Um, but um, to to the point of the question, why is like every term the Supreme Court takes up a couple First Amendment cases. They've taken up a couple First Amendment cases every year, time immemorial, or, you know, for the last fifty years or something. So when you're deciding like three cases every year. You get 150 cases. That's a lot of case law. For reasons that we can only speculate about, the Supreme Court hasn't taken up anything of note in the Second Amendment for 12 years. They keep punting on everything, even though there's a lot of great cases. So one of the reasons our Second Amendment rights 
are not as well flushed out as our First Amendment rights is because the Supreme Court doesn't want to. So and how about prior, that for answer? And prior to, to, to that, it was, what, 60, 60, 70 yeah. years almost? Well, yeah, if you want to go all the way back to Miller, which as Barnes has noted before and I've noted before, is one hell of an interesting decision, particularly because Miller's lawyer didn't show up. Miller himself had died. Miller's lawyer apparently stopped getting paid. So Miller didn't show up to the U.S. Supreme Court, which apparently is an option. So, so it was just the U.S. government arguing U.S. versus Miller in 1923. And that was the last time they took it up. And before that was probably Krushchank in 1860-something. So it's not been great for the Second Amendment. It's been a little bit unloved. It needs a little bit more love. Well, Nate, Nate and I also, we, we did a breakdown of that Second Amendment case, the oral arguments there. And I concur with, with on civil law that uh, the direction that the justices seem to be taking, specifically the six conservative justices actually sounded pretty conservative even kavanaugh and barrett in fact kavanaugh surprisingly so sounded the, the form of their questions seemed to be leading towards a direction and and new york the the attorney for new york new york state rifle and pistol association was a gentleman named caldwell who was phenomenal in he the way good. that he argued he was really i thought he was really really strong and the questions the questions were basically okay so what standard do you think we should apply when he when he when he came forward with a standard that you know they were they were examining should should we look at strict scrutiny should we look at intermediate scrutiny and and he was and he and whatever standard he was applying Kavanaugh was like I don't think that's good enough I don't, I don't think that judges will misinterpret it and be too harsh in allowing some of these statutes that shouldn't stand stand up if you're going to if we embrace that statute we'd have to be go even further than the petitioner's counsel is looking for here so it's not so strict. it was very it's encouraging it wasn't it was, it was Clement who argued pointless. for uh did I, say, did I, I, say, I, I said Caldwell. Yeah, you're right. You're correct. Yeah, you're Paul Clement, we should do who's 12 like one hours on how make no law resulted in levels of scrutiny. At some it's point. ridiculous. Well, <laughs> um, we can get it. We can get into a whole analysis. Do we want to get into a long discussion about this? Because I, I fancy myself a bit of a knowledgeable person on this topic. Well, one, one thing I just want to say, though, is that is that, you know, to the question to the super chat, though, the, 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 there is a huge balance. If you look at the volume of what can potentially be violative of speech versus Second Amendment rights. So, yeah. you know, when you see an imbalance, there's just so many more things where speech is triggered rather than second amendments which explains a lot of that volume from the supreme court uh, on that question i want to i want to just follow up with the thought that 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 question inspired me to have which is you we could see potentially a conflict in between first amendment freedom of assembly and freedom of speech with with trying to protect a jury from a mob that's calling for a verdict to to go the way that their emotions are carrying them and I wonder how, how the panel here would feel, even though in our current political climate, it seems inconceivable that any legislature, legislature would pass such a thing, but I guess in some conservative states they might. And the question I'm getting at here is, let's assume that a state like Florida would pass a law that you can't assemble within, uh, within let's say, half a mile of a courthouse mm -hmm. that is deciding no. something of something significant like that because of the threat of there being a mob that will intimidate the jury into into a decision that is not in keeping with what their actual findings are um whether you guys think that such a thing would would withstand scrutiny from the court well no i mean especially the kind of distances you're talking about is way too far even for some sort of time place matter restriction but i think that more fundamentally, the jury system has always been a community-based decision. It's always been members of the community coming together to to judge things, which is better than the judges doing it because we saw how well that worked out. So I'm not necessarily sure it's completely antithetical to the idea of the jury system that members of the community are expressing their opinions, particularly on issues of the day. I can't disagree with you more on that. I, I can't even believe that those words came out of your mouth. That you have a mob outside, that, especially given the current climate right here and now, this minute, what we just heard in the background there. We have a mob out there, which clearly we can imagine that many of them never bother watching 10 minutes of this trial. The and First Amendment doesn't require people to be well-informed. I understand, but you're, say, but you're saying it's a communal decision about the about the defendant, and the, and much of the community here doesn't know anything about the facts of the case. They haven't been watching anything, so it's not it's a community which has been reduced down to twelve people. So those twelve people shouldn't be influenced by other members of the community who have absolutely no idea what 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 the evidence should lead any person to conclude. 
I was no saying it was logical about. for people of the community to want to have an opinion on what things go on in their communion, community, and they should be able to express those views, and those views do not have to be well informed. So yes. I, 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 I'm a pretty, first, I'm a pretty strong First Amendment guy. I'm not quite an absolutist, but I'm pretty strong on the First Amendment, and I, I think you should think... have the right to express, you know, your views, no matter how stupid they are, pretty much anywhere, and that should be even up to, the, you know, the courthouse steps, you know, barring safety concerns and making sure people can get in and out so how does real, that real not lead to jury tampering though how does that not lead to pushing a jury and swaying them to ignore what they've heard throughout the trial and reaching a decision based on mob mentality as to what as to what the people outside the door house 10, 10 feet away from them are going to be screaming at them hurling at them or potentially putting their lives in jeopardy three minutes after they reach so yeah you have to so, like. you so you're having to pick one basically it's like okay your 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 concern is reasonable people outside the courthouse you know are shouting the let's assume we're in sort of 12 angry men territory and the windows are overlooking the alley or whatever so they can literally hear the screams coming up so you have one of two decisions you can either you can either say all right the jury is so important that we need to back these people further and further up so they can't be heard or the first amendment's more important but you know i think the first amendment's more important because i think it's the first among equals i think freedom of speech is the paramount freedom and the right to say things no matter how stupid you are is paramount um, so that's gentlemen, a right to a fair trial. Gentlemen, on on point with We're, this. So this is in the theme. I'm in the theme here. I'm, I'm loving the, the argument though. Over, I'm loving though that the First Amendment is facing whether or not it impacts jury trial. This is this is good shit here. right now. So uh, <laughs> Sobiek has tweeted out in response to his own tweets. Right, he created a thread while we weren't looking. Uh, he has more worried about the media leaking their names, what will happen to their families, jobs, etc., including doxing threats from, quote, anarchist groups. This is according to, again, uh, Posobiec's uh, alleged source. So it's qualified within that. But with that, with that sounds information, like they want to acquit. that sounds like an it sounds like they want to quit, which is the right decision. It does. By yeah. any by any measure. So why should they be held up even 30 seconds by a thought that their lives may be hampered because of that decision? Well, but how, how do you avoid that? Cannot, it, yeah, how, do you, how do you, at yeah, the very you least, it's like, it's the old at question the very least, who, they shouldn't hear the shouts of a mob screaming outside their windows while they're trying to reach I, a decision. I mean, how would you prevent them from hearing about it in this day and age, short of setting up like some sequestered bunker? I understand, well, I mean, I understand where, what, you, I understand that's where what you're saying. That's where jury selection came in. Well, There's and the other... Yeah. Yeah. And the other aspect, too, here is that they're not just worried about the people that are right there on the street. They're worried about the people that are coming for them at their job, worrying, yeah. worrying about the people that are coming after their families. Any... So that's 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 not something that you can really that you can really uh, impact just by moving a crowd back 200 feet. Or well, whatever. as we were, I don't know, Britain I wanted to make a point earlier, but <laughs> the, normally the highest tier of speech is the political speech. It's as high as it goes. It's the most protected speech. So people are having a an opinion about not even what the law is or maybe what it should be because there's outrage maybe that the law sucks and maybe he should be guilty in some more abstract sense because the law is insufficient to deal with this evil which is they a reasonable need position to... even no matter how much i disagree with it wait 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 what, what robert what were you about to say you were going to oh, say something uh, i mean ago. yes that, that this is also an excuse by bad jurors and a persuasion argument so if it's the case the, the way bad jurors were arguing in Rittenhouse's case, and I've seen it in other cases, is to persuade other. They say, you know, I don't want we, we just can't issue that kind of verdict. The community will get really mad. That's not OK. It's sometimes it's completely legitimate and sincere. They don't want to be part of that. But usually it's because they don't want to be part of it for political reasons, not be not so not just because of their concerns of blowback. But often it's a persuasion argument. They believe it's a persuasive argument to the other side. We got to do some sort of verdict here. Otherwise, the community will go crazy. That's not da, da, da. particularly on the on the left. This has been a common refrain in general. Yeah. See, I think mm -hmm. this is this is at the key of the tension between Joe and you, Uncivil, is because it's selective enforcement. I agree with the law as Uncivil is arguing. I think the, absolutely freedom of speech is, you know, first and foremost. But I think what's behind a lot of what Joe's getting pissed off about, what I get pissed off about, is it's selectively enforced, right? The left is allowed to do this. Well, if the right came out and did a similar thing, they would arrest them all, round them up, and send in the FBI, right? Well, I've always tried to be as consistent as I can on my channel on applying principles universally. When I'm, uh, there's a reason I've got 54 or whatever videos on the Capitol Riot series. 
because you know I don't care if they're right. I, it, people say, well, it's really Antifa, it's really BLM. I was like, I could give a damn either way. I don't care if it's Trump supporters, Republicans, whatever. As far as I'm concerned, you know, the vast majority of them have done illegal things. They need to be prosecuted. That seems to be the result because I also think, for example, when they're burning the cities of Kenosha, that's equally bad or more bad, depending on your scale of crimes. But either way, it should all be prosecuted. It's all bad. And so to I to say, point, well, freedom of speech for the left, freedom of, freedom of speech for the right. It's all good. Yeah. Legal I, mindset. To respond to your to your point too, though, I mean, if 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 the if the argument is that they're not enforcing it on both sides, the answer is not to not enforce it on on the right. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's, it, it shouldn't be not enforced on both sides. It should be enforced on both sides. So I, yeah. I, I, and, I, and I'm not saying, look, uncivil is not the enforcer of these laws. He's just stating the law as it is. Right. You know, but I, I well, I'm also stating that I think it's fundamentally a good thing. Yeah. So I'm also stating, I don't stating think, a normative argument. And, it, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you this much. I don't understand how that's an infringement of time and in place to the point that we're going to, I mean, lead is making a point here. Sorry. Legal bites is making a point here that same thing. I, go I understand, but I, I, you don't. People might not recognize your name, so that's why I, I, I went back to your your stage name. So mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. think the point you're making is saying that they have a th they feel a threat to their jobs or or whatever mm -hmm. that's going to happen days or weeks after the trial. That actually makes my argument all the stronger because whatever concerns they have about that level, if you allow a mob to come up to the doors of the courthouse as as uncivil laws advocating for, all the more that that will make them that much more concerned that this is a real threat that they're going to be dealing with for, for a lengthy time. You're actually letting that ring in their ears as they're trying to reach a decision here. I, I just don't, I don't understand how, how mm. we are hurting our basic first amendment rights by limiting time, manner, and place, which we do all yeah. the time in many it, situations. There are, there are, there are, there are the court, less by the way, if the court believes they are within earshot of the jury, he can move them out of earshot. Yeah, of the jury. I mean, that's fair enough. That they've established that's an except first amendment wise that there's a, you can limit free speech to the degree it impacts directly on the jury. Um, I think the big issue here, though, is ultimately which which is more important if, to the extent of its intention: the First Amendment rights of the protesters or the right of the defendant to fair trial, uh, which is also enshrined in the Constitution. It's uh, well, my my other issue is: uh, are there less re extreme uh, measures? For example, yeah. I've taken no particular position on the jury members themselves being perpetually anonymous. So that would be another remedy that I might support because, well, I'm not sure why we in particular have a right to their names. Any member of the public who is in there might know who they are, but there's no reason to like broadcast that or keep a record or be foilable. So I, I've, that might be a remedy that's easier. I, I'm very reluctant to infringe on First Amendment rights. The concern is that the other First Amendment right, it's perceived that public access to the court is protected under the First Amendment and Part of that is right to know who made a decision in any public trial, including jury members. And you get the Roger Stone question that what happens when suppression of juror names or juror anonymity uh, allows a biased juror to get on the jury because crowdsourced information would have disclosed the bias of that jury. Well, so you should definitely disclose it to the, the lawyers who should be doing their damn job. Oh, I understand that. Uh, but my own f sense, I my thought process is, I also think it's a good way to get rid of bad jurors, that any juror, I think that court should automatically dismiss any juror who says they fear the public consequences of their association with the verdict. Because I don't think that's a juror who can provide an impartial, ver just by the nature of their thought process. It necessarily disqualifies that. Yes, I mean, yes. there's... Yes. Okay, that might be right. That and might have, my, my, I you argued have, that question for the for this jury, and I'm pretty um, sure the jurors were asked ask roughly that question at some point in the voir dire. I listened to a lot of it. What they did but, is they asked questions. There, there were jurors who volunteered; they really didn't want to sit on the jury, but they decided not to get into any detail on any of these subject matters. And you get the rhetorical question, which is useless. Can you put aside your prejudice and bias that you? Every the people who say yes to that are the most biased jurors because they're unaware of their own bias or they're yeah. lying. Well, uh, that the, stands uh, up. This is a bigot. Well, and the the interesting part of this, of course, is there are six alternate jurors, right? Yeah. Like yeah. there's yeah. nothing of why the, obligating the, the two judge people can't to know say. what's going on inside that jury room. That's illegal for them to disclose. So the only way an alternate could replace that to the questions in the chat is if those two decided they're sick and can't come back. That's it. Okay. 
That's that's actually well, a maybe. I mean, problem. if they if one of the foremen or something rats them out because it's like it's because of their fundamental external fear, then maybe you could get to them that way. But I don't. I, that raises different. It, normally, the juror cannot disclose what's going on inside the room. They can say we're internally deadlocked, but can't disclose. The, there's co- pure confidentiality on the internal discussions until the end of trial. Then they can, but have a privilege not to discuss. Depending even on, if they're be- now making a determination outside of the merits of the case, there's there's no escape hatch for that precise thing that's exactly what happened in the snipes case three jurors got on the jury admitted to the other jurors they lied to get onto the jury that they had prejudged him all along nine wanted complete acquittals they held out and did a compromise verdict on three misdemeanor convictions on those misdemeanors they snipes got an unusual sentence so a juror came forward and said here's what happened and the judge said no that's inadmissible as a matter of law I understand well, I've seen jury verdicts overturned because they brought in a Ouija board. So you know, there's that. <laughs> so in, well, we want to call we want to call to the board, uh, Mr. Joseph Rosenbaum. Mr. Rosenbaum, are you with us? <laughs> the ghost <laughs> never <laughs> lies. The ghost and then it says I'm, ASL. I'm loving this conversation <laughs> because I, I I find that absolutely crazy. That you know you, you can't say okay these people are not thinking about the case, not not thinking about it one way or the other, and that needs to be corrected. The yeah. theory is so, that absolute confidentiality is necessary for completely independent free decision making, kind of like executive privilege, the kind of privilege that's attached that says we want the decision making process to have the confidence of the same thing you would have talking to a priest or a shrink. Um, the, that's the theory. There's definitely limitations and problems with it, as you know. Okay, yeah. this is a this is a chat that follows right up on this. Guerrilla one. Uh, by the way, thank you for the very large chat. It says, gentlemen and lady, how do we fix our broken system of law and make it into a system of justice? This case has destroyed any faith I once had. Oh, wow. see, I hate that. Wow. Well, wow. that's, that, that's because of Robert of and opinion. Andrew dead pilling everyone earlier. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. <laughs> I mean, you really got to get public opinion and you really got to push for reform. And it's got to come from both sides, too. It's got it can't be something that's being completely partisan. We've got to say, hey, look, the way prosecutors are acting, it's damaging to all political parties. So let's go and get this shit fixed. And that's what I yes. would say. I mean, you heard me say it before, but it's that high bar. I mean, so much discretion, so much power. We should be looking at it almost in reverse. And, and yeah. I, I want to say this about criminal cases specifically, and I, I've said it before, and not everybody likes this opinion, but if you think that the misconduct that you're seeing in this case is special and unique to this case, you are incorrect. And, and we, uh, the right and the left have divided over this issue because the right wants to be super pro uh, law and order, which is great, but that law and order has to also apply to the enforcement arm of the government. And so when, when you see what's happening to Kyle Rittenhouse, this stuff happens every single day to uh, people in, in inner cities who are charged with drug crimes. I mean, it, yeah. it just does. And, and the, I mean, hell I had, uh, again, in my small town, I had three people charged with possession of CBD oil that you can go buy anywhere in the world because the prosecutor thought there might be, at some level, THC in the CBD oil. It might be yeah. impure, and they based it off of a police officer's common understanding that these these chemicals could contain THC. No testing w- – well – Testing was done. They used a meth test on the CBD oil to test for THC. They got it wrong because they're very, very good at their jobs. And they wrote the report stating this. They actually wrote the report like nine months after the testing, but that's okay. Um, They do this all the time. And the reality is that many defendants are simply too poor to have a lawyer take the time and look at it because a public defender has 50 to 90 cases on their docket in a small volume court, at least, yeah. So well, if and look at a U.S. federal criminal case, I've represented people with significant resources, pales, pales in comparison to federal criminal resources. I mean, yeah. they have full access just procedurally, full access to a federal grand jury, full access to federal law enforcement officers, full access to federal inv- investigative databases. They can coerce and compel anybody, any place, anywhere, anytime to produce evidence. You have almost nothing as a defense lawyer other than the right against self-incrimination. Yeah. Maybe and you get to uh, mute, Andrew. And you get to pay for your right against self-incrimination as well. You get to pay to assert that in court. 
You have to have a lawyer. You don't have to, but you get to have a lawyer do it. You know, well, Nick, I was just saying these they, lines. They, essentially, sorry, the Andrew. state has infinite resources to bring to bear for all practical yeah. purposes. And I think the right might find itself less enamored of uh, prosecutors as we get more George Soros funded prosecutors uh, around the country who are, who are wrecking chaos. You know, back in the day, your local prosecutor was some established member of the legal community. Hardly anyone ran for the job. Maybe they spent a couple grand to run for that office. And uh, he got the job because people knew who he was. He'd been around a long time. We weren't living in, and you could give that guy unbelievable discretion because he didn't abuse it. But now we have these yeah. prosecutors come in with 50 grand, 100 grand, $500,000 in funding. Their opponent has $5,000 in the bank. Who's going to win that campaign? This person's an outsider, not a member of the community. The moment they get in, they fire everybody who's already in that office and hire their, their friends and family to be prosecutors there. And they enact whatever social policies they want. And all the, all the privilege that the old school prosecutor had now is theirs. And they abuse it and abuse it and abuse it. And structurally there's there's no practical check on their authority it's it's, it's look it's at kenosha terrible. look at kenosha it makes your point we have your detective and your mayor and i think one of the one of the da's all have the same last name like and it's an unusual like anti marion or something like that family ties binger has family ties to other key political officials in the like he has I, some I other ties yeah. too but we won't yeah there you go that... i don't know <laughs> i don't know if Pasoviak is watching the stream if you are how's it going buddy uh, he just tweeted out um, one minute ago how U.S. Marshals came to Kenosha from uh, I saw site, that from UrbanMilwaukee.com. Maybe, wow, maybe you heard you. us like wondering that. that. Uh, Jack, let us know who you think is right, me or uncivil, please. Like weigh in on that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> What's more and, important, freedom of speech or the right to a jury? Hey Nick, that's funny. Yeah, uh, just up? a quick thought, real quick. One thing is we were talking about the big picture about how you know the the right seems to be very, very, very big on, you know, prosecutions and police and that kind of stuff. And, 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 you know, I had an internet debate of, or actually I want a debate. Well, somebody posted on the internet saying people who are convicted of crimes or charged with crimes should not have, con have their constitutional rights taken away from them. And I pointed out and I said, so what about the January 6th protesters? And then when I said that they realized, oh, you're right. I mean, you know, the fact is, it, it's the old, it, the shoe is on the other foot. If, if, if the person that, that is being prosecuted or the person who is having their constitutional rights placed into jeopardy happens to be someone that you may align with politically, then you're going to be a little bit more sensitive to that nature. Hey, Nick, I appreciate yes. you having me on the show today. Um, I've, my time is up. I'm going to have to get on out of here so I can get ready for finish working on a brief that I'm working oh, on. And, I do and... legal work. Oh, sure. <laughs> Why not? Also, um, lawyers. So just oh, yeah. So you guys know, Jack Posobiec also just tweeted again. He said, Judge Schroeder. Joe is right. Joe is he right. Says he'll... That's what he no. said. <laughs> he said, Judge Schroeder, he says that he's going to poll the jurors now to determine if deliberations will continue tonight. And no, there is nothing on the feeds. I have three different feeds pulled up. None of them have anything from I inside the, the courtroom back. right now. Ready to go. <laughs> well, anyway, have a good night, folks. Uh, later, thank you, Matt. Good good later, buddy. Good right, luck bye -bye. and Godspeed on your case. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. That means a lot. Uh, he had to bust out of here because he, he was stuck between me and Kurt. That was, that was probably yeah. an awkward <laughs> position. Hey, I got to say, I don't know how many places on the internet are having advanced discussions of due process versus First Amendment freedom of speech. No, it's I was just sitting here enjoying I love it, it every time. Yeah. And, and that's the and that's the problem. That's the conversations we need to have. And when I talk about the right and left coming together, I saw the chat saying that's never going to happen. You're blue pilled. I'm like, yes, I'm telling the solution. I'm not telling you that it's likely to happen. That's the whole problem. Well, Especially I mean, yeah, when, like you said, as always, Joe are and I are having Soros. a wonderful, productive discussion. He's making good points and making me that, think hopefully and, the and same in return. That's, that's yeah, the dream, yeah. right? I mean, that's, yeah. that's 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 my motto. Reasonable minds can differ. Let's have the discussion. Mm -hmm. Or maybe the reasonable minds can come to consensus because that happens sometimes too. And, and that's how we're doing it. Sometimes. And that we're doing it in front of differ. We got to do it. Steps. That we're doing it in front of 67,000 people that we've suckered here with the promise of a verdict is even better. <laughs> hey, <laughs> we trick you with education. A hard sell there, which was what uh, I think this is going to be pretty boring. So if, if you got 67,000 people with that, uh, with that description in the video, I think you're doing something all right. That's true. That's true. Um, real quick, MAGA says, thank you all. 
And then uh, thank you, MAGA. And Evil Bunny says money for today and tomorrow in advance. STD retainer of or standard retainer of not STD <laughs> retainer. That's a little different. <laughs> uh, standard retainer of 50 per day plus Bunny Bunny. Hey, thank you, Evil Bunny, uh, for that. I, I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, because uh, depending on what happens here, I guess we'll find out if the jury is going to come yeah. back tomorrow, if they're going to work through the night. I would love to know uh, how my long understanding I'm going to be is that I Well, someone seems to have already known that they're staying till 5.30 or 6 and no verdict tonight. That's the At least that's the rumor. I don't know if that was some somebody, they already made that decision, the judge just hasn't announced it or what exactly, but that's what if I they're, it, It's not if those they're times not, yet. How do they know there's no verdict? If there's not going to have a verdict, why keep them past one, five? They are not that... able to give one tonight. You you go in there and you work until six, but not give a verdict. That seems weird to me. Just keep I going, going until we get the verdict. Or yeah, yeah. that Do they went out school. at five thirty or six, and that they don't believe they'll have a verdict tonight. I think is what. Because if they thought they'd have a verdict, they would stay another half an hour, hour. I think. Sure. I I seem know, to vaguely they, remember they my, uh, be out of the set reading. Time, a U.S. They history that verdict. the founding of the country that jurors juries were not allowed to leave and were provided like food and water and anything they weren't allowed to leave at all until well, they came to a verdict. Trials used to be out and open, not inside a courtroom of any kind. It was out in the public. The whole community got together. Well, see that goes even goes more to I'm not sure who whose point that more validates mine or Joe's because it's like I how mean, much from more a historical community originalist can perspective, it, it's uh, it val it uncivil's point is would be that would be consistent with that. Yay! The whole community's watching and participating. Mm -hmm. So nine to six is what nine hours with a lunch? Uh, yeah, yeah, yep, nine hours of the lunch. That that's how long that's I'll have been long, streaming yeah. by then. But <laughs> I, I don't know about. I mean, I mean, Andrew may have seen this. I've had cases where the judge holds them from like eight a.m. to eight p.m., eight a.m. to nine p.m. tries to that's squeeze them into. That's a brutal a, one. Do it. Get it done. Some jurisdictions you cannot yeah. do that in, though. That's just good. just just sequester them in a drippy dungeon and say, "Hurry up." <laughs> Like just well, people should watch the cocaine cowboys version three. Love it. It was getting them sequestered that allowed the allegedly allowed the uh, criminal defendants to con to force the jury into acquittals because there were several women who had to take care of older family members, health issues who were not able to because they were sequestered. So they suckered the defense, suckered the prosecution to do the sequestering in order to uh, influence those jurors to switch to acquittals. I wonder if they'd still be deliberating if the defense had told them yesterday in closing that if you go with self-defense, you'll be home by dinner. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I, that's, it's a very good question because if, if they're thinking that they need to approach through all of these charges individually and independently, then they might, uh, you know, a juror who wants to do their diligence. E and even if it's just, you know, one or two in the, in the room uh, who will sit there and go, no, I want to go through and think through each of these things. Whereas they could have, they could have been instructed. Look, if you find self-defense in this first one, it's over. It, you're you're done. Go home. Yeah, and they they absolutely can argue that um, at their at their closing. That would be uh, that would not be a problem for them to suggest. Well, I mean, they, they made an error, right? I mean, at the end of the original defense closing, he says, "What? Uh, uh, this is a difficult decision." It's like I oh, mean, his, well. historically, uh, a ten to two, the twofold. It just may not be that way in this case. Because, I mean, that's what we we're finding, too. One would hold out. Normally, the logic is if you go in 6-6, six, six, that could be a mistrial. Eight, you need eight on your side, and they can usually persuade the other four. The leaders really matter a lot. It's very rare for two, one, two, or even three to hold out. Um, yeah, but this case was strong. different because the intensity of emotion was so strong. And in my view, that's who the prosecutor was arguing to. I thought they were trying to create a mistrial by – Screw it. We're not going to try to persuade the marginal person. We're just going to inflame the emotions of our people. Challenge accepted. Get me on a jury. I will hold out against all odds. I don't even care what way it goes. <laughs> um, Scamdemic Survivor says, uh, what an all-star panel. Free law course worth more than any Harvard Law lecture. Thanks to everyone for making this happen. Hey, thank you. And Will Jones says, leftism must be resisted on all fronts. So that was uh, that's very dramatic, very dramatic chat. <laughs> um, is is but, tomorrow uh, an anniversary of election day? Uh, uh, no, we're past that. That would have been because okay. it's November 17th. Oh, yeah, you're right. You're right. We're way past that. Yes. 
So, uh, you know, I hope not. I hope it's not an anniversary of election day, but no, that would, uh, it'll be, it'll be interesting to see what happens again. I'm, I'm just confused. If the judge is going to pull the jurors and they say, we don't have a verdict and we don't think we're going to be there in an hour. Why send them back in the room for an hour? Uh, oh, I agree. I agree. I, I don't get it, but Ryan Cloudier says, I don't normally do this, but you mentioned an aggregating company working to pull data, especially online info together quickly. If you find a company that does this, I'd be very interested in applying. Thanks. Uh, I, I don't. Have, I have several of those, There's several, but not a lot of them are that accessible. We had several of them available for Kyle's jury selection, and it was rejected. But they, I mean, Richard Barris has a lot of that database. I think this I guy wants a companies. job. Sorry, <laughs> I think this guy wants a job. That's what he's saying. He wants a uh, job. Yeah. Well, I mean, those, those companies Barnes. exist. Just, just look around. You can now. Some of them have. Let's say they they do some interesting work for interesting folks, so they might not be that accessible in the regular world. What one of them was established by. Uh, X this or that. So the uh, so some of that's more available, but you look it up, you can find those companies. They're they're more there's plenty out there. Call up Dr. John Black. I guarantee you he knows them. That guy. <laughs> that guy I don't you want to sit and listen to stories from him? They gotta be fascinating. He's just like, well, oh yeah. You know, I I once killed a man by pulling his skull apart by reaching my <laughs> fingers into his eyeballs. And frankly, it was an interesting experience for me. Uh, a little squishy. DVM421 <laughs> says, I hate to throw this prosecution any bone at all, but what do you think about the pressure on them to not let the city burn after what would be the obvious outcome? Well, the city had burned. Yeah. Can't burn again. And they, I mean, they they've, spent, they've spent the entire trial saying that the city burning just really wasn't that big of a deal anyway. I mean, that's been... That's been their argument is that why would you why would you even think you should possibly put out a fire? Minor just a little fires. bit of a baby fire, Minor that's fires. all. Yeah. Just yeah, a little bit of arson. The dismissal of Rosenbaum, right? Well, yeah, I mean, it matters when it comes fires. to fires and guns. Well, and also that you shouldn't put out a fire because it might anger some tiny angry little man and then you would have to take a beating. That's how the world works. <laughs> the fire Andrew, move. Andrew, in your life experience, have you ever had um, have you ever had a fire start big? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I've sure seen them get big. Yeah, they they always seem to start small. But Binger was saying these are just small fires. It was very weird. Uh, by the way, everybody on the panel who has appeared on the panel today, this is to the chat. This is for you, the lovable chat. Everybody's links are in the description. Um, for most of the guests, uh, you can hover over their names. It'll take you right to their YouTube pages. Uh, Mr. Bronca has lawofselfdefense.com listed as his uh, contact information. Make sure you go and check out everybody on this panel. Uh, subscribe to their stuff. Read uh, what they put out. Watch some videos and and get some interesting education that you you literally cannot find this stuff anywhere else. And it's for free. Well, sort of for most of us. Uh, so, so check it out. You can, you can get some, uh, again, you, you won't find it in law schools necessarily, unless you take really cool electives and you, you're certainly not going to get it in, uh, in mainstream public education or, or undergrad. Yeah. If, I could, if I could just follow up on that for a second. And that is, you know, yeah, I, everyone here should realize that a Nick is awesome. And what you see here is what you get in all the time. Uh, B all of all the people who come onto this panel, the reason we're coming here is twofold. Well, threefold. One, we like Nick and hanging out with him. Two, we enjoy each other's company and sharing different legal philosoph philosophical thing. But the third thing really is we are looking for the exposure here. So it's really the addition to, a, you know, the ability to get the exposure and help build our own channels and our own voices is part of the reasons that we donate hours at a time. If you consider that with respect to signing up to my peers here, each and every one of them puts out high quality content and they all call me the funny one of this group of people. So I think you I do, said I that. <laughs> they backstage that's what they all, i said they, you were the they, fiery but mostly peaceful one. Oh, okay fiery, <laughs> they mostly, all I, I like it. himself <laughs> <laughs> pronouns pronouns stop okay so I, i'm just saying if you can consider that and make sure that you you guys sign up to each of these to each of these fine people here 
And welcome to our newest addition here, which is Law of Self Defense. Who he's just yeah, obviously that's been wonderful. Clearly, yeah. He's clearly brilliant. Yeah, it's been great and, having you. I definitely and, want to have you over on my channel. So you not, can make, not brilliant so you can enough. Apparently, I, I just got an email from Reuters asking me if I can compare and contrast U.S. self defense law with European self defense law, and the answer is no. <laughs> yes. I, I have no idea what the European self uh, covering fifty exist. states and the uh, and the the uh, what, properties you're of the United States government. You're a lawyer. You can't answer that question. I love media oh my God. inquiries. It's <laughs> enough. <laughs> If Talk you want to chat about Canadian states. self-defense law sometime, I'd love to uh, love to pick your brain. I would, but, uh, I would be happy to do that, but I independently have zero knowledge of what self-defense law in Canada might be. Right. Uh, well, well anyway, you but, have no. to. You're required to hit people with hockey sticks. It's <laughs> you can be. You can actually have a gun. This is a common misconception. You can have a gun in Canada, but first you have to resort to a hockey stick. Uh, and and that's, but only if the beaver is only three inches over three inches. And you can never shoot them from inside the crease. Like that doesn't work. You can't do that. Uh, These jokes are terrible. I know. <laughs> so is Canada. Okay. Oh my goodness. Oh. So <laughs> Blackguard Force says the jury has already decided on Rittenhouse. They're just Googling the crimes of the state to decide their verdict on them. In the case of Wisconsin Amen. versus Rittenhouse, we, the jury, find the state guilty of gross misconduct. Uh, one can dream, but I'm, I think that might be optimistic. I mean, um, the notion that Binger is going to face meaningful consequences, I think, is a, a fantasy. It's a nice one. I like the idea. But it's not. No, but I, I think it's. But I think it's to point out that that under the law, under the books, under the ethical rules, he is. He falls squarely within what should be punished, within be behavior that should be punished. And like um, uh, Hoke said, it's something that idealistically the bar should be the lowest. We really should be looking for people that are beyond reproach, that are absolutely people who you can look up to to enforce the rule of law, so we can all believe in it. But what this is doing is it's blackpilling people, even that had previously believed in the rule of law, that have believed in prosecution. Those old Republicans that were like, oh, we're law and order. I don't think there's so much law and order anymore after the seeing old these liberals, prosecutors. To be honest, yeah. I mean, it, it, it cuts to everybody. And so, yeah, by the way, you can call me Hogue. That's totally fine. Yeah. That's, that's, no, that, that's no big worry. But yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm a true believer, right? And I, I don't think it's a political kind of position. I, I want to believe in these systems. I want to improve them. And I don't blame anybody who watches all of this, watches the interaction with the institutions and how it's being reported and all of that and loses faith. And I think the more that happens, you lose real importance in the functioning of society. And so I, I would very much like to see the reforms that somebody asked about in your chats. But yeah, I, politicization is always kind of a hot button issue. I, I don't think it even needs to be political, but for the way social media works and how Twitter works and everything else. We should want prosecutors held to a high standard, whether it's Kyle Rittenhouse or whether it's somebody that you like and you think is getting railroaded because they are. It, it should be of importance to everyone because the state wants to cage human beings and that should be a very high standard that they have to hit. Yeah, justice. The reason justice is blind is because it needs to be blind both ways, right? Like it, it, it it's it's written house today it's somebody else tomorrow in fact most days it's not a written house that's what i was yes. trying to get at before yes. most days it's someone you would have uh no worries about them ending ending up in jail and and frankly uh andrew said it earlier um if you're if you're a criminal defense attorney most of your clients are guilty but the question a lot of times in criminal defense is not whether or not your client's guilty it's whether or not their rights were respected and if if the guilty's rights are not respected, then the prosecution and the investigators are not doing the job to make sure the innocence innocence is protected. And exactly. that is what we all need to be concerned about. Yeah, I, I know it might be it might be no big deal if a judge ignores things and a crack dealer goes to jail because they ignored the probable cause statement was deficient. But when they do that, they're going to ignore the probable cause statement is deficient on someone like Kyle Rittenhouse and right. and. If justice is denied for anybody, it's denied for everybody. Yeah. I mean, and, and one of the most common questions, any of us who do criminal defense, we've had family members or friends ask us, how can you defend those criminals? How, how can you do that? They're horrible. Uh, and I, I couldn't care less if my client's guilty or not. I mean, I care in terms of what kind of arguments I may, may be able to make or not, but not philosophically. My concern is holding the state to its burden, period, before they can put a human being in a cage, for years or decades or the rest of their life, they have to meet that burden. 
That's my job. That's my concern, independent of who the particular client might be. I, I well, had a whole debate with, with, with Ian about this late last night on our show, and we had a great dialogue about this, where I think we each walked out with, with more respect for the other than beforehand, even though we never came to, to terms on it. And I could get into a lengthy discourse in what I and what I call the Dershowitz position, which is what you just espoused, um, Andrew. And that is, you know, the concept of freeing, you know, of of freeing ninety nine guilty men so that we don't wrongfully imprison uh, one innocent man. And I don't know if, if if we go down this discussion, it's going to be like a half hour long in in debating. I'm happy to do it, or you know, I'll do well, it with you before... tomorrow when you come on stream. Before you it's delve a into a philosophical position, if you before you delve into a weirdo debate about legal <laughs> issues on a law show, uh, let me welcome to the stream Nerd. Miss uh, Emily Baker. How's it going, Emily Baker? It's hey. good. It's been a hey, busy Emily. day. Hopefully, the mic's not coming in hot. It's just been a busy day, but you guys have been having great discussions over here, and um, I'm glad I get to come in and pop in and say hi. Did the jury send out any notes today? I haven't seen. Uh, they they asked us. The first six pages of jury instructions, and then they requested the rest. <laughs> they didn't just send them the jury instructions back. They gave them one copy. They requested 11 oh. additional copies. Yeah, they want to take um, notes and argue with each other then. Yeah. Yeah. Apparently, now there's, there are two holdouts, supposedly. Yeah, there's there's oh, some extra How is that information be coming out. That's Jack that's Pasoba kind of tweeted it. Jack Pasoba, <laughs> so quotes a source of, as a, of being a marshal who's there. Yes. Uh, that, and he's the one who quoted out, who tweeted out. So to no out. idea if it's actually uh, accurate or, you know. Yeah, well, all, all we're going off of is the tweet on its face. And uh, there, there are people who trust Jack and there are people who don't trust Jack and they can make determinations on the, the veracity of it. Right now, we're just waiting with court streams that have no indication of what's going on. Although, you know, uh, there were indications that the judge would be polling the jury at five o'clock to see what would happen. And we, we got nothing on the streams. I'm, I'm watching three different court feeds and so they the have not might've just sent a note back and asked them what they wanted to do. And then had the bailiff mm -hmm. send it back to them saying they wanted to work till a certain amount of time and not brought them into open court for that. Cause you don't really need the lawyers for that. You send the bailiff back and go, do you want to go at five? Do you want to go at six? Do you want to go at seven? Let us know. Right. So, and, uh, I the reporting on it is that at six they're going to go, but there's no expectation of a jur of a verdict today. I would imagine not. It's going to take them a while to fill out verdict forms, and even if they do fill out verdict forms, they might want to come back and do it. But interesting that they requested a copy for everybody on the jury instructions, which means they're really trying to parse what they're doing, um, or they're trying to argue with somebody who disagrees with them. That's now, interesting. Yeah. We've heard the rumor that there's two holdouts that are concerned that they're. Uh, basically going to be ripped apart by the public yeah yeah well if that's the concern, then that leans towards to acquittal but i'm sure you guys yeah. already talked about that mm -hmm. um, right the the worst jury intimidation i ever witnessed was not in a criminal case but in a civil case with the church of scientology which probably doesn't oh, oh, yeah, God. huge issues yeah. interesting um with that when i was working for civil judges before i became a da it was wild wild stuff it had but it had i mean this happens even if you don't see it in media cases this can happen in small scale cases in courthouses all over the place where jurors feel intimidated i had a jury send a note back once saying we'd like to come out with a verdict but we want to know if we can be escorted out of the courthouse down the back um immediately after the verdict and not through the public spaces so we knew kind of what they were coming back but they were scared of the defendant's family i mean this is something right. that happens it actually happens all the time, yeah. all the time. Yeah. But but it's not usually a mob threat we're talking about. It's the yeah. other people in the community that they're worried yes. about. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're testifying against some drug dealer's brother or something. They're going to go back there. These are people who kill people in their community. Yeah. So this they're scared to death of, of rendering a verdict and going back. Unfortunately, it's not. It's not unique. This is just on a larger scale um, because I think with social media, there's the threat not of the community but of the social media of it all, right? And the, oh, they're going to figure out who my mom is, my kids are, where my kids go to school, um, yep. and be harassed from people outside the community. And then not be able to get away from it for maybe ever. <laughs> right. Just yeah. be completely that, destroyed for the rest of your life. That's that's yeah, a that's a concern that people have, and that's and not You'll never know, right? Your kid won't oh. get into a college, and you'll never know. Yeah. And sometimes right? those won't... people are police officers, too. Uh, 
I've had people who've had to leave their town because they've, you know, ticked off the local police. And it happens to jurors as well, I think. You don't want to get pulled over every time you leave your house for uh, for some, you know, oh, I, I saw you swerve a little bit. Uh, let's let's take a look. Let's smell your breath. Let's see what's going on. There's um, always probable cause if you're in a car. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Facts. It's, I think a judge has actually said that <laughs> specifically. Not my regret says, hey, look, this is how I see it. You shouldn't allow people to protest right outside a courthouse for the very same reason. You can't push for a certain candidate near a voting place. Um, yeah, it's a, that's a position. I, I don't know. I think we have a lot of case law that suggests that um, that the courthouse is one of the most highly protected uh, places of public speech. Uh, the the fuck the draft case, you know, a guy wore wore a leather jacket that said fuck the draft into the courthouse. Uh, he was he was sanctioned for that. And they're like, no, nope. I mean, if anywhere gets protected political speech and I, I can't imagine going into a courthouse with a profanity on my clothing. Um, this guy did it and uh, they tried to punish him for it. And he ended up winning that. So it's it's yeah, but there. Yeah, but you've but seen it though, right? That's I mean, not, I've seen people that's not going to create stuff on that. Oh yeah, the, the whole the F the draft T-shirt or jacket, whatever he's wearing there, is not something which one can foresee will will lead to imminent bodily harm. I, I think so. I don't see how that's really comparable to the situation where the whole the, where the mob outside the door could could foreseeably yeah. lead towards but, imminent bodily harm. And I'm, I'm not saying they're comparable in that way. I'm just saying that this... And yet you're bringing we, it up. You're bringing it up. <laughs> look, kidding. I'm doing the lawyer thing. <laughs> I'm doing the lawyer thing. No, uh, it, it's just a place that has traditionally, by the Supreme Court, been overtly protected and set aside as this is... Like, it, you may not have freedom of speech anywhere else, <laughs> but how can we deny it from a courtroom? Right? It's like political arena. It's yeah. where it lives. That's it's, dicta. That's dicta. I, I'll... I'll I'll give you something it's been that a while since somebody called dicta at me. Uh, um, yeah, when it comes to dick, the balls are no balls. So there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Tall skinny geek says, I hear full metal jacket five five six rounds and an AR fifteen are really good for self defense if any of the jurors need safety. <laughs> yeah. Just, just give them each an AR fifteen. Give them each their own written house. Uh that'll that'll protect them from all threats, foreign and domestic, uh, mm -hmm. I think. Um, let's see. Do we, I'm Cindy sure there's Mac a gun shop out there that would sponsor them with an AR-15. Cindy Max says, thanks for the insight and the jokes. Nice job making the law entertaining and relatable. Oh, thank you. That's uh, to the panel, I would assume, because I you know, haven't done anything good. Uh, I'm just sitting here citing case law and, and Joe's over. Oh, dicta, dicta, dicta. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because that element, as far as saying that that's protected, that's, you know, that requires protection. That's dicta as far as just, you know. You're going to sit here and argue, like, you're going to credibly argue that the Supreme Court saying that the courthouse itself is the political arena and, and needs the highest order of protection for political speech I'll is dicta? I'll, I'll review. I'll let, give me your citation. I'll review your case. I don't remember the case. I wants a brief just, filed, Nick. Okay, yeah. <laughs> ask, the me, chat for give you some uh, ask the chat to brief it. You right. could just Google fuck the draft case in Supreme Court and you'll get it. And uh, there you go. Uh, Brian Lips says, blame Canada, blame Canada from South Park. Sing it out, Nikki. I'm not singing. No. I've been, <laughs> I've been streaming for almost. Stream. Yeah, I've. it's been almost nine hours. I'm not singing shit. Um, you guys have been chatting for nine hours. Well, uh, eight hours and 45 just, minutes. Not all of us. Nick yeah. has been chatting for eight hours and 45 minutes. Yeah, Emily, I'm going to subpoena you for an entire stream one day and just ruin your entire day and just yeah, the you're, whole you, day. it would kill me. It would just absolutely <laughs> no. It would it would it would not. I love I love the conversation of being able to and people don't understand lawyers and maybe watching the stream helps that disagreeing can be fun. Disagreeing should happen. You can have conversations. You can explore different ideas, and that's part of how everyone a understands better, but b become stronger in their own position or maybe sees another position. And that's part of the back and forth of lawyers where most people are like, Oh, you disagree with me. I don't want to talk to you. Right. And that, that's, that's how a we grow. very big difference. And there's not a lot of space in the internet where you can actually have reasonable disagreements and chat about it and actually not have hard feelings about it. And I think you guys getting to do that and go back and forth. I saw a little bit 
of Joe and Uncivil chatting about, um, you know, where you can protest, where you can't. And it's, they're valid conversations that need to happen. So mm -hmm. I love it. Uh, I just I just got an interesting thing that said uh, someone purporting to be Mark Randaza has joined the channel. Uh, so <laughs> thank you for that. I don't know if it's actually Mark Randaza, but I'm going to pretend it is from now on. Uh, either way, either way. So thank you uh, for for doing that. I very much appreciate it. Um, Emily I'm watching bankruptcy court earlier this afternoon, which is what oh, I was God. doing. Why? By the way, your case is Cohen versus California, which I'm reading now while you go through Super Chats. Why bankruptcy not... court? Uh, uh, Eric Girardi. Oh, oh no, yeah. The... That case is wild. It's um, I'm getting yelled. I'm getting DM'd all over the place here. Apparently, the Activision workers have walked out. Oh, fantastic. Oh. Ooh. Yeah, I did a video so on, on, the, on, the, on the article, and now I'm getting a bunch of requests to cover it again, maybe tomorrow. Good. But can they you, apparently can are walking you briefly... out and asking for Bobby's resignation. Briefly summarize the Activision case, as oh I understand it. Can you? <laughs> the whole case? Well, I mean, no elevator pitch. Not touching. No touching. Yeah, what no happened touching. today, you know, Activision's <laughs> in trouble for sexual harassment and assault and those kinds of things. And what happened today is the Wall Street Journal put out what I would call something of a bombshell type article. Oh, in the uh, day, essentially. oh hey, hey, hey. Oh, in oh, Arizona, it forms a metropolitan area with Phoenix and Glen. Hold on. What the hell? Let me go back a little bit and uh, pull sure. this up. Sorry, There's I didn't one mean to guy, cut you off. One guy no. in the in the chat yeah. is saying that the judge is back and judge and jury are back. There's a guy in there's a guy in the chat saying that. There's a lot of guys in the chat huh. saying that. Just, <laughs> yeah. I haven't been able to trust him. I backed no, it up just a little one. bit. PBS is meteorology and these discharges associated with humo. Oh man. The quartering in the chat is saying the judge is back as well. Oh wow! Okay, so that's uh, him. I I trust. Cubolanibus, um, British authors for six hundred. Um, He's playing jury playing with Jeopardy with the jury. Jeopardy with the jury again. <laughs> um, he wrote the War in the Air as well as the War of the Worlds. H.G. Wells, <laughs> right? Correct. I'm sorry. What is happening? The judge plays Jeopardy with the jury to kill time. The The feed is really, really bad from the court today. It's been doing this loading thing. War uh, in the air as well as the war of the world. Wow. <laughs> the next like question is... I'm just hearing judge phrases. <laughs> he was acquitted of all charges in Wisconsin versus Rittenhouse. The answer is... Written house. That's so God. interesting. This, my God, I don't, I don't know whether people would have more respect or less for the, for the legal process. H.G. Wells, very good. Right. All right, how about after marrying an American, he moved to the U.S. and he wrote two jungle books. The jury. Oh, man. Who is Rupert Who Kipling? Very good. <laughs> Somebody's going to accuse him of racism for this, too. Next I want to clip out the, that very fun. good. Uh, yeah, is this just a well, hot mic? happening? Why? My feed has gone back to the portrait in? now. Yeah, I see yeah. one. I'm back on the portrait. About warbirds nope. during the, the seal. seal. Korean War, the U.S. unsheathed the F-86 named for this after a cavalry sword. Saber. What is a saber? What? Yeah. I, don't, I feel... Okay. Why Are they waiting for the lawyers so, to come back like, in? I can't figure hey, out. Hey, Mom, I went, I went to law school, You're and now right. I'm playing Jeopardy. I'm You've got uh, money on this. This right away. During the Korean War, the U.S. on This is how they're settling the verdict. <laughs> you already read this one, Judge. Come on. Get on there. I named this after a cavalry, cavalry sword. I don't know if it's repeating. I don't know what's going on. Again, here's here's PBS's says, feed. Judge Schroeder just came out and said, y'all think something's about to happen, don't you? Clerk says it's not. Seems we're doing Jeopardy. Are, is the judge seriously just trolling us? <laughs> oh, I bet. I wonder if he's playing Jeopardy with the alternates. Oh, uh, now what is this? To bring has he been doing this for nine hours? <laughs> see a bunch of alternates hanging from nooses in the courthouse yeah I was gonna say. <laughs> they're like could you send rittenhouse in here and i'll rush him we'll just yeah see how this goes. please please it was, it was oh, four letter, four letter US cities, the most oh this i, I guess feed the process is so terrible does anybody have a feed that's actually playing 
Yeah, mine is fine. Long, me, but long I'm not crime trying to scream like at the same well, time. This is this is long crime, and I am just like I am getting a ton of uh, lag on it. I don't know if it's my own fault. I've got the same possible. feed, and it's not spinning for me. Same. But I have uh, it on a different computer. Most populated city in Central Oregon. It's a mega mecca for outdoor enthusiasts. Who said Ben? About four people. Okay. Oh, I think I fixed um, it. What is me? Oh, come on. Come on. Oh, <laughs> I know so I gave the answer already. If Kobe still won't get it. The right. question is, <laughs> how should we settle <laughs> this case? Trial by combat. Did he just diss oh. the jury? He the just the area with Phoenix and Glendale. Mesa. Who answered that? Yeah, and you're from Chicago, so you'd know Mesa. He um, hated heavily on the jury there. To, I gave him the answer, they'll still training? get it wrong. What? Did you ever go to Don and Charlie's restaurant? Uh, what, is, what is happening? I don't know, anyway. Uh, they had a lot Anyone of... Anyone ever been to Don and Charlie's? Could be... Uh, Oh my gosh. The judge keeps his job for the social opportunities. Uh, it's remarkable. <laughs> it's remarkable. Um, if anybody has a stable version of the stream, because I'm having issues um, and you want to share it, I'll I'll share your screen happily um, if you can do that. But I'm so that's what you're saying, yeah. I'm I'm having uh, clearly having issues getting the the downstream memorabilia there. How about advertising and marketing for 600? It's the two word alliterative term for the prominent display of commercial goods in films or TV shows. Product, Product placement. placement. <laughs> God dang it. We need buzzers. <laughs> he clearly, uh, he likes Jeopardy the way he said that. For 600. Well, also his, his ringtone is, uh, is double Jeopardy. No, right. his ringtone was proud to be American. Proud to be was American. his text message uh, Wait, tone. So that, yeah. that was it. That was it. This, this man sense. is getting sicker by the day, if anybody didn't notice. How about he advertising is. and placement for Listen one? Listen how he sounds. Oh, mm. awful. Well, he was definitely suppressing coughs yesterday. Uh, yeah, he's coughed me quite to... a bit over the course of the trial. I, I was concerned for a while that he might, uh, you know, <laughs> we might end up with a different judge. Thousand. People are telling me to close and reopen the, the browser. I, I think I will. Just a second. Yeah, I'm wondering if they're going to send him for a... Uh... A death plague test. I'll yeah, you, what, you never know what you're gonna get on this stream or in this trial. All the, the no, it's jeopardy. Fair. I would have never guessed a prosecutor would have had their gun on a trigger pointing an AR at a jury. And that was a heck of a photo, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, God. All I'm the memes. saddened that he apparently can't be charged for that. But uh, Wisconsin law seems to make it forbidden. But prosecutorial yeah. immunity. Yeah. yeah, that's what I'm told. Prosecutorial okay. immunity is a pretty darn strong thing. So is judicial immunity. So yeah, it's still the, like, uh, yeah, I'm still, I'm still getting circles every, every couple seconds on here. I don't know what it is with me, but uh, the hatred is real. So again, if someone else wants to share their screen of the feed, I'll, I'll happily include it, but it sounds like the judge's hot mic is done. Yeah. The, so election wizard tweeted out a minute ago that I guess the Rittenhouse judge tells the media, I think the jury is going to retire for the evening. Okay. But I don't, I mean, it'd be nice to actually see that. Yeah. Yes. Other than jeopardy, it would be nice to see that. <laughs> That's... But I don't see that on the stream. I've got pulled up either. And I don't hear anything on that stream either. Yeah. I've got, I've got nothing happening in the background. And it's up with audio, by the way. So if there was something happening, we would. Oh wait, no, I've got the. Yeah, I've, I've even got the screen pulled up. So if there was any audio, when the circle stops, you'd hear it. But uh, wow, wow. I share a screen with you if that helps you. Law and Crime has thirty-seven thousand, thirty-eight thousand votes on their poll. We have a much better poll. We have one hundred and sixty-five thousand votes. So. I think I think we win. Uh, thanks, Joe. Oh, you, you pulled up the PBS stream. It's you working. Pull, it's nothing's there. Of course, it's working. Wait, what do you want me? What do you want me? To, which law one and crime? Me? Do law and crime. Okay, give me a second. Yeah, I got you. You just said my law and crime right? feed is uh, working just fine. But I don't know how to share it. It's on a different computer. Yeah, I got it. Mine's at 360p even. It's 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 just embarrassing how 
the connection. I don't know. I've not been having this much trouble uh, lately, but today apparently I am. Maybe my kids are eating my internet, which is very possible. <laughs> that does happen to me. <laughs> what are they streaming? <laughs> Literally everything. That's their entire lives is streaming something. Whether they're streaming uh, YouTube or they're streaming Minecraft or whatever, that's that's what they do during the day. Uh, oh, in my house, they have uh, they have tablets and TVs and phones just laying around un unused, just streaming stuff all the time. Yes, <laughs> are, are my kids using... sleep to this lo-fi beats to lo-fi hip hop beats thing, and I'm oh, like, we have I that walk... on all the time. <laughs> Yeah, I'm walking around at night. I'm like, what the hell is that sound? I'll go and they're under a blanket. There'll be a freaking tablet streaming it. Are you? Uh, are you? They have streaming... good taste, though. Are you streaming mine? Do you need me to keep it open here, or? Uh, yeah, no, okay. keep yours open, please. Yeah, I've got yours okay, on. Okay, uh, I think Comcast my... pays my kids to burn through my internet bandwidth. <laughs> <laughs> it was the most surprising thing about moving from Los Angeles to Middle Tennessee is how much better the internet is here. I was shocked. Hmm. It's incredibly, uh, it's incredibly good. So. Where are you in Tennessee? Um, outside of Franklin. Ah, nice. Nice, ah, yep. nice country. Uh, in uh, Sumner County or a different county? Williamson. Williamson. Ah, okay. My, uh, the reason why I had, my brother-in-law is a judge in Sumner. Oh, very nice. So I, you're like, I oh. love it out here. Go ahead. So you're like between Nashville and Knoxville? Uh, she's in the nice no, suburban I'm, I'm pretty close. I'm in a suburb of Nashville. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Have you ever My been to the peg leg, peg leg porker? No. You well, got go. You got to go to the peg leg porker. They have great barbecue. We will make and it. There's a bunch of good barbecue in Tennessee. Yeah. <laughs> so they have, here's, here's another... they have their own bourbon that they make there in house, and they That's filter true. the bourbon through the charcoal left over from their barbecue. It's great. That sounds. Here's incredible. another Twitter update. Um, so apparently, just a few minutes ago. Uh, Michael Tarm from AP Legal, Legal Affairs, um, he said that Rittenhouse, his attorneys and prosecutors just walked in, and then they walked back to the judge's oh, camera's chambers moving in the courtroom. Rittenhouse stays at the defense table, so they're they're having some kind of some kind of uh, there he is. conversation. Judges there he in the is. courtroom. Yep. All right. Okay. Let's see. Do you have your audio shared, Joe? I hope. Uh, I... <laughs> you got. Can you hear anything? Oh, yeah. Give me a second. Oh, Jesus. The sound just came on. Give me a second. Give me a second. I have to rely on the help here. This is awful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good Lord. It's coming. Nick's pretty demanding. <laughs> Look, I'm just cranky because my, my there, feet there, is go, still go. behind. I didn't hear it. Not yet. No, I can hear it. It sounds okay, like there's perfect. a question. Talk to them separately. Yes. Yeah, talk to them separately. Yes. Yes. All right. Um, by the way, Oh, we're waiting for the jury to come down. Um, the media, somebody asked from the media, and I have no idea who, inquired about the method of selection of those to be struck from the jury just now, this, this afternoon, this morning. Yeah, the trial do it. It was weird. Um, that's been the practice in this court for, I'm going to say, 20 years at least. What? That I've been doing that, uh, that the defendant in a criminal case is the one who makes the uh, selections from the tumbler as to the jurors to be Weird. dismissed. They choose their own fate. Yeah, that's very that's what strange. He did. Yeah. It's like pick World's your weapon. worst game show. It's awful. Yeah. I've never seen that. Select alternates for six hundred. <laughs> Just it, it. It was very odd, and I think without an explanation, when the pictures start circulating on social, it seems very odd because. There's no explanation from the judge that that's their practice, the, and then you just get any, people's supposition. Is there any reason to bring in the DA and Kyle unless there's a decision that's been reached? If there's a I mean, question. They, oh, yeah, they have to be there for every jury proceeding yeah. by law. Yeah, they're yeah. going to, even if they're going to adjourn for the day, right. right? Like, they have yeah. to have them there. Although those smiles might mean, uh, might hmm. mean this is a verdict. No, there's not. It's mute. It's it's not. We got me. police. Fingers looking yeah, pretty antsy. Look at that. Long sheriff. time is muted right now. Sheriff is breaking. Did anyone that find out what his bling is today? <laughs> What's Binger's piece of flair today? <laughs> I 
did he did the judge mute the mic? Yep. Yeah. He's probably talking to the clerk. God, look at the Binger clone in the in the black jacket there behind Sharafi. <laughs> see Sharafi's. Oh yeah, with the yeah. laptop. Yeah. God, weird. Uh, Your Honor, they're wreaking havoc outside of the courtroom. Your <laughs> Honor, we we'd like to move to dismiss. Uh, 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 you're in the, you're in the first class seats now. Um, very uh, jovial. All right. Um, very happy. I understand courtroom. that you wish to break for the evening, which is uh, 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 certainly your prerogative. You're in charge at this particular point, and I also understand that I was told that. I, I, I'm not clear on whether you decided you wanted to come back at nine or if that was conveyed to you that that's what we wanted, but I'm going to take a vote just to make sure how many want to report at nine. Just to make sure. Uh -huh. Okay. That makes it easy. Everybody and it easy. Uh, so we're going to break for the evening. With that unanimous uh, vote. Now you're exactly. in deliberation and the rules are the same as they were before with the additional provision that you can't talk with anybody about the case, even if all 12 of you by happenstance end up at the same place, uh, some uh, a bowling alley or a, or a restaurant or something, you're not allowed to talk about the case, Jury even with all 12. <laughs> uh, and when you get here in the morning, if you come a little early or somebody's late and there are 11 of you or 10 of you or whatever, you can't talk about the case. The only way you can talk about the case, any aspect of the case, is when all 12 of you are together in the jury room. So please keep that in mind. Don't read, watch, or listen to any account of the trial. No talking with anybody who's not involved in the trial. Any question, anybody? All right, thank you very much, and have a wonderful evening. Welcome to day two. Yep, there you go. Uh, that's that's going to be, I think that's going to be it pretty much for the show today. Um, I will be. I will be back tomorrow. And if anybody uh, in the chat or, of course, the, any panelists are welcome to come back and have deliberative law discussions um, <laughs> I gotta on go this or, things. Yeah. Or, or other subjects. Uh, are I will you be... going to play Jeopardy? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I will not be playing Jeopardy at all. Uh, but, uh, but, yes, I, I, I want to thank all of the panelists for coming in. Uh, it's, it's really been fantastic. I, what, come on wait. up. I, I can't see it. What we got? Uh, I'm what sure it's so fine, but let's just make sure. A little closer. <laughs> You're all right. I'm here. There's, have no fear. Um, okay, thanks. And no, it's all right. I just want to make sure there, there are rules about it, and you seem to be in compliance, so don't worry about it. Uh, okay, here's not, a jury don't, don't on to camera. apologize. People have to apologize. People broke the rules. Um, okay. Um, Binger. Like Binger. And now I'm going to, I will be talking now with the alternates. Uh, and uh, they're on their way up, I assume. Yeah. Down wherever they're coming from. Uh, we got a caller. So if oh, caller and tell her, yeah. Wherever we keep them. Somewhere. Somewhere in the courthouse. Storage locker. Has anyone else found it interesting that Huber's dad has consistently, he's not there now, but has consistently sat behind Kyle? I did not notice that. I was yeah, not aware. He's, he's the guy who shaped kind of like um, Humpty Dumpty or whatever. Uh, but he's Mr. Potato he, Head. Yeah, he's he's bald and and he's he's wide. And so he like has this weird flow. But anyway, uh, even earlier today, he was he sits over near where the tech person is. And I've, I've just noticed that. I wonder if it's he's the guy who also flipped off the court at one of the hearings via Zoom. And I was wondering yeah. if that's like his intimidation move is I'm going to I'm going to sit behind this murderer who murdered. Like, I don't fault the guy for being mad about his son dying. Right. But sure, it's it's a weird move to sit there. Uh, you well, would... the fence table doesn't look too happy. They were well, jovial a minute ago. I know. They should be happy. It changed. The longer this goes, the better off they are, so they should be happy. Oh, I don't the know defense? about that. I, no, I would I've... think faster is better. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. You said defense. I thought you, I thought you meant the state. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, no. He, was, he said defense table, Joe. Come on. Oh. I'm, but I'm, they sound a lot alike. I'm asleep. State. It's been a long day. <laughs> 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 
But Binger looks grumpy too. I think they're just tired. It's they wanted a, a verdict today. A long trial, mm -hmm. uh, but the jury had so much to go through. I think a verdict today is always a tough sell. And once they asked for all the verdict or all the jury instructions, I think there's a lot of discussion going on. Right. But this jury, yeah. Every, everybody just got 36. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I uh, know. I was just going to say the prosecution, especially in their rebuttal, was just trying to find their one and yeah. to empower their one to be a pain in the ass or to yep. hold out. And they might have done that with somebody that's going to need the rest of the jurors to go line by line with the jury instructions and say, no, this is what it is. Yeah, I concur. We'll see what happens. I think that's, that's exactly what's happening. Yeah. Binger has one mostly. hell of a wardrobe. That's all I'm going to say. Man's got uh, a lot of suits. I mean, there's been a lot. It was always interesting because there were some DAs in our office that dressed very, very well. And I'm like, do you get paid the same that I get paid? Because how? Because <laughs> I know how much I pay for student loans each month and I can't pay that for shoes. But maybe they uh, have an OnlyFans page. Not back in the day. <laughs> But I've been going for might, though. years. Binger Binger I'm, might. Not, I'm not discounting Binger's <laughs> OnlyFans page. She's like, see where I put my Star Wars pins tomorrow, only on OnlyFans. Oh, no. Oh. <laughs> on a new hey, shirt, Binger. guys. What are you talking about? Binger does rhyme with something else in here. <laughs> Finger. Well, that and some other things. Uh, he has many interesting relationships with many interesting people. Wasn't that a line from a movie? Might I have feel been. Like it was. By the way, um, I, someone pointed this out to me via email yesterday. Uh, Everyone takes a beating sometimes is actually a movie line from Goodfellas. Uh, really? So, so Kraus may just have impeccable movie taste that has seeped into his closing argument rebuttals. Mm. Um, Still. He should tender Goodfellas as a, a correct statement of the law. I was gonna say you got to be careful about quoting mob movies as your <laughs> as your legal statements. Yeah, hey, Nick, as uh, just as a, an aside, uh, I'm pretty stupid about this social media internet stuff, so I'm uh, love to be back on the show again. I had a great time, but if you want me to, you'll have to send me an email with, you know, idiot level instructions for uh, how to do that. <laughs> well, the one today was sufficient, correct? Yeah, yeah, that worked. Yeah, that was yeah. perfect. Okay, well, I'll I'll send you one uh, for tomorrow if you want to pop on. You're welcome to. I know it's it's a long time, so as you are as you are free, you're welcome to pop on. Yeah, I mean, uh, it worked out great today. There's there's as you might imagine, there's a lot of media interviews. I'm sure Robert has the same experience, and uh, so it, it might be in and out. But uh, when I'm not in an interview, then I'm just sitting at the computer like everybody else, waiting for a verdict. So uh, I'm happy to participate. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, I, I will hold to you that. to that contractually. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. No, Nick, you made it really easy. For <laughs> <laughs> what, what were you saying, Richard? Oh, I was saying uh, essentially that I, I really appreciated how easy you made it to pop in and out today because I did have a number of things to hit, but it was it was super easy to just go in and out. When Zoom That's was cooperating, Zoom crashed earlier today in the middle, or not Zoom, um, uh, StreamYard in the middle oh. of my stream earlier. It was Ooh, it killed hard. mine too. Yep, oh, man, no. we stayed up. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's it's fine. It, I had no chat uh, and couldn't couldn't really maneuver very much, so it was interesting. But it, it yeah, was that'd be really frightening. Um, What's up, Nate? <laughs> okay, Judge, let's adjourn this day. Let's get through this. We can do it. We gotta adjourn the alternates too, though. Are there any alternates left alive after Jeopardy? More, more Jeopardy. <laughs> All right, good evening, folks. And um, they get a journal when they your answer three Jeopardy and, questions. Uh, your participation. And you're still at work and will be tomorrow. Um, we're retiring for the evening and we'll return at nine tomorrow morning. And even though, you, well, you're under a continuing obligation not to talk to anyone about the case, not a fellow juror, uh, not even all of the fellow jurors. And uh, certainly not with anybody who's, uh, when I say certainly, it, it kind of downgrades the prior statement. Just don't talk with anybody about the case. Read, watch, or listen to any account of it. Um, and um, we'll, we'll, you know, uh, yeah, uh, we'll start at uh, 9 a.m. Uh, any questions, anybody? Did they bring stuff, Oh, yes. Thank you for saying that. You're welcome to bring something. Uh, if you want to bring a laptop or a, or some other device, 
uh, obviously nothing that you would use to access. Uh, we won't let you turn uh, it on, but you can bring it. You it's that. Mario Party tomorrow, <laughs> folks. To a, Mario a Party turn it on. Or... book. <laughs> Something the court like sourced its internet from North Korea. Uh, Don't worry, they'll be fine. Whatever device you would entertain you. I, actually, I have stored here. Uh oh, this is. Do we know if Wisconsin board games? Does he have board games? Probably. He's going to have trouble. Thousands of trouble. Several thousand Jeopardy. Jeopardy. This guy loves Jeopardy. Get him to you. He does love it. Anybody else? Any, any, any questions? I'm here. All right. Thank you. Last time I was called for jury duty, they had Avatar on repeat for nine and a half hours. Oh, gosh. Oh, Which the one? Version? Last Airbender or? No, Avatar, or the, the, the James Avatar. Cameron blue people. Oh, God. Uh, Even nine worse. Nine and a half hours. No That's a lot of Avatar. Taken, everything else. It was great. <laughs> I've only I've only watched Avatar once and I slept through about two thirds of it. I just couldn't. <laughs> what, was, if you can you imagine, made a sensible call. All right. A movie anything else? On 3D is not looking great on a okay, CRT in, see a, on the in a jury room. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. Well, there we go. There that go. is the uh, that is the end of it. Um, and uh, thank you, Joe, for for saving the stream with that uh, with that actual functional video. That was very helpful. What is um, little, it is IP whatever. is now being targeted. Time to get on a VPN. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this stream could be sponsored by NordVPN, but it's not. <laughs> uh, Nate, man, what's going on? How's uh, how's Arbery? How's that trial happening? Um, it's cool. They just rested the prosecution, rested its case. And um, we'll see. I'll say one of the defense attorneys, even the judge is like, yo, you got to calm down. You got Jesse Jackson coming in here now. You oh, got 100 on. black pastors marching. Like we about it's starting to get like kind of insane right now. Well, he didn't say that outright, but that's essentially what happened because you know he had the black pastor comment. It's the one for yeah. the for the third well, guy. Uh, and he's <laughs> he got wrecked. He's a clown. There too. you go. This last guy's a clown. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's just a oh oh going <laughs> oh, towards no. random YouTube. <laughs> 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 oh no. <laughs> Oh, come on. Uh, I I do want to report Let's that YouTube during this stream, YouTube uh, team YouTube finally responded to me. And oh, um, they said, uh, hey, so Oops. sorry. It's taken us this in capital long to respond. That may have been in response to my several messages to them that may have been angry. Uh, this was a system error on our end that temporarily halted your live stream, but has been fixed. No mm -hmm. penalties or restrictions were applied to your channel. Thanks again for your patience. Better not. Spray hands. So system error. Right. Very, very YouTube helpful. YouTube is taking responsibility for it, though. They're not putting it on PBS or anybody else. Yep. Yep. Okay. It was a system error that just happened to affect all independent live streams. It was amazing. All in sync. It was cool. <laughs> it is. None it is hard to imagine an automated error hitting your stream and not an authoritative stream. Yep, per YouTube. None, none of none of the authoritative ones. No, Fox, CBS, ABC. Uh, With the same Yahoo. audio and visual. It yeah, does strain same audio visual. Credulity. It's at least they responded to me well after it mattered. Uh, that was nice. I'm very happy. I'm busy that they deciding did that. whether I want to risk the strike myself to make a video about it. <laughs> but anyways, um, well, I Nate is you're coming in right at the very end. Uh, so is there anything you want to say? I'm about to shut down the show. But no, I, I wanted no, to I just, give you an opportunity. Oh no, no, I'm 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 a cool. Hello, everybody. It, um, law of self defense. I've watched your stuff, man. I really like it. It's, it's cool. <laughs> I, I, my, my first analysis of the Rittenhouse case, I, I went to your site and pulled down the jury instructions. So yeah, you. <laughs> That's work, very man. kind of you. L long time fan. Um, but no, I but you know, that. I've been watching you guys all day, and and this seems this seems good. But um, hopefully they'll get this kid off. I. I was gambling. I think I lost a hundred dollars because I thought they would be out today. I thought it was chicken and grits, you know, after they were going to stay a little for lunch, but that'd be it. But now we're going into day two with this. I'm assuming they got a couple of holdouts because the prosecution's last hurrah was just really to their holdout, right? They, they were really just speaking to one person and one or two people in the jury to try to get them to hold out. So it seems yeah. to have worked, but I think if there's any justice in this world this kid's going to be off soon. So but we'll see. Well, when you get to be my age, you'll learn not to bet on verdicts. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and not oh, to bet on justice thing. either. One thing I got to keep telling everybody: stop saying the gun was illegal. I, I, I to all today, I'm arguing with these idiots who keep telling he's got it illegal. I said, why you guys keep saying this? They dropped the charge. There's no curfew charge. Stop saying he didn't belong here. Stop saying he had a legal gun. 
That's gone. They're not even charging them with that. Did anymore. the media the update that that charge got dismissed? Because I haven't seen it's, those headlines anywhere. Maybe I'm looking in the wrong spot. I saw one that, that said it was dropped on a technicality. Yeah, so you like the technicality of the law did not apply. The <laughs> How bad the technicality that the gun didn't match the law <laughs> yeah, and yeah, never no. did. They shouldn't have yeah. charged it's, it. It's insane. That's somebody like fact saying they check don't... me with politifacts. Somebody like you know what the politifacts. Somebody fact check me with that, and I'm like, that's old. The, the, the gun charges it there anymore. That's that's what we got to deal with now. Uh, we have a little sorry. meme here. Sorry, <laughs> sorry for the offensive language of bingo. Oh my. Uh, but... <laughs> That should have had hard. That should have had hard R there. It would have and, fit with his name better. <laughs> and, and, and Binger. there were media headlines Binger. about the technicality in which the judge was yelling at the the state for the Fifth Amendment uh, stuff. And is the Fifth know, Amendment violation of technicality now? I, no. It's What's funny is the institution. It's just the U.S. U.S. Constitution. I mean, no big deal. Technicality. <laughs> technicality. What is the institutional media is borrowing from what the right wing did in the 70s, where they referred to all this as kind of technicalities. Defendant got off on a technicality. First Amendment, Fourth Amendment, Fifth Amendment, Sixth Amendment. That's what the technicality yep. was. But now the institutional left has borrowed that terminology. The law yep. is now a technicality. It's always been. Technicality is always either the police screwed up, the prosecution screwed up, or massive rights violation. You know, but or all three, and it's almost but like the institutional violation is a technicality, and that's where I'm confused. It's yeah. well, it's it's like institutional power doesn't really care about left and right at the end of the day. That's for us peons to argue over, and institutional power is playing a completely different game. I mean, you have you have crazy people in the chat, Nick. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't know what they're saying, but I do agree. And uh, <laughs> we'll marriage to legal bites. Be careful of before... finger sandwiches. I was going to say, be careful before standard. you agree, Nick. <laughs> no, I believe me. I've met, I've met them. I, there was I, one. There was one earlier which was asking if Legal Bites ever paints her toenails on her streams, I've and I actually a lot of comments on my feet. In oh, and I responded, "She doesn't." <laughs> but I Legal do. Bites have a wiki feet page. Legal Bites, what's your wiki feet page? Can we get you a good wiki feet rating? Oh God, Alita, I, I do okay. want to ask you. I do want to ask Alita a question. Um, okay. You're Alita, Alita's a runner. So today, the defense was trying to get in that Arbery was not a runner. So the okay. question the defense attorney, defense attorney asked the coroner was like, was um, did Arbery have long and dirty toenails? Nice. And that was supposed to be, he was asking not that. Not racist and, they, and he said all. yes. But he was asking <laughs> that because he said runners don't generally have long and dirty turtles. They'll <laughs> cut their toenails because it helps the run. So that was supposedly the... the okay, the, if the, you're... If but, it was like, I'm what? so glad I switched over to Rittenhouse. <laughs> I'm like, oh what's God. he asking? Dirty toenails. Why is that question even coming up? Uh, but they said it's like a runner's thing. So I'm like, all right, I'll ask I don't, the runner. Okay, if you're, if you're ultra marathoning, yeah, I would say that that's pretty essential. A marathon even. I, you know, <laughs> gruesome, but my first marathon, I may, may or may not have lost a toenail because it was a little too long. And, it, and my, my toe box was just a little bit too narrow. And so it yep. just it, my my toe was just hitting hitting the the top of the toe box a little bit too much, and then it bruised, and eventually that's what happened. But I, I mean, it's the to weirdest. Say, it depends on how long they're talking. Like, I'm are just they talking to figure like out what a what a toe box is? Uh, it, it, sorry, <laughs> the front of the shoe. I was, the, I was yeah, like, am I going to feel better or... or worse about this story if I get a definition of toe box? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> no, it's, it's no, just the no. front part of the shoe where your toes are because oh. if you're yeah, because you're pounding you need, the pavement you need, for need to, so when you're running you know your your running shoes need need uh, enough space so that your toes can kind of spread out so that you can you can you can actually land properly so you know if if you don't have enough room in the toe box then you can run into those kinds of issues but uh, that's probably more important than making sure that your 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 toenails are perfectly manicured. But I've definitely gone on plenty of runs where my my toenails were not. To I, this is more it's stuff about my feet. I, the chat's oh, don't worry, the chat is fine. Yeah. 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 okay with this. this. this is on Stop. Me. Stop. But, no, but I, I mean, you know, and then, then you have an iniquitous kind of audience, and you start referencing your toe box. I don't know what you think is going to happen here. I was someone offered you ten thousand dollars for the toenail. Expert running testimony. <laughs> Someone offered you ten grand for the toenail. That's all. Uh, that's probably where we need to wrap this stream up. All right. Uh, to my panel, I'm gonna. If if you guys can hang around for just a second, I'd like to say goodbye after the stream. I'm gonna pull us off, play a, a very short outro, 
uh, to the chat. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Hope you have a good night. Peace. Peace. I should have timed that better. Sure, we have a mistrial here, sir. I'm gonna mistrial my foot up your ass. You don't shut up.